Talmud, Mas Pesach Shemay C-H-A-P-T-E-R I Mishnah on the evening or of the 14th of Nisan a search is made for leaven by the light of a lamp every place where unleavened bread is not taken does not require searching and in what case did they rule two rows of the wine cellar must be searched concerning a place where unleavened might be taken Beth Shemai maintain two rows over the front of the whole cellar but Beth Hillel maintain the two outer rows which are the uppermost Gemara what? Is or Aruna said light Naga while Rab Judah said night Lele now it was assumed that he who says light means literally light while he who says night means literally night an objection is raised as soon as the morning was light or the men were sent away which proves that or his day is it then written the or was morning surely the morning was or is written as one says morning has broken forth and this verse is in accordance with what Rab Judah said in Rab's name for Rab Judah said. In Rab's name a man should always enter a town by day and set out by day an objection is raised as the light of or the morning when the sun riseth which proves that or means the daytime is it then written or is morning surely it is written as the light of or the morning and this is its meaning and as the light of the morning in this world so shall the rising of the sun be unto the righteous in the world to come an objection is raised and God called the light or day which proves that or is daytime this is its meaning the advancing of light he called day if so and the darkness he called night means similarly the advancing of darkness he called night but surely it is an established principle that it is day until the appearance of the stars rather this is its meaning the merciful one summoned the light and appointed it for duty by day and he summoned the darkness and appointed it for duty by night an objection is raised praise him all yes stars of light or which proves that or is evening this is its meaning praise him all yes stars which give light if so are only the stars that give light to praise him while those which do not give light need not praise yet surely it is written praise ye him all his host rather he the psalmist tells us this the light of the stars too is designated light what is its practical bearing in respect of one who vows not to benefit from life for it was taught if one vows not to benefit from light he is prohibited the light of Stars and objection is raised the murderer riseth with the light or he killeth the poor and needy and in the night he is as a thief Talmud, Mas Pesachim Vina since he states and in the night he is as a thief it follows that or is day the meaning there is this if the matter is as clear as light to you that he the thief comes even to take life he is a murderer and he the victim may be saved at the cost of his a thief's life but if you are doubtful about it like the darkness of it. Night you must regard him only as a thief and he the victim must not be saved at the cost of his life an objection is raised let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark let him look for light or but have none neither let it behold the eyelids of the morning since he says let him look for light but have none it follows that or is day their job indeed curses his destiny and exclaims heaven grant that that man as see himself look for light but have none an objection is raised if I say. Surely the darkness shall overwhelm me and the light or about me shall be night this proves that or is day there David said thus I thought surely darkness shall overwhelm me in the future world which resembles day but now even this world which resembles night is light about me an objection is raised our Judah said we search for eleven in the evening or of the fourteenth in the morning of the fourteenth and at the time of removal now since our Judah says we search in the evening or of the fourteenth and in the morning of the fourteenth it follows that or is evening this proves that an objection is raised from when is work forbidden on the fourteenth of Nisan our Eliezer B. Jacob said from the time of the or our Judah said from the first sparklings of the rising sunset our Eliezer B. Jacob to our Judah where then do we find a day during part of which work is forbidden while during the other part it is permitted he replied let that day itself prove this possibility for during Part of it the eating of leaven is permitted whereas during the other part it is forbidden now since our Judah maintains from the first sparklings of the rising sun it follows that by or our Eliezer B. Jacob means evening know what does or mean the morning dawn if so when he says to him where then do we find a day during part of which work is forbidden while during the other part it is permitted let him answer himself surely there is a night which is permitted our Eliezer B. Jacob argues thus as for my view it is well we find that the rabbis drew a distinction between night and day for it was taught in respect of a public fast until when may one eat and drink until the commencement of dawn this is our Eliezer B. Jacob's view our Simeon maintained until cock crow but on your view where do we find that the rabbis drew a distinction in the day itself to which he replied let that day itself prove it for during part thereof the eating of leaven is permitted while during part thereof it is Forbidden Arjuna answers our Eliza rightly our Eliza says thus to him I speak to you of work which is prohibited by the rabbis while you answer me about leaven on the fourteenth day which is prohibited by scripture thus far the divine law permits and from then scripture forbids and the other the additional hours are rabbinical and the other the rabbis merely erected a safeguard for a scriptural law and objection is raised bonfires are lit only for a new moon that is visible in its due time in order to sanctify it and when were the bonfires lit on the evening or following the intercalated day this proves that or is evening this proves that an objection is raised if he the priest was standing all night and offering the fats of sacrifices on the altar at daybreak or he must wash his hands and feet this is rabbis view or is a different word marzitra raised an objection Talmud Mas Pesachim if a woman miscarries on the evening or of the eighty first day Beth Shammai exempt her from a sacrifice whereas Beth Hillel declare her liable said Beth Hillel to Beth Shammai wherein does the evening or of the 81st differ from the day of the 81st seeing that it was assimilated thereto in respect of uncleanness shall one not assimilated thereto in respect of sacrifice now since Beth Hillel say to Beth Shammai wherein does the evening or of the 81st differ from the day of the 81st it follows that or is evening this. Proves that new moon was fixed by direct observation not calculation and communities at a distance from Jerusalem were informed by bonfires these were lit only if the new moon appeared in its due time I it was fixed for the 30th day the previous month thus consisting of 29 days only in that case too Beth did formally sanctify this day but if observation fixed it for the 31st day no bonfires were lit since the absence of bonfires on the previous day would be sufficient. Signal further new moon was not formally sanctified by Beth Din Rashi an objection is raised one might think that it may be eaten on the evening or of the third day from sacrifice and it is logical sacrifices are eaten on one day while peace offerings are eaten on two days just as there the night follows the day so here too the night should follow the day therefore it is stated it shall be eaten the same day offer it and on the morrow and if it remain until the third day it shall be burnt with fire teaching it may be eaten only during the day but it may not be eaten during the evening or of the third day one might think that it must be burnt immediately and this is logical sacrifices may be eaten one day and one sc the following night while peace offerings may be eaten two days and one sc the intermediate night just as there immediately after the time allowed for eating there is burning so here too immediately after the time allowed for eating there is burning. Therefore it is stated but that which remaineth of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day it shall be burnt with fire teaching you must burn it by day but you must not burn it by night since he states it may be eaten in the evening or of the third day it follows that or is evening this proves it come and here on the evening or of the day of atonement one recites seven benedictions and confesses in the morning service he recites seven and confesses in the additional service he recites seven and confesses at minha he recites seven and confesses at any isle of the concluding service he recites seven and confesses in the evening service he recites one benediction embodying the eighteen arhan of Bigamaliel said on the authority of his fathers he must recite the eighteen benedictions in full because he must pronounce Havdalah in the benediction thou dost graciously grant knowledge this proves that or is evening this proves it come and here for the school of Samuel. Learned in the evening of the fourteenth leaven is searched for by the light of a lamp thus proving that or is evening the fact is both Arhuna and Rabjuda are alike agreeing that or is evening and there is no controversy each master speaks in accordance with his locality in Arhuna's town they called it Naga while in Rabjuda's town it is called Nightlele and Artana why does he not employ Lele he employs a refined expression and in accordance with Arjashua be Levi for Arjashua be Levi. Said one should not utter a gross expression with his mouth for lo the writ employs a circumlocution of eight letters rather than utter a gross expression for it is said of every clean beast and of the beasts that are not clean are Papa said nine for it is said if there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of that which chanceth by night Robin has said ten including the Bab of Tad Arahabi Jacob said sixteen for it is said for he thought something hath befallen him he is not clean.
Wherever more words would be required, the shorter phraseology is employed as Arhuna said in Rab's name, others say Arhuna said in Rab's name on Armaeur's authority. One should always teach his pupil in concise terms and where they are equal, he discourses in refined speech, yet surely writing rope with and sitting Yoshabith are alike in length, yet writing rope with his stated rape path is stated to disciples sat before Rab one said this discussion has made us as tired as an exhausted swine. While the other said this discussion has made us as tired as an exhausted kid and Rab would not speak to the former, there were two disciples who sat before Hillel, one of whom was Aryuhan and Bizakai, others stayed before Rabbi and one of them was Aryuhan and one said, Why must we vintage grapes in cleanness yet need not gather olives in cleanness? While the other said, Why must we vintage in cleanness yet may gather olives in uncleanness? I am certain that the latter will be an authorized teacher in Israel, he observed, and it did not take long before he was an authorized teacher in Israel. There were three priests, one said, I received as much as a bean of the shoe bread, the second said, I received as much as an olive, while the third said, I received as much as a halt. I tail, they investigated his pedigree and found a blemish of unfitness in him, but we learned one must not investigate from the altar and above, do not say a blemish of unfitness, but a baseness which made him unfit. Alternatively, there it was different because he impaired his status himself. A certain Syrian, i.e., Nanju, used to go up and partake of the Passover sacrifices in Jerusalem, boasting it is written, There shall no alien eat thereof, no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof, yet I eat of the very best, said Arju to be thither to him. Did they supply you with the fat tail? No, he replied, Then when you journey up thither, say to them, Supply me with the fat tail. When he went up, he said to them, Supply me with the fat tail, but the fat tail belongs to the Most High. They replied, Who told you to do this? They inquired Arju to be thither, answered he, What is this matter before us? They wondered, they investigated his pedigree and discovered that he was a Syrian and killed him, and they sent a message to Arju to be thither, Peace be with the Arju to be thither, for thou art in Nisibus, yet thy net is spread in Jerusalem. Arkahana fell sick, so the rabbi sent Arjashu, son of Aridi, instructing him, Go and Find out what is wrong with him. He went and found him dead thereupon. He rent his garment and turned the rent behind him and went along weeping. He has died. Asked they of him. I have not said it. He answered for he that uttereth evil tidings is a fool. Yohanan of Dukok went out to some villages on his return. He was asked has the wheat crop been successful. The barley crop has been successful. He replied go out and tell it to horses and asses. They retorted for it is written barley also and straw for the horses and swift steeds. What then should he have said last year the wheat crop was successful or the lentil crop is successful. Talmud. Mas Pesachim Arab was the son of Arhai's brother and the son of his sister. When he went up thither he Arhai asked him is Abu alive. Ask me whether my mother is alive. He replied is your mother alive. Asked he is then Abu alive. He replied thereupon he Arhai said to his servant take off my shoes and carry my bathing things after me to the Baths from his three laws may be inferred. I mourner is forbidden to wear shoes too on a delayed report of death. At SC morning is observed for one day only, and three part of the day is as the whole of it. A certain man used to say, Judge my case, said that this proves that he is descended from Dan, for it is written, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. A certain man was wont to go about and say by the seashore, Thorn bushes are fir trees. They investigated and found that he was descended from Zebulun, for it is written, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea. And now that it is established that all agree that or means evening, consider according to both Arjuna and Armeyer, Levin is forbidden from six hours and onward only, then let us search in the sixth hour. And should you answer the zealous are early to perform religious duties, then let us search from the morning, for it is written, and in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And it was taught the whole day is valid for circumcision, but that the zealous are early to perform their religious duties, for it is said, and Abraham rose early in the morning, said Arnam and B. Isaac, it was fixed at the hour when people are found at home while the light of a lamp is good for searching, and they observed, therefore, a scholar must not commence his regular session in the evening of the thirteenth, breaking into the fourteenth, lest his studies absorb him and he come to neglect his religious duty. Arnam and B. Isaac was asked if one rents a house to his neighbor from the fourteenth, upon whom rests the duty to make the search, does it rest upon the landlord because the leaven is his, or perhaps upon the tenant because the forbidden matter exists in his domain? Come and here, if one rents a house to his neighbor, the tenant must affix a mezuzah. There surely are measures, said the mezuzah is the inhabitant's obligation, but how is it here, said Arnam and B. Isaac to them, we. Learned that if one rents a house to his neighbor if the fourteenth occurs before he delivers him the keys the landlord must make the search while if the fourteenth occurs after he delivers the keys the tenant must make search Arnam and B. Isaac was asked if one rents a house to his neighbor on the fourteenth does it stand in the presumption of having been searched or not what difference does it make let us ask him he is not present to be asked hence what about troubling this one the tenant said Arnam and B. Isaac to them we have a teaching all are believed concerning the removal of leaven even women even slaves even minors now why are they believed Talmud Mas Pesachim B. Talmud Mas Pesachim B. is it not because it stands in the presumption of having been searched the tenant holding all our habram in respect to the searching of leaven for it was taught if a haber dies and leaves a storehouse full of produce crops even if they are but one day old they stand in the presumption of having been tithed, how so perhaps it is different here because they the woman slave or minor stated as then the statement of these any substance what then will you assume it stands in the presumption of having been searched then it should state all houses stand on the fourteenth in the presumption of having been searched what then will you assume it is because of the statement of these that the house is assumed to have been searched but if these did not say that it had been searched it is not so then solved from this teaching that it does not stand in the presumption of having been searched no in truth I may tell you that generally it does stand in the presumption of having been searched but what we discuss here is a case where we know for certain that he the owner did not search but these affirm we searched it you might say let not the rabbis believe them therefore it informs us that since the search for eleven is required only by rabbinical law for by Scriptural long-year nullification all suffices for it. The rabbis gave them credence in respect to a rabbinical enactment. The scholars asked what if one rents a house to his neighbor in the presumption of its having been searched and he the tenant finds that it has not been searched. Is it as an erroneous bargain or not come and here for Abbe said it is unnecessary to say of a town where payment is not made to others for searching that a person is pleased to fulfill a precept personally. But even in a town where payment is made for searching it is not an erroneous bargain because it is to be assumed that one is pleased to fulfill a precept with his money. We learned elsewhere our mayor said one may eat leaven the whole of the five hours and must burn it at the beginning of the sixth. Our Judah said one may eat until four hours hold it in suspense the whole of the fifth and must burn it at the beginning of the sixth. Thus incidentally all agree that leaven is scripturally. Forbidden from six hours, i.e. noon and onwards, whence do we know it said, Abbe two verses are written, seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, and it is written, even a.k. the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses, how is this to be understood? It must include the fourteenth as the day for removal, yet say that it includes the night of the fifteenth as the time for removal, for one might argue days is written, implying only days but not nights, hence it did. Verse informs us that even nights are included in the interdict that is unnecessary. Talmud, Mas Pesachim, for the putting away of leaven is assimilated to the prohibition of eating leavened bread and the eating of leavened bread to the precept of the eating of unleavened bread, the putting away of leaven is assimilated to the prohibition of the eating of leavened bread, for it is written, seven days shall there be no leaven in your houses, for whosoever eat that which is leavened. That soul shall be cut off, and the prohibition of the eating of leavened bread is likened to the precept of eating unleavened bread, because it is written, Ye shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations, shall ye eat unleavened bread, and in respect to unleavened bread, it is written, that even ye shall eat unleavened bread, yet perhaps it is to include the night of fourteenth as the time for removal. The day is written, and say that it must be removed from the morning, a.k. divides it. The school of our Ishmael taught we find that the fourteenth is called the first, as it is said on the first on the fourteenth day of the month, Arnam and B. Isaac said the first Rishon means the preceding
School of Arishmael taught as a reward for the observance of the three firsts the Israel merited three firsts to destroy the seat of Esau the building of the temple and the name of the Messiah to destroy the seat of Esau of whom it is written and the first came forth red all over like an hairy garment and the building of the temple whereof it is written the glorious throne set on high from the first is the place of our sanctuary and the name of Messiah for it is written first unto Zion. Behold, behold, the Rabbah said it is deduced from here thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread that means thou shalt not kill the Passover sacrifice while leavened bread is still in existence then perhaps each person must remove his leaven when he kills his sacrifice scripture meant the time for killing it was taught likewise even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses this means on the eve of the festival yet perhaps that is not so but Rather on the festival itself, therefore it is stated, Thou shalt not offer the blood of thy sacrifice with leavened bread, i.e., thou shalt not kill the Passover sacrifice while leavened bread still exists in thy house. That is, our Ishmael's view, our Akiba said, That is unnecessary. Lo, it is said, Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses, and it is written, No manner of work shall be done in them. While we find that kindling is a principal labor, our Jose said, It is unnecessary. Lo, it is said, Even AK on the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses, that means from the eve of the festival, or perhaps it is not so, but rather on the festival, therefore it is stated, AK which serves to divide, hence if it means on the festival itself, can part of it be permitted? Surely the putting away of leaven is likened to the prohibition of eating leavened bread, while the prohibition of eating leavened bread is likened to the duty of eating unleavened bread, said Rabbi Talmud. Mas Pesachim B. Three things may be inferred from our Akiva. There is no other removal of leaven save by burning two kindling was singled out to indicate separation. Three, we do not say since kindling was permitted when it is necessary for the preparation of food, it was also permitted when it is unnecessary. Our rabbis taught seven days shall there be no leaven found in your house. Why is this stated seeing that it is already said and there shall no leaven bread be seen unto thee neither? Shall there be leaven seen unto thee in all thy borders because it is said neither shall there be leaven seen unto thee implying thy own thou must not see it thou mayest see that belonging to others and to the most high one might think that one may hide leaven or accept bailments of leaven from a Gentile. Therefore it is stated it shall not be found in your houses. Now I know this only of a Gentile who is not in your power or does not dwell with you in the same courtyard. How do I? Know it of a Gentile who is in your power and dwells with you in the same courtyard because it is stated leaven shall not be found in your houses. I know this only of that which is your houses. How do I know it of leaven in pits, ditches, and cavities because it is stated neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy borders. Yet I might still argue indeed on account of leaven in houses one transgresses the injunction against it being seen found and against hiding it and receiving it as bailments from a Gentile. Whereas in respect to leaven in thy borders we say thy own thou must not see it thou mayest see that belonging to others and to the most high. How do we however know to apply that which is stated in this verse to the other and vice versa? Therefore leaven is stated twice for a gazerish while thus leaven is stated in connection with houses. No leaven shall be found in your houses and leaven is stated in connection with the borders neither. Shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy borders, just as with the leaven which is stated in connection with houses, one transgresses the injunctions, it shall not be seen, it shall not be found, it shall not be hidden, nor accepted as bailments from Gentiles. So with the leaven which is stated in connection with the borders, one violates the injunctions, it shall not be seen, it shall not be found, it shall not be hidden, nor accepted as bailments from a Gentile, and just as with the leaven which is stated in connection with the borders, only thine own thou must not see, but thou mayest see that belonging to others and to the most high. So with the leaven which is stated in connection with the houses, only thine own thou mayest not see, but thou mayest see that belonging to others and to the most high. The master said, I know this only of a Gentile who is not in your power or does not dwell with you in the same courtyard. How do I know it of a Gentile who is in your power or who dwells? With you in the same courtyard, because it is stated, leaven shall not be found in your houses. Whither does this tense set of a reverse it? Rabbi said, in truth, you must not reverse it, but it refers to the first clause. I know thou mayest not see it, thou mayest see that belonging to others and to the most high. I know this only of a Gentile who is not in your power or who does not dwell with you in the same courtyard. How do I know it of one who is in your power or who dwells with you? In the same courtyard, because it is stated, there shall not be found, but this tense seeks permission, yet cites a verse intimating a prohibition, because unto thee, unto thee is stated twice. The master said, one might think that one may hide leaven or accept bailments of leaven from a Gentile, therefore it is stated, leaven shall not be found in your houses, but you said in the first clause, I know thou mayest not see it, thou mayest see that belonging to others and to the most high. There is no difficulty the one is meant where he the Israelite accepts responsibility for saying the other where he does not accept responsibility just as Rabbah said to the townspeople of Mahuza remove the leaven belonging to the troops from your house's power or who lives with you in the same courtyard is more likely to be meant than he who is independent or living away from you since the former is more like yourself whereas here the latter is taken for granted while proof is sought for the former since it stands in your possession if lost or stolen and you must requite the loss it is as yours and is forbidden now that is well on the view that that which causes liability for money is as money but on the view that it is not as money what can be said here it is different because scripture saith there shall not be found others say that is well on the view that that which causes liability for money is not as money Talmud, Mas Pesachim hence there shall not be found is Necessary, but on the view that it is as money, what is the purpose of there shall not be found? It is necessary, you might argue, since if in existence it is returned as it is, it does not stand in its possession. Hence, he informs us otherwise. Rabba was asked, Is cattle liable to our known as subject to the law of first links or not? Wherever one can put him off with money, we do not ask, for he is certainly liable. Our problem arises where he cannot put him off with money. What then he replied, It is not subject thereto, but surely it was taught if the animal is subject thereto. There it is a case where he can put him off with money. Other state Rabba said, Cattle liable to our known is not subject to the law of first links, even when he can put him off with money. A doe made of flower liable to our known is subject to hell. What is the reason the facts about cattle are generally known? The facts about a doe are not generally known. Our rabbis taught if a Gentile enters an Israelite court. Yard with leaven dough in his hand he the Israelite is not obliged to remove it if he deposits it with him he is obliged to remove it if he assigns a room to him for the dough he is not obliged to remove it because it is said leaven shall not be found what does he the tana mean said our papa he refers to the first clause and says thus if he deposits it with him he is obliged to remove it because it is said leaven shall not be found our ash he said after all it refers to the second clause and he says thus if he assigned a room to him he is not obliged to remove it because it is said leaven shall not be found in your houses and this is not his house for when the Gentile carries in the leaven he carries it into his own house shall we say that renting confers a title but surely we learned even in the place where they the sages permitted renting to a heathen they did not permit renting for a dwelling house because he the heathen introduces his idols therein. Now if you should think that renting confers a title when he introduces the idols he introduces them into his own house here it is different because the divine law expresses it in the form of there shall not be found implying that which is found in your hand is forbidden which excludes this case since it is not found in your hand Rab Judah said in Rab's name if one finds leaven in his house during the festival he overturns a vessel upon it Rabbah said if dough partly owned by a non-Jew. Nevertheless this dough is subject to hell as explained in the text it is a pitch this is unnecessary what is the reason he does indeed hold aloof from it Rab Judah also said in Rab's name leaven belonging to a Gentile he the Israelite must set up a partition of ten handbreadths around it as a distinguishing mark but if it belongs to Hippish this is unnecessary what is the reason people hold aloof from it Rab Judah also said in Rab's name he who sets sail and he who sets out in a Caravan company before 30 days prior to Passover is not bound to remove the leaven if within 30 days he is bound to remove it. Abbe observed when you say if within 30 days he is bound to remove it we said this only where his intention is to return during Passover but if it is not his intention to return he is not bound to remove it said Rabbah to him
Year to you, and it is written, Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to their fathers' houses, etc. But how do you know that he was standing at the beginning of the month? Perhaps he was standing on the fourth or the fifth of the month, rather, said Rabbi Bishimai in Rabbanah's name, it is deduced from here, and the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year, and it is written, Moreover, let the children of Israel keep the Passover in its appointed season. But here too, how do you know that he was standing at the beginning of the month? Perhaps he was standing on the fourth or the fifth of the month, said Arnaman B. Isaac. The implication of wilderness here is learned from wilderness elsewhere. Here it is written in the wilderness of Sinai, while there it is written, and the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first. Day of the second month, just as there it was at the beginning of the month, so here too at the beginning of the month, now let the events of the first month be written first, and then that of the second month, said Armanasia B. Talafa in Rab's name. This proves that there is no chronological order in the Torah. Our Papa observed this was said only of two subjects, but in the same subject, what is earlier is earlier, and what is later is later, for should you not say thus, how then apply the principle? That when a general proposition is followed by a particular specification, the general proposition comprises only what is contained in the particular specification, perhaps it is a particular specification followed by a general proposition, moreover, it is a principle that when a particular specification is followed by a general proposition, the generalization becomes an addition to the specification here too, perhaps it is a generalization followed by a particularization, but if so, the same. Question applies even to two subjects now that is well on the view that when a generalization and a specification are at a distance from each other we do not interpret them as a generalization followed by a specification then it is correct but on the view that we do interpret them thus what can be said even on the view that we do interpret that is only when they occur in the same subject but when in two subjects we do not interpret them thus Rab Judah said in Rab's name he who searches for love and must also declare it null what is the reason shall we say it is because of crumbs but they are of no value and should you answer since they are guarded in virtue of his house they are of account surely it was taught if there are in a man's field late fix while he guards his field on account of the grapes or if there are late grapes while he guards his field on account of his cucumbers and gourds when the owner is particular about them they are forbidden to it. Stranger as theft and are subject to tithes when the owner is not particular about them they are not forbidden as theft and are exempt from tithes said Rabbah it is a preventive measure lest he find a tasty loaf and set his mind upon it then let him annul it when he finds it he may find it after the interdict commences and then it does not stand in his ownership and so he cannot annul it for our Eliezer said two things are not in a man's ownership yet the writ regarded them as though they were in his ownership and these are the pit in public ground and leaven from six hours and onwards then let him annul it at the fourth or the fifth hour since it is neither the time of the prohibition nor the time of searching he may transgress and not annul it Talmud, Mos Pesachim then let him annul it in the sixth hour since the rabbinical interdict is upon it it is like a scriptural interdict and does not stand in his ownership hence he cannot annul it for our Gittel said in R. I be Joseph's name in Rab's name he who betrothed from the sixth hour and onwards even with wheat of court yet we have no fear of his betrothal but is he unable to annul it after the prohibition commences surely it was taught if he is sitting in the Beth Hamid Rash and recollects that he has leaven at home he annuls it in his heart whether it is the Sabbath or the festival now as for the Sabbath it is well this is possible where the fourteenth of Nisan falls on the Sabbath but the festival is after the prohibition commences said Arahabi Jacob we treat here of a disciple sitting before his master and he recollects that he has a rolled dough at home and fears that it may turn leaven therefore he anticipates and annuls it before it turns leaven this may be proved too for it states if he is sitting in the Beth Hamid Rash this proves it Rabbi the son of Arhuna said in Rab's name if a loaf went moldy if Maza exceeds it in quantity it is permitted how is it meant shall we say that he the owner knows that this loaf is leaven what then matters it if the mazah does exceed it again if we do not know whether it is leaven or mazah then why particularly if the mazah exceeds it even if the mazah does not exceed it too let us go after the last did we not learn money found in front of cattle dealers at all times is accounted as tithe on the temple mount it is hollen in the rest of Jerusalem at any other part of the year it is hollen at the festival season it is tithe and Arshimei of Bezer observed thereon what is the reason because the streets of Jerusalem were swept daily this proves that we assume the earlier losses have gone and these coins are different ones so here too let us say the earlier bread has gone and this is of the present here it is different because its moldiness proves its status if its moldiness proves its status what does it matter if the mazah exceeds it said Rabbi do not say if the mazah exceeds it but say many days of Mazah have passed over it if so it is obvious this is necessary only where it is very moldy you might argue since it is very moldy it is clear that it is certainly true love and therefore he informs us that since many days of Mazah have passed over it we say every day hot Mazah was baked and thrown thereon and that made it very moldy yet do we follow the last surely it was taught our Jose B. Judah said if a chest was used for money of Holland and money of tithe if it was mostly Holland if it money found therein is Holland if mostly tithe it is tithe but why so let us go after the last said Arnaman B. Isaac of what do we treat here e.g. where it was used for money of Holland and money of tithe and one does not know which was last Arzibit said e.g. where it was used for separate packages our Papa said e.g. if it was found in a pit of peace offerings when one could not stay long enough in Jerusalem to expend all his tithe money he would distribute it among the poor or give it to his friends in Jerusalem consequently if money is found in front of cattle dealers whatever the time of the year it is assumed to be of the second tithe on the other hand if it is found on the temple mount we assume it to be Holland even at festival time when most of money handled is tithe because the greater part of the year is not festival and then ordinary Holland is in circulation and this money might have been lost before the festival but if found in the streets of Jerusalem a distinction is drawn as stated in the text Rab Judah said he who searches for leaven must pronounce a benediction what benediction does he pronounce our papi said in Rab's name who has commanded us to remove leaven our papa said in Rab's name who has commanded us concerning the removal of leaven as for the phrase to remove there is no disagreement at all that it certainly implies in the future Talmud Mos Pesachim be they differ only in respect of concerning the removal one master holds that it implies in the past while the other master holds it implies in the future an objection is raised blessed art thou who has sanctified us with thy commandments and has commanded us concerning circumcision how else should he say it there shall he say to circumcise is it imperative that he should circumcise then what can be said of the father of the infant then indeed it is so an objection is raised blessed art thou who has sanctified us with thy commandments and has commanded us concerning Sheshita thereto how else shall he say it shall he say to slaughter is it imperative that he should slaughter then what can be said of the Passover sacrifice and other sacrifices there indeed it is so an objection is raised if one prepares a lullab for himself he recites the blessing who has kept us in life and has preserved us and has suffered us to reach the season when he takes it in order to fulfill his obligation therewith he recites who has sanctified us with thy commandments and has commanded us concerning the taking of the lullab there it is different because in the very moment that he lifts it up his duty is fulfilled if so instead of stating in order to fulfill his obligation therewith he should say having fulfilled his obligation therewith that indeed is so but because he desires to teach to sit in the sukkah in the second clause he also states in the first clause to fulfill his obligation therewith for he teaches in the second clause he who makes a sukkah for himself recites blessed art thou o lord who has kept us in life and has preserved us and has enabled us to reach the season when he enters to sit there and he recites blessed art thou who has sanctified us with thy commandments and has commanded us to sit in the sukkah and the laws he recites concerning the removal of love and now incidentally all agree that we must recite the benediction beforehand how do we know it because Rab Judah said in Samuel's name for all precepts of benediction is recited prior over to their being performed where is it implied that this word over connotes priority said Arnam and B. Isaac because scripture said then Ahim as ran by the way of the plain and over and W. A. the Kishite said it follows from this and he himself passed over Abar before them alternatively from this and their king is
is learned from searching mentioned in its own connection and searching from lamps as it is written and it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and lamps from lamp for it is written the soul of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the innermost parts of the belly the school of our Ishmael taught in the evening of the fourteenth leaven is searched for by the light of a lamp though there is no proof of this there is an allusion to it because it is said. Seven days shall there be no leaven in your houses and it is said and he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack and it is said and it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and it is said the soul of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the innermost parts of the belly what is the purpose of the additional quotations and should you answer this at that time is a statement of lenient treatment. By the merciful one is I will not search Jerusalem with the light of a torch which gives much light but only with the light of a lamp the light of which is much smaller so that great wrongdoing will be found out but petty wrongdoing will not be found out then come and hear the soul of man is the lamp of the Lord searching etc. Our rabbis taught one may not search either by the light of the sun or by the light of the moon or by the light of a torch save by the light of a lamp Talmud, Moss. Pesachim because the light of a lamp is suitable for searching and though there is no proof of the matter yet there is a hint of it for it is said seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses and it is said and he searched and began at the eldest etc and it is said and it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and it is said the soul of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the innermost parts of the belly this light of the sun where is it? Meant shall we say in a courtyard but Rabbah said a courtyard does not require searching because birds frequent it while if in a hall but Rabbah said a hall is searched by its own light this is meant only in respect of a skylight in a room but then what part of it if that which is opposite the skylight then it is the same as a hall rather it means the part of the room at the sides and not by the light of a torch surely Rabbah said what is the meaning of the verse and his brightness was as the light he had raised coming forth from his hand and there was hiding of his power to what are the righteous comparable in the presence of the Sheshana to a lamp in the presence of a torch and Rabbah also said to use a torch for Havdalah is the most preferable way of performing this duty said Arnam and B. Isaac the one can be brought into holes and chinks in the wall whereas the other cannot be brought into holes and chinks are Zebit said the one throws its light forward whereas the other throws its light behind our papa said here with the torch one is afraid whereas there with the lamp one is not afraid Rabbah said the light of the one is steady whereas that of the other is fitful every place wherein leaven is not taken etc what does every place add it adds the following taught by our rabbis the topmost and the nethermost holes of a room the roof of the veranda the roof of a turret a cow stable hen coops a shed for straw and storehouses of wine and oil do not need searching our simian begamaliel said a bed which makes a division in a room and leaves a space need searching but the following contradicts it a whole lying between a man and his neighbor this one searches as far as his hand reaches and that one searches as far as his hand reaches and the rest he annuls in his heart our simian begamaliel said a bed which makes a division in a room timber and stones being arranged under it and it leaves a space does not require searching thus the rulings on a Bed are contradictory and those on holes are contradictory. The rulings on holes are not contradictory. The one refers to the topmost and the nethermost, the other to holes in the middle of the wall. The rulings on a bed are not contradictory. Here it is raised, there it is low down, but do not store houses of wine. Require searching. Surely it was taught store houses of wine need searching. Stores of oil do not need searching. The case we discuss here is where one draws his immediate supplies from it. If so, oil too is for oil. There is a limit to eating, but in respect to wine, there is no limit to drinking. Our high taught stores of beer in Babylonia were made the same as stores of wine in Palestine, where one draws his supplies from them. Our hista said a fish pantry does not require searching, but it was taught that they require searching. There is no difficulty. The one treats of large fish, the other of small rabbis, son of Arhuna sets all chance and max chance need. Searching our papa said storehouses for fuel and storehouses for dates need searching a tanda taught we do not oblige him to insert his hand into holes and chinks and search there on account of the danger which danger shall we say the danger of a snake then when he used it how could he use it this arises only where it the wall collapsed but if it collapsed why do I need searching at all surely we learned if ruins collapsed on love and it is regarded as removed there the circumstances are that a dog cannot search it out here that a dog can search it out but our Eliezer said those sent to perform a religious duty do not suffer harm said our ashi he may have lost a needle and come to look for it but is it not regarded as a fulfillment of a religious duty in such a case surely it was taught if one declares the celebi for charity in order that my son may live or that I may merit the future world Talmud Mos Pesachim B he is completely righteous perhaps after he searched for the leaven he will come to look for it. Arnam and B. Isaac said it means on account of the danger of Gentiles disagreeing with the limo for it was taught in the case of a hole between a Jew and a Syrian, i.e. a Gentile, he must search as far as his hand reaches and the rest he annuls in his heart. The limo said he does not search it at all on account of the danger. Now what is the danger? Shall we say the danger of witchcraft? Then when he used it, how did he use it there? When he used it, it was day and there was light. Therefore the Gentile would not suspect anything, but here it is night and a lamp is used, hence he will suspect. But our Eliezer said those sent to perform a religious duty do not suffer harm where the injury is probable. It is different for it is said, and Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hear it? He will kill me, and the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, etc. Rab was asked scholars who reside out of town, can they come in the early morning or after nightfall to the Academy, he replied, Let them come the risk be upon myself and my neck. What about returning? I do not know. He answered them. It was stated, Our Eliezer said, Those sent to perform a religious duty will not suffer hurt neither in their going nor in their returning. With whom does this agree with this tanifer? It was taught, Is he be Judah said, Seeing that the Torah said, No man shall desire thy land when thou goest up to appear before the Lord thy God. It teaches that your cow will graze in the meadow, and no wild beast will hurt it. Your fowl will go scratching in the dung heap, and no weasel will injure it. Now does this not furnish an argument? A minority of these whose nature it is to be hurt will not be hurt, and human beings for whom it is not natural to be hurt. How much more so I know it only in respect of going. How do I know it of returning? Because it is stated, And thou shalt turn in the morning and go back unto thy tents. This teaches that you will go and find your tent in peace. But since he is safe even on his return why intimate in respect of going that is necessary for our M.I.'s teaching for our M.I. said every man who owns land must make the festival pilgrimage but he who does not own land need not make the festival pilgrimage our Abin son of our Adda said in our Isaac's name why are there no fruits of Genesaret in Jerusalem so that the festival pilgrims should not say had we merely ascended in order to eat the fruits of Genesaret in Jerusalem it would have sufficed us with the result that the pilgrimage would not be for its own sake similarly our dose Tai son of our Jane said why are the thermal springs of Tiberias not found in Jerusalem so that the festival pilgrims should not say had we merely ascended in order to bathe in the thermal springs of Tiberias it would have sufficed us with the result that the pilgrimage would not be for its own sake then in what case did they rule two rows of the wine cellar etc who has mentioned anything about a Wine cellar this is what he the tana says every place wherein no leaven is taken does not require searching and stores of wine and stores of oil do not require searching either then in what case did they rule two rows of the wine cellar must be searched concerning a place wherein leaven may be taken which is one once private supplies are drawn Beth Shammai maintain two rows etc. Our Judah said the two rows which they Beth Shammai specified mean from the ground up to the very ceiling but our Yohanan said it means a single row in the shape of a right angle it was taught in accordance with Rab Judah and it was taught in accordance with our Yohanan it was taught in accordance with Rab Judah Beth Shammai maintain two rows over the front surface of the whole cellar and the two rows which they specified means from the ground up to the very ceiling it was taught in accordance with our Yohanan two rows over the face of the whole cellar i.e. the outer one which looks upon the door and the upper one which faces the ceiling but that which is within this and below this does not require searching Beth Hillel maintain the two outer rows which are the uppermost Rab said that means the upper row and the one beneath it while Samuel said that means the upper row and the one on the
Negative a certainty but cannot a doubt negative a certainty surely it was taught if a haver dies and leaves a storehouse full of produce crops even if they are but one day old they stand in the presumption of having been tithed now here these crops were certainly liable to tithe and there is a doubt whether they have been tithed or not tithed yet the doubt comes and negatives the certainty there it is one certainty against another certainty as we presume that they have certainly been tithed in accordance with our Hanan of Hosea for our Hanan of Hosea said there is a presumption concerning a haver that he does not let anything untithed pass out from under his hand alternatively it is a doubt on the one hand and a doubt on the other perhaps from the very beginning say that it was not liable to tithe in accordance with our Ashai for our Ashai said one may practice an artifice with his produce and take it in its husk so that his cattle may eat thereof and it be exempt from Tithes but cannot a doubt negative a certainty surely it was taught our Judah said it once happened that the bond made of a certain oppressor in Ryman threw her premature born child into a pit Talmud, Mas Pesachim B Talmud, Mas Pesachim B and a priest came and looked down it to see whether it was a male or a female and when the matter came before the sages they declared him clean because weasels and martins were to be found there now here she had certainly thrown it in while it is doubtful. Whether they had dragged it away or not by that time yet the doubt comes and negatives the certainty do not say that she threw a premature child into a pit but say she threw something like a premature child into a pit so that it is a doubt against a doubt but it states in order to see whether it was a male or a female this is what it says to know whether she had aborted wind or a premature child and should you say that it was a premature child to see whether it was a male or a female. Alternatively there it is a certainty against a certainty since weasels and martins are to be found there they had certainly dragged it away by the time for granted that they may have left over yet they certainly had dragged it away by the time but do we say we leave no fear that a weasel may have dragged leaven etc surely the second clause states what he leaves over he must put away in a hidden place so that it should not require a search after it said obey there is no difficulty there. one refers to a search on the 14th the other on the 13th if one searches on the 13th when bread is yet to be found in all houses it a weasel does not hide leaven on the 14th when bread is not to be found in all houses it does hide it said Rabbah is then a weasel a prophet to know that it is the 14th now and people will not bake until the evening so that it should leave some over and hide it rather said Rabbah what one leaves over he must put away in a Hidden place lest a weasel sees it in his presence and it require a search after it it was taught in accordance with Rabbah if one wishes to eat leaven after the search what shall he do let him put it away in a hidden place lest a weasel come and sees it in his presence and it require a search after it Armari said it is for fear that he may leave ten and only find nine if there are nine packages of mazah and one of leaven and a mouse comes and steals a package and we do not know whether it took mazah or leaven that is similar to the case of nine shops if one package was separated and a mouse came and stole it that is similar to the second clause for it was taught if there are nine shops all selling meat of ritually slaughtered animals and there is one shop selling meat of nibble and a man buys meat from one of them but he does not know from which shop he bought the meat and doubt is prohibited but in the case of meat found we follow the majority if there are Two packages, one of Mazah and the other of Levin, and before them are two rooms, one searched and the other unsearched, and two mice came, one took Mazah and the other took Levin, and we do not know which mouse entered which house. That is a case of two baskets, for we learned if there are two baskets, one containing Holland and the other containing Terramah, and in front of them are two Seahs of provisions, one of Holland and the other of Terramah, and these fell into those they see the contents. Of the baskets are permitted, for I assume the Holland fell into Holland and the Terramah fell into Terramah, perhaps we say I assume Talmud, Mas Pesachim, in the case of Terramah only, which is merely rabbinical, but do we say thus in the case of Levin, which is scriptural, is then the searching for Levin scriptural, surely it is only rabbinical, for by scriptural law, mere is sufficient if there is one package of Levin, and in front of it are two houses which have been searched and there came a mouse and seized it and we do not know whether it entered this house or that that is similar to the case of two paths for we learned if there are two paths one clean and the other unclean and the person went through one of them and then touched clean food and then his neighbor came and went through the other and he touched clean food our Judah said if they each inquire separately they are clean if both together they are unclean our Jose said in both cases they are unclean Rabbah. Others say our Yohanan said if they came together all agree that they are unclean if consecutively all agree that they are clean they differ only where one comes to inquire about himself and his neighbor our Jose compares it to both coming together while our Judah likens it to each coming separately if it is doubtful whether it the mouse entered or not that is similar to the case of a plane and there we are involved in the controversy of our Eliezer and the rabbis for we learned if a man Enters a plain in winter and there is uncleanness in a particular field and he states I walked in that place but do not know whether I entered that field or not our Eliezer declares him clean while the sages declare him unclean for our Eliezer ruled if there is a doubt about entering he is clean if there is a doubt of contact with uncleanness he is unclean if it the mouse entered with the leaven and he the master searched but did not find it in like case there is a controversy of Armadir. And the rabbis for we learned Armadir used to say everything which is in the presumption of uncleanness always remains in its uncleanness until it is known to you whether its uncleanness is gone while the sages rule one searches until he reaches a rock or virgin soil if it the mouse entered with leaven and he searched and found leaven in like case there is a controversy of Rabbi and our Simeon Begamaliel for it was taught if a grave was lost in a field he who enters therein is unclean. If a grave is subsequently found in it, he who enters therein is clean, for I assume the grave which was lost is the same grave which was found. This is Rabbi's view. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said the whole field must be examined. If a man left nine pieces of leaven and found ten, there is a controversy of Rabbi and the Rabbis, for it was taught if he left a main and found two hundred Zeus Holland and second tither intermingled. This is Rabbi's view, but the sages maintain it is all Holland if he left ten and found nine. That is analogous to the second clause, for it was taught if he deposited two hundred and found one mana, he assumes one mana was left lying and one mana was taken away. This is Rabbi's view, but the sages maintain it is all Holland Talmud. Mas Pesachim B. If a man left leaven in this corner and finds leaven in another corner, there is a controversy of our Simeon B. Gamaliel and the Rabbis, for it was taught if an axe is lost in a house, the house is unclean, for I assume. Unclean person entered there and removed it. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said the house is clean for I assume he lent it to another and forgot or he took it from one corner and placed it in another corner and forgot who mentioned anything about a corner. The text is defective and is thus taught if an axe is lost in a house the house is unclean for I say an unclean person entered there and took it or if he leaves it in one corner and finds it in another corner the house is unclean for I assume an unclean person entered there and took it from one corner and placed it in another corner. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said the house is clean for I say he lent it to another and forgot or he took it from one corner and placed it in another corner and forgot. Rabbah said if a mouse enters a room with a loaf in its mouth and he the owner enters after him and finds crumbs a fresh search is necessary because it is not a mouse's nature to make crumbs. Rabbah also said if a child enters a room with a loaf in his and he the owner enters after him and finds crumbs a fresh search is not necessary because it is a child's nature to make crumbs Rabbah asked what if a mouse enters with a loaf in its mouth and a mouse goes out with a loaf in its mouth do we say the same which went in went out or perhaps it is a different one should you answer the same which went in went out what if a white mouse entered with a loaf in its mouth and black mouse went out with a loaf in its mouth now this is certainly a different one or perhaps it did indeed seize it from the other and should you say mice do not seize from each other what if a mouse enters with a loaf in its mouth and a weasel goes out with a loaf in its mouth now the weasel certainly does take from a mouse or perhaps it is a different one for had it snatched it from the mouse the mouse would have now been found in its mouth and should you say had it snatched it from the mouse the mouse would have been found in its mouth what if a mouse Enters with a loaf in its mouth and then a weasel comes out with a loaf and a mouse in the weasel's mouth. Here it is certainly the same, or perhaps if it were the same, the loaf should indeed have been found in the mouse's mouth, or perhaps it fell out of the mouse's mouth on account of its terror and if the we
Bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, and even on the first day shall ye put away leaven out of your house. Our Joseph objected, Our Judah said, He who has not searched at these three periods can no longer search, which proves that they differ only in respect of from now and henceforth. Marzitra recited it thus, Our Joseph objected, Our Judah said, He who has not searched at one of these three periods can no longer search, which proves that they differ in whether he can no longer search. Rather, Our Judah too means where he has not searched, and here they differ in this one master holds only before it is forbidden, but not after it is forbidden as a preventive measure, lest he come to eat of it. While the rabbis hold that we do not preventively forbid, but did Our Judah preventively forbid, lest he come to eat thereof. Surely we learned as soon as the omer has been offered, they used to go out and find the markets of. Jerusalem filled with flour and parched corn Talmud, Mas Pesachim but not with the consent of the sages. This is Armenia's opinion. Our Judah said they acted with the consent of the sages. Thus, Our Judah did not preventively forbid lest one come to eat thereof. Said Rabbi Hadish is different since he permitted to him only by means of plucking. You remember said Abay to him that is well at the time of plucking, but what can be said of the grinding and sifting that is no difficulty grinding is done with a handmill sifting is done on top of the seed. But as to what we learned, one may reap an artificially irrigated field and the corn in the valleys, but one may not stack the corn. And we established this as agreeing with Our Judah. What can be said? Rather said Abay from Hadish one holds aloof, but one does not hold aloof. Front Levin Rabbi Demurred Our Judah is self contradictory while the rabbis are not self contradictory. Rather said Rabbi Our Judah is not self contradictory as we. Have answered the rabbis who are not self contradictory, he himself is seeking it in order to burn it. Shall he then eat thereof? Arashi said, Our Judah is not self contradictory, for we learn flour and parched corn, but this answer of Arashi is a fiction. This is well from the time when it is parched years and onwards, but from the beginning until it is parched corn, what can be said? And should you answer it is gathered by plucking as Rabbah answered, then what can be said of what we learned that? One may reap an artificially irrigated field and the corn in the valleys which we established as agreeing with Arjuda, hence Arashi's answer is a fiction, but wherever one does not normally hold aloof, did Arjuda preventively forbid? Surely we learned a man may not pierce an eggshell, fill it with oil, and place it over the mouth of a burning lamp in order that it should drip, and even if it is of earthenware, but Arjuda permits it there on account of the strictness of the Sabbath, he will. Indeed, keep a loop, then one ruling of the Sabbath can be opposed to another ruling of the Sabbath, for it was taught if the cord of a bucket is broken, one must not tie it together but merely make a loop slip knot, whereas Arjuda maintains he may wind a hollow belt or a fascia around it, providing that he does not tie it with a slip knot. Thus, Arjuda's views are self contradictory, and similarly, the rabbis, the rabbis' views are not self contradictory. Oil from one source can be interchanged with oil from another, whereas looping cannot be mistaken for knotting. Arjuda's views are not self contradictory. Arjuda's reason is not that he forbids looping on account of knotting, but because looping itself is a form of knotting. Now, the rabbis may be opposed to the rabbis, for we learned the bucket over a well may be tied with a fascia but not with a cord, but Arjuda permits it. Now, what cord is meant? Shall we say an ordinary bucket cord? How does it state Arjuda? Permits it surely it is a permanent knot for he will certainly come to abandon it hence it is obvious that a weaver's rope is meant and yet the rabbis preventively forbid a weaver's cord on account of an ordinary cord even so one rope may be mistaken for another whereas looping cannot be mistaken for knotting but wherever one normally holds aloof from it does not Arjuda preventively forbid surely we learned if a firstling is attacked with congestion even if it should die otherwise. We must not bleed it this is Arjuda's view but the sages rule he may bleed it providing that he does not inflict a permanent blemish upon it there because one is excited Talmud, Mas Pesachim be about his property if you permit him to bleed it in a place where a blemish is not inflicted he will come to do it in a place where a blemish is inflicted but the rabbis argue if you do not permit him at all he is all the more likely to come to act thus yet do we say according to Arjuda. Man is excited over his property. Surely we learned an animal may not be curried on festivals because it makes a bruise wound, but you may scrape it. But the sages maintain it may neither be curried nor scraped. Now it was taught what is curring and what is scraping. Curring is with a small toothed strigil and it makes a wound. Scraping is with a large toothed strigil and does not make a wound there since it will die if left alone. We say a man is excited about his property here if he leaves it. There is merely discomfort. We do not say a man is excited about his money now as to Arjuda wherein is the difference that he preventively prohibits in the case of leaven but does not preventively forbid in the case of scraping. One bread can be mistaken for another bread but curring cannot be mistaken for scraping. Mishnah Armadir said one may eat leaven the whole of the five hours and must burn it at the beginning of the sixth. Arjuda said one may eat the whole of the four hours. Keep. It in suspense the whole of the fifth and must burn it at the beginning of the sixth. Arjuda said further two unfit loaves of the thanks offering used to lie on the roof of the temple is to but as long as they lay there all the people would eat leaven when one was removed they would keep it in suspense neither eating nor burning it when both were removed all the people commenced burning their leaven. Argamaliel said Helen may be eaten the whole of the four hours and Terima the whole of the five hours and we burn them at the beginning of the sixth hour tomorrow we learned elsewhere if one witness deposes that it took place on the second day of the month and another deposes on the third of the month their testimony is valid because one knows of the intercalation of the preceding month while the other does not know of the intercalation of the month if one deposed on the third while the other deposed on the fifth their testimony is null if one said during the second Hour and the other said during the third hour their testimony is valid if one said during the third hour and the other said during the fifth their testimony is null this is Armadir's view Arjuda maintained their testimony stands if one deposed during the fifth hour while the other deposed during the seventh their testimony is null because during the fifth hour the sun is in the east whereas in the seventh it is in the west have observed when you examine the matter you find that on Armadir's ruling a man does not err in the time at all while on Arjuda's ruling a man may err in half an hour thus on Armadir's ruling a man does not err at all the event to which they testify happened at the end of the second and the beginning of the third hour and when one says during the second he means at the end of the second hour and when the other says during the third hour he means at the beginning of the third hour on Arjuda's ruling a man may err in half an hour the event Happened in the middle of the fourth hour, and he who says in the third hour meant at the end of the third hour, and years in being half an hour before, while he who testified in the fifth hour meant at the beginning of the fifth hour, and years in half an hour behind. Others say, I may observe when you examine the matter, you find that on Armadir's ruling a man may err in just a little while, on Arjuda's ruling a man may err in slightly more than an hour, on Armadir's ruling a man may err in just a little. The event occurred either at the end of the second or at the beginning of the third hour, and one of them heard a little on Arjuda's ruling a man may err in slightly more than an hour. The event happened either at the end of the third or at the beginning of the fifth Talmud, Mas Pesachim and one of them heard in just over an hour. Arhuna, the son of Arjuda, went and reported this discussion before Rabbah said, He now, what if we carefully examined these witnesses and found that? The one who testified that it took place in the third hour meant at the beginning of the third hour while he who testified that it took place in the fifth meant at the end of the fifth so that it would be a CONFU testimony and we would not execute the accused shall we then arise and execute him through a doubt whereas the merciful one has ordered and the congregation shall judge and the congregation shall deliver rather said Rabbah on our mayor's ruling a man mayor in two hours. Less a trifle while on our Judah's ruling a man mayor in three hours less a trifle on our mayor's ruling a man mayor in two hours less a trifle the incident happened either at the beginning of the second or at the end of the third hour and one of them heard in two hours less a trifle on our Judah's ruling a man mayor in three hours less a trifle the incident occurred either at the beginning of the third or at the end of the fifth hour and one of them heard in three hours less a trifle we Learned they were examined with seven Hakaroth in which Septenate was the crime committed in which year in which month on what day of the month on what day of the week and which hour and in which place and yet further learned what is the difference
which asserts that a man may slightly let us eat until the end of the sixth hour and according to Abay on our Judas view who maintains that a man may in half an hour let us eat leaven until half of the sixth hour and even on the version in which you say a man may in an hour and a trifle let us eat until the end of the fifth hour said Abay testimony is committed to careful men whereas leaven is committed to all now according to Rabbah who maintains that on our Mayor's view Man mayor in two hours less a trifle let us not eat leaven from the beginning of the fifth hour in the fifth hour the sun is in the east while in the seventh the sun is in the west if so let us eat during the sixth hour two said our Adabi Ahab in the sixth the sun stands in the meridian and according to Rabbah who maintains on our Judah's view that a man mayor in three hours less a trifle let us not eat from the beginning of the fourth hour in the fifth hour the sun is in the east while in the seventh it is in the west and all the more so in the fourth if so let us also eat in the fifth hour Abay answered this on Rabbah's view testimony is committed to men of care whereas leaven is committed to all but Rabbah said now this is our Judah's reason but our Judah follows his opinion for he maintains there is no removal of leaven save by burning the rabbis therefore gave him one hour in which to collect fuel Rabbah raised an objection to Rabbah our Judah said when is this before the time of removal, but at the time of removal, it's putting away is with anything rather said Rabbah, it is a preventive measure on account of a cloudy day. If so, let us not eat even during the four hours said our Papa. The fourth hour is the general meal time. Our rabbis taught the first hour of the day is the meal time for gladiators, the second is the meal time for robbers, the third is the meal time for heirs, the fourth is the meal time for laborers, the fifth is the meal time for scholars, the sixth is the general meal time. But our Papa said the fourth hour is the general meal time, rather reverse it. The fourth is the general meal time, the fifth is for laborers, and the sixth is for scholars. After that, it is like throwing a stone into a barrel. Abbe said that was said only if nothing at all is eaten in the morning, but if something was eaten in the morning, we have not against it. Or Ashi said, as there is a controversy in respect of testimony, so is there a controversy in respect of. Leaven, but it is obvious that is precisely what we have said. This is what he informs us. The answers which we gave are correct answers, and you need not say that it is dependent on Tanamar Sami B. Ashi said they learned this only in respect of hours. But if one testified that the crime was committed before sunrise and the others testified after sunrise, their testimony is void. That is obvious. Rather say if one testified that it was during sunrise, their testimony is void. That too is obvious. You might say both testified to the same thing while he who said that it was Talmud, Mas Pesachim, during sunrise was standing in the glow before sunrise, and what he saw was merely the glare. Hence he informs us that it is not so. Our Naman said in Rab's name the Halachah is as our Judah said Rabbah to our Naman. Yet let the Master say that the Halachah is as our Mayor since Atana taught anonymously in agreement with him, for we learned as long as it is permitted to eat leaven, he may. Feed animals with it that is not anonymous because there is a difficulty of it is permitted and let the master say that the Halachah is as Argamaliel since he makes a compromise Argamaliel does not make a compromise but states an independent view alternatively Rab rules as this Tana for it was taught if the 14th falls on the Sabbath everything SC11 must be removed before the Sabbath and to remove whether unclean or in suspense or clean are burnt and of the clean terima. Food for two meals is left over so as to eat until four hours this is the ruling of our Eliezer B. Judah of Bartotha which he stated in our Joshua's name said they to him clean to should not be burnt in case eaters may be found for them he replied they have already sought eaters but not found them they may have spent the night without the city wall said they to him and on your reasoning he retorted even those in suspense should not be burnt lest Elijah come and declare them clean. Said they to him, it has long been assured to Israel that Elijah will come neither on the eve of the Sabbath nor on the eve of festivals on account of the trouble. It was said they did not stir thence until they decided to halachah in accordance with our Eliezer B. Judah of Bartotha, which he stated in our Joshua's name. Does that not mean even in respect of eating? Said our Papa in Rabbah's name, no, only in respect of removing. Now Rabbi too holds this view of our Naman for Rabin, son of our Ad related it. Once happened that a certain man deposited a saddlebag full of leaven with Yohan and of Lukok and mice made holes in it, and the leaven was bursting out. He then went before Rabbi the first hour. He said to him, Wait the second. He said to him, Wait the third. He said to him, Wait the fourth. He said to him, Wait at the fifth. He said to him, Go out and sell it in the market. Does that not mean to Gentiles in accordance with our Judah? Said our Joseph, No to an Israelite in accordance with our Mayor. Said Abedu. Him if to an Israelite let him take it for himself he could not do this because of suspicion for it was taught when the charity overseers have no poor to whom to distribute their funds they must change the copper coins with others not themselves the overseers of the soup kitchen when they have no poor to whom to make a distribution must sell to others not to themselves because it is said and ye shall be guiltless towards the Lord and towards Israel our Adabim Ahenna said to our Joseph you explicitly told us that he said go out and sell it to Gentiles in accordance with our Judah our Joseph said with whom does this ruling of Rabbi agree with our Simeon B. Gamaliel for we learned if a man deposits produce with his neighbor even if it is suffering loss he must not touch it our Simeon B. Gamaliel said he must sell it by order of the court on account of returning lost property said Abay to him yet was it not stated there on Rabbi B. Barhanna said in our Yohanan's name they learned this only. Talmud, Mas Pesachim B. When there is a normal rate of decrease, but when the loss exceeds the normal rate of decrease, all agree that he must sell it by a court order. How much more so here that it is entirely lost? Our Judah said further two unfit loaves, etc. A tanner resided before Rab Judah on the top gap of the temple is to beset he to him. Does he then need to hide them? Learn on the roof of the temple is to a portico with a beset in our Judah's name. The temple mount consisted of a double colonnade. It was taught likewise the temple mount consisted of a double colonnade. Our Judah said it was called Istu being a colonnade within a colonnade unfit, etc. Why unfit? Said Arhanin, since they were many, they became unfit through being kept overnight, for it was taught a thanks offering may not be brought during the feast of unleavened bread on account of the leaven therein, but that is obvious. Said our Adabi Ahab, we treat here of the fourteenth and he the tana hold sacred. Food may not be brought to unfitness, hence everybody brought it on the thirteenth, and since they were numerous, they became unfit through being kept overnight in Arjane's name, and was said they were fit. Yet why are they called unfit? Because the sacrifice had not been slaughtered for them, then let us slaughter it. The sacrifice was lost, then let us bring another sacrifice and slaughter it. It is a case where he, the owner, had declared this animal is a thanks offering, and these are its loaves. This being in accordance with Rabbah for Rabbah said, if the loaves are lost, other loaves may be brought. If the thanks offering is lost, another thanks offering may not be brought. What is the reason the loaves are subsidiary to the thanks offering, but the thanks offering is not subsidiary to the loaves? Then let us redeem and free them as Holland. But in truth, it is a case where the sacrifice was slaughtered for them, but the blood was poured out, and with whom does this agree with Rabbi who? Said the two things which permit promote to sanctity without each other, for it was taught the lambs of Pentecost sanctify the loaves only by Shechetah. So if he kills them for their own purpose and sprinkles their blood for their own purpose, either by sanctifies the loaves if he kills them for a purpose that is not theirs and sprinkles their blood for a purpose that is not theirs, he does not sanctify thereby the loaves if he kills them for their own purpose but sprinkles their blood for a purpose that is not theirs. The bread is sanctified and not sanctified. This is Rabbi's ruling. Our Eliezer B. R. Simeon said the bread always remains unsanctified until he kills the lambs for their own purpose and sprinkles their blood for their own purpose. No, you may even say that it agrees with our Eliezer son of our Simeon, but the case we discuss here is where the blood was caught in a goblet and then spilled while our Eliezer son of our Simeon holds as his father who maintained that which. Stands to be sprinkled is as though it were sprinkled. Atana taught in our Eliezer's name. It was said that the loaves were fit as long as they both lay there. All the people ate leaven when one was removed. They kept the leaven in suspense, neither eating nor burning it. When both were removed, all commenced burning their leaven. It was taught Abbasal said Talmud, Mas Pesachim, two cows used to plow on the Mount of Anointing as long as
so that it is a third degree and he holds that a third may be raised to a second but food cannot defile food for it was taught you might think that food should defile food therefore it is stated but if water be put upon the seat and out of their carcass fall thereon it is unclean it is unclean but it does not render that which is similar thereto unclean now it is well according to Abbe who maintained they learned this only of Holland but in the case of Terima and sacred food they can render what is similar thereto unclean and also according to our Abbe Ahab in Rabba's name who maintained they learned this only of Holland and Terima but in the case of sacred food it does not render its like unclean it is correct but according to Rabba in Rabba's name who said the writ states an unqualified law there is no difference whether it is Holland Terima or sacred food it cannot render its like unclean what is there to be said we treat here of a case where there is liquid together with the flesh so that it is defiled on account of the liquid if so instead of this phrase together with flesh which had been defiled with the principal uncle and he should state together with flesh and liquid etc rather reply granted that food cannot defile food by scriptural law by rabbinical law it can nevertheless defile it or akiba added and said during all the days of the priests they did not refrain from lighting etc consider when oil is rendered unfit through contact with a tibulyam what is it a third degree of defilement and when it is lit in a lamp which was defiled by that which or one who was defiled through a corpse what does it become a second degree thus what he does inform us is that a third degree may be raised to a second and it is the identical teaching said rab judah we treat here of a metal lamp for the divine law said talmud mas pesachim b and whosoever touches one that is slain by the sword which intimates the sword is as it Slain hence it is a principal defilement and here Akiba thus holds that a third may be raised to a first yet what compels Rab Judah to relate it to a metal lamp let him relate it to an earthen lamp and as to the question what does here Akiba add we can reply for whereas there in the first clause it was unclean and is now unclean here it was unfit and is now unclean said Rab our Mishnah presents a difficulty to him why does it particularly state a lamp which had been made unclean by that which was unclean through a corpse let it state which had been defiled by Ishra is now what thing is there whose uncleanness is differentiated between the uncleanness of a corpse and that of Ishra say that is metal Rabba said this proves that our Akiba holds the uncleanness of liquids in respect of defiling others is scriptural for if you should think that it is rabbinical only then consider how does this lamp affect the oil if by rendering that itself unfit surely it is already Unfit whence does this follow perhaps it affected it by enabling it to defile others by rabbinical law if by rabbinical law only why particularly state when it was defiled by a principal uncleanness even if it was defiled by a first or second degree it is still a first for we learned whatever renders terima unfit defile liquids making them a first except a tibulyam hence this must prove that it is scriptural said our mayor from their words we learn etc from whose words shall we say from the words of our hand of the seeking of the priests are they alike there it is unclean and unclean whereas here it is clean and unclean again if from the words of our akiba are they then alike there it is unfit and unclean whereas here it is clean and unclean must we then say that our mayor holds that our mission treats of a principal uncleanness according to scripture and a derivative uncleanness by rabbinical law which by scriptural law is completely clean talmud mas pesachim and what does from their words mean from the words of our hand of the seeking of the priests said Rashi Lakish in Barkapur's name our Mishnah treats of a principal uncleanness according to scripture and a derivative uncleanness according to scripture and what does from their words mean from the words of our Elizer and our Joshua which teaching of our Joshua shall we say the following teaching of our Joshua for we learned in the case of a cask of Terima wherein a doubt of uncleanness is born our Elizer said if it is lying in an exposed place it must be laid in a hidden place and if it was uncovered it must be covered our Joshua said if it is lying in a hidden place one may lay it in an exposed place and if it is covered it may be uncovered how compare there it is mere indirect action whereas here it is defiling with one's own hands rather it is this ruling of our Joshua for we learned if a cask of wine of clean Terima in the upper part is broken while in the lower part there is unclean Hullin our Eliezer and our Joshua agree that if a rebuke thereof can be saved in purity one must save it but if not our Eliezer ruled let it descend and be defiled yet let him not defile it with his own hands our Joshua said he may even defile it with his own hands if so instead of this phrase from their words he should state from his words this is what he means from the controversy of our Eliezer and our Joshua we learn etc this may be proved too because he states further our Eliezer and our Joshua agree etc this proves it and thus said our nominee in Rabbi Abba's name to our mission refers to a principal uncleanness according to scripture and a derivative uncleanness according to scripture and what does from their words mean from the words of our Eliezer and our Joshua Rabba raised an objection to our nominee our Jose said to our mayor the conclusion is not similar to the premise for when our masters testified about what did they testify if about flesh which was defiled through a Derivative uncleanness that we burn it together with flesh which was defiled through a principal uncleanness then this is unclean and that is unclean if about oil which was rendered unfit by a tea bullion that it is lit in a lamp which was defiled by one unclean through the dead one is unfit and the other is unclean so we too admit in the case of terima which was defiled through a derivative uncleanness that we may burn it together with terima which was defiled by a principal uncleanness but how can we burn that which is in suspense together with that which is unclean perhaps Elijah will come and declare it the former clean Talmud mas pesachim bs to pickle nut and unclean sacrificial flesh beth I maintain they must not be burned together while Beth Hillel rule they may be burned together now if you think that our mayor argues from the words of our Joshua why does our Jose answer him from the view of our hand of the seeking of the priest said our nominee to him our Jose did not comprehend his Armeyer's reasoning for he thought that Armeyer was arguing from our hand of the seeking of the priests thereupon he said to him I state this law by deduction from our Joshua but he answered him even on our Joshua's view this is no true analogy for our Eliezer and our Joshua admit that one must burn this separately and that separately yet why is this not a true analogy surely it is a perfect analogy there it is different because there is a loss of Holland to this our Jeremiah demurred surely in our Mishnah too there is a loss of wood said a certain old man to him they cared about a substantial loss but they did not care about a slight loss RC said in our Yohanan's name the controversy is only in respect of the sixth hour but in the seventh all agree that we burn them together our Zara said to RC shall we then say that our Yohanan holds that our Mishnah treats of a principal uncleanness according to scripture and a derivative uncleanness by rabbinical law and that what from their words means is from the words of our hand of the seeking of the priests. Yes, he replied, it was stated likewise. Our Yohan and said our mission refers to a principal uncleanness according to scripture and a derivative uncleanness by rabbinical law. And what does from their words mean from the words of our hand of the seeking of the priests and the controversy is only in respect of the sixth hour, but in the seventh all agree that we burn them together. Shall we say that we can support him? As to pickle nut and unclean sacrificial flesh, Beth I maintain they must not be burned together while Beth Hillel rule they may be burned together. There it is different because they possess uncleanness by rabbinical law. For we learn pickle and nut are defiled the hands. Shall we say that this supports him if a loaf goes moldy and is unfit for human consumption, yet a dog can eat it, it can be defiled with the uncleanness of eatables if the size of an egg and it may be burned together. With an unclean loaf on Passover, no, there it is different because it is merely dust. If so, what does they admit mean? Our Jose says thus to our mayor, even according to our Joshua, who is lenient, he is lenient only in connection with doubtful and unclean terima, but not in the case of clean and unclean. If so, why is it not a true analogy? Surely it is a perfect analogy, said our Jeremiah. Here we treat a flesh which was defiled by a liquid which was defiled through a creeping thing, and our mayor is consistent with his view. While our Jose is consistent with his view, our mayor is consistent with his view, for he maintains the uncleanness of liquids in respect of defiling others is only rabbinical. While our Jose is consistent with his view, for he maintains the uncleanness of liquids in respect of defiling others is scriptural, for it was taught Talmud. Mas passage of doubtful cases of uncleanness with fluids in respect of becoming unclean themselves are unclean in respect of defiling others. They are clean. This is our mayor's view, and thus did our Eliezer to rule as his words. Our Judah said it is unclean in respect of everything. Our Jose and our
Maintained they are clean only insofar that they cannot defile other objects, but nevertheless they are unclean in themselves. He holds that the uncleanness of liquids themselves is scriptural, but in respect of defiling others rabbinical, and when did the rabbis decree in respect of liquids in general, but in respect of the liquids of the slaughterhouse, there was no decree again. When did the rabbis refrain from decreeing concerning the liquids of the slaughterhouse in respect of it? Defiling of other objects, but they possess uncleanness in themselves, are who Nabi Hanan said to his son when you come before our Papa point out a contradiction to him, did then Samuel say they are clean in so far that they cannot defile other objects, but nevertheless they are unclean in themselves. Read here and the flesh that touch it, any unclean thing shall not be eaten, said Arshish the son of Aridi, let it be compared to the fourth degree in the case of sacred food to this Arashi Demurde. Fourth degree in the case of sacred food is not designated unclean, whereas this is designated unclean, this is a difficulty come in here and all drink that may be drunk in any vessel shall be unclean. What does it shall be unclean mean? It makes solid foodstuffs fit to become unclean. You say it makes solids fit this you know from the beginning of the verse, all food which may be eaten that on which water cometh shall be unclean. One refers to detached liquid and the other two. Attached liquid and both are necessary for if we were informed of detached that is because he the owner of the eatables assigned importance to them but as for attached I would say that it is not so and if we were informed of attached that may be because it the liquid stands in its place it has value but as for detached I would say that it is not so thus they are necessary come and here nevertheless a fountain or a pit wherein is a gathering of water shall be clean what does shall be clean mean from his words uncleanness but can detached liquid make eatables fit to become unclean surely our Jose B. R. Hanan has said the liquids of the temple slaughterhouse not enough that they are clean but they cannot even make eatables fit to become unclean interpret this as referring to the blood for our high B. Abin said in our Yohanan's name how do we know that the blood of sacrifices does not make anything fit to become defiled because it is said thou shalt pour it out S. C. The blood upon the earth as water blood which is poured out as water makes fit Talmud, Mos Pesachim be Talmud, Mos Pesachim be blood which is not poured out as water does not make fit to this our Samuel be am I demurred behold the last drained blood which is poured out like water yet it does not make fit said our Zerah to him leave the last drained blood alone which does not make fit even in the case of Holland our Samuel be am I received it the reason from him because the divine law saith only be. Sure that thou eat not the blood for the blood is the life blood wherewith life goes out is called blood blood with which life does not go out is not called blood come and here if blood became unclean and he the priest sprinkled it unwittingly at the sacrifice is accepted if deliberately it is not accepted it was rabbinically unclean this not being in accordance with our Jose B. Joezer of Zir to come and here for what does the head plate propitiate for the blood flesh and the fat which were defiled whether in ignorance or deliberately accidentally or intentionally whether in the case of an individual or of the community it was defiled by rabbinical law only this not being in accordance with Jose B. Joezer of Zir to come and here and Aaron shall bear the iniquity of the holy thing now what iniquity does he bear if the iniquity of pickle surely it is already said it shall not be accepted if the iniquity of Nuthar after the first violent rush the life and vitality pass out with the first blood not with the last surely it is already said neither shall it be imputed unto him that offered it hence he bears not but the iniquity of defilement which is inoperative in opposition to its general rule in the case of a community does that not mean the defilement of the blood set our papa no the defilement of the handfuls come in here if one bear unclean coach flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat shall it be defiled and the priests answered and said no talmud mos pesachim or on rab said the priest heard is this view propounded against any but rab rab learned the liquids of the slaughterhouse but the liquids of the altar can be defiled to turn to the main text rab said the priest heard but samuel maintained the priest did not hear rab said the priest heard he asked them about a fourth degree in respect of holy foodstuffs and they answered him that it was clean but samuel Maintain the priest did not hear he asked them about a fifth degree in respect of holy foodstuffs and they answered him it is clean as for rabbit is well hence for our written bread pottage wine and oil but according to Samuel whence does he know five is it then written and his skirt touch the bread surely it is written and touch with that by his skirt meaning that it touched that which was touched by his skirt come and here then said hey if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these shall it be unclean and the priest answered and said it shall be unclean as for Samuel it is well since they did not hear here they did not hear there either but according to Rab why did they hear here yet did not hear there said our nomin in Rabbi Abba's name they were well versed in the uncleanness of the corpse but not well versed in the uncleanness of Ishra's Rabbin said there it was a fourth degree here it was a third come and here then answered hey and said so is this people and so is this nation before me set the Lord and so is every work of their hands and that which they offer there is unclean as for rabbit is well hence unclean is written but according to Samuel why was it unclean he indeed wondered but it is written and so is every work of their hands said Mars it rather state are ashy because they perverted their actions the writ stigmatizes them as though they offered up sacrifices in uncleanness to turn to the main text rab learned it. Liquids of the slaughterhouse while Levi learned the liquids of the altar now according to Levi it is well if he holds as Samuel who said they are clean only in so far that they cannot defile other objects but nevertheless they are unclean in themselves then it is possible where they all touch the first but if he holds as rab who maintained that they are literally unclean how is it conceivable you are compelled to say that he holds as Samuel and according to Samuel it is well if he Holds as Rab who learned the liquids of the slaughterhouse, but the liquids of the altar can even defile others. Hence, it is only a fourth degree which cannot make a fifth, but a third can make a fourth. But if he holds as Levi who learned the liquids of the altar, why particularly ask about a fourth which cannot make a fifth? They cannot even make a second or a third. You are compelled to say that he holds as Rab. It was taught in accordance with Rab. It was taught in accordance with Levi. It was taught in accordance with Rab. Blood, wine, oil, and water. The liquids of the altar which were defiled within and carried without are clean. If they were defiled without and then brought within, they are unclean. But that is not so for our Joshua. Be Levi said they did not rule that the liquids of the altar are clean, save in their places. That not to exclude the case where they were defiled within and carried without. No, it is to exclude where they were defiled without and then taken within. But he states in their place this is what he states they did not rule that these liquids are clean save when they were defiled in their place. S.C. within it was taught as rab blood and water the liquids of the slaughterhouse which were defiled whether in vessels or in the ground are clean. Talmud, Mos Pesachim B. R. Simeon said in vessels they are unclean in the ground they are clean. Our Papa said even on the view that the uncleanness of liquids is biblical the non-defilement of the liquids. Of the slaughterhouse is a traditional law said Arhuna the son of our Nathan to our Papa then when our Eliezer said liquids have no uncleanness at all the proof is that Jose B. Joezer of Zir to testify that the fluids in the temple slaughterhouse are clean but if it is a traditional law can we learn from this Rabbin is said to our Ashi but surely our Simeon maintained that the uncleanness of liquids is biblical for it was taught our Jose and our Simeon maintained in respect of utensils they are clean in. Respect of eatables, they are unclean. Yet here are Simeon rules in vessels, they are unclean in the ground, they are clean. But if it is a traditional law, what is the difference whether they are in vessels or in the ground? This is a difficulty. Our Papa said as to what you say in the ground, they are clean. This was taught only of water, but not of blood, and even of water too. We said this only when there is a rebuff, so that needles and hooks can be bathed therein. But if less than a rebuff, it is unclean. The master said, Our Judah said it is unclean in respect of everything. Shall we say that our Judah holds that the uncleanness of liquids in respect of defiling utensils is biblical? Surely we learned in the case of all utensils which have an outside and an inside, e.g., cushions, feather beds, sacks, and packing bags. If the inside is defiled, the outside is defiled too. If the outside is defiled, the inside is not defiled. Our Judah said, When is that said where they are defiled by a liquid? But if they are Defiled by Ishra's if the inside is defiled the outside is defiled and if the outside is defiled the inside is defiled now if you think that the uncleanness of liquids in respect of defiling utensils is biblical what is the
With the graver uncleanness yet it can at least defile with the lighter uncleanness what does it is nullified in its bowels mean it is indeed nullified from imposing grave uncleanness but it does defile with light uncleanness hence it follows that the first tana holds that it is unclean even with the graver uncleanness but surely he states its flesh is unclean the whole is arjuna but the text is defective and it was thus taught if a cow drinks the water of lustration its flesh is unclean when is that said in respect of light uncleanness but not in respect of grave uncleanness for arjuna maintained it is nullified in its bowels are as she said in truth it is completely nullified in its bowels because it is now noisome liquid are jose and arsimian maintained in respect of eatables they are unclean in respect of utensils they are clean rabbi barhana said in rush lakish name jose stated this in accordance with the opinion of our Akiba, his teacher who interprets Yidma. It shall be unclean as Yidam, it shall defile, for we learned on that very day our Akiba lectured, and every earthen vessel wherein any of the messy creeping things falleth whatsoever is in it shall be unclean Yidam, it does not stay tame unclean but Yidam, intimating that it defiles Yidam, others thus teaching that a loaf of the second degree produces a third in the case of Hullen, and how does he interpret it here, and all drink that may be drunk in every such vessel Yidam shall be unclean, it shall defile Yidam in respect of defiling eatables, you say in respect of defiling eatables, yet perhaps it is not so, but rather in respect of defiling liquids, you can answer it was not thus, what does it was not thus mean, said our Papa, we do not find that uncleanness renders that which is similar to itself unclean, Robin said from the verse itself to you cannot say it shall defile is in respect of defiling liquids, for if you should think that it shall be unclean of it. Second part of the verse is in respect of defiling liquids, while it shall be unclean of the first part is also in respect of defiling liquids, then let it the Torah combine them and write them together all food therein which may be eaten that on which water cometh and all drink that may be drunk in every such vessel shall be unclean. What is the purpose of shall be unclean twice hence shall be unclean of the first part is in respect of defiling liquids while shall be unclean of it. Second part is in respect of defiling eatables, yet perhaps it is in respect of defiling vessels, does it the reverse not follow a memory of a utensil which defile liquids cannot defile another utensil, then how much the more should liquids which are unclean through a utensil not defile utensils, yet perhaps they do not defile utensils when they are liquids unclean through a utensil, but liquids which are unclean through a do indeed defile utensils are then liquids which are Unclean through Asher is written in scripture Talmud, Mas Pesachim B. Are they not rather inferred a minority of liquids which are unclean through a utensil defile? How much the more liquids which are unclean through Asher is then it is sufficient that that which is deduced by this argument shall be as its premise. How does he interpret shall be unclean of the first part? All food therein which may be eaten that on which water cometh it may shall be unclean it shall defile yet in respect of defiling liquids you say to defile liquids yet perhaps it is not so but rather to defile utensils you can answer it follows a minority of a liquid which defile an eatable cannot defile a utensil then an eatable which cannot defile an eatable surely cannot defile a utensil hence how do I interpret shall be unclean that it defiles liquids which are ready to contract uncleanness why particularly apply it to liquids because they are ready to contract uncleanness deduce it from the fact. That there is nothing else left, this is what he means, and should you argue an eatable is more stringent than liquid since it defiles liquids and therefore let it defile utensils too. Hence, we are told that that is a greater stringency of liquids because liquids are ready to contract uncleanness, and what is their readiness because they contract uncleanness without being made fit, it shall be unclean, teaching that it cannot render something similar to itself unclean, but is it deduced from here? Surely it is deduced from elsewhere, is but if water be put upon the seat and out of their carcass fall thereon, it is unclean unto you, it is unclean, but it cannot create a similar uncleanness. One treats of liquids unclean through assurance, and the other treats of liquids unclean through a utensil, and both are necessary, for if we were informed this of liquid which is unclean through a utensil, I would say that is because it is not stringent, but in the case of liquid. Unclean through Asherahs which is stringent I might argue that it creates uncleanness similar to its own then let us be told this about liquid defiled by Asherahs and how much the more liquid unclean through a utensil that which may be inferred a minori scripture takes the trouble of writing it explicitly Rabbanah said to our Ashi but Rabbanah said our Jose does not agree with our Akiba nor does our Akiba agree with our Jose said he to him our Jose stated it in accordance with the opinion of our Akiba his teacher but he himself does not hold thus our Ashi said to our Kahana as for our Jose not agreeing with our Akiba that is well for it was taught our Jose said how do we know that a fourth degree in the case of sacred food is unfit now this follows a minori of he who lacks atonement though permitted to partake of teramah is unfit in respect of sacred food and a third which is unfit in the case of teramah is it not logical that it makes a fourth in sacred food and we learn a third in the case of sacred Food from scripture and a fourth of an orator from scripture for it is written and the flesh that touch it any unclean thing Talmud, Mas Pesachim shall not be eaten do we not treat even of a case where it touched a second while a fourth is learned a minority as we have stated now if you should think that he holds as our Akiba let him also state a fourth in the case of Teramah and a fifth in the case of sacred food but how do we know that our Akiba does not agree with our Jose said he to him. Because Atana could not completely refrain from teaching that there is a fourth in the case of Teramah and a fifth in the case of sacred food and we would say that it agrees with our Akiba and shall we arise and rely upon this thereupon our Ashi others say our Kahana went out searched and found the following which we learned the utensil unites its contents in the case of sacred food but not in the case of Teramah and a fourth degree is unfit in the case of sacred food but not in the case of Terima were on our high B. Abba said in our Yohanan's name this Mishnah was learned as a result of our Akiba's testimony for we learned our Akiba added the fine meal incense frankincense and the burning coals that if a tea bullion touches part thereof he renders all unfit thus there is a fourth in sacred food but not a fifth the third in the case of Terima but not a fourth this proves that he holds that the power of uniting is rabbinical now he differs from our Hanin who maintained the power of uniting is biblical for it is said one golden pan of ten shekels full of incense the writ rendered everything in the pan one we learned elsewhere he testified concerning an unclean needle which is found in the flesh of a sacrifice that the knife and the hands are clean while the flesh is unclean if found in the excrements it is all clean our Akiba said we have been favored in that there is no uncleanness of the hands in the temple Talmud Mas Pesachim B accepts our Jose's argument surely. Then in the whole of the Talmud this view would have found expression somewhere then let him say there is no uncleanness of the hands or of utensils in the temple said Rab Judah in Rab's name others state our Jose son of Arhanah hands were taught before the enactment concerning utensils Rab asked surely both were enacted on that self same day for we learned the following render terima unfit a book the hands of Tebal Yom and eatables or utensils which were defiled by a liquid no said Rab leave the uncleanness of the knife for even in the case of Holland it would not be unclean for what did this knife touch that it should be unclean shall we say that it touched the flesh surely food cannot defile utensils and if it touched the needle surely one utensil cannot defile another utensil what is the condition of this needle shall we say that it is a doubtful needle surely it was stated our Eliezer and our Jose son of Arhanah one said they did not decree uncleanness for doubtful Saliva in Jerusalem while the other said they did not decree uncleanness for doubtful utensils in Jerusalem said Rab Judah in Rab's name e.g. if one lost a needle unclean through a person defiled by the dead and he recognized it in temple and this is all to the good as sacrifices are thereby saved from defilement the flesh our Jose son of Arab and said e.g. if the cow was muzzled and came from without Jerusalem the above text states our Eliezer and our Jose son of Arhanah one said they did not decree uncleanness for doubtful saliva in Jerusalem while the other said they did not decree uncleanness for doubtful utensils in Jerusalem but we have learned about saliva and we have learned about utensils we have learned about saliva for we learned all saliva found in Jerusalem is clean save that of the upper market it is necessary only to state that this is so even though Zab was known to have passed there we have learned about utensils for we learned all utensils which are found in Jerusalem on the way of the descent to the ritual bathhouse are unclean hence
Shall we say that it was made fit by the blood? Surely our high B Abba said in our Yohanan's name, How do we know that the blood of sacrifices does not make anything fit to be defiled? Because it is said, Thou shalt pour it out as see the blood upon the earth as water. Blood which is poured out as water renders fit. Blood which is not poured out as water does not render fit again if it was made fit by the liquids of the slaughterhouse. Surely our Jose B. Our Hannah said the liquids of the temple. Slaughterhouse not enough that they are clean, but they cannot even make eatables fit again if it was made fit through the prizing of sacred objects. Say that the prizing of sacred objects is efficacious in rendering that itself unfit. Is it also sufficient that first and second degree should be counted therein? In that case, you may solve what Rush Lakish asked the dry portion of meal offerings. Do we count first and second degrees therein or not? Said Rab Judah in Samuel's name, Egypt was an animal for a peace offering and it was led through a river and then slaughtered and the water is still dripping upon it if found in the excrements it is all clean but let the excrements defile the flesh in their turn said our Adabi Ahab it refers to thick solid excrements our Ashi said you may even say that it refers to loose fluid like excrements it's non-defilement being because it is a noisome liquid a tanner recited before our she's hate Asher is defile liquids and the liquids defile a utensil and the utensil defile eatables and the eatables defile liquids and thus we learn three stages of uncleanness in the case of Asherahs but there are four delete liquids in the first clause on the contrary delete liquids in the last clause we find no other tanner who maintains that liquids defile utensil save our Judah and he retracted and your sign for remembering the order is the brewing process we learned elsewhere if a creeping thing is found in an oven the bread therein is a Second, because the oven is a first, our Adabi Ahab said to Rabba, let us regard this oven as though it were fine with uncleanness and let the bread be a first, said he to him, you cannot think so, for it was taught you might think that all utensils become unclean through the airspace of an unclean earthen vessel Talmud, Mos Pesachim be therefore it is stated whatsoever is it, it shall be unclean and in proximity thereto all food therein which may be eaten food becomes unclean through the air. Space of an unclean earthen vessel, but no utensils become unclean through the air. Space of an unclean earthen vessel. Our Hisdah opposed two teachings of Passover and reconciled them. Did our Joshua say both of them may be burned together? But the following contradicts it. Our Jose said to our Mayor, the conclusion is not similar to the premise for what our masters testified concerning. What did they testify of concerning flesh which was defiled through a derivative of uncleanness that we burn it? Together with flesh which was defiled through a father of uncleanness, then this is unclean and that is unclean. If concerning oil which was rendered unfit by a tea that it is lit in a lamp which was defiled by one unclean through a corpse, one is unfit and the other is unclean. So too do we admit in the case of Terima which was defiled through a derivative of uncleanness that we may burn it together with Terima which was defiled through a father of uncleanness. But how can we burn even that? Which is doubtful together with that which is unclean, perhaps Elijah will come and declare it clean. And he answered, One agrees with our Simeon and in accordance with our Joshua, while the other agrees with our Jose and in accordance with our Joshua, for it was taught if the fourteenth falls on the Sabbath, everything SC eleven must be removed before the Sabbath and room with unclean, doubtful and clean are burnt together. This is our Mayor's view. Our Jose said the clean terima must be burnt separately. The actually touches it, it defiles, hence one should regard the Shuras as though completely filling it doubtful terima separately and the unclean separately, said our Simeon, our Elijah, and our Joshua did not differ concerning clean and unclean that they must not be burnt together, and concerning doubtful terima and clean terima that they may be burnt together, concerning what did they differ concerning doubtful terima and unclean terima, our Elijah maintaining this must be burnt separately. And this separately while our Joshua ruled both of them may be burnt together but our Mishnah is according to our Jose our Jose says thus to our Mayor even our Simeon who in stating our Joshua's opinion is lenient is lenient only in respect of doubtful terima and unclean terima but not in the case of clean and unclean our Jose son of our Hanan opposed terima to pass over and reconciled them to then our Joshua say both together but the following contradicts it a cask of terima wherein a doubt of uncleanness is born our Elizer said if lying in an exposed place it must be laid in a hidden place and if it was uncovered it must be covered our Joshua said if it is lying in a hidden place one may lay it in an exposed place and if it is covered it may be uncovered thus only an indirect action is permitted but not defiling with one's own hands and he answered one agrees with our Simeon and according to our Joshua's view while the other agrees with our Jose and according to our Joshua's view are Eliezer opposed two teachings of Terima and reconciled them. Did our Joshua say only an indirect action is permitted but not with one's own hands? But the following contradicts it if a cask of wine of clean Terima is broken in the upper bed while in the lower there is unclean Holland. Our Eliezer and our Joshua agree that if a rebuke thereof can be saved in purity one must save it. But if not, our Eliezer ruled let it descend and be defiled. Yet let him not defile it with his own hands. Our Joshua said he may even defile it with his own hands. And he answered, Ed, there it is different because there is a loss of Holland to this robber demurred in our Mishnah too. There is a loss of wood said Abbe to him. They cared about a substantial loss but not about a slight loss. And whence do you know that they cared about a substantial loss but not about a slight one? Because it was taught if a cask of oil of clean Terima was broken in the upper bed while in the lower is unclean Holland. Our Eliezer. Concedes to our Joshua that if a rebuke thereof can be saved in purity one must save it but if not let it descend and be defiled yet let him not defile it with his own hands why is oil different because it is fit for lighting then wine too is fit for sprinkling and should you answer sprinkling is of no account surely Samuel said in our highest name you drink wine at a cellar per lock whereas you sprinkle with wine at two cellars per lock it refers to new wine but it is fit for aging one. Will come to a stumbling block through it then oil too one will come to a stumbling block through it he pours it into a dirty vessel wine too can be poured into a dirty vessel seeing that it is required for sprinkling will he pour it into a dirty vessel now a stumbling block itself is dependent on tanaim for it was taught a cask of wine of terima which was defiled Beth Shammai maintained it must be poured out all at once while Beth Hillel rule it may be used for sprinkling our Ishmael son of our. Jose said I will make a compromise if it is in the field it must be poured out all at once in the house it can be used for sprinkling other state in the case of new wine it must be poured out all at once in the case of old it can be used for sprinkling said they to him Talmud, Mos Pesachim of the compromise of a third view is not a compromise our Jose son of our Hannah said the controversy is where it falls into less than 100 seahs of unclean Holland but if it falls into 100 seahs unclean Holland all agree that it must descend and be defiled and he must not defile it with his own hands it was taught likewise if a cask of clean terima was broken in the upper vat and beneath it there is 100 times as much unclean Holland our Eliezer concedes to our Joshua that if he can save a rebuke thereof in purity he must save it but if not let it descend and be defiled but he must not defile it with his own hands but instead of this phrase our Eliezer concedes to our Joshua, our Joshua concedes to our Eliezer is required, said Robert, reverse it, Arhuna, the son of our Joshua said, after all you need not reverse it, what case do we discuss here that of a vessel the inside is clean while its outside is unclean, you might say let us enact a preventive measure lest its outside touch the terima, therefore he informs us otherwise, C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I, I mission the whole time that one is permitted to eat leaven, one may feed it to cattle, beasts and birds, and he may sell it to a Gentile, and benefit thereof is permitted when its period has passed, benefit thereof is forbidden, and he may not fire an oven or a pot range with it, our Judah said there is no removal of leaven saved by burning, but the sages maintain he also crumbles and throws it to the wind or casts it into the sea, Gamar, the whole time that one is permitted to eat leaven, one may feed, etc., hence the whole time that one is not permitted to eat it, he may not feed cattle, etc., there which shall we say that are Mishnah is not according to our Judah for if our Judah surely there is a fifth hour when he may not eat yet he may feed for we learned our Mayor said one may eat leaven the whole of the five hours and must burn it at the beginning of the sixth our Judah said one may eat the whole of the four hours keep it in suspense the whole of the fifth and must burn it at the beginning of the sixth
Judah B. Bathurah said Qutah and all kinds of Qutah may not be sold 30 days before Passover and benefit thereof is permitted that is obvious it is necessary to teach it only where he charted in the fire before its time and he the Tana informs us that the law is as Rabbah for Rabbah said if he charted in the fire before its time benefit thereof is permitted even after its time when its period has passed benefit thereof is forbidden that is obvious it is necessary to state. This only in respect of the hours when leaven is interdicted by rabbinical law for Argidal said in the name of our high B. Joseph in our Yohanan's name he who betrothed from the sixth hour and onwards even with wheat of Cordina we have no fear of his betrothal and he may not fire an oven or a pot range with IT that is obvious this is necessary only according to our Judah who maintained there is no removal of leaven save by burning you might argue since our Judah said its precept demands burning. Then while he is burning it let him benefit from it hence we are informed that it is not so Hezekiah said how do we know that leaven during Passover is forbidden for general use because it is said there shall no leaven bread be eaten meaning there shall not be in it permission i.e. the right of eating us the reason is because the divine law wrote there shall no leaven bread be eaten but if shall not be eaten were not written I would say prohibition of eating is implied but Prohibition of benefit is not implied now he differs from our Arabab for our Arabab said wherever it is said it shall not be eaten that shall not eat ye shall not eat the prohibitions of both eating and benefit in general are understood unless the writ expressly states otherwise as it does in the case of Nibla for it was taught ye shall not eat of Nibla anything that dieth of itself thou mayest give it unto the stranger ger that is within thy gates that he may eat it or thou mayest sell it unto a foreigner know only that it may be given to a stranger or sold to a foreigner even how do I know that selling to a stranger ger is permitted therefore it is stated thou mayest give it unto the stranger ger that is within thy gates or sell how do we know that giving to a foreigner is permitted because it is stated thou mayest give it that he may eat it or thou mayest sell it unto a foreigner thus the result is that to a stranger ger and a foreigner even alike. Both selling and giving are permitted. This is our Meir's view. Our Judah said the words are as they are written. This to a ger it must be given, and to a heathen it must be sold. What is our Judah's reason? If you should think as our Meir says, let the divine law write, thou mayest give it unto the stranger ger that is within thy gates, that he may eat it, and thou mayest sell it. Why state or infer from this that the words are as they are written, and our Meir or is to show that giving to a ger takes precedence over selling to a heathen, and our Judah no verse is required for this, since you are commanded to maintain a ger, but you are not commanded to maintain a heathen. The verse is not required for it stands to reason on the view of our Meir who maintained to a ger and a heathen alike. Both selling and giving are permitted as well, since a verse is required to permit benefit from a nibble. It follows that all other things forbidden in the Torah are forbidden in respect of both eating and General benefit, but according to our Judah who maintained it comes from the purpose of teaching that the words are as they are written. Once does he know that all other things forbidden in the Torah are forbidden in respect of benefit? He deduces it from Ye shall not eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field, ye shall cast it to the dogs. Talmud, Mos Pesachim, it you may cast to dogs, but you may not cast to dogs. All other things forbidden in the Torah and our Meir he interprets. It you may cast to dogs, but you may not cast to dogs. Hulling killed in the temple court, and the other benefit from Hulling killed in the temple court is not forbidden by scriptural law or Isaac of Napa objected, but what of the nervous ischiaticus though the divine law saith therefore the children of Israel eat not the sinew of the thigh, and yet we learned a man may send the thigh of an animal to a heathen with the nervous ischiaticus in it because its place is distinguishable are about. Holds when Nibla was permitted by the Torah, it is forbidden fat and its thigh sinew were permitted. This is well on the view that the sinews possess the power of imparting a taste, but on the view that the sinews possess no power of imparting a taste, what can be said? Whom do you know to maintain that the sinews have no power to communicate taste? Our Simeon, for it was taught he who eats of the thigh sinew of an unclean animal, our Judah declares him liable on two accounts while our Simeon holds him non culpable according to our Simeon. It is indeed forbidden for use too, for it was taught the thigh sinew is permitted for use. This is our Judah's view, but our Simeon forbids it. But what a blood of which the divine law saith no soul of you shall eat blood, yet we learned both these and those mingled in the duct and passed out to the brook of Kidron, and they were sold to gardeners as fertilizers, and trespass is committed in respect of them. Blood is different because it is likened to water. For it is written, Thou shalt not eat it, thou shalt pour it out upon the earth as water, just as water is permitted, so is blood permitted. Yet say, like water poured out as libations upon the altar, said Aravau as water means like most water is then most water written, rather said Arashi as water which is poured out, but not as water offered as a libation. Yet say, like water which is poured out in idol worship, there too it is designated a libation as it is written, they drink the wine of their drink offering libation. Talmud, Mos Pesachim be now according to Hezekiah in respect of what law is blood likened to water for the law of Arhai B. Abba in Ar Yohanan's name, for Arhai B. Abba said in Ar Yohanan's name, How do we know that the blood of sacrifices does not make anything fit to be defiled? Because it is said, Thou shalt pour it out upon the earth as water, blood which is poured out as water renders fit, blood which is not poured out as water does not render fit, but what of it? Limb of a living animal, though it is written, Thou shalt not eat the life with the flesh, yet it was taught. Our Nathan said, How do we know that a man must not hold out a cup of wine to a Nazi right or the limb of a living animal to the children of Noah? Because it is stated, Thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the blind. This implies that giving to dogs is permitted. The limb of a living animal is different because it is assimilated to blood, as it is written, Only be steadfast in not eating it. Blood for the blood is alike. Then, according to Hezekiah, in respect of what law is the limb from a living animal assimilated to blood, he can answer you, It is blood which is assimilated to the limb from a living animal, just as a limb from a living animal is forbidden, so is the blood from a living animal forbidden, and which blood is that the blood of arteries with which life goes out? But what of the ox that is stoned, though the divine law saith its flesh shall not be eaten, yet it was taught. From the implication of the verse, the ox shall be surely stoned. Do I not know that it is nibble and nibble is forbidden as food? Why then is it stated and its flesh shall not be eaten? The writ informs us that if it was ritually slaughtered after its trial was ended, it is forbidden. I only know this in respect of eating. How do we know it in respect of benefit from the verse? But the owner of the ox shall be clear. How is this implied? Simeon Bezoma said, as a man may say to his friend, so and so has gone out clear from his property and has no benefit whatsoever from it. Thus the reason is that but the owner of the ox shall be clear is written. For if we deduce from it shall not be eaten alone, that would imply a prohibition of eating, but not a prohibition of benefit. In truth, it shall not be eaten implies a prohibition of eating and a prohibition of benefit. And as to but the owner of the ox shall be clear that is stated in respect of the use of its skin, and it is necessary you would. Think that I might argue his flesh shall not be eaten is written thus only his flesh is forbidden but not his skin therefore we are informed otherwise but according to those tanaim who employ this verse for a different exegesis is for half ransom and damages for children how do they know that the use of the hide is forbidden they infer it from ethbizro his flesh meaning that which is joined to its flesh and the other he does not interpretate as it was taught simeon imzoni others state nehemiah imzoni interpreted every eth in the torah but as soon as he came to thou shalt fear at the lord thy god he desisted said his disciples to him master what is to happen with all the eth in which you have interpreted just as i received reward for interpreting them he replied so will i receive reward for retracting subsequently our akiva came and taught thou shalt fear at the lord thy god is to include scholars but there is orlo the merciful one set three years Shall it be forbidden unto you? It shall not be eaten. Yet it was taught. It shall be as forbidden unto you. It shall not be eaten. Thus I only know the prohibition of eating. Once do we know that a man may not benefit from it, that he may not die or light a lamp with it from the verse? Then ye shall count the fruit thereof as forbidden. Three years shall they be as forbidden unto you. It shall not be eaten, which is to include all of them. Thus the reason is that Scripture wrote, Then ye shall count the fruit thereof as forbidden. They shall be as forbidden.
Head grow long as hair growth is holy but nothing else is holy as then and nothing else written but it is clearly as Mars Itra stated but what of Hadish where the merciful one set and ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor fresh ears until the self same day yet we learned he may cut the corn for fodder and feed his cattle said Arshimei there it is different because scripture saith ye shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest implying it shall be yours and the other your harvest implies that of all Israel but what of creeping things where the merciful one saith it is a detestable thing it shall not be eaten yet we learned hunters of beasts birds and fish who chance upon unclean species are permitted to sell them to Gentiles there it is different because scripture saith they are a detestable thing unto you it shall be yours if so it should be permitted at the very outset too here it is different because scripture saith and they shall be a Detestable thing meaning they shall be in their forbidden state now according to Hezekiah for what purposes shall not be eaten written so that unto you is it is to teach that it is permitted let the merciful one not write shall not be eaten so that unto you will be unnecessary Hezekiah can answer you my opinion is indeed deduced from this but what of leaven though the merciful one saith there shall no leaven bread be eaten yet it was taught our Jose the Galilean said wonder at yourself how can leaven be prohibited for general use the whole seven days there it is different because scripture saith neither shall there be leaven seen unto thee this implies it shall be thine and the rabbis thine own thou must not see but thou mayest see that belonging to others and to the most high and the other unto thee is written twice and the other one refers to a heathen whom you have conquered and the other refers to a heathen whom you have not conquered and the other unto he is written three times and the other one refers to leaven se or and one refers to leaven bread hey, may, and they are both necessary shall we say that it is dependent on tanaim and the fat of that which dieth of itself and the fat of that which is torn of beasts may be used for all service but ye shall in no wise eat of it why is for all service stated for i might think for the service of the most high let it be permitted but for secular service let it be forbidden therefore it is stated for all service this is a view of our jose the galilean our akiva said for i might think for secular service let it be clean but for service of the most high let it be unclean therefore it is stated for all service now our jose the galilean holds that in respect of uncleanness and cleanness a verse is not required a verse being required only in respect of what is forbidden and what is permitted while our akiva maintains in respect of what is forbidden and what is permitted no verse is required a verse being required only in respect of uncleanness and cleanness Talmud, Mos Pesachim be surely then they differ in this viz our Jose the Galilean holds ye shall not eat connotes both a prohibition of eating and a prohibition of benefit and when the verse comes to permit nibble it comes in respect of benefit while our Akiva holds it connotes a prohibition of eating but does not connote a prohibition of benefit and for what purpose does the verse come in respect of uncleanness and cleanness know all hold that ye shall not eat connotes both a prohibition of eating and a prohibition of benefit but here they differ in this our Jose the Galilean holds when nibble was permitted alone was permitted whereas its fat and its sinew were not permitted and therefore for what purpose is the verse required it is in respect of permission for use but our Akiva holds when nibble was permitted its fat and its sinew too were permitted hence for what purpose is it Verse necessary it is in respect of uncleanness and cleanness now as to our Jose the Galilean we have found that the divine law permits Heleb for use but as for the sin you let us say that it is forbidden if you wish I can say that it is in fact forbidden alternatively it is a distant memory of Heleb for which there is a penalty of Kareth is permitted for use how much the more the sin you for which there is no penalty of Kareth but our Simeon who forbids it or this can be refuted as for Heleb. That is because it is freed from its general prohibition in the case of a beast will you say the same of the sin you which was not freed from its general prohibition in the case of a beast and the other we are speaking of cattle behema and in the case of cattle at all events at SC Heleb was not permitted consider we have raised objections from all these verses and answered them then wherein do Hezekiah and Arabah differ in respect of love and during Passover on the view of it. Rabbis and in respect of the ox that is stoned and this on the view of all Hezekiah deduces it from shall not be eaten while Arabah learns it from Nebula consider according to both masters they are forbidden for use and wherein do they practically differ they differ in respect of Hullen which was slaughtered in the temple court Hezekiah holds shall not be eaten is to exclude these while it is to exclude Hullen which was slaughtered in the temple court Arabah holds it is to exclude these while Hullen which was slaughtered in the temple court is not forbidden for use by scriptural law one of the scholars sat before our Samuel be Namani and he sat and said in our Joshua be Levi's name how do we know of all prohibitions in the Torah that just as they are forbidden for food so are they also forbidden for use and which are the eleven Hamei during Passover and the ox that is stoned you ask how do we know learn it from it shall not be eaten to him it shall not be eaten implies a prohibition of eating but it does not imply a prohibition of benefit then let him deduce it from Nibla he agrees with Arjuda who maintain the words are as they are written if he agrees with Arjuda let him deduce it once Arjuda deduces it is from ye shall cast it to the dogs underscore he holds that Hullen which was slaughtered in the temple court is forbidden for use by scriptural law once then do we know it from the verse and no sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten it shall be burnt with fire now it shall be burnt with fire need not be stated then what is the purpose of it shall be burnt with fire if it is unnecessary in its own connection seeing that it is written and behold it was burnt apply its teaching to all other prohibitions of the Torah Talmud Mos Pesachim and if it is irrelevant in respect of eating apply the matter to the prohibition of benefit if so just as there it must be destroyed by burning so all prohibited things of the Torah must be destroyed by burning underscore scripture saith in the holy place it shall be burnt with fire that which is forbidden in the holy place requires burning but all the other forbidden things of the Torah do not require burning but does this phrase in the holy place it shall be burnt with fire come for this teaching surely it is required for our Simeon stick for it was taught our Simeon said in the holy place it shall be burnt with fire this teaches concerning the sin offering that we burn it in the holy place now I only know this alone how do we know it of the unfit of the other most sacred sacrifices and the immurium of the lesser sacrifices thereof it is stated in the holy place it shall be burnt with fire said he to him or Jonathan thy teacher deduced it from this verse and if out of the flesh of the consecration or of the bread remain unto the morning then thou shalt burn it Remainder with fire it shall not be eaten because it is holy now it shall not be eaten need not be stated then why is it shall not be eaten stated if it is irrelevant in respect of itself seeing that it is written then thou shalt burn the remainder with fire apply its teaching to the other interdicts of the Torah and if it is irrelevant in respect of eating apply its teaching to the prohibition of benefit if so just as here it must be destroyed by burning so all the forbidden things of it. Torah must be destroyed by burning scripture saith then thou shalt burn the nathar remainder nathar requires burning but all other forbidden things of the Torah do not require burning yet does this verse it shall not be eaten come for this teaching surely it is required for our Eliezer's dictum for our Eliezer said it shall not be eaten because it is holy whatever of holy flesh etc that is unfit the rib comes to impose a negative injunction against eating it underscore said Abay after all. It is deduced from the first verse but reverse the argument for let scripture write it shall be burnt with fire so that it shall not be eaten will be superfluous why then is it shall not be eaten written if it is irrelevant for itself seeing that it is deduced by our Eliezer's exegesis apply its teaching to all other interdicts of the Torah and if it is irrelevant in respect of eating apply its teaching to the prohibition of benefit if so just as here it must be destroyed by burning so. All the forbidden things of the Torah must be destroyed by burning scripture set the Nathar remainder Nathar requires burning but all other forbidden things of the Torah do not require burning our Papa said to have a yet say that it comes to assign a negative injunction specifically for itself for if we learn from our Eliezer estic and we do not flagellate for an implied negative injunction rather said our Papa it is deduced from this and the flesh that touch it any unclean thing. Shall not be eaten, it shall be burnt with fire. Now shall not be eaten, need not be stated why then it shall not be eaten. Stated if it is irrelevant for itself, seeing that it may be deduced a menorah from tithe which is lighter, thus if tithe which is light, yet the Torah said, Neither have
Interpret and not apply it to additional injunctions. Now, what is the purpose of and the flesh that touch it? Any unclean thing shall not be eaten of the commencement of the verse. It is to include wood and frankincense. What is the purpose of and as for the flesh? Everyone that is clean shall eat thereof of the end of the verse. It is to include Emirim, but Emirim are learned from elsewhere, for it was taught by the soul that eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord having his uncleanness upon him. This is to include the Emirim there. The reference is to the uncleanness of the person which is punishable with Karath, whereas here we treat of the uncleanness of the flesh which is subject to a negative injunction. Our Abba said in our Yohanan's name with regard to all the prohibited articles of the Torah, we do not flagellate on their account save when they are eaten in the normal manner of their consumption. What does this? Exclude underscore said Arshai Mabi Ashi it is to exclude this viz that if he ate raw hell up, he is exempt from punishment others say Arabab said in Aryohanan's name with regard to all the prohibited articles of the Torah we do not flagellate on their account save when they are used in the normal manner of their usage what does this exclude said Arshai Mabi Ashi it is to exclude this viz if he applied the hell up of the ox which is stoned upon his wound he is exempt and all the more so if he eats raw meat he is exempt it was stated likewise Arahab Arawiya said in Arasi's name in Aryohanan's name if he applies the hell up of the ox which is stoned upon his verse does not bear upon its own subject at all why specify the flesh scripture could say and that which touch it etc wound he is exempt because in the case of all the interdicts of the Torah we do not flagellate on their account save when they are used in the normal manner of their usage Arzara said we too learn thus one does not Receive forty lashes on account of Orla save for that which issues from olives or from grapes alone but for that which issues from mulberries fix and pomegranates there is as implied no flagellation what is the reason is it not because he does not eat them in the normal manner of their usage said Abbe to him that were well if he informed us of the fruit itself where he did not eat it in the normal manner of its usage but here the reason is because it is mere moisture Abbe said all agree in respect of Kilayim of the vineyard that we flagellate on its account even when one does not enjoy it in the normal manner of its usage what is the reason because eating is not written in connection there with an objection is raised Isi Judah said how do we know that meat and milk seated together are forbidden it is stated here for thou art a holy people thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk and it is stated elsewhere and ye shall be holy men unto me therefore yet Shall not eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field, ye shall cast it to the dogs, just as there it is forbidden, so here too it is forbidden again. I know it only of eating, how do I know it of general use? I will tell you it follows a menorah if Orla, though no sin was committed therewith is forbidden for use, and meat and milk seated together wherewith a sin was committed, is it not logical that they are forbidden for use? Talmud, Mos Pesachimay, this can be refuted as for Orla. That may be because it had no period of fitness, will you say the same of meat and milk seated together, seeing that they had a period of fitness, then let leaven during Passover prove it, though it had a period of fitness, it is forbidden for use, this again can be refuted as for leaven during Passover, that may be because he the offender is punished with Karath, will you say the same of meat seated in milk where he is not punished with Karath, then let Kilim of the vineyard prove. It though he the offender is not punished with Karath yet it is forbidden for use now if this is so let us refute it thus as for Kilim of the vineyard that may be because we flagellate on its account even when he does not use it in the normal manner of its usage and Abbe he can answer will you say with what will you say the same of meat seated in milk for which we do not flagellate save when it is eaten in the normal manner of its uses and eating written in connection with meat seated in milk and the other who raises the objection holds for that purpose it is deduced from Nibla just as Nibla must be enjoyed in the normal manner of its usage so must meat seated in milk in the normal manner of its usage and Abbe he argues for that reason eating is not written in its own case to teach that we flagellate on its account even when one does not enjoy it in the normal manner of its usage but let us refute it thus as for Kilim. That may be because it had no period of fitness at our Abba but this proves that in Kilayim of the vineyard their very stock is forbidden and so we cannot refute it thus since it had a time of fitness before taking root our Shimei objected if one sets a perforated pot in a vineyard if one two hundred part is added it is all forbidden thus only if there is added but not if there is not added said Rabba two verses are written the fullness is written and the seed is written how is this to be reconciled that which is sown from the very outset becomes forbidden on taking root that which was sown when partly grown if it increased it is forbidden if it did not increase it is not forbidden our Jacob said in our Yohanan's name we make your ourselves with all things save with the wood of the Asherah how is it meant if we say that there is danger even the wood of the Asherah too is permitted while if there is no danger even all other forbidden things of the Torah too are not permitted after all it means that there is danger yet even so the wood of the Asherah must not be used for it was taught our Eliezer said if with all thy soul is said why is with all thy might said or if with all thy might is said why is with all thy soul said but it is to teach you if there is a man to whom his person is dearer than his wealth therefore with all thy soul is stated and if there is a man to whom his wealth is dearer than his person therefore with all thy might I.e. substance is stated when Rabin came he said in our Yohanan's name we make your I.e. save ourselves with all forbidden things except idolatry incest Talmud Mos Pesachim be and murder idolatry as we have stated incest and murder as it was taught Rabbi said for as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him even so is this matter now what connection has a murderer with a betrothed maiden thus this comes to throw light and is itself illumined the murderer is compared to a betrothed Maiden just as a betrothed maiden must be saved from this Yanur at the cost of his or ravisher's life so in the case of a murderer he the victim must be saved at the cost of his the attacker's life conversely a betrothed maiden is learned from a murderer just as in the case of murder one must be slain rather than transgress so a betrothed maiden must be slain yet not transgress and how do we know it of murder itself it is common sense even as one who came before Rabbah and said to him the governor of my town has ordered me go and kill so and so if not I will kill you he answered him let him kill you rather than that you should commit murder what reason do you see for thinking that your blood is redder perhaps his blood is redder Marsan of Arashi found Rabbah rubbing his daughter with undeveloped olives of Orla said he to him granted that the rabbis ruled thus in time of danger was it likewise ruled when there is no danger this inflammatory fever is also like a Time of danger he answered him, others say he answered him, am I then using it in the normal manner of its usage and was stated as to forbidden benefit that comes to a man against his will, Abbe said it is permitted while Rabba maintained it is forbidden where it is possible to avoid it while he intends to benefit or if it is impossible to avoid it yet he intends to benefit none dispute that it is forbidden if it is impossible to avoid it and he does not intend to benefit none. Dispute that it is permitted they differ where it is possible to avoid it and he does not intend to benefit now on the view of our Judah who ruled that which is unintended is forbidden none dispute that it is forbidden where do they differ on the view of our Simeon who maintained that which is unintended is permitted Abbe rules as our Simeon but Rabba argues our Simeon rules thus only where it is impossible to do otherwise but not where it is possible others state if it is possible to avoid it. And he does not intend to benefit that is the case of the controversy between Arjuna and Arsimian if it is impossible to avoid it and he does not intend to benefit none dispute that it is permitted when do they differ where it is impossible to avoid it and he intends to benefit now on the view of Arsimian who regards the intention none dispute that it is forbidden where do they differ on the view of Arjuna who maintained it makes no difference whether he intends or does not intend. If it is possible to avoid it it is forbidden Abbe rules as Arjuna Talmud, Mos Pesachim Rabba says thus Arjuna rules that the unintentional is the same as the intentional only in the direction of stringency but he did not rule that the intentional is the same as the unintentional where it is in the direction of leniency Abbe said once do I know it because it was taught it was related of Aryohan and Bizakai that he was sitting in the shadow of the temple and teaching all day now hear it. Was impossible not to lecture, and he intended to benefit from the shade, and it is permitted. But Rabbah said the temple was different because it was made for its inside. Rabbah said, "Once do I know it? Because we learned there were passageways opening in the upper chamber to the holy of holies through which the artisans were lowered
Perform yet it involves trespass for it is written and he shall put them the ashes beside the altar which means that he the priest must not scatter nor use them because the references to the separation of the ashes and the priestly garments are two verses written with the same purpose and the teaching of two such verses does not eliminate other cases of separation of the ashes than which we have stated the priestly garments as it is written and he shall leave them there this. Teaches that they must be hidden that is well on the view of the rabbis who say this teaches that they must be hidden but according to our dosa who disagrees with them and maintains but they are fit for an ordinary priest while what does and he shall leave them there mean that he the high priest must not use them on another day of atonement what can be said because the separation of ashes and the beheaded heifer are two verses with the same teaching and such two verses do not eliminate other. Cases that is well according to him who maintains they do not eliminate other cases but on the view that they do eliminate what can be said two limitations are written it is written and he shall put them the ashes and it is written over the heifer whose neck was broken etc come and here if he took it the heifer into the team and it accidentally did some threshing it is fit but if it was in order that it should suck and thresh it is unfit now here it is impossible to do otherwise. And he intends to benefit and he the tana teaches that it is unfit there it is different because scripture saith which hath not been wrought with implying in all cases if so even in the first clause too the same applies Talmud, Mos Pesachim be this can only be compared to the following if a bird rested upon it the red heifer it remains fit but if it copulated with a male it is unfit what is the reason said our papa if it were written about and we read it about I would say it becomes. Unfit only if he himself wrought with it while if you bad were written and we read it you bad it would imply even if it were of itself since however it is written about active whilst read you bad passive it was wrought with must be similar to he wrought with it just as he wrought with it must mean that he approved of it so also it was wrought with refers only to what he approved come and here he may not spread it is a lost rhyme upon a couch or a frame for his needs but he may spread it. Out upon a couch or a frame in its own interest if he was visited by guests he may not spread it over a bed or a frame whether in its interest or his own there it is different because he may the yoke be though this heifer had threshed it remains fit because it had been taken into the team to feed not to thresh thereby destroy it either through an evil eye or through thieves come and here clothes merchants sell in their normal fashion providing that they do not intend to gain protection. From the sun in hot weather or from the rain when it is raining but the strictly religious sling them on a staff behind their back now here though it is possible to do as the strictly religious yet when he has no intention of benefiting it is permitted this is a refutation of him who learns Rabbi's first version this is indeed a refutation and one may not fire etc. Our rabbis taught if an oven was fired with the shells of orla or with the stubble of kilim of the vineyard if new it must be. Demolished if old it must be allowed to cool if a loaf was baked in it rabbi said the loaf is forbidden but the sages maintain the loaf is permitted if he baked it upon the coals all agree that it is permitted but it was taught whether new or old it must be allowed to cool there is no difficulty one agrees with rabbi the other with the rabbis granted that you know rabbi to rule thus because the benefit of the fuel lies in the loaf do you know him to maintain this ruling where two things. Produce the result rather reply thus there is no difficulty one is according to our Eliezer the other according to the rabbis which ruling of our Eliezer is alluded to shall we say our Eliezer s ruling on se or for we learned if se or of Hullen and se or of Terima fall into dough and neither is sufficient to make it leaven but they combined and made it leaven our Eliezer said I regard the last but the sages maintain whether the forbidden matter falls in first or the forbidden matter. Falls in last he never renders it forbidden Talmud, Mos Pesachim unless it contains sufficient to induce fermentation now Abbe said they learned this only where he anticipated and removed the forbidden matter but if he did not anticipate and remove the forbidden matter it is forbidden this proves that the product of two causes is forbidden yet how do you know that our Eliezer's reason is as Abbe states it perhaps our Eliezer's reason is because I follow the last there being no difference. Whether he anticipated and removed the forbidden matter or he did not anticipate and remove the forbidden matter but if they fell in simultaneously then indeed it may be permitted rather it is our Eliezer's ruling on the wood of the Asherah which is alluded to for we learned if he took wood from it see the Asherah benefit thereof is forbidden if he fired an oven with it if new it must be destroyed if old it must be allowed to cool if he baked bread in it benefit thereof is forbidden if it the bread became mixed up with others and these others again with others they are all forbidden for use our Eliezer said let him carry the benefit derived thence to the dead sea said they to him you cannot redeem an idol granted that you hear our Eliezer to rule thus in the case of idolatry whose interdict is very severe do you know him to rule likewise in respect of other interdicts of the Torah then if so to whom will you ascribe it moreover it was explicitly taught and thus did our Eliezer declare it forbidden in the case of all interdicts in the Torah Abbe said should you say that the product of two causes is forbidden then Rabbi is identical in view with our Eliezer but should you say the product of two causes is permitted while your Rabbi forbids the bread because there is the improvement of the fuel in the bread then plates goblets and regards them which completes the leavening having produced the whole of it flasks are forbidden they differ only in respect of it. Oven and pot on the view that the product of two causes is forbidden, these are forbidden on the view that the product of two causes is permitted, these are permitted. Others state even on the view that the product of two causes is permitted, the pot is forbidden, for it receives the stew before the permitted fuel is placed. Our Joseph said in Rab Judah's name and Samuel's name, if an oven was fired, heated with shells of orla or with stubble of kilim of the vineyard, if knew it must be demolished, if old, it must be allowed to cool if he baked bread in it. Rabbi said the bread is permitted, but the sages maintain the bread is forbidden, but the reverse was taught. Samuel learned it the reverse. Alternatively, in general, Samuel holds that the Halachah is as Rabbi is against his, but not as against his colleagues, but here he holds even against his colleagues, and so he reasoned, I will recite it reversed in order that the Rabbis may stand as ruling stringently if he baked it upon. The coals all agree that the bread is permitted. Rab Judah and Samuel's name and our high Ashi and our Yohanan's name differ therein. One says they learned this only of dying coals, but live coals are forbidden, while the other maintains even live coals too are permitted. As for the view that live coals are forbidden, it is well the reason being because there is the improvement of the fuel in the bread, but on the view that even live coals are permitted, then how is the bread which is forbidden? Because there is the improvement of the fuel in the bread conceivable according to Rabbi said our Papa when the flame is opposite it Talmud, Mos Pesachim be Talmud, Mos Pesachim be whence it follows that the Rabbis who disagree with him permitted even when the flame is opposite it then how is forbidden fuel conceivable according to the Rabbi said our Mi Bihama in the case of a stool Rami Bihama asked our his if an oven was heated with wood of and bread is baked therein what is the law? According to the rabbis who permit in the first case the bread is forbidden he replied and what is the difference between this and Orla said Rabbi how compare Orla is annulled in 200 times its own quantity it is not annulled even in 1000 times its quantity but said Rabbi if there is a difficulty this is a difficulty surely he who fires the oven commits trespass and wherever he who fires the oven commits trespass it the fuel passes out to Hullen said our Papa we treat here of wood of peace offerings and in accordance with our Judah who maintained it if misappropriated for secular use unwittingly becomes Hullen if deliberately it does not become Hullen now what is the reason that if deliberately it does not become Hullen since it does not involve a trespass offering it does not pass out to Hullen so peace offerings too since it the misappropriation of this type of sacrifice does not involve a trespass offering it does not pass out to Hullen yet. Whenever he that fires the oven commits trespass it the fuel passes out to Hullen but it was taught in the case of all which are burnt their ashes are permitted for use except the wood of an asherah while the ashes of Ippish are forbidden forever said Rami Biham e.g. if a fire fell of its own accord on wood of Ippish so that there is no man to be liable for trespass Arshimea said it refers to those ashes which must be hidden for it was taught and he shall put them the ashes. Gently and he shall put them the whole thereof and he shall put them means that he must not scatter them Arjuda said there is no removal etc. It was taught Arjuda said there is no removal of leaven save by burning and logic impels this if not har which is not subject to there shall not be seen and there shall not be found requires burning then leaven which is subject to there shall not
Subject to Yeshua, let nothing of it remain, and leaven is subject to Yeshua, let nothing of it remain, just as Nathar is disposed of by burning, so is leaven disposed of by burning. Said they to him, let the guilt offering of suspense and the sin offering of a bird which is brought for a doubt on your view prove it, for they are subject to Yeshua, let nothing of it remain, and we maintain that they require burning while you say it is disposed of by burial. Thereupon our Judah was silent, said, Our Joseph, thus people say the ladle which the artisan hollowed out in it his tongue shall be burnt with mustard. Abbe said, When the maker of the stock sits in his own stock, he is paid with the clue which his own hand wound. Rabbah said, When the arrow maker is slain by his own arrows, he is paid with the clue which his own hand wound. But the sages maintain he crumbles and throws it, etc. The scholars asked, How is it meant he crumbles and throws it to the wind, or he crumbles and throws it into the See, or perhaps he crumbles and throws it to the wind, but he may throw it into the sea hole without crumbling. And we learn similarly in connection with an idol to our Jose said he crushes and throws it to the wind or cast it into the sea. And the scholars asked, How is it meant he crushes and throws it to the wind, or he crushes and cast it into the sea, or perhaps he crushes and throws it to the wind, but he may cast it into the sea hole without crushing said rabbit. It is logical that an idol which goes into the dead sea need not be crushed. Leaven which goes into other streams needs crumbling, said our Joseph to him. On the contrary, the logic is the reverse. An idol which does not dissolve needs crushing. Leaven which dissolves does not need crumbling. It was taught in accordance with rabbit. It was taught in accordance with our Joseph. It was taught in accordance with rabbit. If he was walking in a wilderness, he crumbles it the leaven and cast it to the wind if he was traveling in a Ship he crumbles it and cast it into the sea. It was taught in accordance with our Joseph. If he was traveling in the desert, he crushes the idol and throws it to the wind. If he was traveling in a ship, he crushes and cast it into the sea. The teaching requiring crushing is a difficulty according to Rabbi, while the teaching requiring crumbling is a difficulty according to our Jose. Crushing is not a difficulty according to Rabbi. One means into the dead sea, the other means into other waters. Crumbling is not a difficulty according to our Joseph. One refers to wheat grains, the other refers to bread. Mission eleven belonging to a Gentile over which Passover has passed is permitted for use, but that of an Israelite is forbidden for use because it is said neither shall there be leaven seen with the Gemara, who is the authority of our mission. It is neither our Judah nor our Simeon nor our Jose the Galilean. What is the solution for it? Was taught as to leaven both before its time and after. Its time he transgresses a negative command on its account during its time he transgresses a negative command and commits a sin subject to Gareth Talmud, Mos Pesachim B.R. Simeon said as to leaven before and after its time he does not transgress anything at all on its account during its time he transgresses on its account an interdict subject to Gareth and a negative command and from the hour that it is forbidden for eating it is forbidden for general use this agrees with the first. Ten R. Jose the Galilean said wonder at yourself how can leaven be prohibited for general use the whole seven days and how do we know of him who eats leaven from six hours and onwards that he transgresses a negative command because it is said thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it this is our Judah's opinion said R. Simeon to him is it then possible to say thus seeing that it is already stated thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith if so what does thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it teach when he is subject to the injunction arise eat unleavened bread he is subject to the prohibition do not eat leavened bread and when he is not subject to arise eat unleavened bread he is not subject to do not eat leavened bread what is our Judah's reason three verses are written there shall no leavened bread be eaten yet shall eat nothing leavened and thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it one refers to before its time another two after its time and the third to during its time and our Simeon one refers to during its time yet shall eat nothing leavened he requires for what was taught he may I only know that it is forbidden where it turned leaven of its own accord if it turned leaven through another substance how do we know it therefore it is stated yet shall eat nothing leavened there shall no leavened bread be eaten he requires for what was taught our Jose the Galilean said how do we know that at the Passover of Egypt it's Prohibition of leaven was enforced one day only because it is said there shall no leavened bread be eaten and in proximity thereto is written this day ye go forth and our Judah how does he know that it is prohibited when made leaven through another substance because the divine law expressed it in the term mongs how does he know our Jose the Galilean's deduction I can either say because this day is stated in proximity thereto alternatively he does not base interpretations on it. Proximity of verses the master said and how do we know of him who eats leaven from six hours and onwards that he transgresses a negative command because it is said thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it this is our Judah's opinion said our Simeon to him is it then possible to say thus seeing that it is already stated thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith now as to our Judah our Simeon says well to him our Judah can answer you the purpose of that verse is to make it a statutory obligation even for nowadays and our Simeon whence does he know to make it a statutory obligation even nowadays he deduces it from it even ye shall eat unleavened bread and our Judah he requires that in respect of an unclean person or one who was on a distant journey I might say since he cannot eat the Passover sacrifice he need not eat unleavened bread or bitter herbs either hence we are informed that it is not so and our Simeon for an unclean person or one who was on a distant journey no verse is required because he is no worse than an uncircumcised person and an alien for it is written but no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof thereof he shall not eat but he eats of unleavened bread and bitter herbs and our Judah it is written in the case of one and it is written in the case of the other now who is the authority for our mission if our Judah he states leaven without qualification even that of a Gentile and if our Simeon Talmud, Mos Pesachim. Even that of an Israelite is indeed permitted, while if it is our Jose the Galilean, even during its time it is indeed permitted for general use. Said our Ahabi Jacob, in truth it is our Judah, and he learns se or leaven of eating from se or of seeing, just as with the se or stated in connection with seeing, you must not see your own, but you may see that belonging to others or to the Most High. So with the se or written in connection with eating, you must not eat your own, but you may eat that belonging to others or to the Most High. And logically, he the ten of our mission ought to teach that it is permitted even for eating, but because he teaches that that of an Israelite is forbidden for use, he also teaches that that of a Gentile is permitted for use. Again, logically, he ought to teach that even during its period it is permitted for use, but because he mentions after its period in connection with that of an Israelite, he also teaches about that of even after its period. Rabbi said. In truth, it is our Simeon, but our Simeon does indeed penalize him since he transgresses. There shall not be seen, and there shall not be found there with as for Rabbah. It is well, hence it is taught, but that of an Israelite is forbidden for general use because it is said, Neither shall there leaven be seen with thee, but according to our Ahabi Jacob, he should state because it is said, There shall no leaven bread be eaten. Do you think that that refers to the second clause? No, it refers to the first clause, and he states, Thus, leaven belonging to a Gentile over which Passover has passed is permitted for use because it is said, Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee, implying thine own thou must not see, but thou mayest see the leaven of strangers or of the most high, and se or of eating is learned from se or of seeing. Now they are consistent with their views, for it was stated, If one eats se or belonging to a heathen over which Passover has passed, according to our Judas view, said he. Is flagellated while our Ahabi Jacob said he is not flagellated. Rabbi said he is flagellated. Our Judah does not learn se or of eating from se or of seeing. While our Ahabi Jacob said he is not flagellated, he learns se or of eating from se or of seeing. But our Ahabi Jacob retracted from that view, for it was taught he who eats leaven of it during the festival Passover commits trespass. But some say he does not commit trespass. Who is meant by some say said our Yohanan it is our Nihunya Bihakana for. It was taught our Nihunya Bihakana used to treat the Day of Atonement as the Sabbath in regard to payment. Just as with the Sabbath he forfeits his life and is exempt from payment, so with the Day of Atonement he forfeits his life and is exempt from payment. Our Joseph said they differ as to whether sacred food can be redeemed in order to feed dogs. There with he who says that he commits trespass holds one may redeem sacred food in order to feed dogs. There with while he who rules that he does.
Retracted from that statement are as she said all hold that we may not redeem etc. and that which has indirect monetary value is not as money but here they differ in the controversy of our Jose the Galilean and the rabbis he rules that he is liable to trespass holds as our Jose while he rules that he is not liable for trespass agrees with the rabbis rab said love in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind is forbidden when not in its time if mixed with its own kind it is forbidden if with a different kind it is permitted what are we discussing shall we say where it imparts its taste to the mixture then how state when not in its time if mixed with a different kind it is permitted surely it imparts taste rather it refers to a minute quantity of love and love in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind is forbidden rab being consistent with his view for rab and Samuel both said all forbidden things of it Torah if mixed with their own kind render forbidden the mixture even when there is a minute quantity if with a different kind only when the forbidden element imparts its taste now rab forbade leaven in its time when mixed with a different kind on account of a mixture with its own kind when not in its period and mixed with its own kind that the mixture is forbidden in accordance with our Judah but when leaven has no monetary value at all nor has it any indirect monetary value. Since it cannot be redeemed to feed it to dogs by selling it to a non Jew for the purpose mixed with a different kind it is permitted because to forbid it when not in its time and mixed with a different kind on account of a mixture with its own kind to that extent we do not enact a preventive measure Samuel said leaven in its time if mixed with its own kind is forbidden if with a different kind it is permitted when not in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different Kind it is permitted leaven in its time if mixed with its own kind is forbidden Samuel is consistent with his view for Rab and Samuel both said all prohibited things of the Torah if mixed with their own kind render forbidden the mixture even when there is a minute quantity if mixed with a different kind only when the forbidden element imparts its flavor now he does not forbid leaven mixed with a different kind on account of a mixture with its own kind when not in its time. Whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind it is permitted in accordance with our Simeon while our Yohanan said leaven in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind is forbidden when it imparts its taste when not in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind it is permitted leaven in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind is forbidden when it imparts its taste our Yohanan is consistent with his view. For our Yohanan and Reshlakish both maintain all forbidden things in the Torah whether mixed with their own kind or with a different kind render forbidden the mixture only when they impart their taste when not in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind it is permitted in accordance with our Simeon Talmud. Mas Pesachim Rabba said the law is leaven in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind is forbidden even when there is a minute. Quantity in accordance with Rab when not in its time whether mixed with its own kind or with a different kind it is permitted in accordance with our Simeon yet did Rabba say thus surely Rabba said our Simeon does indeed penalize him since he transgressed there shall not be seen and there shall not be found with it that is only in its natural state but not when it is in a mixture now Rabba is consistent with his view for Rabba said when we were at our Naman's house when the seven days of Passover were. Gone he would say to us go out and buy leaven from the troops Rab said pots must be broken on Passover why so let them be kept until after Passover and used with a different kind lest he come to use it with its own kind but Samuel maintained they need not be broken but can be kept until after its period and then used with their own kind or with a different kind now Samuel is consistent with his view for Samuel said to the hardware merchants charge all equitable price for your pots for if not I will publicly lecture that the law is in accordance with our Simeon then let him lecture thus to them in any case seeing that Samuel holds as our Simeon it was Rab's town a certain oven was greased with fat thereupon Rabba be a high lever for all time the bread baked therein to be eaten even with salt lest he come to eat it with kutine objection is raised one must not knead dough with milk and if he does knead it the whole loaf is forbidden because it leads to sin similarly Talmud. Mas Pesachim B1 must not grease an oven with fat and if he does grease it all the bread baked therein is forbidden until the oven is refired which implies if the oven is refired it is nevertheless permitted this is a refutation of Rabba Biahila it is indeed a refutation Rabba has said to Arashi now since Rabba Biahila was refuted why did Rab say pots must be broken on Passover there it was a metal oven replied he whereas here an earthen pot is referred to alternatively both refer to earthen where this the oven is fired from the inside while the other the pot is fired on the outside and should you say here to let him burn it the pot out from within he would spare it lest it burst therefore a tiled pan since it is burnt from without is forbidden but if he filled it with coals it is permitted Rabba ask Arashi what does one do about the knives on Passover I provide make new ones for myself he replied that is well for you who can afford this said he to him but what about one who cannot afford this? I mean, like new ones. He answered, I thrust their handles in loam and their blades in fire, and then I place their handles in boiling water. But the law is both the one and the other need only be put into boiling water. And in the first vessel, Arhuna, the son of Ar Joshua, said, A wooden pot ladle must be purified in boiling water. And in the first vessel, thus he holds as it absorbs, so it exudes. Mirmar was asked, Glazed vessels may they be used on Passover about green ones? There is no problem, as they are certainly forbidden. The question is, How about black ones and white ones? Again, if they have splits, there is no question, as they are certainly forbidden. The question is, What about smooth ones? Said he to him, We see that they exude, which shows that they absorb, hence they are forbidden. And the Torah testified concerning an earthen vessel that it, the absorbed matter never passes out from its sides. And what is the difference in respect of wine of Nizek that? Mirmar lectured glazed vessels whether black, white, or green are permitted and should you answer the interdict of wine of Nizek is only rabbinical whereas that of love is scriptural surely whatever the rabbis enacted they enacted similar to scriptural law said he to him this is used with hot matter while the other is used with cold Rabbi Abba said in our high B Ashi's name and Samuel's name all utensils which were used with leavened matter hey cold may be used with unleavened bread mazah except a container of Essie or because it is strongly leavened our Ashi said and a Haroseth container is like a container of Essie or because it is strongly leavened Rabbi said the kneading basins of Mahusa since leaven is continually kneaded in them and leaven is kept in them are like a container of Essie or which is strongly leavened that is obvious you might say since they are why the air acts on them and they do not absorb therefore he informs us otherwise mission if a Gentile lent money. To an Israelite on his leaven after Passover it is permitted for use while if an Israelite lent money to a Gentile on his leaven after Passover it is prohibited for use. Gemara it was stated in the case of a creditor Abbe said he collects retrospectively while Rabbi said he collects from now and onwards now where the debtor sanctified the pledge or sold it all agree that the creditor can come and seize a Talmud, Mas Pesachim and the creditor can come and redeem it for we learned he adds another dinar and redeems this property they differ where the creditor sold or dedicated Abbe said he collects retrospectively since the time for payment came and he did not repay him the matter was retrospectively revealed that from the very beginning it stood in his possession and he rightly dedicated or sold it but Rabbi ruled he collects from now and onwards since if he the debtor had money he could have quitted him with money it is found that he the creditor acquires it. Only now yet did Rabbi say thus surely Rami Bihaba said if Reuben sold his estate to Simeon with security and he Simeon set it the money up as a loan against himself then Reuben died and Reuben's creditor came and seized the estate from Simeon whereupon Simeon went and satisfied him with money it is by right that the children of Reuben can go and say to Simeon as for us we maintain that our father left us movables in your possession and the movables of orphans are not under lien to a creditor now Rabbi said if Simeon is wise he lets them seize the land and then he reclaims it from them for Arnaman said if orphans seize land for their father's debt a creditor of their father can in turn seize it from them now if you agree that he a creditor collects retrospectively it is right for that reason he in turn can seize it from them because it is just as though they had seized it in their father's lifetime but if you say that he collects it from now and henceforth why can he in Turn sees it from them surely it is as though the orphans had bought immovable property and if orphans buy immovable property is it then under a lien to their father's creditor there it is different because he can say to them just as I was indebted to your father so I was indebted to
Loving after Passover he transgresses on all views but surely the reverse of the rulings in the first clause is required according to the view there in the first clause that he does not transgress here he does transgress while according to the view there that he does transgress here he does not transgress Talmud, Mas Pesachim B. Rather the circumstances here in both clauses are that he the borrower deposited it the leaven with him and they differ in our Isaac estictum for our Isaac. Said whence do we know that the credit requires a title to the pledge because it is said thou shalt surely restore to him the pledge when the sun goeth down and it shall be righteousness unto thee if he has no title thereto whence is his righteousness hence it follows that the credit requires a title to the pledge now the first tana holds that applies only to an Israelite taking a pledge from an Israelite since we read in his case and it shall be righteousness unto thee but an Israelite taking a pledge from a Gentile does not acquire a title while our mayor holds it follows a fortiori if an Israelite acquires from an Israelite how much the more an Israelite from a Gentile but if a Gentile lent money to an Israelite on his leaven after Passover all agree that he transgresses there the Gentile certainly does not acquire a title from the Israelite we learned if a Gentile lent money to an Israelite on his leaven after Passover it is permitted for use now even Granted that he deposited it with him, surely you said that a Gentile does not acquire a title from an Israelite. There is no difficulty there in the Mishnah. It means that he said to him from now here in the Beretha. It means that he did not say to him from now. And whence do you assure that we draw a distinction between where he said from now and where he did not say from now? Because it was taught if a Gentile deposited with an Israelite large loaves as a pledge, he the Israelite does not transgress. But if he said to him, I have made them yours, he transgresses. Why is the first clause different from the second? This surely proves that where he says to him from now, it is different from where he does not say from now. This proves that our rabbis taught a shop belonging to an Israelite and its wares belong to an Israelite. While Gentile workers enter their leaven that is found there after Passover is forbidden for use, while it need not be stated for eating a shop belonging to a Gentile. And the wares belong to a Gentile while Israelite workers go in and out leaven that is found there after Passover may be eaten while it is unnecessary to state that benefit is permitted mission if ruins collapsed on leaven it is regarded as removed our Simeon B. Gamaliel said provided that a dog cannot search it out Gamar Arista said yet he must annul it in his heart a tanda taught how far is the searching of a dog three handbreadths are the son of our Joseph said to our Ashi as to what Samuel said money can only be guarded by placing it in the earth do we require it to be covered by three handbreadths or not here he replied we require three handbreadths on account of the smell of the leaven but there it is put into the earth in order to cover it from the eye therefore three handbreadths are not required and how much is necessary said Raphram of Sakara one handbreadth mission he who eats terima of leaven on Passover unwittingly must repay to the priest the principal. Plus a fifth if deliberately he is free from payment and from liability for its value as fuel tomorrow we learned elsewhere he who eats terima unwittingly must restore the principal plus a fifth whether he eats drinks Talmud, Mas Pesachim be rather the circumstances here in both clauses are that he the borrower deposited it the leaven with him and they differ in our Isaac estictum for our Isaac said whence do we know that the creditor acquires a title to the pledge because it is said thou shalt surely restore to him the pledge when the sun goeth down and it shall be righteousness unto thee if he has no title thereto whence is his righteousness hence it follows that the creditor acquires a title to the pledge now the first tana holds that applies only to an Israelite taking a pledge from an Israelite since we read in his case and it shall be righteousness unto thee but an Israelite taking a pledge from a Gentile does not acquire a title while our mayor holds it follows a for she if an Israelite acquires from an Israelite how much the more an Israelite from a Gentile but if a Gentile lent money to an Israelite on his leaven after Passover all agree that he transgresses there the Gentile certainly does not acquire a title from the Israelite we learned if a Gentile lent money to an Israelite on his leaven after Passover it is permitted for use now even granted that he deposited it with him surely you said that a Gentile does not acquire a title from an Israelite there is no difficulty there in the mission it means that he said to him from now here in the Beretha it means that he did not say to him from now and whence do you assure that we draw a distinction between where he said from now and where he did not say from now because it was taught if a Gentile deposited with an Israelite large loaves as a pledge he the Israelite does not transgress but if he said to him I have made them yours he transgresses why is the first clause Different from the second, this surely proves that where he says to him from now it is different from where he does not say from now this proves that our rabbis taught a shop belonging to an Israelite and its wares belong to an Israelite while Gentile workers enter their leaven that is found there after Passover is forbidden for use while it need not be stated for eating a shop belonging to a Gentile and the wares belong to a Gentile while Israelite workers go in and out leaven that is found. There after Passover may be eaten while it is unnecessary to state that benefit is permitted mission if ruins collapsed on leaven it is regarded as removed our Simeon B. Gamaliel said provided that a dog cannot search it out Gamar Arista said yet he must annul it in his heart a tanda taught how far is the searching of a dog three handbreadths are the son of our Joseph said to our Ashi as to what Samuel said money can only be guarded by placing it in the earth do we require it to be covered. By three handbreadths or not here he replied we require three handbreadths on account of the smell of the leaven but there it is put into the earth in order to cover it from the eye therefore three handbreadths are not required and how much is necessary said Raphram of Sakara one handbreadth mission he who eats terima of leaven on Passover unwittingly must repay to the priest the principal plus a fifth if deliberately he is free from payment and from liability for its value as fuel tomorrow we learned elsewhere he who eats terima unwittingly must restore the principal plus a fifth whether he eats drinks Talmud, Mas Pesachim or anoints therewith whether it was defiled or undefiled terima he must pay a fifth and a fifth of the fifth the scholars asked when he repays does he repay according to quantity or according to value where it was originally worth four zoos while subsequently it was worth a zoos there is no question for he must certainly repay on the original Price according to its value because it is no worse than a robber for we learned all robbers repay as at the time of the robbery the question arises where it was originally worth a zoos while subsequently it was worth for what then must he repay according to quantity for he the priest can say he ate a while well, he must repay a while or perhaps he repays according to the value he ate the worth of a zoos he repays the worth of a zoos said our Joseph come and here if he ate figs of terima and repaid him dates blessings be upon him it is well if you say that he must repay according to quantity therefore blessings be upon him because he ate a while of dry figs which is worth a zoos and he returns him a while of dates which is worth for but if you say that he pays according to its value why should blessings be upon him he ate for a zoos and he returns as much as for a zoos said of a indeed he pays according to value yet why should blessings come upon him because he ate something. For which buyers are not eager and he pays with something for which buyers are eager we learned he who eats terima of leaven on Passover unwittingly must pay to the priest the principal plus a fifth it is well if you say that he must pay according to quantity then it is right but if you say that he must pay according to the value as then leaven on Passover any value yes the author of this is our Jose the Galilean who maintained leaven on Passover is permitted for use if so consider the second clause if deliberately he is free from payment and from liability for its value as fuel but if the author is our Jose the Galilean why is he free from payment and from liability for its value as fuel he holds as our Nihunya Bihakana for it was taught our Nihunya Bihakana used to treat the day of atonement as the Sabbath in regard to payment etc this is dependent on Tanaim he who eats terima of leaven on Passover is free from payment and from liability for the value of the fuel this is our Akiba's ruling. Our Yohanan Binuri declares him liable. Said our Akiba to our Yohanan Binuri, What benefit then has he, the priest therein? Our Yohanan Binuri retorted to our Akiba, And what benefit has the priest therein that he who eats unclean terima during the rest of the year must pay not so? Replied he, If you speak of unclean terima during the rest of the year, that is because though he, the priest, does not enjoy the right to eat it, yet he enjoys the right to use it as fuel, will you say? The same of this in which he does not enjoy the right of eating or the right to use it as fuel. Hence, to what is this like to terima of mulberries and grapes which was defiled in
Because though he the priest does not enjoy the right to eat it yet he enjoys the right to use it as fuel will you say the same of this in which he does not enjoy the right of eating or the right to use it as fuel said he to him in this too he has the right to use it as fuel for if the priest wishes he can place it before his dog or burn it under his pot Talmud. Mas Pesachim B.A.B. said our Elizer B. Jacob Arakiba and our Yohanan Binari all hold that leaven during Passover is forbidden for. Use and they differ in this bizarre Akiba holds he must pay according to value while our Yohanan Binari holds he must pay according to quantity that is obvious you might say our Yohanan Binari also holds as our Akiba that he must pay according to value but the reason that he declares him liable there is this is because he agrees with our Jose the Galilean who maintained leaven is permitted for use on Passover therefore he informs us that it is not so yet perhaps that indeed is so if so let our Yohanan Binari answer our Akiba just as our Eliezer Hizma answered our Eliezer B. Jacob our rabbis taught he who eats as much as an olive of Terah must pay the principal plus a fifth Abbas said he is not liable unless it has the worth of a parata what is the first ten is reason scripture set and if a man eat of the holy thing unwittingly and eating requires as much as an olive and Abbas what is his reason scripture set and he shall give unto the priest the holy thing and Giving is not less than the worth of a parata and the other two surely it is written that comes to teach excluding him who destroys Terima and the first ten is surely it is written and he shall give you requires that to intimate that he must return something which is fit to be holy or rabbis taught he who eats less than an olive of Terima must pay the principal but he does not pay the additional fifth how is it meant if it is not worth a parata let him not pay the principal either. While if it is worth a parata let him pay a fifth too after all it means that it is worth a parata yet even so since it was less than an olive he pays the principal but does not pay the fifth the rabbi stated this before our papa this is not according to Abbasal for if according to Abbasal surely he says since it is worth a parata even if it is less than an olive the law applies said our papa to them you may even say that it agrees with Abbasal Abbasal requires both yet does Abba. Saul require both surely we learned Abbasal said for that which possesses the worth of a paratahi the eater is liable for payment for that which does not possess the worth of a paratahi is not liable for payment said they the sages to him the worth of a paratahi was stated in connection with the trespass offering only but for terima he is not liable unless it contains as much as an olive now if this is correct they should have stated once it contains as much as an olive this is a refutation now our papa to retract it for it was taught if anyone commit a trespass and sin unwittingly this excludes deliberate trespass but does this not follow a fortiori if other precepts for the transgression of which one is liable to Karath yet scripture exempts the deliberate offender in their case with regard to trespass which does not involve Karath does it not follow that the deliberate transgressor is exempt no if you say thus in the case of other precepts that is because he is not liable to death on their account. Will you say the same of trespass for which death is incurred? Therefore, unwittingly is stated, excluding deliberate transgression. Now, our nomin B. Isaac said to our high B. Abin this tana at first regards Karath as severe, while subsequently he regards death at the hands of heaven as more severe, and he answered him, This is what he means. No, if you say thus in the case of other precepts, that is because he is not liable to death on their account for less than an olive. Will you say the same of trespass where death is incurred for less than an olive? Whereon he said to him, Thy mind be at rest because thou hast set my mind at rest. Said he to him, What satisfaction is there in this answer? Seeing that Rabbah and Arshis have swung an axe at it, whom do you know to maintain Talmud? Mas Pesachim, if he deliberately transgressed in respect of a trespass offering, he is punished by death. It is Rabbi, for it was taught if he deliberately. Transgressed in respect of the trespass offering, Rabbi said he is punished by death while the sages maintained by warning what is Rabbi's reason said Arabah he derives identity of law from the fact that sin is written here and in the case of Terima just as Terima involves death so trespass involves death and from that it also follows just as Terima involves punishment for as much as an olive so trespass involves punishment for as much as an olive now our Papa demurred how do you know? That Rabbi holds as the Rabbis perhaps he agrees with Abbasal who said if it possesses the worth of a parata even if it does not contain as much as an olive but surely it was our Papa who said that Abbasal requires both hence this proves that he retracted Mar the son of Rabbi said this is what he means no if you say thus of other precepts where the unintentional is not treated as intentional for if he intended cutting what was detached but cut what is attached he is not culpable will you? Say the same in the case of trespass where if he intended to warm himself with wool shearings of Holland but warmed himself with the wool shearings of a burnt offering he is liable to a trespass offering Arnam and B. Isaac said he means this if you say thus in the case of other precepts that is because he who is not engaged therein is not declared culpable like he who is engaged therein for if he intended picking up that which was detached but he plucked that which is attached instead he is not culpable will you say the same of trespass where if he stretched out his hand to take a vessel and incidentally anointed his hand with holy oil he is liable for trespass the master said when is this said when he separates terima and it became leaven but if he separates terima of leaven on Passover all agree that it is not holy once do we know this said Arnam and B. Isaac scripture set the first fruits of thy corn of thy wine and of thy oil shalt thou give to him but not for its like Arhuna son of Arjashu objected one must not separate Terima from unclean produce for clean yet if he separates thus unwittingly his Terima is valid yet why let us say for him but not for his light there is no difficulty there it enjoyed a time of fitness whereas here it did not enjoy a time of fitness and how is it conceivable that it had no time of fitness e.g. if it became leaven whilst attached to the soil but if it became leaven when detached would it indeed be holy yes he replied the sentences by the decree of the watchers and the matter by the word of the holy ones and thus do they rule in the academy in accordance with my view when Arhuna the son of Arjashu came Talmud, Mas Pesachim B he said scripture set the first fruits of the corn etc implying that its residue is distinct and that it becomes permitted to the Israelite thus this is excluded since its residue is not so distinct Arallah Bar we sat before Arjashu and he sat and said in our Yohanan's name if grapes are defiled one may tread them out less than an egg in quantity at a time and their wine is fit for libations this proves that he holds that the juice is indeed stored up consequently when is it the juice defiled when he expresses it but when he expresses it its standard quantity for defiling is absent if so he can tread as much as an egg too for we learned if a man unclean through a corpse squeezes out olives or grapes exactly as much as an egg in quantity. They are clean there it is thus if he did it here it is in the first instance when he must not tread as much as an egg for fear lest he come to tread more than an egg said Arhista to him who needs you and Yohanan your teacher whether then has their uncleanness gone this proves that he holds that the juice is indeed absorbed and since the solid eatable is defiled the juice too is defiled and do you not hold that the juice is stored up he replied surely we learned if he who is unclean. Through a corpse squeezes out olives and grapes exactly as much as an egg in quantity they are clean now it is well if you say that the liquid is stored up for that reason it is clean but if you say that it is absorbed why is it clean said he to him we discuss your grapes which were not made fit when and do they become fit when he squeezes them but when he squeezes them the standard quantity for defilement is diminished for if you should not say thus then when it was taught to what is this like to tear of mulberries and grapes which were defiled which is not permitted to him either for eating or for burning but surely it may be eaten too for if he wishes he can tread them out less than an egg at a time said Rabbah it is a preventive measure lest he come to a stumbling block through them Abbe said to him yet do we fear a stumbling block surely it was taught one may light a fire with bread or oil of terima which was defiled the bread he cast among the wood he replied and the oil of Terima he pours into a repulsive vessel it was stated in the text one may light a fire with bread or oil of Terima which was defiled Abbe said in Hezekiah's name and Rabbah said the school of our Isaac B. Martha said in Arhuna's name they learned this of bread only but not of wheat lest he come to a stumbling block through it but our Yohanan said even wheat but why let us fear lest he come to a stumbling block through it as our Ashi said elsewhere Talmud, Mas Pesachim it refers to boiled grains so that they are repulsive so here too it refers to boiled grains which are repulsive and where was our
It is permitted in a species whose seed is destroyed, but in the case of a species whose seed is not destroyed, even its second growth is forbidden for eating. They were silent, said they to him, Have you heard anything about this? Thus did Arshis hate say, He answered, What does forbidden mean? They are forbidden to priests since they became unfit for eating through his mental neglect. That is correct on the view that mental neglect is an intrinsic disqualification, and it is well, but on the view that mental neglect is a disqualification of defilement, what can be said for it was stated as to mental neglect, Aryohan and said it is a disqualification of defilement, while Arsimian Belakish said it is an intrinsic disqualification, Aryohan and said it is a disqualification of defilement, for if Elijah should come and declare it clean, we eat him, Arsimian Belakish said it is an intrinsic disqualification, for if Elijah should come and declare it clean, we do not eat him, Aryohan and raisin. Objection to Arsimian Belakish, Ar Ishmael, son of Aryohan and Bibarakish said there was a small passage between the stairway and the altar at the west of the stairway, whither they used to throw disqualified birds and offerings until the flesh became disfigured, and then they passed out to the place of burning. Now it is well if you say that mental neglect is a disqualification of uncleanness, therefore it requires disfigurement, lest Elijah may come and declare it clean, but if you say that it isn't. Intrinsic disqualification what is the need of disfigurement surely it was taught this is the general rule Talmud, Mos Pesachim be wherever its disqualification is in itself it must be burnt immediately if it is in the blood or in its owner the flesh must become disfigured and then it goes out to the place of burning he must think of it the terima having once become defiled however the priest would dismiss it from his mind as he would abandon the hope of using it said he to him this. Tana is a tana of the school of Rabbi Abba who maintained even pickle requires disfigurement here Yohanan raised an objection to him if the flesh became unclean or disqualified or if it passed without the curtains or Eliezer said he the priest must sprinkle the blood our Joshua said he must not sprinkle the blood yet our Joshua admits that if he does sprinkle it the sacrifice is accepted now what does disqualified mean is it not through mental neglect now it is well if you say. That it is a disqualification of uncleanness, then it is conceivable that the headplate makes it accepted. But if you say that it is an intrinsic disqualification, why is it accepted? What does disqualified mean? It was disqualified by a tebul yum. If so, it is identical with unclean. There are two kinds of uncleanness. When Rabin went up, he reported this teaching with reference to the terima plants before our Jeremiah, whereupon he observed the Babylonians are fools because they dwell in a land of dark. Nest they engage in dark, obscure discussions. Have you not heard this dictum of Arsimian Belakish in Arashai's name? If the water of the festival was defiled and he made level contact and then sanctified it, it is clean. If he sanctified it and then made level contact, it is unclean. Now consider this is sowing. What does it matter whether he made level contact and then sanctified it or he sanctified it and then made level contact? This proves that sowing has no effect upon it. If so, here too. Sowing has no effect upon Terima Ardimi sat and reported this teaching said Abbe to him does he or Ashai mean that he sanctified it in a vessel but if merely verbally the rabbis did not set a higher standard or perhaps for verbal sanctification too the rabbis set a higher standard I have not heard this he replied but I have heard something similar to it for our Abbe said in our Yohanan's name if grapes were defiled and he trod them and then sanctified them they are clean if he sanctified them and then trod them they are unclean now grapes are a case of verbal sanctification yet even so the rabbis set a higher standard said our Joseph you speak of grapes we treat here of grapes of Terima their verbal sanctification is being tantamount to the sanctification of a vessel but those that require a vessel for sanctification where they are sanctified verbally maybe the rabbis did not set a higher standard if he trod them does that mean even in great quantity but did are you say thus surely are you said if grapes are defiled he may tread them out less than an egg in quantity at a time if you wish I can say that here too it means less than an egg at a time alternatively I can answer there the cases that they the grapes had come into contact with the first degree of uncleanness so that they the grapes are a second but here they come into contact with the second degree so that they are a third Rabbah said we too learned thus and he shall put there too. Running living water in a vessel this teaches that its running must be directly into a vessel and he shall put this proves that it is detached but surely this is attached Talmud, Mos Pesachim but it is a higher standard so here too it is a higher standard Arshai my Ashi said we too learned thus when he an unclean person has a ritual bath he may eat tithe when the sun sets he may eat terima thus only terima but not sacred food yet why so he is clean but you must say it is a Higher standard so here too it is a higher standard Arashi said we too learned us and the flesh this is to include fuel and frankincense are then fuel and frankincense capable of being defiled but you must say it is a higher standard so here too it is a higher standard mission of these are the commodities with which a man discharges his obligation on Passover with wheat with barley with spelt with rye and with oats and they discharge it with demon with first tithe whose terima has been separated and with second tithe or hippish which have been redeemed and priests can discharge their obligation with hala and terima but a man cannot discharge his obligation with tebul nor with first tithe whose terima has not been separated nor with second tithe or hippish which have not been redeemed as to the unleavened loaves of the thanks offering and the wafers of a Nazi right if he made them for himself he cannot discharge his obligation with them if he made them to sell in. The market he can discharge his obligation with them. Gemara Tanda taught Kuzman spelt is a species of wheat, oats, and rye are a species of barley. Kuzman is Golbiship and is Dishrashibal of Shual is Fakirs only. These are fit but not rice or millet. Once do we know it said Arsimian Belakish and thus the school of our Ishmael taught and thus the school of our Eliezer B. Jacob taught scripture said thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith. With regard to commodities which come to the state of leaven, a man discharges his obligation with unleavened bread made thereof. Thus these are excluded which do not come to the state of leaven but to the state of decay. Our mission does not agree with our Yohanan Binuri who maintains rice is a species of corn and Karath is incurred for eating it in its leavened state for it was taught our Yohanan Binuri prohibits the use of rice and millet because it is near to turn leaven. The scholars asked. Does because it is near to turn leaven mean that it quickly becomes leaven, or perhaps it is near to leaven but is not completely leaven? Come and here for it was taught. Our Yohanan Binuri said rice is a species of corn, and Karath is incurred for eating it in its leaven state, and a man discharges his obligation with it on Passover. And thus our Yohanan Binuri used to say Karmith Kawid is subject to hell. What is Karmith said? Abay Shazanath the weed. What is Shazanath said? Our Papa Aweed. Found among Caliph the Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Reshlakish as to dough which was kneaded with wine oil or honey. Karath is not incurred for eating it in its leaven state. Now our Papa and our Huna son of our Joshua sat before our Edb Abin while our Edb Abin was sitting and dozing. Said our Huna son of our Joshua to our Papa, What is Reshlakish reason? He replied, Scripture said, Thou shalt eat no leaven bread with it, etc. In the case of the commodities with which a man discharges his. Obligation in respect of unleavened bread Karath is incurred for eating them in their leavened state but with regard to this dough since a man cannot discharge his obligation therewith because it is rich Mazah Karath is not incurred for its leaven Arhuna son of Arjashu objected to our Papa if he dissolves it and swallows it if it is leaven he is punished with Karath while if it is unleavened bread he does not discharge his obligation therewith on Passover now here though a man does not discharge his obligation therewith as unleavened bread yet Karath is incurred for its leaven thereupon Redb Abin awoke and said to them children this is the reason of Resh Lakish because they are fruit juice Talmud, Mos Pesachim B and fruit juice does not cause fermentation and they discharge their obligation with Dimei and with the first tithe etc Dimei but it is not fit for him since if he wishes he can renounce his property become a poor man and eat Dimei it is fit for him now too. For we learn the poor may be fed with Dimei and Jewish troops in billets may be supplied with Dimei and Arhuna said it was taught Beth Shammai maintained the poor may not be fed with Dimei nor troops in billets but Beth Hillel ruled the poor may be fed with Dimei also troops in billets first tithe whose terima has been separated that is obvious since its terima has been separated it is hull and it is necessary to teach it only where he anticipated it in setting it aside while the
Terima has not been separated that is obvious it is necessary to state it only where it had been anticipated and set aside in the pile you might argue as our Papa proposed to Abe hence Hidatana informs us that it is as Abe answered him nor with second tithe or hitish which have not been redeemed etc that is obvious it is necessary only where they have been redeemed and what does they have not been redeemed mean that they have not been redeemed with their regulations thus it is second tithe which he redeemed with ungoing metal for the divine law states and thou shalt bind up wizard of the money in thine hand implying that which bears a figure zura again it is hitish which was secularized by means of land for the divine law stated then he shall give the money and it shall be assured to him our rabbis taught one might think that a man can discharge his obligation with tibble which was not made ready but surely all tibble indeed has not been made ready rather Say with Tebal which was not made ready with all its requirements the great Terima having been separated from it whereas the Terima of tithe was not separated from it or the first tithe but not the second tithe or even the poor tithe whence do we know it because it is stated thou shalt not eat leavened bread with a teaching you must eat of that the interdict of which is on account of thou shalt not eat leavened bread with it thus this is excluded for its interdict is not on account of thou shalt not eat leavened bread with it but on account of thou shalt not eat Tebal yet whither has the interdict of leaven gone said Arshis hate the author of this is our Simeon who maintained the prohibition cannot fall upon another prohibition for it was taught our Simeon said Talmud Mas Pesachim he who eats nibble on the day of atonement is not liable to a sin offering Rubinus said you may even say that it agrees with the rabbis the meaning is that the interdict which is on account of Thou shalt not eat leavened bread with it alone, thus this is excluded for its interdict is not on account of thou shalt not eat leavened bread with it alone, but also on account of thou shalt not eat tibble is then alone written. Rather, it is clearly as our she's hate stated our rabbis taught you might think that a man can discharge his obligation with second tithe in Jerusalem, therefore it is stated the bread of affliction, O and I teaching it must be that which may be eaten in grief and eat thus. This is excluded which is not eaten in grief, but only enjoy this is the view of our Jose the Galilean our Akiba said the repetition of unleavened bread, unleavened bread is an extension, if so what is taught by bread of affliction, O and I it excludes dough which was kneaded with wine oil or honey, what is our Akiba's reason is then lehem bread of O and I grief written surely on the poverty is written and our Jose the Galilean do we then read it on surely we read it O and I and our Akiba the fact that we Read it O'Nai is explained as Samuel's dictum for Samuel said bread of O'Nai means bread over which many words are recited on and yet does our Akiva hold that dough which was kneaded with wine oil or honey is not fit surely it was taught dough must not be kneaded on Passover with wine oil or honey and if one did need it our Gamaliel said it must be burnt immediately while the sages say it may be eaten now our Akiva related I was staying one Passover with our Eliezer and our Joshua and I needed dough for them with wine oil or honey and they said nothing to me and though one may not need yet one may smooth the surface with them this is according to the first tenet but the sages maintain with that with which one may need one may smooth while with that with which one may not need one may not smooth and they all agree that dough may not be needed with lukewarm water there is no difficulty the one refers to the first day of the festival the other to the second day of the festival. As our Joshua believe I said to his sons for the first day do not need it for me with milk from and onwards need it for me with milk but it was taught dough must not be needed with milk and if one does need it the whole loaf is forbidden because it leads to sin rather he said this for the first day do not need it for me with honey from and onwards need it for me with honey alternatively I can say after all it means with milk but as Rubin said when made like the eye of an ox it is permitted so here too it was like the eye of an ox and they all agree that dough may not be needed with lukewarm water why is it different from meal offerings for we learned all meal offerings are needed with lukewarm water and he the official in charge guards them that they should not become in connection with the eating of unleavened bread on the night of Passover leaven if this was said of very careful men priests shall it also be said of those who are not careful if so let it also be permitted to wash the grain. Why did Arzera say in the name of Rabbi Jeremiah in Samuel's name that we for meal offerings must not be washed? The kneading was done by careful men, but the washing would not be done by careful men. Yet must the kneading be done by careful men? Priests, surely it is written, and he shall bring it to Aaron's sons the priests, and he shall take thereof his handful from the taking of the handful, and onwards is the duty of the priest who this teaches. Concerning the pouring of oil and the mixing, that it is valid when done by any man. The kneading granted that it is not done by careful men, yet it is done in the place of careful men. For a master said the mixing is valid if done by a lay Israelite, but if done without the wall as of the temple court, it is invalid. Thus this excludes washing, which is not done by careful men, nor in the place of careful men. And wherein do they all other meal offerings differ from the meal offering of? The Omer for it was taught the meal offering of the Omer is washed and heaped up the public offering is different our rabbis taught you might think that a man discharges his duty with first fruits therefore it is stated in all your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread teaching it must be unleavened bread which is eaten in all your habitations thus excluding first fruits which may not be eaten in all your habitations save in Jerusalem alone this is the view of our Jose the Galilean R. Akiba said unleavened bread and bitter herbs are assimilated just as bitter herbs which are not first fruits are required so unleavened bread which is not first fruits must be eaten if so just as bitter herbs of a species not subject to first fruits are required so unleavened bread of a species of grain not subject to first fruits is meant Talmud, Mas Pesachim B and I will thus exclude wheat and barley which species are subject to first fruits hence the repetition unleavened. Bread unleavened bread is stated as an extension if the repetition unleavened bread unleavened bread is an extension then even first fruits too may be included are Akiba retracted for it was taught you might think that a man can discharge his obligation with first fruits therefore it is stated in all your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread teaching it must be unleavened bread which is eaten in all your habitations thus excluding first fruits which may not be eaten in all your habitations save in Jerusalem alone you might think that I exclude second tithe too but the repetition unleavened bread unleavened bread is stated as an extension but what reason do you see to include second tithe and exclude first fruits I include second tithe because it can be permitted to be eaten in all habitations in accordance with our Eliezer and I exclude first fruits for which there is no permission in all habitations for our Eliezer said once do we know in the case of second Tithe that became defiled that we can redeem it even in Jerusalem from the verse when thou art not able seo to bear it now sef can only refer to eating as it is said and he took and sent mazoth messes unto them from before him now whom do you know to maintain that he fulfills his obligation with second tithe or akiba yet he excludes first fruits through the phrase in all your habitations this proves that he retracted and our jose the galilean let him deduce it from the phrase that bread of affliction o and i implying that which can be eaten in grief thus excluding this sc first fruits which can be eaten only in rejoicing he holds as our simeon for it was taught first fruits are forbidden to in one and but our simeon permits and what is the reason of the rabbis because it is written thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn nor the heat offering of thy hand and the master said the heat offering of the room with thy hand means first fruits thus first fruits are assimilated to tithe just as tithe is forbidden to in one and so are first fruits forbidden to in one and our Simeon the divine law designated them terima hence they are like terima just as terima is permitted to in one and so are first fruits permitted to in one and now our Simeon granted that he does not accept the hitish yet rejoicing is nevertheless written in connection therewith for it is written and thou shalt rejoice in all the good etc that comes for the time of rejoicing for we learn from Pentecost until the festival of tabernacles he the Israelite brings the first fruits and recites the confession between the festival and Hanukkah he brings the first fruits but does not recite the confession our rabbis taught bread of poverty this excludes Hala and Ashish and cake you might think that a man can discharge his obligation only with coarse bread therefore the repetition unleavened bread unleavened bread is stated as an extension intimating even if it is like the unleavened bread of Solomon if so why is bread of poverty stated to exclude halal and pancakes and where is it implied that this word ashishah denotes something of value because it is written and he dealt among all the people even among the whole multitude of Israel both to men and women to ever
In private and who is in our holy teacher what is meant by a thick bread bread in large quantity and why is it called a thick bread because it is much in needing alternatively in the locality of this tan of bread in large quantity is called thick bread then what is the reason if because he takes unnecessary trouble why particularly on Passover even on any other festival too it is forbidden that indeed is so but this tan was engaged on the festival of Passover it was taught likewise. Beth Shammai maintain one may not bake thick bread on a festival while Beth Hillel permitted our rabbis taught you discharge your obligation with fine bread with coarse bread and with Syrian cakes shaped in figures although they the sages said Syrian cakes shaped in figures must not be made on Passover Rab Judah said this thing Boethus Bezod and asked the sages why was it said that Syrian cakes shaped in figures must not be made on Passover said they to him because a woman would carry over it and cause it to turn leaven but he objected it is possible to make it in a mold which would form it without delay then it shall be said replied they that all Syrian cakes shaped in figures are forbidden but the Syrian cakes of Boethus are permitted our Eliezer Bezod said I once followed my father into the house of Argamaliel and they placed before him Syrian cakes shaped in figures on Passover said I father did not the sages say thus one may not make Syrian cakes shaped in figures on Passover, my son, he replied, they did not speak of the cakes of all people, but only of those of bakers. Others say, he said thus to him, they did not speak of those of bakers, but only of those of private people. Our Jose said, one may make Syrian cakes like wafers, but one may not make Syrian cakes like rolls. We learned elsewhere, sponge cakes, honey cakes, paste balls, cakes made in a mold and mixed dough are exempt from halal. What are cakes made in a mold? Said our Joshua B. Levi, that is halal of private people. Rush said, these are prepared in adults, while our Yohan and maintain those which are prepared in adults are liable to hell, but these are exempt because they were prepared in the sun. An objection is raised, sponge cakes, honey cakes, and paste balls, if prepared in adults, they are liable to hell. If in the sun they are exempt, this is a refutation of our Simeon B. Lakish said, well, our Simeon B. Lakish can answer you the case we treat of here is where he first heated it. Built and then place the dough in it, but what is the law if he first place the dough and then heated it? Are they indeed exempt? Then instead of teaching in the second closet prepared in the sun, they are exempt. Let him draw a distinction in that itself and teach when is that e.g. if he heated it and then place the dough, but if he first place the dough and then heated it, they are exempt. There is a lacuna in this teaching, and it was thus taught when is that if he heated it. And then place the dough, but if he first for the shape to be exactly right and so may take too long over it, but private people are not so particular, place the dough and then heated it, it becomes as though he prepared it in the sun and they are exempt. Come and here you discharge your duty with partially baked unleavened bread and unleavened bread which was prepared in adults here too. It means that he first heats it and then places the dough what is partially baked unleavened bread. Said Rab Judah in Samuel's name, whatever can be broken without threads dragging from it, Rabbi said, and the same rule applies to loaves of the thanks offering that is obvious. Bread is written here, and bread is written there. You might say, since it is written, and he shall offer one Talmud, Moss Pesachim, be out of each oblation, one intimating that he should not take a broken off piece, whereas here it is as broken off, therefore he informs us that it is not so. An objection is raised to Meisa. Beth Shammai exempted from Halal, while Beth Hillel hold it liable there to the Halal of Beth Shammai hold it liable to Halal, while Beth Hillel exempted, which is Meisa, and which is Halal of Meisa, is flour poured over boiling water, Halal is boiling water poured over flour, Arishmael B. R. Jose ruled in his father's name that both are exempt, others state that both are liable, but the sages maintain both the one and the other if prepared in adults, each is exempt in an oven. Each is liable now according to the first Tanover and does Meisa differ from Halad said Rab Judah and Samuel's name and thus did our Yohan and others state our Joshua believe I say just as there is a controversy in respect of the one so is there a controversy in respect of the other and they the two clauses are contradictory he who learned the one not having learned the other now it is at all events taught but the sages maintain both the one and the other if prepared in adults each is exempt in and of an each is liable which is a refutation of our Yohan and our Yohan can answer you it is dependent on Tanaim for it was taught you might think that Meisa and Halad are liable to Halad therefore bread is stated our Judah said not is bread save that which is baked in oven now our Judah is identical with the first Tana hence surely they differ over that which is prepared in adults the first Tana holds that which is prepared in adults is liable while our Judah holds that which is Prepared in an oven is exempt. No, all agree that what is prepared in an oven is exempt, but they differ here. E.g., where he rebaked it in an oven. The first tana holding that since he rebaked it in an oven, it is called bread. While our Judah holds not is bread, save that which is baked in an oven from the very beginning. And since this was not baked in an oven from the very beginning, we do not call it bread. Rabbi said, "What is our Judah's reason? Because it is written, 'Ten women shall bake your bread.' In one oven, bread which is baked in one oven is called bread, but that which is not baked in one oven is not called bread." Rabbi and our Joseph were sitting behind our Zera, and our Zera was sitting in front of Ola. Said Rabbi to our Zera, "Ask Ola, what if he placed the dough within and boiled it up from without? What shall I ask him?" He replied, "For if I ask him, he will say to me that then is the very preparation of an altar." Joseph then said to our Zera, "Ask Ola, what if he placed the dough inside?" And the flame is opposite. What shall I ask him? He replied, For if I ask him, he will reply, Most poor people do this. R.C. said, Dough of second tithe according to our Meir is exempt from Hala. According to the rabbis, it is liable to Hala Talmud. Mos Pesach is to unleavened bread of second tithe. According to our Meir, a man cannot discharge his obligation therewith on Passover. According to the sages, a man can discharge his obligation therewith on Passover with regard to a citron of second tithe. According to our Meir, he cannot discharge his obligation therewith on the festival. According to the sages, a man can discharge his obligation therewith on the festival. Our Papa demurred as for dough, it is well because it is written of the first of your dough, implying of your own a citron too is likewise for it is written, and ye shall take unto yourselves, implying it shall be of your own. But as for unleavened bread is then your unleavened bread written, said Rob, other state are. Yamar be me the meaning of bread here is derived from bread elsewhere here it is written the bread of affliction while there it is written then it shall be that when ye eat of the bread of the land ye shall offer up an heap offering unto the Lord of the first of your dough etc just as there it means of your own so here too it must be of your own shall we say that the following supports him dough of second tithe is exempt from hell this is the view of our Meir but the sages maintain it is liable you say shall we say that this supports him this is the identical statement this is what he says shall we say that since they differ in the case of dough they differ in respect to those two or perhaps it is different there because your dough your dough is written twice our Simeon be like can a man discharge his obligation with the hell of second tithe in Jerusalem on the view of our Jose the Galilean there is no problem seeing that he does not fulfill his obligation with Holland, can there be a question about its hell? Your question arises on the view of our Akiva. Is it only with Holland that he can discharge his obligation? Because if it is defiled, it is permitted in all habitations. But with Hell, which if defiled is not permitted in all the habitations and is consigned to the fire, he cannot discharge his obligation. Or perhaps we say, since if he had not designated it with the name of Hell and it became defiled, it would be permitted in all the habitations and he could discharge his obligation there with then now too he can discharge his obligation with it. Other state, this is certainly no question for we certainly say, since your question arises in respect of Hell, which was bought with the money of second tithe. Now on the view of the rabbis, there is no question for since they say that it is to be redeemed, it is identical with the tithe itself. Your question arises on the view of our Judah, who said it must be very for we. Learned if that which was bought with second tithe money was defiled, it must be redeemed. Our Judah said it must be very due. We say since if it were not purchased, and since if he had not designated it with the name of second tithe and it became defiled, it would be permitted in all habitations, and he could discharge his duty therewith. He can therefore discharge his duty therewith now too, or perhaps we say one since, but we do not say since twice. Said Rabbi, it is logical that the name of tithe is one of unleavened loaves of the thanks offering and the wafers of a Nazi right, etc. Once do we know it? Said Rabbi, because Scripture saith Talmud,
They might not be eaten in all habitations, said Reshlakish. This proves that the loaves of the thanks offering and the wafers of the Nazi right could be eaten in Nob and Gibeon. It was taught RILA. I said, I asked RILA how about a man discharging his obligation with the loaves of the thanks offering and the wafers of a Nazi right? I have not heard replied he, so I went and asked it before our Joshua said he to me, surely the sages said as to the unleavened loaves of the thanks offering. And the wafers of a Nazi right, if he made them for himself, he cannot discharge his obligation with them. If to sell in the market, he can discharge his obligation with them. When I went and discussed the matter before our Eliezer, he said to me, By the covenant, these are the very words which were stated to Moses at Sinai. Others state by the covenant, are these the very words which were stated to Moses at Sinai, and is not a reason required. And what is the reason, said Rebel, whatever is for market, he may change his mind about it. And he says, If it is sold, it is sold. If it will not be sold, I will discharge my duty with it. Talmud, Mos Pesachim, Amisha, and these are the herbs with which a man discharges his obligation on Passover with lettuce, Hazareth, with TAMKA, with HARHABINA, with endive, and with maror. The law is complied with by eating them both moist, fresh, and dry, but not preserved in vinegar, nor stewed, nor boiled, and they combine to the size of an olive. You can discharge your obligation with their stock S and with Dima and with first tithe the Teramah which has been separated and with Hippish and second tithe which have been redeemed Gemara HAZEREH is Hasselatus ULSHIN is Hindi and Dives Tampa Rebel B Barhana said it is called Demak HARHABINA or Simeon B Lakish said it is the creeper of the palm tree and with Maror Maria Tabar Kapur taught these are the herbs with which a man discharges his obligation. On Passover with endives with Tampa with Harhal and with Harhabanan and with lettuce are Judah said also with wild field endives and with garden endives and with lettuce garden endives and lettuce but that is taught in the first section this is what he says wild endives too are like garden endives and lettuce are Meir said also with Aspaz and Tura and Maryar Ar said are Jose to him Aspaz and Tura are one and Mar Zero are the school of Samuel taught these are the herbs with which a man. Discharges his obligation on Passover with lettuce with endives with Tampa with Harbin and with Harjanan and with Heart of Anamar Judah said Hazarethil and Thistles and Willow Lettuce too are like the Mar Judah said in Arlazer's name Arkablin too but I went about to all his SC Arlazer's disciples and sought a companion but did not find one but when I came before Arlazer B Jacob he agreed with my words Ar Judah said whatever plant which contains an acrid pungent sap are Yohanan B Berica. Said any plant the leaves of which look faded bleached others say every bitter herb contains an acrid sap and its leaves are faded Ar Yohanan said from the words of all of them we may learn that every bitter herb contains an acrid sap and its leaves are faded Ar Huna said the Halachadis as the others Robin have found Araha son of Rob going in search of Mary said he to him what is in your mind that it is more bitter but we learned HAZERETH and the school of Samuel taught Hazareth. While Arashai said the obligation is properly fulfilled with Hazareth and Rabba said what is Hazareth Hassel what does Hassel symbolize that the merciful one had pity has upon us further our Samuel B. Naman said in our Jonathan's name why were the Egyptians compared to Merah to teach you just as this Merah the beginning of which is soft while its end is hard so were the Egyptians their beginning was soft mild but their end was hard cruel then I retract he replied our Rehumi said to Abihau. Do you know that this Merah means a kind of herb say that it is the gall of Kufi it is like unleavened bread just as unleavened bread is a product of the earth so Merah means a product of the earth and say it is heard of it is like unleavened bread just as unleavened bread is a species of plant so Merah means a species of plant and say it is harzapu it must be like unleavened bread just as unleavened bread is that which can be bought with second tithe money so Merah is that which can be. Bought with second tithe money, Rabbi son of Arhanin said to Abay, say that Mara means one herb, Mara plural is written, and say that Mara means two, it is like unleavened bread, just as unleavened bread can be of many species, so can Mara be of many species. Rabbi son of Arhanin said in Rab's name regarding the herbs whereof the sages ruled that a man can discharge his duty with them on Passover, they all may be sown in one garden, bed is this to say that they are not forbidden. On account of Kilim, Rabbi objected lettuce and willow lettuce garden endives and wild endives garden leeks and wild leeks garden coriander and wild coriander mustard and Egyptian mustard and the Egyptian gourd and the bitter gourd, all these are not Kilim with one another, thus only lettuce with willow lettuce but not lettuce with endives, and should you answer, they are all taught together, surely Rab said he teaches them in peers, what did Rab mean by they are sown, they are sown. According to their law, you say according to their law, but we already learned in Talmud, Mos Pesachim B.A. garden bed, which is six handbreadth square, may be sown with five species of seeds, four on the four sides of the bed, and one in the middle. You might say that this applies only to seed cereals, but not to vegetables. Therefore, he informs us otherwise. Shall we then say that vegetables are stronger than seeds? But surely we learned all species of seeds may not be sown in one garden bed. Together, yet all species of vegetables, herbs may be sown in one seed bed. You might say this merit is a species of seed cereal, hence he informs us that it is not so. You say seeds, can you think so? But surely we learned herbs, and Barkapur also taught herbs, and the school of Samuel also taught herbs. He needs to state it about lettuce, I might argue, since it is destined to harden, we must allow it more space, for did not our Jose B. Our Hannah say if the cabbage stock hardens. More room is given to it up to a bathrobe, but this proves that since it is destined to harden, we allow it more space, so here too we should give it more space, hence he informs us otherwise the law is complied with by eating them both moist, fresh, or dry, etc. Arista said they learned this only of the stock, but in the case of the leaves, only moist, fresh ones, but not dry ones, but since a later clause states with their stock, it follows that the first clause refers to leaves that clause. Indeed, gives an explanation when does he the tanda teach both moist and dry in reference to the stock, an objection is raised, one can discharge the obligation with them and their stocks both moist and dry. This is our mayor's view, but the sages maintain one can discharge the obligation with moist, fresh ones, but one cannot discharge the obligation with dry ones, and they agree that one can discharge the obligation with them when withered, but not when preserved, stewed, or boiled. This is the general principle of the matter, whatever has the taste of marrow, one can discharge the obligation with it, but whatever does not possess the taste of marrow, one cannot discharge the obligation with it. Explain it as referring to the stock our rabbis taught, one cannot discharge the obligation with them when withered in the name of our Eliezer B. Arzadik. It was said, one can discharge the obligation with them when withered. Rami Biham asked, how about a man discharging his obligation with? Second tithe marrow in Jerusalem on our Akiva's view, there is no question seeing that he discharges his obligation there within the case of unleavened bread, the tithing of which is enjoined by scripture. Need you ask about marrow, which is only rabbinical? The question arises on the view of our Jose the Galilean, what then is it only with unleavened bread, which is tithed by scriptural law, that he cannot discharge his obligation, but with marrow, which is tithed by rabbinical law only he? Discharges his obligation, or perhaps whatever measure the rabbis enacted, they enacted it similar to a scriptural law. Said Rabbi, it is logical that unleavened bread and marrow are assimilated. Mishnah one may not soak bran for fowls, but one may scald it. A woman may not soak bran to take with her to the baths, but she may rub it on her skin, and a man may not chew wheat and place it on his wound because it turns leaven. G E M A R A. Our rabbis taught these are the things which cannot come to fermentation. That which is baked boiled, and that which is scalded, having been scalded in boiling water, that which is boiled, but while it is being boiled, it turns leaven. Said our Papa, he means baked mazah, which was then boiled. It was taught our Jose B. Our Judah said flour into which there fell a dripping of water, even all day does not come to fermentation. Said our Papa, provided that it acted drop after drop. The school of our Sheila said what is permitted, but it was taught what is forbidden. There is no difficulty here, it is such as is prepared with oil and salt, there it is prepared with water and salt. Marzitra said a man must not line a pot with flour of roast grain lest it had not been properly baked, and it comes to leaven. Our Joseph said a man must not scald Talmud, Mos Pesachim, two grains
which is hard said Arnaman to him he who will eat Abba will eat moldy bread for surely the household of Arhuna washed it and the household of Rabbi Abin washed it but Rabbi said it is forbidden to wash wheat but what of what was taught you may not wash barley on Passover implying barley only may not be washed but wheat is permitted he leads to a climax it is unnecessary to teach about wheat for since it has splits the water enters it but barley which is smooth I would say that it is allowable therefore he informs us otherwise subsequently Rabbi said it is permitted to wash wheat for it was taught one can discharge the obligation with fine bread and with coarse bread now fine bread is impossible without washing the grain our papa raised an objection against Rabbi with regard to the flowers and fine meals of Gentiles those of villages are clean while those of towns are unclean what is the reason that those of villages are clean is it not because they do not wash the grain yet he calls it fine meal explained this as referring to flour after he robbed departed he or papa said to himself why did I not cite him an objection from what our said in our Jeremiah's name and Samuel's name the wheat for meal offerings must not be washed yet he calls it fine meal subsequently Rabbah said it is obligatory to wash the grain for it is said and yet shall guard the unleavened bread now if not that it requires washing for what purpose is the guarding of guarding for the needing the guarding of needing is not guarding for our who not said the dose of a heathen a man may fill his stomach with them providing that he eats as much as an olive of unleavened bread at the end thus only at the end but not at the beginning what is the reason because he had not afforded it any guarding then let him guard it from the baking and onwards hence this surely proves that we require guarding from the beginning yet whence does this follow perhaps it is different there because when guarding became necessary he did not guard it but where he did guard it when guarding became necessary it may indeed be that the guarding at the needing is truly considered guarding yet even so Rabbah did not retract for he said to those who handle sheep handle them for the purpose of the precept this proves that he holds that we require guarding of an issue from beginning to end Mar the son of Rabbah Talmud, Mos Pesachim be his mother stored grain for him in a trophy. Certain ship of grain foundered in Hishta whereupon Rabbah gave permission to sell the grain to Gentiles Rabbah Bilwai raised an objection against Rabbah with regard to a garment wherein Kalim is lost he must not sell it to a Gentile nor may he make a saddle cloth for an ass but it may be made into shrouds for a corpse what is the reason that it may not be sold to a Gentile surely it is because he might resell it to an Israelite subsequently Rabbah said let them sell it to Israelites. Cab at a time so that it should be consumed before Passover. Our rabbis taught one may not mash a dish on Passover, and he who wishes to mash must put in the flour and then add the vinegar. But some say he may even put in the vinegar first and then add the flour. Who is some say said are his dot it is our Judah. For we learned in the case of a stew pot or a boiling pot which he removed seeding from the fire, he must not put spices therein, but he arhan reads for the sake of unleavened bread, i.e. take care that no water falls on them and do not store them in a damp place. May put spices into a dish or a tureen. Our Judah said he may put spices into anything except what contains vinegar or brine. Yet let us establish it as our Jose, for it was taught our Jose said he can soak them in vinegar and the vinegar binds them. We know our Jose to rule us only when it is by itself, but not when it is in a mixture. Allah said both the one and the other are forbidden because go go thou not right say we take it. Most devious root, but approach not the vineyard. Our papa permitted the stewards of the house of the Reshalita to mash a dish with parched grains. Said Rabbah, is there anyone who permits such a thing in a place where slaves are found? Others say Rabbah himself mashed a dish with parched grains. Mishnah flour may not be put into Haroseth or into the mustard, and if he did put it, it must be eaten immediately. But our Meir forbids it. One may not boil the Passover sacrifice neither in liquids nor in fruit juice, but one may baste and dip it in the water used by a baker must be poured out because it promotes fermentation contents as long as they are seething cause any condiments put therein to boil. Likewise, this of course is forbidden on the Sabbath. Kamara Arkahana said the controversy is about putting flour into mustard, but if it was put into Haroseth, all agree that it must be burnt immediately, and it was taught likewise flour must not be put into Haroseth, and if he did put it. Must be burnt immediately if put into mustard. Our said it must be burnt immediately, but the sages rule it must be eaten immediately. Arhuna the son of Rab Judah said in Arnaman's name and Samuel's name the Halachah is as the words of the sages said Arnaman be Isaac to Arhuna the son of Rab Judah Talmud. Mas Pesachim, do you say it in reference to Haroseth or do you say it in reference to mustard? What is the practical difference? Ask he in respect to Arkahana's dictum for Arkahana. Said the controversy is about putting flour into mustard, but if it was put into Haroseth, all agree that it must be burnt immediately. I have not heard it. He replied to him as if to say, I do not agree with it. Or Ashi said logic supports Arkahana's and Samuel said the Halachah is not as our Jose surely then since it vinegar does not bind it does indeed cause fermentation. No, perhaps it neither binds nor promotes fermentation. One may not boil, etc. Our rabbis taught eat not of it wrong or boiled. At all with water I only know that it may not be boiled in water once do we know it of other liquids you can answer it follows a minor if water which does not impart its taste is forbidden then other liquids which impart their taste how much with these liquids when it is being roasted and the roasted meat may be dipped into liquids at the time of eating more so rabbi said with water I only know it of water once do we know it of other liquids because it is stated nor boiled at all implying in all cases wherein do they differ they differ in respect of that which is roasted in a pot and the rabbis how do they utilize this phrase nor boiled at all they employ it for what was taught if he boiled it and then roasted it or roasted it and then boiled it he is liable as for if he boiled it and then roasted it he is liable that is well seeing that he boiled it but if he roasted it and then boiled it surely it is roast with fire why then is he liable said Arkhanavit. Author of this is our Jose for it was taught the law is complied with by eating an unleavened wafer that is soaked or boiled but not dissolved. This is a view of our Meir. Our Jose said the law is complied with by eating a wafer that is soaked but not with one that is boiled even if not dissolved. Ola said you may even say that it agrees with our Meir here it is different because scripture saith nor boiled at all implying in all cases our rabbis taught you might think that if you roasted it as much as it needs he should be liable therefore it is stated eat not of it semi roast nor boiled at all with water semi roast or boiled did I forbid thee but not that which is roasted as much as it needs how is that men said our ashi that he rendered it charred meat our rabbis taught you might think that if he ate as much as an olive of raw meat he should be liable therefore it is stated eat not of it semi roast na nor boiled at all with water semi roast and boiled did I forbid thee but not well, you might think that it is permitted, therefore it is stated, but roast with fire. How is N.A. understood? Said Rabbis, that which the Persians call Varnamar Hista said, he who cooks food in the hot springs of Tiberias on the Sabbath is not culpable. If he boiled the Passover sacrifice in the hot springs of Tiberias, he is culpable. Wherein does the Sabbath differ that he is not culpable because we require the product of fire which is absent, then in respect to the Passover sacrifice to it is not a product of fire. Said Rabbah, what is the meaning of his statement? He is culpable that he transgresses on account of thou shalt not eat, but roast with fire. Our high son of our Nathan recited the dictum of Arhista explicitly. Thus, Arhista said, he who cooks in the hot springs of Tiberias on the Sabbath is not culpable, but if he boiled the Passover sacrifice in the hot springs of Tiberias, he is culpable because he transgressed on account of but roast with fire. Rabbah said, if he ate it. Semi roast Talmud, Mas Pesachim be he is flagellated twice if he ate it, boiled he is flagellated twice if he ate semi roast and boiled he is flagellated thrice. Abbe said we do not flagellate on account of an implied prohibition. Some maintain he is not indeed flagellated twice, but he is nevertheless flagellated once. Others say he is not even flagellated once because scripture does not particularize its interdict like the interdict of Muslim Rabbah said if he a Nazi right ate the husk of grapes he is flagellated twice if he ate the kernel he is flagellated twice for the husk and the kernel he is flagellated thrice. Abbe maintained we do not flagellate on account of an implied prohibition. Some say he is indeed not flagellated twice, but he is nevertheless flagellated once. Others maintain he is not even flagellated once because scripture does not particularize its interdict
Not subject to the commander rise and eat roast. He is not subject to eat not of it. Semi roast rabbi said I could read Bashal why is Mabushal stated too for I might think I only know it where he boiled it after nightfall. Whence do we know it if he boiled it during the day? Therefore it is stated Bashal Mabushal implying in all cases but rabbi has utilized this Bashal Mabushal in respect of flesh roast head in a pot and flesh boiled in other liquids. If so let scripture say either. Bashal Bashal or Mabushal Mabushal why Bashal Mabushal hence you infer two things from it. Our rabbis taught if he ate roast Paschal offering during the day he is culpable and if he ate as much as an olive of semi roast after nightfall he is culpable thus he teaches roast similar to half roast just as semi roast after nightfall is interdicted by a negative injunction so is roast before nightfall subject to a negative injunction as for half roast it is well it is written eat not. Of its semi roast, but whence do we know the negative injunction for roast? Because it is written, and they shall eat the flesh in that night only at night, but not by day. But this is a negative injunction deduced by implication from an affirmative command, and every negative injunction deduced by implication from an affirmative command is technically an affirmative command. Said Aristotle, the author of this Talmud, Mas Pesachim is rabbi, for it was taught either a bullet or a lamb that hath anything superfluous or lacking in its parts that mayest thou offer for a free will offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted that thou mayest dedicate for the temple repair, but thou mayest not dedicate unblemished animals for the temple repair. Hence it was said, whoever dedicates unblemished animals for the temple repair transgresses an affirmative precept. I only know that he transgresses an affirmative precept. Whence do we know that he transgresses also a negative injunction? Because it is stated and the Lord spake unto Moses saying Lemur this teaches concerning the whole section that it is subject to a negative injunction this is our Judas view Rabbi asked Barkipur how does that imply it said he to him because it is written Lemur not low was stated in these matters the school of Rabbi interpreted Lemur a negative injunction low was stated the water used by a baker etc one bury the taught you must pour it out on a slope but you may not pour it out on broken ground while another bury the taught you may pour it out on broken ground there is no difficulty here it means that if the water is abundant so that it collects there it means that it is not abundant so that it does not collect Rabbi Judah said a woman must eat unleavened bread only with water which was kept overnight our men had taught this in a public lecture at Papini on the morrow all took their pictures and repaired to him and demanded of him give us water said he to them I meant with water which has been kept overnight Rabbi lectured a woman may not need in the sun nor with water heated by the sun nor with water collected from the cauldron and she must not remove her hand from the oven until she has finished all the bread and she requires two vessels one with which she moistens the dough and the other wherein she cools her hands is now being discussed as likewise the same superscription in VIQV the scholars asked what if she transgressed and needed in warm water Marzitra said the bread is permitted or as she said it is forbidden Marzitra said once do I know it because it was taught one may not wash barley on Passover and if one did wash them if they split they are forbidden if they did not split they are permitted but or as she says will you weave all these things in one web where it was stated it was stated and where it was not stated it was not stated C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I-I mission now the following things must be removed on Passover. Babylonian Qutami and Biri Dumian vinegar Egyptians of them the dyers brought cook stow and the scribes paste our Eliezer said women's ornaments too this is the general rule whatever is of the species of corn must be removed on Passover these are subject to a warning but they do not involve Karath Gemara our rabbis taught three things were said of Babylonian Qutai it closes up the heart blinds the eyes and emaciates the body it closes up the heart on account of the way of milk and it blinds the eyes on account of the salt and it emaciates the body on account of the stale crust our rabbis taught three things increase one's motion bend the stature and take away a five hundredth part of a man's eyesight they are these coarse black bread new beer and raw vegetables our rabbis taught three things decrease one's motion straighten the stature and give light to the eyes these are the white bread fat meat and old wine white bread Talmud Mas Pesachim be a fine meal fat meat of a goat which was not opened old wine very old everything that is beneficial for the one is harmful for the other and what is harmful for one is beneficial for the other save moist stench along peppers white bread fat meat and old wine which are beneficial for the whole body meat and beer because barley water is mixed into it edomian vinegar because barley is cast into it arnam and bi isaac said in former times when they used to bring wine libations from judah the wine of judah did not turn vinegar unless barley was put into it and they used to call it simply vinegar but now the wine of the edomians does not turn vinegar until barley is put into it and it is called edomian vinegar in fulfillment of what is said tyre hath said against jerusalem i shall be replenished now that she is laid waste if one is full flourishing the other is desolate and if the other is full the first is desolate arnam and bi isaac quoted this and the one people shall be stronger than the other people it was Taught Arjuna said originally he who bought vinegar from an MHRS did not need to tithe it because it was a presumption that it was produced from not but to med, but now he who buys vinegar from an MHRS must tithe it. Now does Arjuna hold that to med is not liable to tithing, but we learned he who makes to med pouring water on by measure and then he finds the same quantity is exempt from tithing, but Arjuna declares him liable. This is what he says the MHRS were not under suspicion in connection with to med. Alternatively, they were under suspicion, yet there is no difficulty. The one refers to to med made with the straining bag, the other refers to to med made of kernels and Egyptians of them. What is Egyptians of the Marjos have learned a concoction made of a third part barley, a third part safflower, and a third part salt. Our papa omitted barley and substituted wheat, and your token is saying they soaked them these ingredients, then roasted them, ground them, and then drank. Them from the Passover sacrifice until Pentecost, they who are constipated are relieved, while they who are dire are bound before an invalid and a pregnant woman. It is dangerous and dire's broth here. It is explained brand water with which Laka is primed and cooks dough. Elofi dough made of corn less than a third grown, which she places on the mouth of the pot and it absorbs the froth and scribes paste. Here it is explained shoemakers paste. Our Shimei Opozi said it is a toilet paste used by the daughters of rich men, of which they leave some for the daughters of poor men, but that is not so for our high taught. There are four commodities of general use and three manufacturing commodities. Now, if you say that it is a toilet paste used by the daughters of rich men, what manufacturing commodities are there? What then it is shoemakers paste? Then why does he call it scribes paste? He should say cobbler's paste. Said Arashai to him in truth, it is shoemakers paste. Yet why? Does he call it scribes paste because scribes too stick their paper ruses together with it? Or Eliezer said women's ornaments too, etc. Women's ornaments can you think so? Rather say women's cosmetics too. For Rab Judah said in Rab's name as to the daughters of Israel Talmud, Mas Pesachim who have attained maturity but have not attained their years. The daughters of poor men plaster them. The unwanted hairs with lime. The daughters of wealthy men plaster them with fine flour while royal princesses. With oil of myrrh as it is written six months with oil of myrrh. What is oil of myrrh? Arhuna be Jeremiah said Sakath Jeremiah be Abba said oil of olives which were not a through grown. It was taught Arjuna said and pecan is oil of olives which were not a through grown. And why do women rub it in their skin because it removes the hair and rejuvenates the skin? This is the general rule. Whatever is of the species of corn it was taught Arjuna said. Now since we learned whatever is of the species of Corn must be removed on Passover. Why did the sages enumerate these so that fine flour and wealthy women give believings to their poorer sisters, the daughters of scribes who were generally poor? One should be familiar with them and with their names. As it once happened that a certain Palestinian visited Babylonia, he had meat with him and he said to them, His host, bring me a relish. He then heard them saying, Take him, Kutah. As soon as he heard Kutah, he abstained. These are subject to a warning. Which Tana holds that real leaven of corn in a mixture and spoiled leaven in its natural condition is subject to a negative injunction, said Rab Judah in Rab's name. It is Armaeir, for it was taught Esir must be burnt and he may give it to his dog and he who eats it is punished by forty lashes. Now this is self contradictory. You say Esir must be burnt. This proves that it is forbidden for use and it is stated and he may give it to his dog, which proves that it is permitted for use. This is it's meaning SIRI what is SIR according to our mayor
In accordance with Rab Judah Yeshali, nothing leavened this is to include Babylonian Qutah and Median beer and Edomian vinegar and Egyptians of them. You might think that the penalty is Karath, therefore it is stated for whosoever eat that which is leavened shall be cut off for real leaven of corn. There is a penalty of Karath, but for the mixture of it you are subject to a negative injunction. Now whom do you know to maintain that for the mixture of it you are subject to a negative injunction? It is Aralizer, yet he does not state spoiled leaven in its natural state. This proves that Aralizer does not hold that spoiled leaven is subject to a negative injunction. Now Aralizer, once does he know that the mixture of it involves a negative injunction because it is written Yeshali, yeah, nothing leavened, if so let him the offender be liable to Karath, that real leaven in a mixture is more stringent leaven than spoiled leaven in its natural state too, since it is written. For whosoever eat that which is leavened shall be cut off. He requires that for what was taught, ye shall eat nothing leavened. I only know that it is forbidden where it turned leaven of itself if it fermented through the agency of another substance. How do we know it? Because it is stated for whosoever eat that which is leavened shall be cut off. If so, the teaching of the negative injunction too comes for this purpose. Rather, our Eliezer's reason is that he deduces from whosoever, but there too whosoever is written, he requires that to include women, but women are deduced from Rab Judah's dictum in Rab's name. For Rab Judah said in Rab's name and the school of our Ishmael taught likewise when a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit the writ assimilated woman to man in respect of all the penalties which are decreed in the Torah, it is necessary Talmud, Mos Pesachim B. You might argue since it is written, thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it seven days shalt thou. Eat unleavened bread there with whoever is subject to arise. Eat unleavened bread is subject to thou shalt eat no leavened bread. Hence these women, since they are not subject to arise, eat unleavened bread because it is an affirmative precept limited to time. I would say that they are also not subject to thou shalt eat no leavened bread. Hence it the verse informs us otherwise. And now that they have been included in the injunction of thou shalt eat no leavened bread, they are also included in respect of eating unleavened bread in accordance with our Eliezer. For our Eliezer said women are subject to the precept of eating unleavened bread by the law of scripture. For it is said thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread there with whoever is subject to thou shalt eat no leavened bread is subject to the eating of unleavened bread. And these women, since they are subject to the injunction of thou shalt eat no leavened bread, are also subject to. Arise eat unleavened bread and why do you prefer to assume that this whosoever is to include women while you exclude its mixture say that it is to include the mixture it is logical that when treating of eaters scripture includes eaters but when treating of eaters shall it include things which are eaten to this are Nathan the father of our who not then wherever scripture treats of eaters does it not include things eaten surely it was taught for whosoever eat the fat halab of it. Beast of which men present an offering made by fire to the Lord even the soul that eat that shall be cut off from his people I only know it of the halab of unblemished animals which are fit to be offered as sacrifices whence do we know it of the halab of blemished animals therefore it is stated of the beast whence do we know it of the halab of Holland because it is stated for whosoever thus here though scripture treats of eaters yet it includes things eaten since there are no eaters. There to be included it includes things eaten here however that there are eaters to be included he cannot abandon eaters and include things eaten now as to the rabbis who do not accept the view that a negative injunction is violated through a mixture they do not interpret whosoever as an extension but then how do they know that women are liable to correct they do not interpret whosoever as an extension but they do interpret for whosoever as such then according to our Eliezer say that whosoever is to include women for whosoever is to include the mixture of leaven and should you answer our Eliezer does not interpret for whosoever as an additional extension surely it was taught for ye shall not burn any leaven as an offering made by fire unto the Lord I only know it of the whole of it once do I know even part of it because any coal is stated once do we know that its mixture is forbidden because it is stated for any key coal whom do you know to interpret coal as any extension our Eliezer and he also interprets for any key coal this is indeed a difficulty our Abab said in our Yohanan's name in all the prohibitions of the Torah a permitted commodity does not combine with the prohibited commodity except in the case of the prohibitions of a Nazi right for lo the Torah said any infusion of grapes while Z-E-I-R-I said also ye shall not burn any leaven with whom does disagree with our Eliezer who interprets coal if so Talmud, Mos Pesachim in the matter of leaven too that indeed is so yet this is to reject the ruling of Abbe who said there is burning on the altar in respect of less than an olive therefore he informs us that there is no burning for less than an olive Ardimi sat and reported this discussion said Abbe to Ardimi and in all other prohibitions of the Torah does not a permitted commodity combine with the prohibited commodity surely we learned if the might pay is of terima, while the garlic and the oil are of Hullen and a tibul yam touched part of it he disqualifies all of it if the might pay is of hullen while the garlic and the oil is of terima and a tibul yam touches part of it he disqualifies only the place which he touches now we pondered thereon why is the place where he touches unfit surely the seasoning is nullified in the greater quantity and rabbi barhan answered what is the reason because a lay israelite is flagellated on its account for eating as much as an olive how is that conceivable is it not because the permitted commodity combines with the forbidden commodity no what does as much as an olive mean that there is as much as an olive within the time of eating half a loaf is then as much as an olive within the time of eating half a loaf a scriptural standard yes he answered him if so why do the rabbis disagree with our Eliezer in reference to babylonian Qutah? what then the reason is because the permitted commodity combines with the prohibited commodity then after all why do the rabbis differ from our Eliezer in the matter of Babylonian Qutah but leave Babylonian Qutah alone because it does not contain as much as an olive within the eating of half a loaf or if it is eaten in its natural state so that he gulps it down and eats it we disregard such a fancy as being exceptional while if he dips bread into it and eats it it does not contain as much as an olive within the time of eating half a loaf he raised all objection against him if there are two. Stew pots one of Hullen and the other of Terimah and in front of them are two mortars one containing condiments of Hullen and the other containing Terimah and the latter fell into the former they are permitted for I assume the Terimah fell into the Terimah and the Hullen fell into the Hullen now if you say that as much as an olive within the time of eating half a loaf is a biblical standard why do we say for I assume the Terimah etc leave the Terimah of condiments alone he replied. Which is only rabbinical, he raised an objection against him if there are two baskets, one containing Holland and the other containing Terima, and in front of them are two SEI of provisions, one of Holland and the other of Terima, and these fell into those they are permitted for. I assume the Holland fell into Holland and the Terima fell into the Terima. Now, if you say that as much as an olive within the eating of half a loaf is a scriptural standard, why do we say because I assume, etc.? Leave the Terima set aside, Qutah, there is as much as an olive of leaven, and for that he should be liable at the present time, he answered him, which is only rabbinical. Now, does this law of the infusion of grapes come for this purpose? It is required for what was taught in infusion Talmud, Mos Pesachim B. This is to intimate that the taste is as the substance itself, so that if he the Nazi writes steep grapes in water and it possesses the taste of wine, he is culpable from this, you may draw. A conclusion for the whole Torah for if a Nazi right whose prohibition is not a permanent prohibition and his prohibition is not a prohibition of general use and there is a release for his prohibition yet scripture made the taste tantamount to the substance in his case then he the prohibition of which is a permanent prohibition and whose prohibition is a prohibition of general use and there is no release from its prohibition is it not logical that the taste should be treated as tantamount to the substance itself and the same applies to Orla by two arguments the authority for this is the rabbis which are Yohanan stated his ruling in accordance with our Akiva which ruling of our Akiva is alluded to shall we say our Akiva of our Mishnah for we learned our Akiva said if a Nazi right soaked his bread in wine and it contains sufficient to combine as much as an olive he is culpable but once do you know that he means sufficient of the bread and the wine perhaps he means of the wine alone, and should you say if of the wine alone, why stated he informs us thus he is culpable, although it is a mixture, rather it is our Akiva of the very though for it was taught our Akiva said if a Nazi right soaked his bread in wine and ate as
tantamount to the substance itself from this you may draw a conclusion for the whole Torah that according to our Akiba 2 let us say an infusion this is to intimate that the permitted commodity combines with the forbidden commodity from this you may draw a conclusion for the whole Torah said he to him Talmud, Mas Pesachim because a Nazi right and a sin offering are two verses with the same teaching and they do not illumine other cases a Nazi right that which we have stated what is the reference to the sin offering for it was taught whatsoever shall touch in the flesh thereof shall be holy you might think even if it did not absorb of the flesh of the sin offering therefore it is stated in the flesh thereof only when it absorbs in the flesh shall be holy to be as itself so that if it the sin offering is unfit that which touches it becomes unfit while if it is fit that may be eaten only in accordance with its stringencies anything that dieth of itself nibble it out. May give it unto the stranger hence whatever is fit for a stranger is designated nibble but what is unfit is not designated nibble in the sense that if it imparts a deteriorating flavor it does not render the food forbidden then according to the rabbis to let a Nazi right and a sin offering be two verses with the same teaching and they do not illumine other cases they can answer these are indeed both necessary and are akiba how are they both necessary it is well to say that if it Merciful one wrote it in respect to a sin offering the case of a Nazi right could not be derived from it because we cannot derive Holland from sacred sacrifices but let the merciful one write it in respect to a Nazi right and then the sin offering would come and be derived from it seeing that all the prohibitions of the Torah are learned from a Nazi right but the rabbis can answer you they both are indeed required the sin offering to show that the permitted combines with the forbidden while Holland cannot be deduced from sacred sacrifices and an infusion to intimate that the taste is as the substance itself and from this you may draw a conclusion for the whole Torah but our Akiba maintains both are required for teaching that the permitted combines with the forbidden so that they are two verses with the same teaching and all instances of two verses with the same teaching do not illumine other cases are as she said to our Kahana then as to what was taught all the days of his Nazi right ship shall he eat nothing that is made of the grapevine from the husks to the kernels. This teaches concerning a Nazarite's prohibited commodities that they combine with each other, seeing that according to our Akiva, even the forbidden with the permitted combine is it necessary to state the forbidden with the forbidden said he to him the forbidden with the permitted combine only when eaten together the forbidden with the forbidden even when eaten consecutively which absorbs some of it. Thus here too the permitted flesh combines with the forbidden and all is regarded as forbidden mission with regard to the dough in the cracks of the kneading trough. If there is as much as an olive in one place he is bound to remove it, but if not it is nullified through the smallness of its quantity and it is likewise in the matter of uncle and as if he objects to it it interposes but if he desires its preservation it is like a kneading trough. Rab Judah said in Samuel's name. They learned this only of a place where the dough does not serve for reinforcing the trough but where it serves for reinforcing it he is not bound to remove it hence it follows that where there is less than an olive even if it does serve for reinforcing it he is not obliged to remove it others recited in reference to the second clause but if not it is nullified through the smallness of its quantity said Rab Judah in Samuel's name they learned this only where it serves for reinforcing the trough but where it does not serve for reinforcing it he is bound to remove it hence it follows that if there is as much as an olive even where it serves for reinforcing it he is bound to remove it it was taught as the former version it was taught as the latter version it was taught as the former version dough in the cracks of the kneading trough where it serves for reinforcing it does not interpose and he its owner does not transgress but if it is in a place where it does not serve for reinforcing it interposes and he transgresses when is the said where there is as much as an olive but if there is less than an olive even where it does not serve for reinforcing it does not interpose and he does not transgress again it was taught as the latter version dough in the cracks of a kneading trough where it serves for reinforcing Talmud, Mas Pesachim B it does not interpose and he does not transgress if it is in a place where it does not serve for reinforcing it interposes and he transgresses when is the said when there is less than an olive but if there is as much as an olive even in a place where it serves for reinforcing it interposes and he transgresses then these are contradictory said are who not elite the more lenient bereta in favor of the more stringent are Joseph said you quote Tanaim at random this is a controversy of Tanaim for it was taught if a loaf went moldy he is bound to remove it because it is fit to crumble and leaven many other those with it are Simeon B. Eliezer said when is the said if it is kept for eating but a mass of se or which he put aside for sitting he has nullified it now since our Simeon B. Eliezer said he has nullified it it follows that the first tanda holds that he has not nullified it this proves that he holds wherever there is as much as an olive even if he nullifies it it is not nullified said Abbe to him you have reconciled it where there is as much as an olive yet have you reconciled it where there is less than an olive rather both the one and the other are the rulings of our Simeon B. Eliezer yet there is no difficulty one is taught where it is in the place of needing the other where it is not in the place of needing our ashi said do not assume that not in the place of needing means on the back of the trough only but it means even on the upper rim of the trough that is obvious you might say it sometimes splashes up and reaches their hands he informs us otherwise our nomin said in Rab's name the Halachah is as Arsimian B. Eliezer yet that is not so for our Isaac B. Ashi said in Rab's name if he plastered its surface with clay he has nullified it thus only if he plastered it but not if he did not plaster it he who recited this did not recite that other state Arnaman said in Rab's name the Halachah is not as Arsimian B. Eliezer for our Isaac B. Ashi said in Rab's name if he plastered its surface with clay he has nullified it etc. Arnaman said in Samuel's name if there are two half olives and a thread of dough joining them we see wherever if the thread were taken up these would be carried with it he is bound to remove them but if not he is not bound to remove them said well this was said only of dough in a kneading trough but if they are in the house he is bound to remove them what is the reason because he may sometimes sweep them and they will fall together Allah said they asked in the West Palestine what of a room and an upper story what of a room and the entrance hall what of two rooms one within the other the question stand our rabbis taught if a loaf went moldy and it became unfit for human consumption yet a dog can eat it it can be defiled with the uncleanness of eatables if the size of an egg and it may be burnt together with an unclean loaf on Passover in our Nathan's name it was ruled it cannot be defiled as an eatable with whom agrees the following which we learned the general principle was stated in respect to the laws of ritual cleanness whatever is set aside for human consumption is unclean until it becomes unfit for a dog to eat with whom does this agree it is not in accordance with our Nathan our rabbis taught with regard to the trough of tanners into which he put flour if within three days before Passover he is bound to remove it if before three days he is not bound to remove it said our Nathan when is the said if he did not put hides into it but if he put hides into it even if it is within three Days he is not bound to remove the flower. Rabbi said the halachah is as our Nathan, even if it is one day and even one hour before Passover, and it is likewise in respect to Uncle Anas. If he objects to it, it interposes. But if he desires its preservation, it is like the kneading trough. How compare there? The matter is dependent on the quantity of the dough, whereas here the matter is dependent on his objecting to it. Said Rabbi Judah. Say, but in respect to uncleanness, it is not so. Said Abay. To him, but he states, and it is likewise in respect to Uncle Anas. Rather, said Abay, he means it thus, and it is likewise Talmud. Mas Pesachim in respect to combining for Uncle Anas on Passover, whereas during the rest of the year there is a distinction. How is that? E.g., if there are eatables less than an egg in quantity, and they were in contact with this dough on Passover, when its prohibition renders the dough important, it combines. But during the rest of the year, when the matter is dependent. On his objecting if he objects to it it combines while if he desires its preservation it is like the kneading trough to this rabbi demur does he then teach it combines surely he teaches it interposes rather said rabbi the meaning is and it is likewise in respect to cleaning the kneading trough how is that eg if this kneading trough became unclean and he wishes to immerse it on passover when its interdict renders it important it interposes and the immersion is not efficacious for it but during the rest of the year the matter is dependent on his objecting if he objects to it interposes while if he desires its preservation it is like the kneading trough to this our papa demur does he teach and it is likewise in respect to cleanness surely he teaches and it is likewise in respect to uncle Anas. rather said our papa the
These if he tanned them or trod on them to the extent of tanning are clean accepting a man's skin and how much is the extent of tanning said are able in our Jenna's name the extent of walking four mils are Jose son of Arhanna said they learned this only about going on ahead but as for going back he need not return even a mil said Araha and from this we deduce it is only a mil that he need not go back but less than a mil he must go back Mishnah how do we separate Hala on the festival from Doe which is in a state of uncle and Esar Elizer said it must not be designated with the name of Hala until it is baked the son of Bathura said let it the dough be cast into cold water said Joshua Talmud Mas Pesachim be now this is eleven concerning which we are warned with the injunctions it shall not be seen and it shall not be found but he separates it and leaves it until the evening and if it ferments it ferments Gemara shall we say that they differ in respect of Good will benefit our Elizer holding good will benefit is considered money while our Joshua holds good will benefit is not money no all hold that good will benefit is not money but here they differ in respect to since for our Elizer holds we say since if he desires he can have it sc the designation of Hala revoked it is his property while our Joshua holds we do not say since it was stated with regard to one who bakes food on a festival for consumption on a weekday our his said he is flagellated Rabbi said he is not flagellated our his said he is flagellated we do not say since if guests visited him it would be fit for him on the festival itself Rabbi said he is not flagellated we say since said Rabbi to our his according to you who maintain we do not say since how may we bake on a festival for the Sabbath on account of the Arab of dishes he answered him and on account of an Arab of dishes we permit a biblical prohibition said he to him by biblical law Requirements of the Sabbath may be prepared on a festival and it was only the rabbis who forbade it lest it be said you may bake on a festival even for weekdays but since the rabbis necessitated an Arab of dishes for it he has a distinguishing feature he rabbi raised on objection against him in the case of an animal at the point of death he must not slaughter it save when there is time to eat as much as an olive of it roast before night thus it states when he is able to eat thereof. That is even if he does not wish to eat now according to me who maintain that we say since it is well since if he desires to eat he is able to eat for that reason he may slaughter but according to you who maintain we do not say since why may he slaughter said he to him on account of the loss of his money and on account of the loss of his money we permit a biblical prohibition yes he replied on account of the loss of his money he determined in his heart to eat as much as an olive and as much as an olive of flesh is impossible to obtain without slaughtering. He rabbi raised an objection against him. The shoe bread Talmud, Mas Pesachim, is eaten on the ninth, the tenth, or the eleventh day, neither earlier nor later. How so? Normally it is eaten on the ninth day. It is baked on the eve of the Sabbath and eaten on the Sabbath of the following week, which is on the ninth. If the festival occurred on the eve of the Sabbath, it is eaten on the Sabbath on the tenth. If the two festival days of New Year occurred before the Sabbath, it is eaten on the Sabbath on the eleventh day, because if the baking of the shoe bread does not override either the Sabbath or the festival. Now, if you say that the requirements of the Sabbath may be prepared on a festival, why does it not override the festival? Said he to him, near Shabbat they permitted a distant Shabbat. They did not permit that, according to our Simeon Gamaliel, who said on the authority of our Simeon, the son of the Seganet. Overrides the festival but it does not override the fast day what is to be said they differ in this one master holds they permitted a near shabbat but a distant shabbat they did not permit while the other master holds a distant shabbat too they permitted armari raised an objection the two loaves are eaten neither less than two days after baking nor more than three days after baking how so they were baked on the eve of the festival and eaten on the festival i.e. on the second day if the festival fell after the sabbath they are eaten on the festival on the third day because if the baking does not override either the sabbath or the festival but if you say that the requirements of the sabbath may be prepared on the festival seeing that those of the sabbath are permitted on the festival is there a question about those of the festival on the festival there it is different because scripture says save that which every man must eat that only may be done for you for you but not for the most high then according to our Simeon B. Gamaliel who said on the authority of our Simeon the son of the Seekin it overrides the festival what is there to be said he holds as Abbasal who interpreted for you but not for Gentiles are his da sent to by the hand of our son of our but do we say since surely we learned one may plow one furrow and be culpable for it on account of eight negative injunctions thus he who plows with an ox and an ass together which are sacred and the furrow consists of Kilim in a vineyard Talmud, Mas Pesachim B and it is the seventh year on a festival and he is a priest and a Nazi right while this furrow is in unclean ground now if we say since let him not be liable for plowing on the festival since it is fit for covering the blood of the bird said our Papa B. Samuel the reference is to smooth round stones but they are fit for crushing is then crushing permitted on the festival but they are fit for crushing in an Unusual matter the reference is to rocky ground is then rocky ground capable of being sown it is rocky ground above but powdered loose earth beneath then deduce it that he is not culpable because of the loose earth but said mar the soil of our ashi the reference is to clay earth and is clay earth capable of being sown it refers to swampy earth have raised an objection against him he who cooks the thigh sinew on a festival and eats it is flagellated five times he is flagellated on account of cooking the sinew on a festival he is flagellated on account of eating the sinew he is flagellated for cooking meat and milk he is flagellated for eating meat cooked in milk and he is flagellated on account of lighting a fire but if we say since let him not be liable on account of lighting since it is fit for him for his legitimate needs said he to him omit lighting and substitute the thigh sinew of an but our high taught he is flagellated twice for his eating and thrice for his cooking now, if this is correct, he should say thrice for his eating, rather omit lighting and substitute the wood of muksa and his muksa is scriptural interdict. Yes, he replied, for it is written, and it shall come to pass on the sixth day that they shall prepare that which they bring in, and its warning injunction is learned from here. This from thou shalt not do any manner of work, said he to him, but it was you who said he asked of our his to others, state I asked of our Huna, what if he brought a lamb from the meadow and slaughtered it as a continual burnt offering on a festival, and you said to us, he answered me, it is written, and a lamb implying, but not a firstling one, but not the tithe of the flock. This is to exclude a palgis Talmud, Mos Pesachim out of the two hundred, i.e., out of the residue of the two hundred which was left in the vault once we learned that Orla is nullified in an excess of two hundred from the well watered pastures of Israel from that which is. Permitted to Israel, hence it was said one may not bring drink offerings from people you might think he must not bring them from Muksa either than say just as Tebal is distinguished in that its intrinsic prohibition causes it so everything whose intrinsic prohibition causes it may not be used thus Muksa is excluded because not its intrinsic prohibition causes it but a prohibition of something else causes it now if you say that the prohibition of Muksa is scriptural what does it matter? Whether it is an intrinsic prohibition or a prohibition through something else moreover it was you who said there is separation of labors on the Sabbath but there is not separation of labors on a festival rather delete lighting and substitute the wood of the Asherah while its warning injunction is learned from here is and there shall cleave not of the accursed thing to thy hand Araha son of Rabba said to Abay then let him be flagellated on account of and thou shalt not bring in. Abomination into thy house to rather delete lighting and substitute the wood of Hippish while the warning is learned from here, and ye shall burn their asher and with fire ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Rami Bihama said this controversy of our Hista and Rabbah is the controversy of our Elizer and our Joshua for our Elizer holds. We say since while our Joshua holds, we do not say since said our Papa yet perhaps our Elizer rules that we say since they're only because when they go into the oven each one is fit for himself, but here that it is fit for visitors only, but it is not fit for himself. Perhaps it is indeed the fact that we do not say since our Shisha son of our Edi said yet perhaps it is not so our Joshua may rule that we do not say since only there where there is one Mazah that is not fit either for himself or for visitors, but here that it is at least fit for visitors. Perhaps it is indeed the fact that we say since the Rabbis reported this Rami Bihama statement. Before our Jeremiah and our Zerah, our Jeremiah accepted it, our Zerah did not accept it, said our Jeremiah to our Zerah, a matter which has been a continual difficulty to us for many years, is wherein do our Elizer and our Joshua differ now that it has been explained
Be reversed, but it was taught our Ishmael son of our Yohanan be Barakah said in the case of wheat three labs and in the case of barley four calves there is no difficulty one refers to inferior corn the other to superior corn our Papa observed this proves for wheat is more inferior to good wheat than poor barley is inferior to good barley for whereas there there is a difference of a third year there is a difference of a quarter rab said a cab of Melika is the standard for Passover and it is. Likewise in respect of halibut we learn Talmud, Mas Pesachim be slightly more than five quarters of flour are subject to halibut this is what he says a cab of Melika too is the equivalent of this quantity our Joseph said our women are accustomed to bake a kapaza at a time on Passover said Abbe to him what is your intention to be stricter but it is strictness which leads to unwarranted leniency as the woman exempts it from halibut said he they do as our Eliezer for we learned our Eliezer. Said if he removes loaves from the oven and places them in the basket, the basket combines them in respect of Halibur on Rab Judah said in Samuel's name the Halachah is as our Eliezer said he to him, but it was stated thereon our Joshua B. Levi said they taught this only of Babylonian loaves which cleave to each other but not of Cracknells. Surely it was stated thereon our Hannah said even Cracknells are Jeremiah asked what of a board which has no ledges do we require the inside of a vessel which is absent here or perhaps we require the air space of a vessel which is present. The question stands it was taught our Eliezer said the basket only combines them our Joshua said the oven combines them our Simeon B. Gamaliel said Babylonian loaves which cleave to each other combine mission our Gamaliel said three women may need at the same time and bake in one oven one after the other but the sages rule three women may be engaged on dough at the same time one needing another shaping and the third baking are. Akiba said not all women and not all kinds of wood and not all ovens are alike this is the general principle if it the dough rises let her wet it with cold water Gemara our rabbis taught having needed the dough she forms it in shape while her companion needs in her place having formed the dough she bakes it and her companion shapes the dough in her place while the third woman needs the first having baked she needs again and her companion bakes in her place while the third shapes her dough and thus the round revolves as long as they are engaged in working on the dough it does not come to fermentation our Akiba said not all women etc it was taught our Akiba said I discussed the matter before our Gamaliel let our master teach us does this refer to energetic women or to women who are not energetic to damp wood or to dry wood to a hot oven or to a cool oven said he to me you have not else save what the sages learned if it rises let her wet it with cold water Mission S I R must be burnt while he who eats it is not culpable. Siddiq must be burnt while he who eats it on Passover. I S liable to Kareth. What I S I R when there are lines on the surface like locusts torn. Siddiq is when the cracks have intermingled with each other. This is the view of our Judah. But the sages maintain regarding the one and the other he who eats it is liable to Kareth. And what I S S I R when its surface is blanched like the face of a man whose hair is standing on end. Gemara our rabbis taught what is S I R P whenever its surface is blanched like the face of a man whose hair is standing on end. Siddiq is when there are lines on the surface like locusts torn. This is our Meir's view. But the sages maintain what is S I R when the lines on its surface are like locusts torn. Siddiq is when the cracks have intermingled with each other. And in both cases he who eats it is liable to Kareth. But we learned S I R must be burnt while he who eats it is not culpable. This is a view of our Judah say according to our Meir in both cases he who eats it incurs Karath Rabbah said what is our Meir's reason there is not a single crack on the surface for which there are not many cracks below the surface Talmud, Mas Pesachim Amishnah if the 14th of Nisan falls on the Sabbath everything must be removed before the Sabbath this is our Meir's view while the sages maintain IT must be removed at its usual time our Eliezer Bezotic said Terimah must be removed before the Sabbath and Holland at its usual time Gemara it was taught our Eliezer Bezotic said my father once spent a week in Yevna when the 14th fell on the Sabbath and there came Zonin our Gamaliel's deputy and announced the time has come to remove the leaven and I followed my father and we removed the leaven Mishnah he who on his way to slaughter his Passover sacrifice or to circumcise his son or to dine at a betrothal feast at the house of his father-in-law and recollects that he has leaven at Home if he is able to go back remove IT and then return to his religious duty he must go back and remove IT but if not he annuls it in his heart if he is on his way to save people from heathens or from a river or from brigands or from a fire or from a collapse of a building he annuls it in his heart but if to appoint a Sabbath station for a voluntary secular purpose he must return immediately similarly he who went out of Jerusalem and recollected that he had holy flesh with him. If he has passed Scopus he burns it where he is but if not he returns and burns it in front of the temple with the wood of the altar pile and for what quantity must they return our Meir said for both when there is as much as an egg our Judah said for both when there is as much as an olive but the sages rule holy flesh the standard is as much as an olive while love and the standard is as much as an egg but the following contradicts it he who is on his way to partake of a betrothal feast. In his father-in-law's house or to appoint a Sabbath station for a voluntary purpose must return immediately said our Yohan and there is no difficulty one is according to our Judah the other is according to our Jose for it was taught the betrothal feast is a voluntary function this is our Judah's view our Jose said it is a religious function but now that our Hisda said the controversy is in respect of the second feast but in respect to the first feast all agree that it is a religious function you may even say that both are according to our Judah yet there is no difficulty one refers to the first feast while the other refers to the second feast it was taught our Judah said I have heard only of the betrothal feast but not of the feast in connection with his spousal gifts said our Jose to him I have heard of both the feast of betrothal and that of his spousal gifts it was taught our Simeon said every feast which is not in connection with a religious deed a scholar must derive no enjoyment. Thereof what for instance said our Yohanan e.g. the feast at the betrothal of the daughter of a priest to an Israelite or the daughter of a scholar to an ignoramus for our Yohanan said if the daughter of a priest marries an Israelite their union will not be auspicious what is it said our Hista she will be either a widow or a divorced woman or she will have no seed children in a very that it was taught he will bury her or she will bury him or she will reduce him to poverty but that is not so for our Yohanan said he who desires to become wealthy let him cleave to the seed of Aaron for it is all the more that the Torah and the priesthood will enrich them there is no difficulty one refers to a scholar the other refers to an Amhar as our Joshua married a priest's daughter falling sick he said Aaron is not pleased that I should cleave to his seed and possess a son-in-law like myself or E.D.B. Abin married a priest's daughter and there came forth from him two ordained sons are Son of Aridi and our Joshua the son of Aridi our Papa said had I not married a priest's daughter I would not have become wealthy our Kahana said had I not married a priest's daughter I had not gone into exile said they to him but you were exiled to a place of learning I was not exiled as people are generally exiled our Isaac said whoever partakes of a secular feast eventually goes into exile for it is said and yet that eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall and it is written therefore now shall they go captive at the head of them that go captive our rabbis taught every scholar who feasts much in every place eventually destroys his home widows his wife orphans his young forgets his learning and becomes involved in many quarrels his words are unheeded and he desecrates the name of heaven and the name of his teacher and the name of his father and he causes an evil name for himself his children and his children's children until the end of time what is it? Said Abbe, he is called the heater of ovens. Rabbah said a tavern dancer. Our Papa said a plate liquor. Our Shemaya said a folder of garments and a man who lies down to sleep. Our Rabbis taught let a man always sell all he has and marry the daughter of a scholar. For if he dies or goes into exile, he is assured that his children will be scholars. But let him not marry the daughter of an Amhiras. For if he dies or goes into exile, his children will be Amhiras. Our Rabbis taught let a man always sell all he has and marry the daughter of a scholar and marry his daughter to a scholar. This may be compared to the grafting of grapes of a vine with grapes of a vine, which is a seemly and acceptable thing. But let him not marry the daughter of an Amhiras. This may be compared to the grafting of grapes of a vine with berries of a thorn bush, which is a repulsive Talmud. Mas Pesachim be an unacceptable thing. Our Rabbis taught let a man always sell all he has and marry the daughter of a Scholar, if he does
More for the life of his companions are Samuel B. Naman he said in Aryohan and name one Matir and Amharas like a fish said our Samuel B. Isaac and this means along his back it was taught our Akiba said when I was in Amharas I said I would that I had a scholar before me and I would maul him like an ass said his disciples to him Rabbi say like a dog the former bites and breaks the bones while the latter bites but does not break the bones he answered them it was taught our Matir used to say whoever marries his daughter to an Amharas is as though he bound and laid her before a lion just as a lion tears his prey and devours it and has no shame so an Amharas strikes and cohabits and has no shame it was taught our Elizer said but that we are necessary to them for trade they would kill us our high taught whoever studies the Torah in front of an Amharas is as though he cohabited with his betrothed in his presence for it is said Moses commanded us a lion inheritance more of it. Congregation of Jacob read not more shop of me or is of the betrothed greater is the hatred wherewith the Amharas hate the scholar than the hatred wherewith the heathens hate Israel and their wives hate even more than they it was taught he who has studied and then abandoned the Torah hates the scholar more than all of them our rabbis taught six things were said of the Amharas we do not commit testimony to them we do not accept testimony from them we do not reveal a secret to them we do not appoint them as guardians for orphans we do not appoint them stewards over charity funds and we must not join their company on the road some say we do not proclaim their losses too and the first ten of virtuous seed may sometimes issue from him and they will enjoy it as it is said he will prepare it and the just shall put it on similarly he who went out of etc shall we say that our Meir holds only as much as an egg is of importance whereas our Judah holds even as much as an olive too is of importance but the following contradicts it for what minimum quantity must they recite grace in common until as much as an olive are Judah said until as much as an egg said are Johan and the discussion must be reversed Abbe said after all you need not reverse it there they differ in the interpretation of scriptural verses whereas here they differ in the matter of logic there they differ in the interpretation of verses our Meir holds and thou shalt eat this refers to eating and be satisfied this means drinking and eating is constituted by as much as an olive while our Judah holds and thou shalt eat and be satisfied implies eating in which there is satisfaction of one's hunger and what is that as much as an egg here they differ in the matter of logic for our Meir holds its return is like its defilement just as its defilement requires as much as an egg so does its return require as much as an egg while our Judah holds its return Talmud Mos Pesachim is like its Prohibition just as its prohibition is for as much as an olive so its return is for as much as an olive it was taught our Nathan said both have the standard of two eggs but the sages did not agree with him and it shall come to pass in that day that there shall not be light but heavy clouds yet rot and thick we keep on what does yet rot we keep on mean said our Eliezer this means the light which is precious yucker in this world is yet of little account kapu in the next world are Yohanan. Said this refers to Nagaim and Ahalith which are difficult heavy in this world yet shall be light easily understood in the future world while our Joshua be Levi said this refers to the people who are honored in this world but will be lightly esteemed in the next world as was the case of our Joseph the son of our Joshua be Levi who became ill and fell into a trance when he recovered his father asked him what did you see I saw a topsy turvy world he replied the upper class underneath and it Lower on top he replied my son he observed you saw a clear world and how are we situated there just as we are here so are we there and I heard them saying happy is he who comes hither with his learning in his hand and I also heard them saying those martyred by the state no man can stand within their barrier who are these martyrs shall we say our Akiba and his companions is that because they were martyrs of the state and nothing else rather he meant the martyrs of Lydda in that day. There shall be upon the bells of the horses Mazilith Hayas US holy unto the Lord what does Mazilith Hayas US intimate said our Joshua be Levi the Holy One blessed be he is destined to add to Jerusalem as far as a horse can run and cast its shadow mazel under itself our Eliezer said all the bells which are hung on a horse between its eyes shall be holy unto the Lord while our Yohanan said all the spoil which Israel shall take spoil from morning until a horse can run and cast its shadow under itself shall be holy unto the Lord as for him who explains it as referring to all the spoil which Israel shall take spoil it is well hence it is written and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the basins before the altar but according to those who give the other two explanations what is the relevance of and the pots in the Lord's house shall be etc the verse states another thing is that Israel will become wealthy make votive offerings and bring them to the temple as for him who says that it means spoil it is well that is what is written and in that day there shall be no more trafficker in the house of the Lord of hosts but according to those who give the other two explanations what does and there shall be no more trafficker keen on etc means said our Jeremiah no poor man shall be here and how do we know interdict the passage describing the death of great scholars ten in number is found in the liturgies for the day of atonement and the fast of some of the most famous of them were our Gamaliel, our Judah, be Baba, and our Akiba, that Kenani connotes a merchant because it is written, and Judah saw there the daughter of a certain Canaanite. Kenani, what does Kenani mean? Shall we say literally a Canaanite? Is it possible that Abraham came and admonished Isaac? Isaac came and admonished Jacob, and then Judah went and married a Canaanite. Rather said, our Simeon, be like it means the daughter of a merchant, as it is written, as for the trafficker. Kenan, the balances of the sea are in his hand. Alternatively, I can quote this: whose merchants are princes, whose traffickers Kenani are the honorable of the earth, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day shall the Lord be one, and his name one is he. Then not one now said, our Ahab, and not like this world is the future world. In this world, for good tidings one says he is good, and he doth good, while for evil tidings he says, blessed be the true judge. Whereas in the Future world it shall be only he is good and he doth good and his name one what does one mean is then now his name not one said our nom and be Isaac not like this world is the future world in this world his name is written with a yachty and read as Allah Allah but in the future world it shall all be one it shall be written with yachty and read as yachty now Rabbah thought of lecturing it at the session whereupon a certain old man said to him it is written Eliel Amar Evan appointed out a contradiction it is written this is my name to be hidden and it is also written and this is my memorial unto all generations the holy one blessed be he said not as I I my name and written am I read I am written with a yachty while I am read as Allah Allah C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-B Mishnah where it is a custom to do work on the eve of Passover until midday one may do work where it is a custom not to do work one may not do work he who goes from a place where they work to a place where they do not work on from a place where they do not work to a place where they do work we lay upon him the restrictions of the place whence he departed and the restrictions of the place whither he has gone Talmud, Mos Pesachim B and a man must not act differently from local custom on account of the quarrels which would ensue similarly he who transports sabbatical year produce from a place where it has ceased to a place where it has not ceased or from a place where it has not ceased to a place where it has ceased is bound to remove it our Judah said do you two go out and bring produce for yourself tomorrow why particularly the eve of Passover even on the eve of Sabbaths and festivals too for it was taught he who does work on the eve of Sabbaths or festivals from Minha and onwards will never see a sign of blessing there it is forbidden only from Minha and onwards but not near to Minha whereas here it is forbidden from midday alternatively there he merely does not see a sign of Blessing yet we do not place him under the ban whereas here we even place him under the ban to turn to the main text he who does work on the eve of the Sabbath and on the eve of festivals from in high and onwards and at the termination of the Sabbath or at the termination of a festival or at the termination of the day of atonement or wherever there is the least suspicion of sin which is to include a public fast will never see the sign of a blessing our rabbis taught some are industrious and profit thereby while others are industrious and suffer loss some are indolent and profit thereby while others are indolent and suffer loss an industrious man who profits he who works the whole week but does not work on the eve of the Sabbath an industrious man who suffers loss he who works the whole week and works on the eve of the Sabbath an indolent man who profits he who does not work the whole week and does not work on the eve of the Sabbath an indolent man who suffers loss he who does not work the whole week but works on the eve of the Sabbath? Rabbi said as to these women of Mahusa, though they do not work on the eve of the Sabbath, it is because they are used to indulgence, indolence, seeing that they do not work every day either. Yet even so, we call them
Those who cut down beautiful trees and those who cast their eyes at the better portion will never see a sign of blessing. What is the reason? Because people gaze at them. Our rabbis taught for Baruchov never contain a sign of blessing. The wages of clerks, the wages of interpreters, the profits of orphans, and money that came from overseas countries. As for the wages of interpreters, that is well. The reason being because it looks like wages for Sabbath work, orphans' money too, because they are not capable of renunciation. Money which comes from overseas because a miracle does not occur every day. But what is the reason for the wages of writers? Said our Joshua B. Levi, the men of the great assembly observed twenty-four fasts so that those who write scrolls Tefillin and Mezuzoth should not become wealthy. For if they became wealthy, they would not write. Our rabbis taught those who write scrolls Tefillin and Mezuzoth, they are traders and their traders, traders and all who engage in trade in. Sacred commodities which includes the sellers of blue will never see a sign of blessing but if they engage therein for its own sake they do see a sign of blessing the citizens of Bashan were accustomed not to go from Tyre to Sidon on the eve of the Sabbath their children went to our Yohanan and said to him for our fathers this was possible for us it is impossible said he to them your fathers have already taken it upon themselves as it is said here my son the instruction of thy father and forsake not the teaching of thy mother the inhabitants of Jose were accustomed to separate halal on rice when they went and told it to our Joseph he said to them let a lay Israelite eat it in their presence have they raised an objection against him things which are permitted yet others treat them as forbidden Talmud Mos Pesachim you may not permit it in their presence said he to him yet was it not stated thereon our Hisdah said this refers to Kutians what is the reason in the case of Kutians? Because they confound one thing with another, then these people too being ignorant confound one thing with another. Rather, said our Ashi, we consider if most of them eat rice bread, a lay Israelite must not eat it. The hell in their presence, lest the law of hell be altogether forgotten by them. But if most of them eat cornbread, let a lay Israelite eat it in their presence, lest they come to separate hell from what is liable upon what is exempt and from what is exempt upon what is liable. It was stated in the text, things which are permitted, yet others treat them as forbidden. You may not permit it in their presence, said our Hisdah. This refers to Kutians, yet not to all people. Surely it was taught two brothers may bathe together, yet two brothers do not bathe together in Kabul. And it once happened that Judah and Hillel, the sons of Argamaliel, bathed together in Kabul, and the whole region criticized them, saying, We have never seen such a thing in all our days whereupon. Hillel slipped away and went to the outer chamber, but he was unwilling to tell them you are permitted to do this again. One may go out in slippers on the Sabbath, yet people do not go out in slippers in very and it once happened that Judah and Hillel, the sons of Argamaliel, went out in slippers on the Sabbath in very whereupon the whole district criticized them, saying, We have never seen such a thing in all our days, so they removed them and gave them to their non-Jewish servants, but they were unwilling to tell them you are permitted to wear these again. One may sit on the stools of Gentiles on the Sabbath, yet people do not sit on the stools of Gentiles on the Sabbath in Acho, and it once happened that Arsimian B. Gamaliel sat down on the stools of Gentiles on the Sabbath in Acho, and the whole district criticized him, saying, We have never seen such a thing in all our days. Accordingly he slipped down onto the ground, but he was unwilling to tell them you are permitted to do. This the people of the coastal region since rabbis are not common among them are like Kutians as for not sitting on Gentile stools that is well the reason being because it looks like engaging in buying and selling that they do not go out in slippers too is understandable lest they fall off and they come to carry them four cubits in the street but what is the reason that brothers do not bathe together as it was taught a man may bathe with all except with his father his father in law his mother's husband and his sister's husband but our Judah permits a man to bathe with his father on account of his father's honor and the same applies to his mother's husband and they the people of Kabul came and forbade it in the case of two brothers on account of bathing with his sister's husband it was taught a disciple must not bathe with his teacher but if his teacher needs him it is permitted when Rabbi Barhana came he ate of the stomach fat now are already elder and Rabbi son of Arhuna visited him as soon as he saw them he hid the fat from them when they narrated it to Abbe he said to them he has treated you like Kutians but does not Rabbi Barhan agree with what we learned we lay upon him the restrictions of the place whence he departed and the restrictions of the place whither he has gone said Abbe that is only when he goes from one town in Babylonia to another in Babylonia or from a town in Palestine to another in Palestine or from a town in Babylonia to another in Palestine but not when he goes from a place in Palestine to another in Babylonia for since we submit to them we do as they are as he said you may even say that this holds good when a man goes from Palestine to Babylonia this is however where it is not his intention to return but Rabbi Barhan had the intention of returning Rabbi Barhan said to his son my son do not eat this fat whether in my presence or not in my presence as for me who saw our Yohanan eat it, or Yohanan is sufficient in authority to rely upon in his presence and not in his presence, but you have not seen him eat it, therefore do not eat whether in my presence or not in my presence. Now one statement of his disagrees with another statement of his for Rabbi Barhana said, Our Yohanan B. Eliezer related to me. I once followed our Simeon son of our Jose B. Lekun into a kitchen garden Talmud, Mos Pesachim B. And he took the aftergrowth of the cabbage and ate it. And he gave some to me and said to me, My son, in my presence you may eat when not in my presence you may not eat it. I who saw our Simeon B. Yohei eat it, our Simeon B. Yohei is great enough to rely upon in his presence and not in his presence, but you may eat in my presence, but do not eat when not in my presence. What is this reference to our Simeon? For it was taught our Simeon said, All aftergrowths are forbidden except the aftergrowth of the cabbage because there is none like them among. The vegetables of the field, but the sages maintain all aftergrowths are forbidden. Now both state their views on the basis of our Akiva, for it was taught, Behold, we may not sow nor gather in our increase. Our Akiva said, Now since they do not sow, whence can they gather? Hence it follows that the aftergrowth is forbidden. Wherein do they differ? The rabbis hold, We preventively forbid the aftergrowth of cabbage on account of other aftergrowths in general, whereas our Simeon holds, We do not preventively forbid the aftergrowth of cabbage on account of other aftergrowths in general. He who goes from a place, etc. As for teaching, he who goes from a place where they do work to a place where they do not work, we lay upon him the restrictions of the place whither he has gone, and a man must not act differently on account of the quarrels that is well, and he must not work. But if he goes from a place where they do not work to a place where they do work, a man must not act differently because of the quarrels that is he is to work but you say we lay upon him the restriction or the place whither he has gone and the restrictions of the place whence he has departed said Abay it refers to the first clause Rabbi said after all it refers to the second clause but this is its meaning this does not come within the scope of differences which cause quarrels what will you say he who sees will say he regards work as forbidden no they will indeed say how many unemployed are there in the marketplace our Safra said to our Abba for instance I who know the art of fixing the new moon Talmud Mos Pesachim in inhabited places I do not work because it is a change which would lead to strife but how is it in the wilderness said he to him thus did our M I say in inhabited regions it is forbidden in the desert it is permitted our Nathan B Asia went from Rab's Academy in Surge upon on the second festival day of Pentecost whereupon our Joseph put him under the ban said Abay. To him yet let the master punish him with lashes said he to him I have treated him more severely for in the West Sea Palestine they take a vote for punishing a disciple with lashes yet they do not take a vote on the ban others say our Joseph had him lashed said Abay to him yet let the master ban him for Rab and Samuel both said we impose the ban for the violation of the two festival days of the diaspora said he to him that refers only to an ordinary person but here it is a scholar so I did. What was better for him for in the West they take a vote for punishing a disciple with lashes yet they do not take a vote on the ban similarly he who transports sabbatical year produce etc does then our Jude not accept what we learned we lay on him the restrictions of the place whence he departed and the restrictions of the place whither he has gone said our Shisha the son of our Edr Judah says a different thing and this is its meaning or from a place where it has not ceased to a place where it has not ceased and then he heard that it had ceased in his town he is bound to remove it our Judah said he can say do you two go out and procure produce for yourself
Rubin has said it enters into the controversy of the following Tanaim for we learned one may eat dates until the last Inzur is finished our Simeon be Gamaliel said Talmud, Mas Pesachim be one may eat in reliance on those that are among the upper overarching boughs but one may not eat in reliance on those that are among the single prickly branches we learned elsewhere there are three separate districts in respect of removal Judea, Transjordania and Galilee and there are three districts in each of them separately then why did they say there are only three districts in respect of removal because in each one they may eat until it the produce has ceased in the last region thereof once do we know it said our have a be in the name of our Jose be the scripture set and the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you and for the cattle and for the beasts that are in thy land as long as the wild beasts can eat in the field feed the cattle in the house when there is no more for the beasts in the field make an end of it for the cattle in the house and we have it on tradition that the beasts in Judea do not live on the produce of Galilee and the beasts in Galilee do not live on the produce of Judea our rabbis taught produce which went from the land abroad must be removed wherever it is our Simeon B. Eliezer said they must go back to their original place and be removed because it is said in thy land but you have utilized this red therein in the land in thy land. Alternatively it is deduced from that our Asher in thy land our Sapphire went from the land abroad and he had with him a barrel of wine of the Sabbath year now are who now the son of our Ika and our Kahana accompanied him he asked them is there anyone who has heard from our Abad whether the Halachah is as our Simeon B. Eliezer or not said our Kahana to him thus did our Abad say the Halachah is as our Simeon B. Eliezer are who now the son of our Ika however said to him thus did our Abad say the Halachah is not. As our Simeon B. Eliezer said, our Safra accept this ruling of Arhuna because he is meticulously careful to learn the laws from his teacher like Reuba Pumadai. The for Reuba said in Rab Judah's name, the Temple Mount consisted of a double colonnade, i.e., a colonnade within a colonnade. Thereupon, our Joseph applied to him, our Safra, the verse, My people ask counsel at their stock, and their staff, Makalo, declareth unto them, whoever is lenient, equal to him, to him, he concedes right, early cut down. Date berries of the sabbatical year, how might he do thus? The merciful one said, It shall be for food, but not for destruction, and should you answer that is only where it has reached the stage of fruit, but not where it has not reached the stage of fruit. Surely, our Naman said in Rabbi Abba's name, the calyxes of Orla are forbidden because they became a guard for the fruits. Now, when is it a guard for the fruits when they are unripe berries, yet he calls them fruits, our Naman ruled as are. Jose, for we learned our Jose said the berries of Orla in the budding stage Samadar are forbidden because they count as fruit whereas the rabbis disagree with him to this our Shammai of Nihardia demur yet do the rabbis disagree with our Jose in respect to other trees surely we learn from when may you not cut down trees in the sabbatical year Beth Shammai maintain all trees may not be cut down from when they bring forth but Beth Hillel rule the carob trees from when they form chains of carobs the vine trees Talmud, Mos Pesachim from when they form kernels olive trees from when they blossom and all other trees from when they bring forth now RC said thereon Bozer half ripe fruit gyro formation of kernels and the white bean are identical the white bean can you think so rather say its size is that of a white bean now whom do you know to maintain that Bozer is fruit but not Samadar the rabbis yet it is stated and all other trees from when they bring forth rather are I like cut down the shame our rabbis taught one may eat grapes of the sabbatical year until the espalier branches of oakal are finished if there are later ones than these one may eat in reliance on them one may eat olives until the last of tekoa is finished our Eliezer said until the last of gushalev is finished so that a poor man should go out and not find a quarter either on the branches or on the stem one may eat dry figs until the unripe figs which of beth are finished said our judah the unripe figs of beth were not mentioned except in connection with tithe for we learned the unripe figs of beth and the dates of tobanya are subject to tithe one may eat dates until the last inzor is finished our simeon b gamaliel said one may eat in reliance on those that are among the upper overarching branches but you may not eat in reliance on those that are among the single prickly branches but the following contradicts this one may eat grapes until passover olives until Pentecost dry fix until Hanukkah and dates until Purim now our BB said our Yohan and transposes the last two both are one the same limit alternatively surely it is explicitly taught if there are later ones than these one may eat in reliance on them it was taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel said an indication of mountainous country is the presence of mill an indication of valleys is palm trees an indication of streams is reeds an indication of lowlands is the sycamore tree and though there is no proof of the matter there is an allusion to the matter for it is said and the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones and cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the lowland for abundance an indication of mountainous country is the presence of mill an indication of valleys is palm trees the practical differences in respect of first fruits for we learn first fruits are not brought of any save the seven species nor of the palm trees in the highlands nor of it. Fruits in the valleys an indication of streams is reads the practical differences in respect of the rough valley of even an indication of lowlands is the sycamore tree the practical differences in respect of buying and selling now that you have arrived at this all the others two are in respect of buying and selling mission where it is the practice to sell small cattle to heathens one may sell where it is the practice not to sell one may not sell and in all places one may not sell large cattle to them nor calves or foals whether sound or maimed are due to permits in the case of a maimed one the son of a permitted in the case of a horse where it is a custom to eat roast meat on the night of passover one may eat it where it is a custom not to eat it one may not eat it tomorrow rab judah said in rab's name a man is forbidden to say this meat shall be for passover because it looks as though he is sanctifying his animal and eating sacred flesh without it Temple said our papa this applies only to meat but not to wheat because he means it is to be guarded from fermenting for Passover but not meat an objection is raised our Jose said Thaddeus of Rome accustomed the Roman Jews to eat helmeted goats on the nights of Passover thereupon they the sages sent a message to him if you were not Thaddeus we would proclaim the band against you because you make Israel eat sacred flesh without the temple sacred flesh can you think so rather say Talmud. Mos Pesachim be it is near to making Israel eat sacred flesh without the temple thus only a helmeted goat but not if it is not helmeted I will tell you if it is helmeted there is no difference whether he stated or he did not state but if it is not helmeted if he specified it is forbidden if he did not specify it is not forbidden Araha learned this very as the statement of our Simeon to this Arshis hate demur it is well according to him who learns it as the statement of our Jose then it is correct but according to him who learns it as a statement of our Simeon is it correct surely we learned our Simeon declares him exempt because he did not make the offering in the way which people make this offering said Rabbanu to our Ashi and is it correct even according to him who learns it as a statement of our Jose surely Rabbanu said our Simeon stated this according to the view of our Jose who maintained a man is held responsible for his last words too surely then since our Simeon agrees with our Jose our Jose also agrees with our Simeon no our Simeon agrees with our Jose but our Jose does not agree with our Simeon the scholars asked was Thaddeus the man of Rome a great man or a powerful man come and hear this too did Thaddeus of Rome teach what reason did Hananiah Missal and Ezra see that they delivered themselves for the sanctification of the divine name to the fiery furnace they are due to minority to themselves if frogs which are not commanded concerning it. Sanctification of the divine name, yet it is written of them, and they shall come up and go into thy house and into thine ovens and into thy kneading troughs. When are the kneading troughs to be found near the oven? When the oven is hot, we who are commanded concerning the sanctification of the name, how much the more so are Jose B. Oven said he cast merchandise into the Passover sacrifice at the time of roasting. This is not the way in which people consecrate animals, therefore his words are invalid. Pockets of scholars for our Yohanan said, Whoever casts merchandise into the pockets of scholars will be privileged to sit in the heavenly academy, for it is said, For wisdom is a defense, even as money is a defense. Mishnah, where it is a practice to light a lamp at home on the night of the day of atonement, one must light one, where it is a practice not to light a lamp, one must not light one, and we light lamps in synagogue, school houses, and dark alleys, and for the sake of invalid tomorrow. It was taught whether they maintained that we should light lamps or they maintained that we should
Talmud, Mas Pesachim, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. This applies to Allah, but a man of understanding will draw it out. This applies to Rabbi Barhan, and in accordance with whom did they hold their view? In accordance with the following, which are Benjamin B. Jaffet said in our Yohanan's name, we recite a blessing over light both at the termination of the Sabbath and at the termination of the Day of Atonement, and that is the popular practice. An objection is raised. We do not recite a blessing over light except at the termination of the Sabbath, since it was then created for the first time, and as soon as he sees it, he immediately recites a blessing. Our Judah said he recites them in order over the cup of wine. Now our Yohanan said there on the Halachah is as our Judah. There is no difficulty here. The reference is to light that has burnt over the Sabbath. There it refers to light which issues from tinder and stones. One very Taught we can recite a blessing over light which issues from tinder and stones while another taught we cannot recite a blessing over it there is no difficulty one refers to the termination of the Sabbath and the other refers to the termination of the Day of Atonement Rabbi used to scatter them or high collected them or Isaac B. of Dimi said the Rabbi scattered them he subsequently repeated them in their order over the cup of wine so as to quit his children and household of their obligation yet was light created at the termination of the Sabbath surely it was taught ten things were created on the eve of the Sabbath at twilight these are they the well the man of the rainbow the writing and the writing instrument s the tables the sepulchre of Moses the cave in which Moses and Elijah stood the opening of the ass's mouth and the opening of the earth's mouth to swallow up the wicked Arnim I said in his father's name also fire and the mule Arjus I said in his father's Name also the Ram and the Shamir Arjuna said tongs too he knew thing to the person since he did not benefit from the light during the day used to say tongs are made with tongs then who made the first tongs hence in truth it was a heavenly creation said they to him it is possible to make it in a mold and shape it simultaneously hence in truth it is of human manufacture there is no difficulty one refers to our fire the other to the fire of the Gehenna our fire was created at the termination of the Sabbath the fire of the Gehenna on the eve of the Sabbath yet was the fire of the Gehenna created on the eve of the Sabbath surely it was taught seven things were created before the world was created and these are they, the Torah repentance the garden of Eden Gehenna the throne of glory the temple and the name of the Messiah the Torah for it is written the Lord made me see the Torah as the beginning of his way repentance for it is written before the mountains were brought forth and it is Written thou turnest man to contrition and sayest repent ye children of men the garden of Eden as it is written and the Lord planted a garden in Eden from before time the Gehenna for it is written for Tophet i.e. Gehenna is ordered of old the throne of glory and the temple for it is written thou throne of glory on high from the beginning thou place of our sanctuary the name of the Messiah as it is written is S.C. the Messiah's name shall endure forever and has exited before the sun I will tell. You only its cavity was created before the world was created but its fire was created on the eve of the Sabbath yet was its fire created on the eve of the Sabbath surely it was taught our Jose said the fire which the Holy One blessed be he created on the second day of the week shall never be extinguished as it is said and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have rebelled against me for their worm shall not die neither shall their fire be quenched again Arbana Asan. Of Arola said why was it was good not said concerning the second day of the week because the fire of the Gehenna was created therein also our Eliezer said although it was good was not said in connection with it yet he re-included it in the sixth as it is said and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good rather the cavity was made before the world was created and its fire on the second day of the week while as for our fire on the eve of the Sabbath he decided to create it but it was not created until the termination of the Sabbath for it was taught our Jose said two things he decided to create on the eve of the Sabbath but they were not created until the termination of the Sabbath and at the termination of the Sabbath the Holy One blessed be he inspired Adam with knowledge of a kind similar to divine knowledge and he procured two stones and rubbed them on each other and fire issued from them he also took two heterogeneous animals and crossed them and from them came forth the mule Arsimian B. Gamaliel said the mule came into existence in the days of Anna for it is said this is the Anna who found the mules in the wilderness those who interpret symbolically used to say Anna was unfit therefore he brought unfit animals into the world for it is said these are the sons of Seir the Horite and Zibian and Anna while it is written and these are the children of Zibian and Anna hence it teaches that Zibian cohabited with his mother and begot Anna by her but perhaps there were two Anna said Rabbi I say a thing which even King Shippur could not say and who is that Samuel others say our Papa said I say a thing which even King Shippur did not say and who is that Rabbi the Ritzet that is Anna meaning that is the original Anna our Rabbis taught ten things were created on the eve of the Sabbath at twilight and these are they the well man of the rainbow writing the writing instruments the tables the sepulchre of Moses and the cave in which Moses and Elijah stood the opening of the ass's mouth and the opening of the earth's mouth to swallow up the wicked while some say also Aaron's staff its almonds and its blossoms others say the harmful spirits demons too others say also Talmud, Moss Pesachim B. Adam's Raman our rabbis taught seven things are hidden from men these are they, the day of death and the day of comfort the depth extent of judgment and a man does not know what is in his neighbor's heart and a man does not know from what he will earn and when the Davidic dynasty will return and when the wicked kingdom will come to an end our rabbis taught three things God will to come to pass and if he had not willed them it would be but right that he should will them and these are they concerning a corpse that it should become offensive and concerning a dead person that he should be forgotten from the heart and concerning produce that it should rot and some say concerning coins that they should enjoy currency. Mission where it is the custom to do work on the ninth of one may do it where it is the custom not to do work one may not do it and in all places scholars cease from work on that day our Simeon B. Gamaliel said a man may always make himself a scholar Gamara Samuel said there is no public fast in Babylonia save the ninth of it alone shall we say that Samuel holds with regard to the ninth of its twilight is forbidden but Samuel said with regard to the ninth of its twilight is permitted and should you say Samuel holds the twilight of every public fast is permitted surely we learned one must eat and drink while it is yet day now what is this to exclude is it not to exclude twilight no it is to exclude after nightfall shall we say that this supports him it was taught there is no difference between the ninth of it and the day of atonement except that with the latter its doubt is forbidden while with the former its doubt is permitted what does its doubt is permitted Mean surely that refers to twilight no but as Arshisha the son of Aridi said it is in respect of the fixing of new moon so here too it is in respect of the fixing of the new moon Rabba lectured pregnant women and suckling women must fast and complete the fast on that day the ninth of just as they fast and complete the fast on the day of atonement and the twilight thereof is forbidden and they said likewise in our Yohanan's name yet did our Yohanan say thus surely our Yohanan said it. Ninth of it is not like a public fast surely that means in respect of twilight no in respect of work you say work we have learned it where it is the custom to do work on the ninth of it one may do it where it is the custom not to do work one may not do it and even our Simeon B. Gamaliel merely says that if he sits and does not work it does not look like concede yet he certainly does not forbid it rather what does is not like a public fast mean in respect of the NEI service but surely are. Yohanan said with that a man would go on praying all day there it is a statutory obligation whereas here it is voluntary another alternative answer is what does it is not like a public fast mean in respect of the 24 benedictions our papa said what does it is not like a public fast mean it is not like the first ones but like the last ones an objection is raised there is no difference between the ninth of it and the day of atonement except that with the latter its doubt is forbidden while with the former its doubt is permitted now what does its doubt is permitted mean does it not refer to its twilight said Arshisha son of Aridi no it is meant in respect of the fixing of new moon hence in all other regulations they are alike the supports our Eliezer for our Eliezer said a man is forbidden to dip his finger in water on the ninth of it, just as he is forbidden to dip his finger in water on the day of atonement an objection is raised there is no difference between the ninth of it and the public fast except that on one work is forbidden while on the other work is permitted where it is customary this implies that in all other matters they are both alike whereas in respect to a public fast it was taught when they the sages ruled bathing is forbidden they spoke only of the whole
Marketplace Mishnah, but the sages maintain in Judea they used to do work on the eve of Passover until midday while in Galilee they did not work at all as for the night. Beth Shammai forbid work while Beth Hillel permitted until daybreak of is not more lenient than public fast save that work is permitted on the former but he does not refer to the reverse cases where the ninth of is more stringent hence you cannot deduce that they are alike in all other matters. Gemara at first he did. Tana teaches custom and then he teaches a prohibition set are you had and there is no difficulty one is according to Armeir the other according to our Judah for it was taught our Judah said in Judea they used to do work on the eve of Passover until midday while in Galilee they did not work at all said Armeir to him what proof is Judea and Galilee for the present discussion but where they are accustomed to do work one may do it while where they are accustomed not to do work one may not do it now. Since Armeir states that it is merely a matter of custom it follows that our Judah states that it is a prohibition yet does our Judah hold that work on the 14th is permitted surely it was taught our Judah said he who weeds on the 13th and an ear of corn is uprooted in his hand must replant it in swampy damp soil but must not replant it in a dry place thus only on the 13th but not on the 14th now consider we know that our Judah maintains any grafting which does not take. Root within three days will never take root, and if you think that work may be done on the fourteenth, why state the thirteenth? Surely there is the fourteenth, the fifteenth, and part of the sixteenth. Said Rabbah, we learned this of Galilee, but there is a night. Said Arshis, hate this is according to Beth Shammai. Arshis said, in truth, it is as Beth Hillel. Yet the night of the fourteenth is not stated because it is not the practice of people to eat at night. Rabbah said, after all, it refers to Judea. But in respect to taking root, we do say once that part of the day is as the whole of it, but we do not say twice that part of the day is as the whole of it. Mission Armeir said, any work which he began before the fourteenth, he may finish it on the fourteenth, but he may not begin it at the outset on the fourteenth, even if he can finish it on the same day. But the sages maintain three craftsmen may work on the eve of Passover until midday, and these are the tailors, hairdressers, and washermen. Our Jose B. R. Judah said shoemakers to Gamar the scholars asked did we learn that it may be finished when required for the festival but when not required for the festival he may not even finish it or perhaps we learn that he must not begin work when it is not required for the festival but when it is required we may indeed begin it or perhaps whether it is needed for the festival or it is not needed he may finish but not start come in here but he may not begin at the outset on the 14th even a small girdle or even a small hairnet what does even imply surely even these which are required for the festival he may only finish but not begin once it follows that where it is not required for the festival we may not even finish no after all even when it is not required we may indeed finish the work and yet what does even connote even these two which are small for you might argue their beginning that is the end of their work then we should even begin them at the very outset, therefore, he informs us that it is not so come and here. Armeir said, Any work which is required for the festival Talmud, Mos Pesachim B, he may finish it on the 14th. When is that when he began it before the 14th? But if he did not begin it before the 14th, he must not begin it on the 14th. Even a small girdle, even a small hair net, thus only when required for the festival, but not when it is not required. No, the same law holds good that even when it is not required for the festival, we may also finish it. And he informs us this that even when it is required for the festival, we may only finish but not begin come and here. Armeir said, Any work which is required for the festival, he may finish it on the 14th, but that which is not required for the festival is forbidden, and one may work on the eve of Passover until midday where it is customary to work, thus only where it is the custom, but if it is not the custom, it is not permitted at all hence. This proves that when required for the festival it is permitted but when it is not required for the festival it is not permitted this proves it but the sages maintain three craftsmen etc. attended taught tailors because a layman may sew in the usual way on the intermediate days hairdressers and washermen because he who comes from overseas and he who comes out of prison may cut their hair and wash their garments on the intermediate days are Jose son of our Judah said shoemakers too because the festival pilgrims repaired their shoes on the intermediate days wherein do they differ one master holds we learn the beginning of the work from the end of the work while the other master holds we do not learn the beginning of the work from the end of the work mission one may set up chicken houses for fowls on the 14th and if a brooding fowl ran away one may set her back in her place and if she died one may set another in her place one may sweep away from under an animal's feet on the 14th, but on the festival one may remove IT on a side only one may take utensils to and bring them back from an artisan's house even if they are not required for the festival. Gamara seeing that you may even set the fowls for brooding is there a question about putting back set of a the second clause refers to the intermediate days of the festival Arhuna said they learned this only when it is within three days of her rebellion so that her heat has not yet left her and after three days of her brooding so that the eggs are quite spoiled but if it is after three days since her rebellion so that her heat has left her or within three days of her brooding so that the eggs are still not completely spoiled we must not put her back RM I said we may even put her back within the first three days of her brooding wherein do they differ one master holds that the sages cared about a substantial loss but they did not care about a slight loss while the other master holds. They cared about a slight loss to one may sweep away from under etc. Our rabbis taught the manure which is in the courtyard may be moved aside that which is in the stable and in the courtyard may be taken out to the dunghill. This is self-contradictory. You say the manure which is in the courtyard may only be moved aside then he the tanna teaches that which is in the stable and in the courtyard may even be taken out to the dunghill. Said Abay there is no difficulty one refers to the 14th of Nis and the other to the intermediate days. Rabbis said both refer to the intermediate days and this is what he says if the courtyard became like a stable it may be taken out to the dunghill. One may take utensils to and bring them back from an artisan's house. Our papa said Rabbah examined us we learned one may take utensils to and bring utensils from an artisan's house even if they are not required for the festival but the following contradicts it one may not bring utensils from an Artisan's house, but if he fears that they may be stolen, he may remove them into another courtyard. And we answered, There is no difficulty here. It means on the 14th, there on the intermediate days. Alternatively, both refer to the intermediate days, yet there is no difficulty here. It is where he trusts him, there where he does not trust him. And thus it was taught one may bring vessels from the artisan's house, e.g., a pitcher from a potter's house, and a glass goblet from a glassmaker's house. But one may not bring wool from a dyer's house, nor vessels from an artisan's house. Yet if he, the artisan, has nothing to eat, he must pay him his wages and leave it the utensil with him. But if he does not trust him, he places them in a nearby house. And if he is afraid that they may be stolen, he may bring them secretly home. You have reconciled the contradictions on bringing, but the contradictory statements on taking the utensils to the artisan's house present a difficulty, for he teaches one. Must not bring from the artisan's house, hence how much more that we must not take them to his house, rather it is clear that it must be reconciled as we answered it at first mission. Six things the inhabitants of Jericho did three, they the sages forbade them, and three they did not forbid them, and it is these which they did not forbid them. They grafted palm trees all day, they wrapped up the Shema, and they harvested and stacked their produce before the bringing of the Omer, and it is these which they forbade them, they permitted for use the branches of carob or sycamore trees belonging to Hippish Talmud, Mos Pesachim, and they ate the fallen fruit from beneath the tree on the Sabbath, and they gave P.E. from vegetables, and the sages forbade them. Gemara our rabbis taught six things King Hezekiah did, and three they the sages agreed with him, and in three they did not agree with him, he dragged his father's bones corpse on a rope beer, and they agreed with him, he Crushed the brazen serpent and they agreed with him and he hid the book of remedies and they agreed with him and in three they did not agree with him he cut the gold off the doors of the temple and sent them to the king of Assyria and they did not agree with him and he closed up the waters of Upper Gin and they did not agree with him and he intercalated the month of Nisan in Nisan and they did not agree with him they grafted palm trees all day how did they do it said Rab Judah they brought a fresh myrtle the juice of bayfruit and barley flour which had been kept in a vessel less than forty days and boiled them together and injected the concoction into the heart of the palm tree and every tree which stands within four cubits of this one if that is not treated likewise immediately withers Araha the son of Rabbah said a male branch was grafted onto a female palm tree
Enacted that it should be recited quietly or Isaac said the school of RMI said this is to be compared to a king's daughter who smelled a spicy pudding if she reveals her desire she suffers disgrace if she does not reveal it she suffers pain so her servants began bringing it to her in secret our said that the sages enacted that this should be recited aloud on account of the resentment of heretics but in the heart where there are no heretics so far they recited quietly our rabbis. Taught six things the inhabitants of Jericho did three with the consent of the sages and three without the consent of the sages and these were with the consent of the sages they grafted palm trees all day of the fourteenth they wrapped up the Shema and they harvested before the Omer and these were without the consent of the sages they stacked the corn before the Omer and they made breaches in their gardens and orchards to permit the poor to eat the fallen fruit in famine years on Sabbaths and festivals and they permitted for use the branches of carob and sycamore trees belonging to it. This is our mayor's view said our Judah to him if they did these things with the consent of the sages then all people could do so but they did both without the consent of the sages save that three they forbade them to do and three they did not forbid them to do and it is these which they did not forbid them they grafted palm trees the whole day and they wrapped up the Shema and they Stack the corn before the omer, and it is these which they forbade them to do. They permitted for use branches of hippish of carob and sycamore trees, and they made breaches in their garden and orchards to permit the poor to eat the fallen fruit in famine years on Sabbaths and festivals. They gave P.E. from vegetables, and the sages forbade them. Yet does our Judah hold that the reaping was not with the consent of the sages? Surely we learned the inhabitants of Jericho reap before the omer with the consent of the sages, and stacked before the omer without the consent of the sages. But the sages did not forbid them to do it. Talmud, Mos Pesachim, be whom do you know to maintain that they forbade and did not forbid our Judah? Yet he teaches they reap with the consent of the sages. Then according to your reasoning, surely these are for rather delete reaping from this, and they permitted the branches of carob and sycamore trees of hippish. They said our fathers sanctified not but tree. Trunks, hence we will permit for use the branches of Hittish of carob and sycamore trees. Now we discuss the growth which came after that, so that while they held as he rules, there is no trespass offering due when one benefits from what grows. The rabbis held granted that there is no trespass offering due, there is nevertheless a prohibition, and they made breaches, etc. Ola said in the name of our Simeon Belakish, the controversy is in respect of the dates of the upper branches for the rabbis held, we forbid them preventively lest he go up and cut them off, while the inhabitants of Jericho held, we do not forbid them preventively lest he go up and cut them off. But as for the dates which are among the lower branches, all agree that it is permitted, said Rabbi to him, but they are muksa, and should you say that is because the dates were fit for his ravens, I would rejoin seeing that that which is ready for man is not ready for dogs, for we learned our Judah said if it was. Not nibble from the eve of the Sabbath, it is forbidden because it is not of that which is ready, then shall what is ready for birds be regarded as ready for human beings. Yes, he replied, that which is ready for human beings is not ready for dogs, for whatever is fit for a man, he does not put it out of his mind, but that which is ready for birds is also ready for human beings, for his mind is set upon it. When Rabin came, he said in the name of Arsimian Belakish, the controversy is in respect of the fallen dates among the lower branches. The rabbis holding that which is ready for birds is not ready for man, while the men of Jericho hold that which is ready for birds is ready for man, but the fallen dates on the place are permitted now that they have fallen to earth, for since none grow there, there was never any fear that he might go up and cut off the growing dates, though this explanation removes several difficulties. Tosaf observes that it raises a practical difficulty. How? Is one to distinguish between those which fell down before the festival and those which fell on the festival itself and those which had fallen on the upper branches in the first place and those which had first fallen on the lower branches upper branches all agree that they are forbidden we forbid them preventively lest he ascend and cut off some dates and they gave P.E. off from vegetables yet did not the inhabitants agree with what we learned they stated a general principle in respect to P.E. whatever is an eatable and is guarded and its growth is from the earth and is all gathered simultaneously and is collected for storage is subject to P.E. whatever is an eatable excludes the aftergrowth of wood and matter and is guarded excludes hefker and its growth is from the earth excludes mushrooms and truffles and is all gathered simultaneously excludes a fig tree and is collected for storage excludes vegetables said Rab Judah in Rab's name the reference is to turn tops and they differ in respect to what one collects for storing by means of something else one master holds if he takes it in for storage by means of something else it is designated storage while the other master holds what he takes in for storage by means of something else is not designated storage our rabbis taught at first they used to leave P.E. off for turnips and cabbages our Jose said also for porridge while another buried the taught they used to give P.E. off for turnips and porridge our Simeon said for cabbage to Talmud, Mos Pesachim shall we say that there are three tanaim in dispute no there are only two tanaim in dispute the first tana opposed to our Simeon being our Jose while the first tana opposed to our Jose is our Simeon and what does two mean it refers to the first mentioned our rabbis taught the son of Bohem gave P.E. off from vegetables and his father came and found the poor laden with vegetables and standing at the entrance to the kitchen garden said he to them my son's cast. If from you and I will give you twice as much of tithe produce not because I begrudge it to you but because the sages said you must not give P.E.R. from vegetables why had he to say to them not because I begrudge it to you so that they should not say he is merely putting us off our rabbis taught at first they used to place the skins of sacrifices in the chamber of Beth Hopper in the evening they used to divide them among the men of the paternal division but men of violence used to seize more than their due share by force so they enacted that they should divide them every Sabbath Eve so that all the wards came and received their portions together yet the chief priests still seized them by force thereupon the owners arose and consecrated them to heaven it was related it did not take long before they covered the whole temple with gold plates a cubit square of the thickness of a golden and on festivals they used to lay them together and place them on a high eminence on the Temple Mount so that the festival pilgrims might see that their workmanship was beautiful and that there was no imperfection in them it was taught Abbas all said there were sycamore tree trunks in Jericho and the men of violence seized them by force whereupon the owners arose and consecrated them to heaven and it was of these and of such as these that Abbas all be both net said in the name of Abba Joseph be Hanin woe is me because of the house of Boethus woe is me because of their staves woe is me because of the house of Hanin woe is me because of their whisperings woe is me because of the house of Kithros woe is me because of their pens woe is me because of the house of Ishmael the son of Phabai woe is me because of their fists for they are high priests and their sons are temple treasurers and their sons in law are trustees and their servants beat the people with staves our rabbis taught four cries did the temple court cry out the first depart hence yet children of Eli for they Defiled the temple of the Lord and another cry departs his of Farbarkai who honors himself while desecrating the sacred sacrifices of heaven for he used to wrap his hands with silks and perform the sacrificial service the temple court also cried out lift up your heads O ye gates and let Ishmael the son of Phabai Phineas's disciple enter and serve in the office of the high priest who the temple court also cried out lift up your heads O ye gates and let Yohanan the son of Narbe the disciple of Pinkai enter and fill his stomach with the divine sacrifices it was said of Yohanan be Narbe that he ate 300 calves and drank 300 barrels of wine and ate 40 se of young birds as a desert for his meal it was said as long as Yohanan the son of Narbe lived Nadhar was never found in the temple what was the fate of Isachar of Farbarkai it was related the king and queen were sitting the king said goat's flesh is better while the queen said Lemis. Better said they who shall decide the high priest who offers up sacrifices every day so he came Talmud, Mos Pesachim be and indicated with his hand if the goat were better let it be offered for the daily sacrifice said the king since he had no fear of my royal person let his right hand be cut off but he gave a bribe and they cut off his left hand instead then the king heard of it and they cut off his right hand too said our Joseph praise be the merciful one who caused Issachar of Far. Barkai to receive his deserts in this world our Ashi said Issachar of Far Barkai had not studied the mission for we learned our Simeon said lambs take precedence over goats in all places you might think that that is because they are the best of their species therefore it is
that it must be slaughtered at eight and a half hours according to scriptural law. How may we perform it earlier? Rather, said Rabbah, the duty of the tamed properly begins from when the evening shadows begin to fall. What is the reason? Because scripture saith between the evenings, meaning from the time that the sun commences to decline in the west, therefore on other days of the year when there are vows and free will offerings in connection with which the divine law states, and he shall burn upon it the fat of the peace offerings he shall aim and the master set upon it complete shalom all the sacrifices we therefore postpone it two hours and sacrifice it at eight and a half hours but on the eve of passover when there is a passover offering after it we advance it one hour and sacrifice it at seven and a half hours when the eve of passover falls on the eve of the sabbath so that there is the roasting too to be done for it does not override the sabbath we let it stand on its own law is at six and a half hours our rabbis taught just as its order during the week so is its order on the sabbath these are the words of our ishmael our Akiva said just as its order on the eve of passover what does this mean said abay this is what it means just as its order on a weekday which is the eve of passover so is its order on the sabbath which is the eve of passover these are the words of our ishmael our Akiva said just as its order on the eve of passover which falls on the eve of it Sabbath so is its order on the Sabbath and our mission which teaches whether on a weekday or the Sabbath agrees with our Ishmael wherein do they differ they differ as to whether the additional sacrifices take precedence over the burning of the frankincense in the censers our Ishmael holds the additional offerings take precedence over the burning of the frankincense in the censers therefore he the priest sacrificed the additional sacrifices at six hours burned the incense in the censers at seven and sacrificed the tamed at seven and a half hours our Akiva holds the burning of the frankincense in the censers takes precedence over the additional sacrifices hence the burning in the censers took place at five hours the additional offering at six hours and the tamed was sacrificed at six and a half hours to this Rabbah Demur does then our Akiva teach just as its order on the eve of Passover which falls on the Sabbath so is its order on the Sabbath surely he teaches just as its Order on the eve of Passover without qualification rather said Rabbah this is what he means just as its order on the weekdays in general so is its order on the Sabbath which is the eve of Passover these are the words of our Ishmael our Akiva said just as its order on the eve of Passover hence our mission which teaches whether on weekdays or on the Sabbath agrees with our Akiva wherein do they differ they differ in the heating of the flesh our Ishmael holds we fear for the heating of the flesh while our Akiva holds we do not fear for the heating of the flesh Talmud, Mas Pesachim B if we do not fear let us sacrifice it at six and a half hours he holds that the burning of the frankincense in the censers takes precedence over the additional sacrifices hence he sacrificed the additional sacrifices at six hours perform the burning in the censers at seven and sacrifice the tamed at seven and a half to this Rabbah Beulah does he then teach just as its order on weekdays in General, so is its order on the Sabbath, which is the eve of Passover. These are the words of our Ishmael. Surely he teaches, so is its order on the Sabbath without qualification. Rather, said Rabbi Biola, this is what he means, just as its order on a weekday in general. So is its order on the Sabbath in general. These are the words of our Ishmael. Our Akiva said, just as its order on the eve of Passover in general. So is its order on the Sabbath in general. Hence, our mission, which teaches whether on weekdays or on the Sabbath, agrees with all wherein do they differ. They differ as to whether there is a preventive measure on account of vows and free will offerings. Our Ishmael holds we enact a preventive measure for the Sabbath on account of weekdays, while our Akiva holds we do not enact a preventive measure. If we do not enact a preventive measure, let us sacrifice it at six and a half. He holds the Sabbath, since many are to be offered, we must start as early as possible that the additional. Sacrifices take precedence over the burning of the frankincense in the censers, hence the additional sacrifices are offered at six hours, the burning in the censers at seven, and he sacrifices the tamed at seven and a half hours. An objection is raised the tamed during the whole year, it is offered according to its law, as it is slaughtered at eight and a half hours and offered at nine and a half hours, but on the eve of Passover it is slaughtered at seven and a half and offered at eight and a half. If at the eve of Passover fell on the Sabbath, it is as though it fell on a Monday. Our Akiva said, as its order is on the eve of Passover, as for Abbe it is well, but according to Rabbah, it is a difficulty. Rabbah can answer, you do not say it is the same as when it falls on a Monday, but say it is the same as a Monday in general. An objection is raised if it falls on the Sabbath, it is as its order during the whole year. These are the words of our Ishmael. Our Akiva said, it is as its order on. The eve of Passover in general now as for Rabbah it is well but according to Abay it is difficult Abay answers you do not say it is as its order during the whole year but say it is as its order in all other years these are the words of our Ishmael our Akiva said it is as the order when the eve of Passover falls on the eve of the Sabbath our rabbis taught how do we know that there must not be anything before the morning tamed because it is said and he shall lay the burnt offering in order upon it what is the exegesis said Rabbah the burnt offering implies the first burnt offering and how do we know that nothing may be offered after the evening tamed because it is stated and he shall burn upon it the fat of the peace offerings what is the exegesis said Abay after it see the morning tamed you may sacrifice peace offerings but not after its companion see the evening tamed may you sacrifice peace offerings to this Rabbah demurred say then it is only peace offerings that we may not Present yet we may present burnt offerings rather said Rabbah Hashalamah implies upon it complete all the sacrifices our rabbis taught the evening tamed is sacrificed before the Passover offering Passover offering is sacrificed before the burning of the evening incense the incense before the kindling of the lights Talmud Mas Pesachim let that in connection with which be Arab at evening and Ben Harabim between the evenings are said be deferred after that in connection with which be Arab is not said save Ben Harabim alone if so let the burning of the incense and the kindling of the lights also take precedence over the Passover offering for let that in connection with which be Arab and Ben Harabim are stated be deferred after that in connection with which not save Ben Harabim alone is said there it is different because scripture expressed a limitation it for it was taught Aaron and his son shall set it in order to burn from evening to morning Furnish it with its requisite measure so that it may burn from evening to morning. Another interpretation you have no other service which is valid from evening to morning. Save this alone. What is the reason scripture saith Aaron and his sons shall set it in order to burn from evening to morning? It shall be from evening to morning, but no other thing shall be from evening until morning. And the burning of the incense is likened to the kindling of the lights. Now it was taught in accordance with our difficulty. The evening tamed is sacrificed before the burning of the incense. The incense is burnt before the kindling of the lamps, and the lamps are kindled before the sacrificing of the Passover offering. Let that in connection with which B.A.R. and Ben Harabim are stated be deferred after that in connection with which not save Ben Harabim alone is stated, but it is written that it is required to exclude a service of the inner temple. And what is it? Burning of the incense you might think but in connection with the former only Ben Harabim is stated number XXVII and the other lamp shalt thou offer at dusk Ben Harabim that I would say since it is written and when Aaron lighteth the lamps at dusk he shall burn it say let us first light the lamps and then burn the incense therefore the merciful one expressed a limitation it then what is the purpose of at dusk he shall burn it this is what the merciful one saith when thou lightest it. Lamps the incense must already be burning our rabbis taught there is nothing which takes precedence over the morning tamed except the burning of the morning incense alone in connection with which in the morning in the morning is stated so let the burning of the incense in connection with which in the morning in the morning is stated for it is written and Aaron shall burn thereon incense of sweet spices in the morning in the morning take precedence over that in connection with which only. One morning is stated and there is nothing which may be delayed until after the evening tamed save the burning of the incense the lighting of the lamps the slaughtering of the Passover sacrifice and he who lacks atonement on the eve of Passover who performs ritual immersion a second time and eats his Passover sacrifice in the evening are Ishmael the son of our Yohan and Bibaraka said he who lacks atonement at any other time of the year too who performs ritual immersion and eats of sacred flesh. In the evening according to the first tenet it is well let the affirmative precept of eating the Passover sacrifice which involves Kareth come and override the affirmative precept of completion which does not involve Kareth but according to our Ishmael the
Ordinance, but this furnishes a general rule for all sin offerings that they take precedence of all burnt offerings which accompany them. And we have an established principle that even a bird sin offering takes precedence of an animal burnt offering. Said Rabbah, the burnt offering of a leper is different because the merciful one saith Talmud, Mas Pesachim B, and the priest shall have offered at the burnt offering, implying that which he has already offered our shaman B. Abba said to our Papa according to you who maintain that he takes it up and keeps it overnight on the top of the altar, shall we arise and do a thing to the priests whereby they may come to a stumbling block, for they will think it is of that day and thus come to burn it. He priests are most careful, replied here as he said to our Kahana, other state are not the son of our Nathan said to our Papa, but as long as the Emirim have not been burnt, the priest may not eat the flesh, for it was taught you might think that the priest should. Be permitted to partake of the breast and the thigh before the burning of the emirim. Therefore, it is stated, and the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar, and then follows. But the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons. And as long as the priests have not eaten it, the owners obtain no atonement. For it was taught, and they shall eat those things wherewith atonement was made. This teaches that the priests eat it, and the owners obtain atonement. Said he to him, since it is impossible that the emirim are treated as though they were defiled or lost. For it was taught, you might think that if the emirim were defiled or lost, the priests have no right to the breast or the thigh. Therefore, it is stated, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons. In all cases, are Kahana opposed two verses. It is written, neither shall the fat of my feast remain all night until the morning. Thus, it is only until the morning that it shall not remain all night, but it may be kept for the whole night. But it is. Written and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings, implying after it complete all the sacrifices he raised the difficulty, and he himself answered it that is where they were left over. Our Saffir pointed out a contradiction to Rabbah. It is written, Neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning, thus it is only unto the morning that it shall not be left, but it may be kept all night. But it is written, The burnt offering of the Sabbath shall be burnt on its Sabbath, but not the burnt offering of a weekday on the Sabbath, nor the burnt offering of a weekday on a festival. Said he to him, Our Abu has already pointed out this contradiction to our Abu, and he answered him, We treat here of the case where the fourteenth falls on the Sabbath, for the fats of the Sabbath may be offered on the festival. Said he to him, Because the fats of the Sabbath may be offered on the festival, we are to arise and assume that this verse is written only in respect. Of the fourteenth which falls on the Sabbath, leave the verse he answered for it is compelled to establish its own particular case. Mishnah, if a man slaughtered the Passover sacrifice for another purpose and he caught the blood and went and sprinkled it for another purpose or for its own purpose and for another purpose or for another purpose and for its own purpose, it is disqualified how is for its own purpose and for another purpose meant in the name of the Passover sacrifice first and then in the name of a peace offering for another purpose and for its own purpose means in the name of a peace offering first and then in the name of the Passover offering. Gamar, our Papa asked, Did we learn of a dual intention expressed even in respect to one service or did we learn only of a dual intention expressed at two separate services? Did we learn of a dual intention expressed even in respect of one service? This being in accordance with our Jose who maintained the man is. Responsible for his last words too, for if it agreed with our Mayor, surely he said, Seize, i.e., determine the matter by the first expression, Talmud, Mas Pesachim, or perhaps we learned it only in respect to two services, and even according to our Mayor, who said, Seize the first expression that applies only in the case of one service, but in the case of two services, he agrees that it is disqualified. I will tell you to which case does this problem refer, shall we say, to the case where it was for another purpose first, and then for its own purpose, then whether it was in connection with one service or in connection with two services, according to both our Mayor and our Jose, it was disqualified by the first wrongful intention, for according to our Jose, too, he holds that a man is held responsible for his last words, also, rather, the problem refers to where it was done for its own purpose first, and then for another purpose, what then come and here if a man slaughtered the Passover. Sacrifice for another purpose and caught the blood and went and sprinkled it for another purpose. How is it meant? Shall we say literally as he teaches it? Why must he intend all of them for a wrong purpose? From the first it is disqualified. Hence he must teach us if a man slaughtered the Passover sacrifice for another purpose or even if he slaughtered it for its own purpose but he caught its blood and went and sprinkled it for another purpose or even if he slaughtered it caught its blood and went with it for its own purpose but sprinkled it for another purpose so that it is a question of two services and consider the second clause for its own purpose and for another purpose. How is it meant? Shall we say in respect of two services that it is identical with the first clause? Hence it must surely be in respect of one service and this agrees with our Jose who maintained a man is held responsible for his last words to know after all it refers to two services but the first. Clause discusses where he is standing at engaged in the slaughtering and intends with due purpose in respect of the slaughtering or again he is standing at the sprinkling and intends for another purpose in respect of sprinkling while the second clause means when he is standing at the slaughtering and intends in respect of the sprinkling when he for instance declares behold I slaughter the Passover sacrifice for its own purpose but to sprinkle its blood for another purpose and he the Tana informs us that you can intend at one service for another service and that is our Papa's question come and here or for another purpose and for its own purpose ITIS disqualified how is it meant if we say in the case of two services then seeing that where if the first is for its own purpose and the second is for another purpose you say that it is disqualified is it necessary to state it where it is first for another purpose and then for its own purpose hence it must surely Refer to one service and since the second clause refers to one service the first clause two refers also to one service no after all it refers only to two services and logically indeed it is not required but because he speaks of for its own purpose and for another purpose he also mentions for another purpose and for its own purpose come in here if he killed it the Passover sacrifice for those who cannot eat it or for those who were not registered for it for uncircumcised or for unclean persons it is disqualified now here it obviously refers to one service and since the second clause refers to one service the first clause two treats also of one service what argument is this the one is according to its nature while the other is according to its nature the second clause certainly refers only to one service while the first clause may refer either to one service or to two services come in here if he killed it for those who can eat it and for those who cannot eat it, it is. Fit how is it meant shall we say at two services and the reason that it is fit is because he intended it for non-eaters at the sprinkling for there can be no effective intention of eaters at the sprinkling hence if it were at one service e.g. at the slaughtering where an intention with reference to eaters is effective it would be disqualified but we have an established law that if some are eaters it is not disqualified Talmud, Mas Pesachim B hence it surely refers also to one service. And since the second clause refers also to one service the first clause two refers also to one service what argument is this the one is according to its nature while the other is according to its nature the second clause refers also to one service while the first clause refers either to one service or to two services the scholars asked what is the law of the Passover sacrifice which he killed at any other time of the year for its own purpose and for another purpose does the other purpose come and nullify its own purpose and thus make it fit or not when our Dimi came he said I stated this argument before our Jeremiah since slaughtering it for its own purpose makes it fit at its own time while slaughtering it for another purpose makes it fit at a different time than just as the slaughtering for its own purpose which makes it fit at its own time does not save it from the disqualifying effect of another purpose so also the slaughtering for another purpose which makes it Fit at a different time does not save it from the disqualifying effect of its own purpose and it is unfit whereupon he said to me it is not so if you say thus in respect to another purpose that is because it operates in the case of all sacrifices will you say the same where it is slaughtered for its own purpose seeing that it does not operate as a cause of disqualification in the case of all other sacrifices but only in the case of the Passover sacrifice alone what is our decision? Thereon said Rabbi a Passover sacrifice which he slaughtered at any other time of the year for its own purpose and for another purpose is fit for it tacitly stands to be killed for its own purpose yet even so when he kills it for another purpose it is fit which proves that the other purpose comes and nullifies its own purpose hence when he slaughters it for its own purpose and for another purpose too the other purpose comes and nullifies its own
disqualifies it at its own time and a change of owner disqualifies it at its own time and just as a change of sanctity which disqualifies it at its own time validates it at a different time so a change of owner which disqualifies it at its own time validates it at a different time but he said to me it is not so if you say thus in the case of a change of sanctity that is because its disqualification is intrinsic and it is operative in respect of the four services Talmud, Mas Pesach may end. It is operative after death and it is operative in the case of the community as in the case of an individual will you say the same of a change of owner where the disqualification is not intrinsic and it is not operative in respect of the four services and it is not operative after death and it is not operative in the case of the community as in the case of an individual and though two of these distinctions are not exact two nevertheless are exact for how is a change of owners. Different that you say its disqualification is not intrinsic because its disqualification is merely one of intention and with a change of sanctity to its disqualification is merely one of intention again as to what he says a change of owners is not operative as a disqualification after death and according to our Phineas the son of RMI who maintained there is a disqualification in a change of owner after death what is there to be said two of these distinctions are nevertheless. Exact rather said Rabbi Pascal and which he slaughtered during the rest of the year with a change of owners is regarded as though it had no owners in its proper time and it is disqualified Mishnah if he killed it for those who cannot eat it or for those who are not registered for it for uncircumcised persons or for unclean persons it is unfit if he killed it for those who are to eat it and for those who are not to eat it for those who are registered for it and for those who are not. Registered for it for circumcised and for uncircumcised for unclean and for clean persons it is fit if he killed it before midday it is disqualified because it is said and the whole assembly shall kill it at dusk if he killed it before the evening tame it, it is fit providing that one shall stir its blood until that of the tame it is sprinkled yet if it was sprinkled it is fit tomorrow our rabbis taught how is for those who cannot eat it meant if it was killed in the name of an invalid or an old man how is for those who were not registered for it meant if one company registered for it and he killed it in the name of a different company how do we know this because our rabbis taught and shall he and his neighbor next unto him take one according to the number of beam except the souls this teaches that the paschal lamb is not slaughtered save for those who are registered numbered for it you might think that if he slaughtered it for those who were not registered for it he should be as one who violates the precept yet it is fit therefore it is stated according to the number of beam except the souls ye shall make your count tackets so of the re reiterated it to teach that it is indispensable rabbi said this is a syriac expression as a man who says to his neighbor kill kosmi this lamb we have thus found it disqualified if killed for those who are not registered for it how do we know the same of those who cannot eat it scripture saith according to every man's eating ye shall make your count thus eaters are assimilated to registered persons talmud mas pesachim b if he slaughtered it for circumcised persons on condition that uncircumcised persons should be atoned for there with at the sprinkling arhista said it the lamb is disqualified rabbi ruled it is fit arhista said it is disqualified there is a disqualification in an intention for uncircumcised at the sprinkling rabbi ruled it is fit there is no disqualification in an Intention for uncircumcised at the sprinkling rabbi said once do I know it because it was taught you might think that he an uncircumcised person disqualifies the members of the company who come with him and it is logical since uncircumcision disqualifies and uncleanness disqualifies then just as with uncleanness part uncleanness was not made tantamount to entire uncleanness so with uncircumcision part uncircumcision was not made tantamount to entire uncircumcision or turn this way since uncircumcision disqualifies and time disqualifies then just as with time part in respect to time was made tantamount to the whole in respect of time so with uncircumcision part in respect to uncircumcision should be made tantamount to the whole in respect to uncircumcision let us see to what it is similar you just draw an analogy between that which does not apply to all sacrifices by that which does not apply to all sacrifices and let not time provide an argument which operates as a disqualification in the case of all sacrifices or turn this way you judge a thing which was not freed from its general rule by a thing which was not freed from its general rule and let not uncleanness provide an argument seeing that it was freed from its general rule therefore it is stated this is the ordinance of the Passover what is the purpose of this if we say to teach that entire uncircumcision disqualifies it the Paschal Lamb but part thereof does not disqualify it surely that is deduced from an all uncircumcised person as shall not eat thereof hence either Tana must have taught us therefore it is stated and all uncircumcised shall not eat thereof entire uncircumcision disqualifies it but part thereof does not disqualify it and should you say the same law applies to sprinkling because that entire uncircumcision at least does disqualify it therefore this is stated teaching it is only at the slaughtering that entire uncircumcision disqualifies but as for Sprinkling even entire uncircumcision too does not disqualify it and should you ask what is the leniency of sprinkling that there is no intention of eaters in respect to sprinkling but Arhista maintains on the contrary the berita is to be explained in the opposite direction thus therefore it is stated and all uncircumcised person s shall not eat thereof if the whole of it the registered company is in a state of uncircumcision it disqualifies it but part thereof does not disqualify it but as for sprinkling even part thereof disqualifies it and should you say the same law applies to sprinkling because that unless there is entire uncircumcision it does not disqualify it therefore this is stated teaching only at the slaughtering does part thereof not disqualify it but at the sprinkling even part thereof disqualifies it and should you ask what is the stringency of sprinkling it is that the prohibition of pickle cannot be imposed save at the sprinkling to this are Ashi demurred once do you know that this verse and all uncircumcised person s implies in its entirety perhaps this verse and all uncircumcised person s implies whatever there is of uncircumcision and therefore the merciful one wrote this to teach that unless there is an entire company in a state of uncircumcision it does not disqualify it there being no difference whether it is at the slaughtering or at the sprinkling rather said our Ashi Arhista and Rabbi Talmud, Mas Pesachime. Differ in this verse and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him for him but not for his companion Rabbi holds his companion must be like himself just as he is capable of atonement so must his companion be capable of atonement thus excluding this uncircumcised person who is not capable of atonement but Arhista holds this uncircumcised person too since he is subject to the obligation he is also subject to atonement since if he wishes he can make himself fit yet does Arhista. Except the argument of since surely it was stated if one bakes food on a festival for use on a weekday are his said he is flagellated rabbi said he is not flagellated rabbi said he is not flagellated we say since if guests visited him it would be fit for him on the festival itself it is fit for him now too are his said he is flagellated we do not say since as for rabbi it is well and he is not self-contradictory here in the case of circumcision an action is wanting whereas there an action is not wanting but are his is self-contradictory I will tell you when does Arhista reject the argument of since where it leads to greater leniency but where it results in stringency he accepts it Marzitra son of Armari said to Rabbi the Barry the teacher since uncircumcision disqualifies and uncleanness disqualifies then just as uncleanness part uncleanness was not made tantamount to entire uncleanness so uncircumcision part uncircumcision was not made tantamount to Entire uncircumcision how is this uncleanness meant shall we say it means uncleanness of the person and what is meant by part uncleanness was not made tantamount to entire uncleanness that if there are four or five unclean persons and four or five clean persons the unclean do not disqualify the paschal lamb for the clean but then in the case of uncircumcision too they do not disqualify for we learn for circumcised and uncircumcised it is fit how then is uncleanness different that he is certain about it and how is uncircumcision different that he is doubtful hence it must refer to uncleanness of the flesh and what is meant by part uncleanness was not made tantamount to entire uncleanness for where one of the limbs becomes unclean that which becomes unclean we burn while the others we eat to what have you thus referred it to uncleanness of the flesh then consider the sequel you judge that which does not apply to all sacrifices by that which does not apply to all sacrifices Hence let not time disprove it since it applies to all sacrifices now what does uncleanness mean shall we say uncleanness of the flesh why does it not apply to all sacrifices hence it is obvious that it refers to uncleanness of person and what does it does not apply to all sacrifices mean for whereas in the case of all other sacrifices an uncircumcised person and an unclean person can send their sacrifices in the case of the
Let not uncleanness disprove it, seeing that it was freed from its general interdict, in which case shall we say Talmud, Mas Pesachim B. In the case of uncleanness of the flesh, where was it permitted? Hence it obviously refers to uncleanness of the person, and where was it permitted in the case of a community? Thus the first clause refers to uncleanness of flesh, while the second clause refers to the uncleanness of the person. Yes, he argues from the designation of uncleanness. Alternatively, the whole refers to uncleanness of the flesh, and as to the question where was it permitted, it was in the case of the uncleanness of the Paschal lamb, for we learn the Paschal lamb which comes if offered in uncleanness is eaten in uncleanness, for at the very outset it did not come for aught except to be eaten. Our son of our Joshua raised an objection if a Paschal lamb has passed its year and he its owner slaughtered it at its own time for its own purpose, and similarly when a man kills. Other sacrifices as a Passover offering in its own time our Eliezer disqualifies it while our Joshua declares it fit thus the reason that our Eliezer disqualifies it is that it is in its own time but if it were slaughtered at a different time it is fit yet why so let us say since he disqualifies it in its own time he also disqualifies it at a different time said our Papa there it is different because scripture saith then ye shall say the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover it is let it retain its own nature neither may it be slaughtered in the name of other sacrifices nor may others be slaughtered in its name in its time when it is disqualified if slaughtered in the name of others others are disqualified if slaughtered in its name at a different time when it is fit if slaughtered in the name of others others are fit if slaughtered in its name our simply came before our Yohanan and requested him let the master teach me the book of genealogy said he to him whence are you? He replied from Lot, and where is your dwelling in Nehartia? Said he to him, We do not discuss it either with the Lodians or with the Nehartians, and how much more so with you who are from Lot and live in Nehartia? But he urged him, and he consented, Let us learn it in three months. He proposed thereupon, he took a clot and threw it at him, saying, If Beruria, wife of Armeir, and daughter of Arhan of Eterion, who studied three hundred laws from three hundred teachers in one day, could nevertheless not do her duty in three years, yet you proposed to do it in three months. As he was going, he said to him, Master, what is the difference between the Passover sacrifice which is offered both for its own purpose and for a different purpose, and one that is offered both for those who can eat it and for those who cannot eat it? Since you are a scholar, he answered him, Come, and I will tell you when it is killed for its own purpose and for another purpose, its disqualification is in. Respect of itself when he kills it for those who can eat it and for those who cannot eat it its disqualification is not in respect of itself when it is for its own purpose and for another purpose it is impossible to distinguish its prohibition when it is for those who can eat it and for those who cannot eat it it is possible to distinguish its interdict sacrificing for its own purpose and for another purpose applies to the four services for those who can eat it and for those who cannot eat it does not apply to the four services the disqualification of sacrificing for its own purpose and for another purpose applies to the community as to an individual for those who can eat it and for those who cannot eat it does not apply to the community as to an individual or as she said that its disqualification is intrinsic and that it is impossible to distinguish its prohibition are one and the same thing for why does he say that its disqualification is intrinsic because it is impossible to distinguish its prohibition. Rami, the son of Rab Judah, said, Since the day that the book of genealogies was hidden, the strength of the sages has been impaired, and the light of their eyes has been dimmed. Marzitra said, Between Azel and Azel, they were laden with four hundred camels of exegetical interpretations. It was taught others say, If he put the circumcised before the uncircumcised, it is fit. The uncircumcised before the circumcised, it is disqualified. Wherein does the case? Where he put circumcised before uncircumcised, differ that it is fit because we require them to be all uncircumcised. Then where he put the uncircumcised before the circumcised, too, we require all to be uncircumcised, which is absent. Talmud, Mas Pesachim, shall we then say that the others hold slaughtering does not count, say that the end and this is in accordance with Rabbah, who said there is still the controversy. Therefore, if he put the circumcised before the uncircumcised, it operates. In respect of the circumcised, but it does not operate in respect of the uncircumcised. While if he put the uncircumcised before the circumcised, it operates in respect of the uncircumcised, but it does not operate in respect of the circumcised. Said Rabbi, not so in truth. The others hold that slaughtering counts from beginning to end. But the case we discuss here is the CG where he mentally determined it for both of them, i.e., both for circumcised and for uncircumcised, and he verbally expressed his intention for uncircumcised, but he had no time to say for the circumcised before the slaughtering was completed with the expressed intention of the uncircumcised alone. And they differ in this. Our mayor holds that we do not require his mouth and his heart to be the same in intention, while the rabbis hold we require his mouth and his heart to be the same. Yet does our mayor hold that we do not require his mouth and at the same service or at different services because the first. Statement only is regarded, but the rabbis maintain that his last words do count so that if both are expressed at the same service, there is a mixing of intentions and it does not become pickle for a sacrifice becomes pickle only when the blood has otherwise been properly sprinkled. This proves that the view that the first statement only is regarded is maintained even in respect of perhaps for the sacrifice is large enough to permit us to assume that each wrongful intention was expressed with respect to a different part thereof. And yet our Judah disagrees to this. Abbe answered, Do not think that the slaughtering counts only when it is completed so that the two intentions come together at the same moment. On the contrary, the slaughtering counts from beginning to end. And in the passage quoted, he cut one organ of the animal with the intention of eating it after time, and the second organ with the intention of eating it without the permitted area are mayor holding that you can make an animal. Pickle even at one organ only ritual slaughtering Sheshita consists of cutting across the two organs of the throat is the windpipe and the gullet this proves that Rabbah who raised this objection holds that in the views of our Meir and our Judah slaughtering counts only at the end hence the present passage too can be explained on that basis too thus he must express his intention for whom he is slaughtering the Passover sacrifice at the end of the slaughtering and at that moment there is insufficient time to mention both and so only the first expression is regarded the second being entirely disregarded therefore if he first mentions the circumcised it is fit while if he first mentions the uncircumcised it is unfit his heart to be the same but the following contradicts that he who intended saying let this be terima but he said tithe instead or let this be tithe and he said terima or I swear that I will not enter this house but he said that house or I vow that I will not benefit from this person but he said from that person he has said nothing unless his mouth and his heart are alike rather said obey the first clause means where he stated I cut the first organ for the circumcised and the second organ for the uncircumcised too so that at the second organ also circumcised too are included but the second clause means where he stated I cut the first organ for uncircumcised the second organ for circumcised so that at the first organ circumcised are not included now our mayor is consistent with his opinion for he maintained you can render a sacrifice pickle at half of that which makes it permitted while the rabbis are consistent with their view for they maintain you cannot render a sacrifice pickle at half of that which makes it permitted Mishnah he who slaughters the Passover offering with leaven in his possession violates a negative command our Judah said also the evening tamed to our Simeon said if he slaughters the Passover Offering with leaven on the fourteenth for its own purpose he is liable to punishment if for a different purpose he is exempt but for all other sacrifices whether slaughtered for their own purpose or for a different purpose he is exempt but if he slaughters the Passover sacrifice with leaven on the festival if for its own purpose he is exempt if for a different purpose he is liable but for all other sacrifices slaughtered on the festival with leaven whether for their own purpose or for another purpose he is liable except in the case or a sin offering which he slaughtered for a different purpose Gemara Arsimian Belakish said he is never liable unless there is leaven belonging to him who slaughters or to him who sprinkles the blood Talmud, Mos Pesachim B or to one of the members of the company and providing that it the leaven is with him in the temple court our Yohanan said even if it is not with him in the temple court wherein do they differ shall we say that they Differ in whether with L means near our Simeon Belakish holding with means near while our Yohanan holds we do not require within the sense of near but surely they have differed in this once already for we learned if a man slaughters the thanks offering within the temple court while its bread is without the wall the bread is not sanctified what does without the wall mean our Yohanan said without the wall of Beth
They differed on the subject of love and alone I would say it is only there that our Yohanan maintains that we do not require within the sense of near because it is a prohibited article and wherever it is it is but in the matter of sanctifying the bread it is not sanctified save within the temple court hence I would assume that he agrees with our Simeon Belakish that if it is inside it is sanctified and if not it is not sanctified by analogy with service vessels thus this latter case is necessary and if we were informed of this in the matter of sanctifying the bread I would say in this our Simeon Belakish maintains that we require within the sense of near so that if it is inside it is sanctified and if not it is not sanctified but in the matter of love and I would say that he agrees with our Yohanan that we do not require within the sense of near because it is a prohibited article and wherever it is it is hence they are both necessary our Ashai asked our MI what if he who slaughters has none but one of the members of the company has love and said he to him is it then written thou shalt not slaughter the blood of my sacrifice with thy leavened bread thou shalt not slaughter the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread is written if so he countered he is culpable even if a person at the end of the world possesses love and said he to him scripture saith thou shalt not slaughter the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the passover be left overnight unto the morning thus thou shalt not slaughter with leavened bread applies to those who are subject to it shall not be left overnight on its account our papa said as a corollary the priest who burns the fat on the altar violates a negative command since he is subject to the general interdict of leaving the emurim overnight it was taught in accordance with our papa he who slaughters the passover sacrifice with leavened violates a Negative command when is that when it belongs to him who slaughters or to him who sprinkles the blood or to one of the members of the company if it belong to someone at the end of the world he is not tied to him and whether he slaughters or sprinkles or burns the fat he is liable but he who rings a bird's neck on the fourteenth does not violate anything but the following contradicts it he who slaughters the Passover offering with leaven violates a negative command our Judah said the tamed. Two said they to him they the sages said thus of not accept the Passover offering alone when is that when either he who slaughters or he who sprinkles or one of the members of the company possesses eleven if a person at the end of the world possesses it he is not tied to him and whether he slaughters or he sprinkles or he rings a bird's neck or he sprinkles the blood of the bird he is liable but he who takes a handful of the meal offering does not violate a negative command. He who burns the emurim does not violate a negative command Talmud, Mos Pesachim and now the rulings on ringing are contradictory and the rulings on burning the fat are contradictory then according to your reasoning let that beritha itself present a difficulty to you for it teaches they said this of not accept the Passover offering alone and then it teaches whether he slaughters or he sprinkles or he rings a bird's neck or he sprinkles the blood of the bird say rather both are according to our Simeon the rulings on ringing are not contradictory here it refers to the 14th while there it means during the intermediate days and thus both the one and the other are according to our Simeon the rulings on the burning of fat too are not contradictory it is dependent on Tanaim for some compare burning to slaughtering whilst others do not compare them our Judah said the evening tame it too etc what is our Judah's reason he tells you scripture saith thou shalt not slaughter the blood of my sacrifice implying the sacrifice which is particularly assigned to me and which is that the tamed Arsimian said if he slaughters the Passover sacrifice with leaven on the 14th etc what is Arsimian's reason because my sacrifice my sacrifice is written twice read it a sacrifice my sacrifices for what law did the divine law divide them from one another and not write my sacrifices in one word to intimate when there is a sacrifice it is a paschal lamb. You are not liable on account of my sacrifices when there is no sacrifice you are liable for my sacrifices but if he kills the Passover offering with leaven on the festival if for its own purpose he is exempt etc the reason is that it is for a different purpose but if it is unspecified he is exempt yet why the Passover offering during the rest of the year is a peace offering can you then infer from this that the Passover offering during the rest of the year requires cancellation said R. I began it was thrown out from the mouth of the company and they said the circumstances are e.g. that its owners were unclean by reason of a dead body and relegated to the second Passover so that while unspecified it still stands to be sacrificed as a Passover offering mission of the Passover offering is slaughtered in three divisions for it is said and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it i.e. assembly congregation and Israel the first division entered it. Temple court was filled they closed the doors of the temple court they sounded a T-E-K-I-I-A-T-E-R-U and a T-E-K-I-I-A the priests stood in rows and in their hands were basins of silver and basins of gold a row which was entirely of silver was of silver and a row which was entirely of gold was of gold they were not mixed and the basins had no flat bottoms lest they put them down and the blood become congealed the Israelite killed the lamb and the priest caught the blood he handed it to his colleague and his colleague passed it on to his colleague and he received the full basin and gave back the empty one the priest nearest the altar sprinkled it once over against the base or the altar the first division then went out and the second entered the second went out and the third entered as a matter of the first group so was the matter of the second and the third they recited the hell if they finished it they repeated and if they repeated and were not finished yet they recited it a third time though they never did recite it a third time our Judah said the third division never reached I love that the Lord should hear etc because the people for it were few as was done on weekdays so was done on the Sabbath save that the priests willed the temple court but without the consent of the sages our Judah said he a priest used to fill a goblet with the mixed blood and he sprinkled it once on the altar but the sages did not agree with him how did they hang up it Sacrifices and flay them there were iron hooks fixed in the walls and in the pillars on which they suspended the sacrifices and flay them if anyone had no place to suspend and flay there were their thin smooth staves which he placed on his shoulder and on his neighbor's shoulder and so suspended the animal and flayed itr Eliezer said when the fourteenth Talmud, Mos Pesachim befell on the Sabbath he placed his hand on his neighbor's shoulder and his neighbor's hand on his shoulder and he thus suspended the sacrifice and flayed it then he tore it and took out its emur and placed them in a tray and burnt them on the altar the first division went out and sat down on the temple mount the second sat in the hell while the third remained in its place when it grew dark they went out and roasted their paschal lambs Gamar Isaac said the Passover offering was not slaughtered except in three divisions each consisting of thirty men what is the reason assembly Congregation and Israel are prescribed and we are doubtful whether that means at the same time or consecutively therefore we require three divisions each consisting of thirty men so that if it means at the same time they are there and if consecutively they are there hence fifty and all two are sufficient thirty entering and preparing their sacrifices and ten enter and ten leave and another ten enter and another ten leave the first division entered etc it was stated Abbe said we learned they the doors locked themselves Rabbi said we learned they locked wherein do they differ they differ in respect of relying on a miracle Abbe said we learned they locked themselves as many as entered entered and we rely on a miracle Rabbi said we learned they locked and we do not rely on a miracle and as to what we learned our Judah said heaven forfend that Akiva be Mehalalal was banned for the wisdom and fear of sin to Akiva be Mehalalal Abbe explains temple court was never closed Upon any man in Israel equal in it according to his view while Rabbah explains it according to his view Abbe explains it according to his view there was none in the temple court when it closed itself upon every man in Israel like Akiva Bimehalalel in wisdom and fear of sin Rabbah explains it according to his view there was none in the temple court when they closed it on all Israel like Akiva Bimehalalel in wisdom and the fear of sin our rabbis taught no man was ever crushed in the temple court except on one Passover in the days of Hillel when an old man was crushed and they called it the Passover of the crushed our rabbis taught King Agrippa once wished to cast his eyes on the host of Israel said he to the high priest cast your eyes upon the Passover sacrifices he thereupon took a kidney from each and six hundred thousand pairs of kidneys were found there twice as many as those who departed from Egypt excluding those who were unclean and those who were on a distant journey. And there was not a single paschal lamb for which more than ten people had not registered, and they called it the Passover of the dense throngs. He took a kidney, but it required burning on the altar. He burned them subsequently, but it is written, and Aaron's sons shall burn it, etc., which intimates that he must not mix the fat portions of one sacrifice with that of another. He subsequently burned them each separately, but it was taught, and the
Infer from this that carrying without moving the feet is carrying no perhaps he moved slightly too then in that case what does he inform us he informs us this in the multitude of people is the king's glory he received the full basin and gave back the empty one etc but not the reverse this supports our Simeon Belagish for our Simeon Belagish said you must not postpone the precepts the priest nearest the altar etc which Tana holds that the Passover offering requires sprinkling said R. It's dot it is our Jose the Galilean for it was taught our Jose the Galilean said thou shalt sprinkle their blood against the altar and thou shalt burn their fat its blood is not said but their blood its fat is not said but their fat this teaches concerning the firstling the tithe of animals and the Passover offering that they require the presenting of blood and a at the altar how do we know that they require sprinkling against the base at our Eliezer the meaning of sprinkling is deduced. From a burnt offering here it is written thou shalt sprinkle their blood against the altar while there it is written and Aaron's sons the priests shall sprinkle its blood against the altar round about just as the burnt offering requires sprinkling against the base so does the Passover offering to require sprinkling against the base Talmud, Mos Pesach and how do we know it of the burnt offering itself scripture set at the base of the altar of the burnt offering this proves that the burnt offering requires sprinkling at the base the first division went out etc a tan taught it the third division was called the slothful division but it was impossible otherwise what should they have done even so they should have hurried themselves as it was taught rabbi said the world cannot exist without a perfume maker and without a tanner happy is he whose craft is that of a perfume maker and woe to him whose craft is that of a tanner nor can the world exist without males and Females happy is he whose children are males and woe to him whose children are females as he did on weekdays etc. Without whose consent said are his da without the consent of our Eliezer for if the ruling of the rabbis is regarded surely they maintain that it is a Shabbat and a Shabbat is not interdicted in the temple what is the solution for it was taught whether he milk sets milk for curdling or makes cheese the standard for culpability is as much as a dried fig he who sweeps. The floor lays the dust by sprinkling water and removes loaves of honey if he does this unwittingly on the Sabbath he is liable to a sin offering if he does it deliberately on a festival he is flagellated with forty lashes this is our Eliezer's view but the sages maintain in both cases it is forbidden only as a Shabbat our Ashi said you may even say it means without the consent of the sages this agreeing with our Nathan for it was taught our Nathan said a Shabbat that is necessary they Permitted in the temple, but a Shabbat which is not necessary, they did not permit our Judah said he used to fill a goblet, etc. It was taught our Judah said he used to fill goblet with the mingled blood, so that should the blood of one of them be spilled, it is found that this renders it fit said they to our Judah. But surely if this mingled blood had not been received in a basin, how do they know rather they said thus to him? Perhaps it was not caught in a vessel. I too he answered them, spoke only of that which was received in a vessel. How does he know the priests are careful if they are careful? Why was it spilled? Because of the speed with which they work it is spilled, but the draining blood is mixed with it. Our Judah is consistent with his view, for he maintained the draining blood is considered proper blood, for it was taught the draining blood is subject to a warning. Our Judah said it is subject to Gareth, but surely our Eliezer said our Judah agrees in respect to atonement that it does not. Make atonement because it is said for it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of life Talmud, Mos Pesachim be blood wherewith life departs makes atonement and blood wherewith life does not depart does not make atonement rather reply our Judah is consistent with his view for he maintained blood cannot nullify other blood it was taught our Judah said to the sages on your view why did they stop up the holes in the temple court said they to him it is praiseworthy for the sons of Aaron. The priests to walk in blood up to their ankles but it interposed it is moist liquid and does not interpose as it was taught blood ink honey and milk if dry interpose it moist they do not interpose but their garments become blood dash stained whereas it was taught if his garments were soiled and he performed the service his service is unfit and should you answer that they raised their garments surely it was taught and the priest shall put out his linen measure that means that it must not. Be too short nor too long they could raise them at the carrying of the limbs to the altar ascent which was not a service was it not but since it required the priesthood it was a service for it was taught and the priest shall offer the whole and burn it on the altar this refers to the carrying of the limbs to the altar ascent rather they could raise them at the carrying of the wood to the altar pile which was not a service nevertheless how could they walk when carrying the limbs to the altar ascent and when carrying the blood they walked on balconies how did they hang up the sacrifices and flay them etc then he tore it open and took out its emir and placed them on a tray and burned them on the altar did he then burn them himself say to burn them on the altar the first division went out etc a tana taught each one placed his paschal lamb in its height and slung it behind him said Arilish in Arab like fashion chapterv mission of these things in connection with the Passover offering override the Sabbath its shechita and the sprinkling of its blood and the cleansing of its bowels and the burning of its fat but its roasting and the washing of its bowels do not override the Sabbath its carrying and bringing it from without the tehum and the cutting off of its wart do not override the Sabbath our Eliezer said they do override the Sabbath said our Eliezer does it not follow a fortiori of shechita which is usually forbidden as a labor overrides it. Sabbath shall not these which are only forbidden as a Shabbat override the Sabbath our Joshua answered him let festival esser but it wherein they permitted labor and forbade a Shabbat said our Eliezer to him what is this Joshua what proof is a voluntary act in respect of a precept our Akiba answered and said let has prove it which is performed because it is a precept and is normally forbidden only as a Shabbat yet it does not override the Sabbath so you too do not wonder at these that. Though they are required on account of the precept and are only forbidden as a Shabbat, yet they do not override the Sabbath, said our Eliezer to him, but in respect of that itself, I argue if Shechita, which is a labor, overrides the Sabbath, is it not logical that Hazah, which is only a Shabbat, overrides the Sabbath? Talmud, Mos Pesachim, said our Akibah to him, or on the contrary, if Hazah, which is forbidden as a Shabbat, does not override the Sabbath, then Shechita, which is normally forbidden on account of labor, is it not logical that it does not override the Sabbath? Akibah said our Eliezer to him, you would erase what is written in the Torah, let the children of Israel prepare the Passover sacrifice in its appointed time, implying both on weekdays and on the Sabbath, said he to him, Master, give me an appointed time for these, as there is an appointed season for Shechita, our Akibah stated a general rule work which could be done on the eve of the Sabbath, overrides the Sabbath. Shechita which could not be done on the eve of the Sabbath does override the Sabbath. Gemara our rabbis taught this halacha was hidden from i.e. forgotten by the Bani Bithira on one occasion the fourteenth of Nisan fell on the Sabbath and they forgot and Passover our Akiba holds that the Hazah must not be performed though the man is thereby prevented from joining in the Passover sacrifice did not know whether the Passover overrides the Sabbath or not said is there any man who knows whether the Passover overrides the Sabbath or not they were told there is a certain man who has come up from Babylonia Hillel the Babylonian by name who served the two greatest men of the time and he knows whether the Passover overrides the Sabbath or not thereupon they summoned him and said to him do you know whether the Passover overrides the Sabbath or not have we then only one Passover during the year which overrides the Sabbath replied he to them surely we have many more than two. Hundred Passovers during the year which override the Sabbath said they to him how do you know it he answered them in its appointed time is stated in connection with the Passover and in its appointed time is stated in connection with the Tamid just as its appointed time which is said in connection with the Tamid overrides the Sabbath so its appointed time which is said in connection with the Passover overrides the Sabbath moreover it follows a minority of the Tamid the omission of which is not punished by Gareth overrides the Sabbath and the Passover neglect of which is punished by Gareth is it not logical that it overrides the Sabbath they immediately set him at their head and appointed him Nasi patriarch over them and he was sitting and lecturing the whole day on the laws of Passover he began rebuking them with words said he to them what caused it for you that I should come up from Babylonia to be a Nasi over you it was your indolence because you did not serve the two greatest. Men of the time Shimea and Abtalion said they to him Master what if a man forgot and did not bring a knife on the eve of the Sabbath I have heard this law he answered but have forgotten it but leave it to Israel if they are not prophets yet they are the children of prophets on the morrow he
Rather he spoke to them on their own ground it is well that you do not learn Gazerishawa because a man cannot argue by Gazerishawa of his own accord but an inference a minori which a man can argue of his own accord you should have argued said they to him it is a fallacious a minori argument the master said on the morrow he whose passover was a lamb stuck it in its wool he whose passover was a goat stuck it between its horns talmud mas pesishim but he performed work with sacred animals they did as hillel for it was taught it was related of hillel as long as he lived no man ever committed trespass through his burnt offering but he brought it unconsecrated hull into the temple court consecrated it laid his hand upon it and slaughtered it yet how might a person consecrate the passover on the sabbath surely we learned you may not consecrate nor make evaluation bound nor make a vow of her and nor separate terima and tithes they said all this of festivals how much the more of the Sabbath that applies only to obligations for the discharge of which no time is fixed, but in the case of obligations for the discharge of which a time is fixed, you may consecrate for our Yohan and said a man may consecrate his Passover on the Sabbath and his festival offering Hajjah on the festival, but he drives a laden animal, it is driving in an unusual way, but even driving in an unusual manner, granted that there is no scriptural prohibition, there is nevertheless a rabbinical prohibition that is precisely what they ask him, an action which is permitted by scripture while a matter of a stands before it to render it impossible, such as an action performed in an unusual manner standing in the way of a precept. What then said he to them, I have heard this halacha, but have forgotten it, but leave it to Israel if they are not prophets, they are the sons of prophets. Rab Judah said in Rab's name, whoever is boastful, if he is a sage, his wisdom departs. From him, if he is a prophet, his prophecy departs from him. If he is a sage, his wisdom departs from him. We learn this from Hillel, for the master said he began rebuking them with words, and then he said to them, I have heard this halacha, but have forgotten it. If he is a prophet, his prophecy departs from him. We learn this from Deborah, for it is written, the ruler ceased in Israel. They ceased until that I rose. Deborah, I rose a mother in Israel, and it is written, Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Utter a song, Rush Lakish said, as to every man who becomes angry, if he is a sage, his wisdom departs from him. If he is a prophet, his prophecy departs from him. If he is a sage, his wisdom departs from him. We learn this from Moses, for it is written, and Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, etc. And it is written, and Eliezer the priest said unto the men of war that went to the battle, This is a statute of the law which the Lord hath commanded Moses, etc. Whence it follows that it had been. Forgotten by Moses, if he is a prophet, his prophecy departs from him. We learn this from Elisha because it is written, Were it not that I regard the presence of Yahashaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. And it is written, But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord, i.e., the spirit of prophecy, came upon him. Armani B. Paddish said, Whoever becomes angry, even if greatness has been decreed for him by heaven, is cast down. Whence do we know it from Eliab? For it is said, And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why art thou come down? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy presumptuousness and the naughtiness of thy heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And when Samuel went to anoint him as a king of all David's brothers, it is written, Neither hath the Lord chosen this, whereas of Eliab it is written, But the Lord saith unto Samuel, Look. Not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him, hence it follows that he had favored him until then we have thus found that the Tamit and the Passover override the Sabbath. How do we know that they override uncleanness? I will tell you just as he learns the Passover from the Tamit in respect to the Sabbath, so also does he learn the Tamit from the Passover in respect to uncleanness, and how do we know it of the Passover itself? Said Aryohan, and because the writ. Seth, if any man of you shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, a man, i.e., an individual is relegated to the second Passover, but a community is not relegated to the second Passover, but they must offer it in a state of uncleanness. Our Simeon B. Lakish said to Aryohan, and say a man is relegated to the second Passover, whereas a community has no remedy for its uncleanness, neither on the first Passover, not on the second Passover, rather said our Simeon B. Lakish, it is deduced from your commandment. Children of Israel that they send out of the camp of every leper and every one that hath an issue and whosoever is unclean by the dead let scripture state those who are unclean by the dead and not state Zavin and lepers and I would argue if those who are unclean by the dead are sent out of the camp how much the more Zavin and lepers Talmud, Mos Pesachim but it intimates there is a time when Zavin and lepers are sent out whereas those who are unclean by the dead are not sent out and when is that it is when the Passover comes is sacrificed in uncleanness at Abbey if so let us also argue let scripture state Azab and those who are unclean by the dead and let it not state a leper and I would argue if Azab is sent out how much the more a leper but the fact that a leper is stated intimates there is a time when lepers are sent out whereas Zavin and those who are unclean by the dead are not sent out and when is that it is when the Passover comes in uncleanness and should you say that indeed is so surely we learn the Passover which comes in uncleanness of and Zab off menstruant women and women in childbirth must not eat thereof yet if they ate they are not liable to Garth rather said Abay after all it is derived from the first verse and as to the question raised the reply is if so let the divine law write if any man of you shall be unclean what is the purpose of by reason of a dead body and should you say this phrase by reason of a dead body comes for this purpose is only he who is unclean by reason of a dead body is relegated to the second Passover but not other unclean persons surely it was taught you might think that only those who are unclean by the dead and he who was on a distant journey keep the second Passover whence do we know to include Zabin and lepers and those who had intercourse with menstruant women therefore it is stated any man then what is the purpose of the phrase by reason of a dead body which the Divine Lord, but this is what Scripture states: A man, i.e., an individual, is relegated to the second Passover, whereas a community is not relegated to the second Passover, but they keep the first Passover in uncleanness. And when do the community keep the first Passover in uncleanness? When they are unclean by reason of the dead. But in the case of other forms of uncleanness, they do not keep it. Thus, Arhista said, if a leper entered within his barrier, he is exempt from flagellation, because it is said, he shall dwell solitary without the camp. Shall his dwelling be the rid transformed? And his prohibition into a positive command and objection is raised. A leper who entered within his barrier is punished with forty lashes. Zavin and Zabah who entered within their barrier are punished with forty lashes, while he who is unclean by the dead is permitted to enter the Levitical camp. And they said this not only of him who is unclean by the dead, but even of the dead himself. For it is said, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, with him implying within his barrier precincts. It is a controversy of ten aim, for it was taught he shall dwell solitary. That means he shall dwell alone, so that other unclean persons should not dwell with him. You might think that Zavin and unclean persons are sent away to one the same camp. Therefore, it is stated that they defile not their camps. This is to assign a camp for this one and a camp for that one. This is our Judas. Opinion: Our Simeon said it is unnecessary for lo. It is said, command the children of Israel that they send out of the camp every leper and everyone that hath all issue and whosoever is unclean by the dead. Now let Scripture state those who are unclean by the dead and not state Zab. And I would say if those who are unclean by the dead are sent out, how much the more Zavin? Why then is Zab stated to assign a second camp to him? And let Scripture state Zab and not state leper. And I would say if. Zavin are sent out how much the more lepers why then is a leper stated to assign a third camp to him when it states he shall dwell solitary the rid transforms it the prohibition into a positive command what is the greater stringency of a zav over him who is unclean by reason of the dead because uncleanness issues upon him from his own body on the contrary he who is unclean by the dead is more stringent since he requires sprinkling on the third and the seventh day scripture saith instead of the unclean and whosoever coal is unclean to include him who is unclean through a reptile and a zav is more stringent than he who is unclean through a reptile and what is his greater stringency as we have stated on the contrary a reptile is more stringent since it defiles even accidentally I will tell you Talmud Mas Pesachim be to that extent a zav too is certainly defiled through an accident in accordance with Arhuna for Arhuna said the first discharge of a zav defile when it is caused by an accident what is the greater stringency of a le
Whosoever is unclean by the dead when those who are unclean by the dead are sent out Dobbin and lepers are sent out when those who are unclean by the dead are not sent out Dobbin and lepers are not sent out the master said and every coal one that hath an issue is to include a BAL carry the supports are you had and for are you had and said the sellers under the temple were not consecrated and a BAL carry is sent without the two camps an objection is raised a BAL carry is like a person defiled. Through contact with a reptile surely that means in respect of their camp no it means in respect of their uncleanness you say in respect of their uncleanness surely uncleanness until evening is written in connection with the one and uncleanness until evening is written in connection with the other hence it must surely mean in respect of their camp no after all it means in respect of their uncleanness and he informs us this that a BAL carry is like a person defiled through the Contact of the reptile just as the contact of a reptile defile even accidentally so is a BAL carry defiled when the semen is discharged accidentally an objection is raised Talmud, Mas Pesachim he who has intercourse with an is like he who is unclean by the dead in respect of what shall we say in respect of their uncleanness but uncleanness for seven days is written in connection with the one and uncleanness for seven days is written in connection with the other hence it must surely be in respect of their camp and since the second clause is in respect of their camps the first clause too is in respect of their camps what argument is this the one is as stated and the other is as stated an objection is raised a leper is more stringent than Azab and Azab is more stringent than he who is unclean by the dead a BAL carry is accepted for he who is unclean by the dead is more stringent than he what does is accepted mean surely it means he is accepted from the rule of a. Zab and is included in the rule of him who is unclean by the dead, seeing that he who is unclean by the dead is more stringent than he, and yet he is permitted within the Levitical camp. No, it means that he is accepted from the camp of him who is unclean by the dead and is included in the camp of Zab, and though he who is unclean by the dead is more stringent than he, and yet he may enter the Levitical camp. Nevertheless, we compare him the Bal carry to what is like himself at Hana. Recited before our Isaac be of Dimi, then he shall go abroad out of the camp. This means the camp of the Shechinah, he shall not come within the camp. This means the Levitical camp. From this we learn that a Bal carry must go without the two camps. Said he to him, You have not yet brought him, and that you should already expel him. Another version, You have not yet expelled him, and already you discuss whether he should enter. Rather say abroad out of the camp. This is the Levitical camp. He shall not. Come within the camp that is the camp of the Shechinah to this Rabban and assume that both refer to the camp of the Shechinah being repeated so that he should violate an affirmative command and a negative command on its account if so let scripture say then he shall go abroad out of the camp and he shall not enter what is the purpose of within the camp infer from it that it is to prescribe another camp for him and the cleansing the of its bowels what is the cleansing of its bowels are huna said it means that we pierce them with a knife high said it means the removal of the viscous substance of the bowels which comes out through the pressure of the knife are Eliezer observed what is high birab's reason because it is written and the waste places of the fat ones mayhem shall wander as he how does this imply it as our Joseph translated and the estates of the wicked shall the righteous inherit and shall the lambs feed as in their pasture kid be Jeremiah interpreted it in Rab's name as was spoken about them Kim Bam what means as was spoken about them said Abay and the waste places of the fat ones shall wander as eat said Rabbah to him if the waste places were written it would be well as you say since however and the waste places is written the states another thing rather said Rabbah it is to be explained as our Hanil said in Rab's name for our Hanil said in Rab's name the righteous are destined to resurrect the dead for here it is written then shall the lambs feed to Dobram while elsewhere it is written then shall Bashan and Gilead feed as in the days of old now Bashan means Elisha who came from Bashan as it is said and Jana and Shaphat in Bashan while it is written Elisha the son of Shaphat is here who poured water on the hands of Elijah again Gilead alludes to Elijah for it is said and Elijah the Tishbite who was of the settlers of Gilead said unto Ahab our Samuel be Naman he said in our Jonathan's name it. Righteous are destined to resurrect the dead for it is said there shall yet old men and old women sit in the broad places of Jerusalem every man with his staff in his hand for very age and it is written and lay my staff upon the face of the child Ola opposed two verses it is written he will swallow up death forever but it is written for the youngest shall die a hundred years old there is no difficulty there the reference is to Israel here to heathens but what business have the heathens? There because it is written and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks and aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers are his dog opposed two verses it is written and the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed whereas it is written moreover the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of the seven days there is no difficulty the former refers to the world to come the latter to the days of the Messiah but According to Samuel who maintained this world differs from the messianic age only in respect of the servitude to governments what can be said both refer to the world to come yet there is no difficulty one refers to the camp of the righteous the other to the camp of the Shechin Arabah opposed two verses it is written I kill and I make alive whilst it is also written I have wounded and I heal seeing that he even resurrects how much the more does he heal but the Holy One blessed be he said thus. What I put to death I make alive just as I wounded and I heal the same person our rabbis taught I kill and I make alive you might say I kill one person and give life to another as the world goes on therefore it is stated I have wounded and I heal just as the wounding and the healing obviously refer to the same person so death and life refer to the same person this refutes those who maintain that resurrection is not intimated in the Torah another interpretation at first what I slay I Resurrect and then what I wounded I will heal Talmud, Mas Pesachim B and the burning of its fat it was taught our Simeon said come and see how precious is a precept in its proper time for lo the precept of burning the fats and limbs and the fat pieces is valid all night yet we do not wait for burning them until nightfall its carrying and its bringing etc but the following contradicts it you may cut off a word of an animal in the temple but not in the country and if it is done with a utensil a knife it is forbidden in both cases our Eliezer and our Jose Behan one answered both refer to removing the word with the hand one refers to a moist word the other to a dry one while the other maintains both refer to a moist word yet there is no difficulty one means by hand and the other means with a utensil now according to him who explained one means by hand and the other means with a utensil why did he not say both mean by hand yet there is no difficulty one refers to a moist Word the other to a dry one he can answer you a dry one just crumbles away and according to him who maintained both mean by hand yet there is no difficulty one refers to a moist word the other to a dry one why did he not say both refer to a moist word yet there is no difficulty one means by hand and the other means with a utensil he can answer you as for a utensil surely he the tana teaches there if it is done with a utensil it is forbidden in both cases and the other that which he teaches about a utensil here is because he comes to inform us of the controversy of our Eliezer and our Joshua said our Eliezer if Shechet etc our Joshua is consistent with his view for he maintains rejoicing on a festival too is a religious duty for it was taught our Eliezer said a man has not else to do on a festival save either to eat and drink or to sit and study our Joshua said divide it to both half of it to eating and drinking and half of it to the Beth Hamid Rash now are Yohanan said. Thereon both deduce it from the same verse. One verse says a solemn assembly to the Lord thy God, whereas another verse says there shall be a solemn assembly unto you. Or Eliezer holds that means either entirely to God or entirely to you. While our Joshua holds divided to both half to God and half to yourselves. Nemonic of Amar Eliezer said all agree in respect to the feast of weeks. Ezra that we require it to be for you too. What is the reason? It is the day on which the Torah was given. Rabbi said all agree in respect to the Sabbath that we require it to be for you too. What is the reason? And thou shalt call the Sabbath a delight. Our Joseph said all agree that on Purim we require for you too. What is the reason? Days of feasting and gladness is written in connection there with Mar son of Rabbi would fast the whole year except on the feast of weeks Purim and the eve of the day of atonement. The feast of weeks because it is the day on which the Torah was given Purim because. Days of feasting and gladness is written in connection there with the eve of the day of atonement for high of fifty taught and ye shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month do we then fast on the ninth surely we fast on the tenth but this is to tell you wh
Permitted Talmud, Mas Pesach and our Eliezer in his view the Shabbat required for a precept is more important than was taught our Eliezer said I argue if the necessary adjuncts of the precept which come after Shechita when the precept has already been performed override the Sabbath shall not the necessary adjuncts of the precept which come before Shechita override the Sabbath said are Akiba to him if the necessary adjuncts of the precept which come after Shechita override the Sabbath. The reason is because the Shechita has already overridden the Sabbath will you say that the necessary adjuncts of the precept before the Shechita shall override the Sabbath seeing that the Shechita has not yet overridden the Sabbath another argument is the sacrifice may be found to be unfit and thus he will be found retrospectively to have desecrated the Sabbath if so let us not slaughter it either lest the sacrifice be found unfit and thus it be found that he retrospectively desecrated. The Sabbath rather he first told him this argument and he refuted it and then he told him this the reason is etc be studied by day and by night heaven and earth would not enjoy permanence how then could Arshis hey take such a selfish view of his studies our Akiba answered and said let has approve it etc it was taught our Eliezer said to him Akiba you have refuted me by Shechita by Shechita shall be his death said he to him master do not deny me at the time of argument I have thus received. The law from you this Hazah is a Shabbat and does not override the Sabbath and since he himself had taught it to him what is the reason that he retracted said Ullah when our Eliezer taught it to him it was concerning Hazah for the sake of Terima since Terima itself does not override the Sabbath and our Akiba too when he refuted him refuted him by Hazah for the sake of Terima which is likewise a religious duty and is usually forbidden as a Shabbat but he our Eliezer thought that he was refuting him by Hazah for the Passover sacrifice rabbi raised an objection Arakiba answered and said let the Hazah of a person unclean through the dead prove refuted when his seventh day falls on the Sabbath and on the eve of Passover so that it is a religious duty and it is only a Shabbat yet it does not override the Sabbath hence he Eliezer certainly taught him about Hazah for the sake of the Passover sacrifice then since he himself had taught it to him what is the reason that our Eliza rebutted him thus our Eliza had forgotten his own tradition and our Akiba came to remind him of his tradition and let him tell it to him explicitly he thought that it would not be mannerly now what is the reason that Hazah does not override the Sabbath consider it is mere handling then let it override the Sabbath on account of the Passover sacrifice said rabbi it is a preventive measure lest he take it the water of purification and carry it four cubits in Public ground, but according to our Eliezer, let us indeed carry it for our Eliezer rule the necessary adjuncts to a precept override the Sabbath. I will tell you that is only when the man himself is fit to perform the precept and the obligation lies upon him. But here that the man himself is not fit, the obligation does not lie upon him. Rabbi said, according to the words of our Eliezer, if there is a healthy infant, one may heat water for him to strengthen him and to circumcise him on the Sabbath. Since it is fit for him, if there is a sickly infant, one may not heat hot water for him to strengthen him and to circumcise him. Since it is not fit for him, said Rabbi, but if he is healthy, why does he need hot water to strengthen him? Rather, said Rabbi, all are regarded as invalids in respect to circumcision, both in the case of a strong infant or a sickly infant, one may not heat hot water for him to strengthen him and to circumcise him on the Sabbath, since it is not fit for him, have Objection against him an adult uncircumcised person who did not circumcise himself on the eve of Passover is punished by Gareth. This is the view of our Eliezer now here though the man himself is unfit yet he states that he is punished by Gareth which proves that the obligation lies upon him said Rabbi our Eliezer holds one may not slaughter the Passover and sprinkle its blood for him who is unclean through a reptile Talmud, Mos Pesachim B and wherever an individual would be relegated to. The second Passover in the case of a community they keep it in uncleanness and whatever is obligatory in the case of a community is obligatory in the case of an individual and whatever is not obligatory in the case of a community is not obligatory in the case of an individual hence as for the defect of uncircumcision where if the whole community are uncircumcised we say to them arise circumcise yourselves and sacrifice the Passover then an individual too we say to him arise. Circumcise yourself and sacrifice the Passover while if he does not circumcise himself and does not sacrifice he is punished with Gareth but in the case of uncleanness where if the whole community is unclean we do not sprinkle the water of purification upon them but they keep it in uncleanness therefore an individual too is not culpable Arhuna son of Arjashua said to Rabbi yet there is a second Passover which is not practiced in the case of a community yet it is practiced in the case of an individual there it is different replied he because the community has already sacrificed at the first Passover an objection is raised you might think that there is no penalty of Gareth for neglecting to offer the Passover except if he the delinquent was clean and was not on a journey afar off how do we know it of an uncircumcised person and one who was unclean through a reptile and all others who are unclean because it is stated and the man that is clean etc in essence. He seeks a verse to teach the inclusion of him who is unclean through a reptile. He evidently holds one may not slaughter the Passover sacrifice and sprinkle its blood for him who is unclean through a reptile. For if one may slaughter and sprinkle, why seek a verse for him, seeing that he is indeed identical with a clean person by the rule stated, a community in like condition is not bound to purify itself but may sacrifice in uncleanness again, since the community need not purify itself by sprinkling. An individual is not obliged to either, for an individual has no obligation which is not likewise binding upon the community. Consequently, since an individual is not bound to purify himself, he may not do so on the Sabbath. But if the whole community are uncircumcised, it is their duty to circumcise themselves on the eve of Passover, and therefore it is the duty of an individual to neglect of which entails Karath had he, however, held that we do slaughter the Passover for a man. Who is unclean through a reptile or through a corpse when his seventh day falls on the eve of Passover? Then, since the individual is not relegated, the community too might not sacrifice in uncleanness but would have to purify itself. And as a corollary, since the community would have to perform hazard, it would also be an individual's duty, and in consequence, it would be permitted on the Sabbath. This proves that though he is not fit, the obligation is upon him to make himself fit. And though this is not so in the case of a community, yet it is so in the case of an individual. Rather, said Rabbi our Eliezer holds one may slaughter and sprinkle for a man who is unclean through a reptile, and the same law applies to a man who is unclean through the dead on his seventh day. Then, for what purpose is the hazard for the eating? Yet the eating of the Passover sacrifice is not indispensable. Our Adabi Abba said to Rabbi, if so, it is found that the Passover sacrifice is slaughtered for those who. Cannot eat it for those who cannot eat it means for the infirm and the aged he replied since they are physically unfit but this one is indeed fit save that he is not made ready our Akiba stated a general rule etc. Rab Judah said in Rab's name the Halachah is as our Akiba and we learn similarly in respect to circumcision our Akiba stated a general rule no labor which can be performed on the eve of the Sabbath overrides the Sabbath circumcision which cannot be performed on the eve of the Sabbath overrides the Sabbath and Rab Judah said in Rab's name the Halachah is as our Akiba now both are necessary for if he informed us this in connection with the Passover I would say it is only there that the necessary adjuncts of the precept do not override the Sabbath because thirteen covenants were not made over it but as for circumcision over which thirteen covenants were made I would say that they, the adjuncts override the Sabbath while if he informed us this of circumcision I would. Argue it is only there that the necessary adjuncts of the precept do not override the Sabbath since there is no Gareth but as for the Passover sacrifice where there is Gareth I might argue let the necessary adjuncts override the Sabbath thus they are necessary Mishnah when does he bring a Hajjagah with it the Passover sacrifice when it comes during the week in purity and in small portions but when it comes on the Sabbath in large portions and in Uncle Anas one does not bring the Hajjagah with it the Hajjagah was brought of flocks herds lambs or goats of the males or the females and it is eaten two days and one night tomorrow what has he taught previously that he now teaches about the Hajjagah he has taught about carrying it the Paschal lamb on his shoulders and bringing it which do not override the Sabbath so he also teaches about the Hajjagah that it too does not override the Sabbath and he states thus when does one bring a Hajjagah with it when it comes during the week in purity and in small portions are as she said this proves that the Hajjagah of the 14th
Overnight but not in respect of roast or perhaps there is no difference come and here on this night all must be eaten roast and Arhista said these are the words of the son of Tima this proves it the scholars asked according to the son of Tima does it the Hajjaga come from a herd or does it not come from a herd does it come from females or does it not come from females does it come a two-year-old or does it not come a two-year-old do we say when the divine law compared it to it? Passover it was in the matter of eating but not in respect of all other things or perhaps there is no difference come and here the Hajjaga which comes with the Passover is as the Passover it comes from the flock but it does not come from a herd it comes from the males but it does not come from the females it comes a year old but it does not come a two-year-old and it may be eaten only a day and a night and it may be eaten only roast and it may be eaten only by those who have registered for. It now whom do you know to hold this view the son of Tima this proves that we require everything this proves it the scholars asked according to the son of Tima is it subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone or is it not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone do we say though the divine law assimilated it to the Passover yet the writ saith neither shall ye break a bone thereof implying thereof but not of the Hajjaga or perhaps this thereof comes to teach of a fit. Sacrifice but not of an unfit one come and here if a slaughtering knife is found on the fourteenth one may slaughter with it immediately if it is found on the thirteenth he must repeat the table if he finds a chopper whether on the one or on the other he must repeat the table who is the authority for this shall we say the rabbis wherein does a slaughtering knife differ that we assume that it had been immersed because it is fit for slaughtering the Passover than a chopper too. Surely it is fit for breaking the bones of the Hajjah, hence it must be the view of the son of Tima which proves that it is subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone. No, in truth it is the view of the rabbis and this was taught e.g. when it the Passover comes on the Sabbath but since the second clause teaches if the fourteenth occurred on the Sabbath he may slaughter with it immediately and likewise if he finds it on the fifteenth he may slaughter with it immediately if a chopper is found tied to a knife it is as the knife it follows that the first clause does not treat of the Sabbath rather it means that at the Passover readiness for slaughtering the Passover on the fourteenth we disregard the possibility that the owner may have lost it some time ago for Jerusalem was thronged at Passover and it could not have lain long without being discovered came Talmud, Mos Pesachim B in large portions how can we know rather it means that it came in uncleanness yet. After all how could they know the Nasai had died when did the Nasai die shall we say that he died on the 13th then why was it necessary for the owner to perform tabilah for the knife again if he died on the 14th wherein does the knife differ that we say he its owner gave a tabilah and wherein does the chopper differ that we assume he did not give a tabilah this arises only when the Nasai was in a dying condition on the 13th as for the knife concerning which there is one doubt he would give a tabilah on the 13th the chopper concerning which there are two doubts he would not give a tabilah it was taught you to the son of Durda separated himself from the sages he and his son Durda and went and dwelt in the south for said he of Elijah should come and say to Israel why did you not sacrifice the Hajjah on the Sabbath what can they answer him I am astonished that the two greatest men of our generation Shimei and Abtalion who are great Sages and great interpreters of the Torah, yet they have not told Israel the Hajjah overrides the Sabbath. Rab said, What is the reason of the son of Judah? Because it is written, And thou shalt sacrifice the Passover offering unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd. Yet surely the Passover offering is only from lambs or goats, but flock refers to the Passover offering, while herd refers to the Hajjah and the divine law set, And thou shalt sacrifice the Passover offering, said Arashi. And are we to arise and explain the reason of schismatics? But the verse comes for the exegesis of Arnaman, for Arnaman said in Rabbi Abba's name, How do we know that the leftover of the Paschal offering is brought as a peace offering? Because it is said, And thou shalt sacrifice the Passover offering unto the Lord thy God of the flock and of the herd. Now does then the Passover offering come from the herd? Surely the Passover offering comes only from lambs or from goats, but it means the left. Over of the Paschal offering is to be utilized for something which comes from the flock and from the herd. Now, according to the rabbis, what is the reason that it the Hajjah does not override the Sabbath, seeing that it is certainly a public sacrifice at RLA on the authority of our Judah B. Sapphire scripture set, and yet shall keep it a feast hag unto the Lord seven days in the year seven? But there were eight hands from here. We learned that the Hajjah does not override the Sabbath when Rabin came. He said, I stated before my teachers, sometimes you can only find six e.g. if the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles fell on the Sabbath, said Abbe that Abin the childless should say such a thing. Eight is altogether impossible, while seven are found in most years. Well, said in RLA's name, peace offerings which a man slaughtered on the eve of the festival, he does not discharge there with his duty either on account of rejoicing or on account of Hajjah, on account of rejoicing. Because it is written, and thou shalt sacrifice peace offerings, and thou shalt rejoice. We require the slaughtering Talmud, Mos Pesachim, at the time of rejoicing, which is absent here on account of Hajjah. This is an obligatory sacrifice, and every obligatory sacrifice comes from not but Holland. Shall we say that the following supports him? For it was taught, and thou shalt be altogether a.k. joyful. This is to include the night of the last day of the festival for rejoicing. You say the night of the last day of the festival. Yet perhaps it is not so, but the night of the first day of the festival. Therefore, a.k. is stated dividing it now. What is the reason? Is it not because he has not wherewith to rejoice? No, it is as it states. The reason why do you prefer to include the night of the last day of the festival and to exclude the night of the first day of the festival? I include the night of the last day of the festival because there is rejoicing before it, while I exclude it. Night of the first day of the festival, seeing that there is no rejoicing before it, or Joseph raised an objection to Hajjah of the fourteenth one discharges with it his duty on account of rejoicing, but one does not discharge with it his duty on account of Hajjah. Yet why so surely we require slaughtering to be at the time of rejoicing, which is lacking here, said R.E.D.B. Abin. It is meant where he delayed and slaughtered it on the fifteenth. Arashi observed this too is logical for if you should not say thus who taught this teaching the son of Tima, but according to the son of Tima, surely he has disqualified it through keeping it overnight. Rabbi objected the reciting of hell and rejoicing are observed eight days now. If you say that we require the slaughtering at the time of rejoicing, then there are many occasions when only seven are found. E.g. if the first day of the festival falls on the Sabbath, said Arhuna, son of Rab Judah, he rejoices with the he goats of the festivals. Said Rabbi of this there are two refutations firstly because the he goats of the festivals can be eaten raw on the Sabbath but cannot be eaten roast and there is no rejoicing in eating raw meat moreover the priests eat it and wherewith do the Israelites rejoice rather said our papa he rejoices with clean garments and old wine when Rabin came he said in our Eliezer's name peace offerings which one slaughtered on the eve of the festival he discharges there with his duty on account of rejoicing. But he cannot discharge there with his duty on account of Hajjah he discharges his duty on account of rejoicing for we do not require the slaughtering at the time of rejoicing but not on account of Hajjah this is an obligatory sacrifice and every obligatory sacrifice comes from not but Holland objection is raised and thou shalt be altogether a.k. joyful this is to include the night of the last day of the festival for rejoicing you say to include the light of the last day of it. Festival yet perhaps it is not so but it is to include the night of the first day of the festival therefore AK is stated dividing it now what is the reason is it not because he has no light wherewith to rejoice no it is as it was taught why do you prefer to include the night of the last day of the festival and to exclude the night of the first day of the festival I include the night of the last day of the festival because there is rejoicing before it while I exclude the night of the first day of the festival because there is no rejoicing before it our Kahana said how do we know that the Emirim of the Hajjah of the 15th are disqualified through being kept overnight because it is said neither shall the fat of my feast Hagai remain all night until morning and in proximity thereto the first is stated to intimate that this morning means the first morning to this are Joseph the Mur, thus the reason is that first is written but if first were not written I would say what does Morning mean the second morning, but is there a case where the flesh is disqualified from the evening, whereas the Emirim are fit until morning? Said Abay to him, yet why not? Surely there is a Paschal offering according to our Eliezer B. Ezrai, where the flesh is disqualified from midnight
Therewith if the Hajjah of the 15th surely a day and a night is written in connection therewith but this is in respect of the Hajjah of the 15th while the whole of the other verse is in respect of the Hajjah of the 14th only and thus it teaches concerning the Hajjah of the 14th that it may be eaten two days and one night thus the reason is that on the first day until the morning is written so that what does morning mean the second morning hence wherever morning is. Written without qualification it means the first morning even if first is not written in connection with it mission if the Passover was slaughtered for a different purpose on the Sabbath he the slaughterer is liable to a sin offering on its account while all other sacrifices which he slaughtered as a Passover if they are not eligible he is culpable while if they are eligible our Eliza rules him liable to a sin offering while our Joshua rules him not culpable said our Eliza to him if it Passover which is permitted for its own purpose yet when he changes its purpose he is culpable then other sacrifices which are forbidden even for their own purpose if he changes their purpose is it not logical that he is culpable our Joshua answered him not so if you say thus of the Passover he is culpable because he changed it for something that is forbidden will you say the same of other sacrifices where he changed them for something that is permitted said our Eliza to him let it Public sacrifices prove it which are permitted for their own sake yet he who slaughters other sacrifices in their name is culpable our Joshua answered him not so if you say thus of public sacrifices that is because they have a limit will you say the same of the Passover which has no limit our Meir said he too who slaughters other sacrifices in the name of public sacrifice is not liable if he slaughtered it for those who are not its eaters or for those who were not registered for uncircumcised or for unclean persons he is culpable if he slaughtered it for its eaters and for those who are not its eaters for those who are registered for it and for those who are not registered for it for circumcised and for uncircumcised for unclean and for clean persons he is not liable if he slaughtered it and it was found to possess a blemish he is liable if he slaughtered it and it was found tearful internally he is not liable if he slaughtered it and then it became known that its owners had withdrawn their hands from it or that they had died or that they had become unclean he is not culpable because he slaughtered with permission Talmud, Mos Pesachim Gemara what are we discussing shall we say where he heard then you may infer from this that abrogation in error constitutes abrogation hence it means that he intentionally abrogates its status and consider the sequel while all other sacrifices which he slaughtered as a Passover if they are not eligible he is culpable while if they are eligible our Eliza rules him liable to a sin offering while our Joshua rules him not culpable but if he abrogates their status what does it matter whether they are eligible or they are not eligible hence it obviously refers to a man who errs then the first clause refers to a man who abrogates its status whereas the second clause refers to him who errs said Arabin yes the first clause refers to a man who abrogates whereas the second clause refers to him who errs. Our Isaac B. Joseph found Arab standing in a large concourse of people said he to him how is our mission meant the first clause refers to a man who abrogates whereas the second clause refers to him who hears he answered him he learned it from him forty times and it seemed to him as though it were lying in his wallet we learned said our Eliza if the Passover which is permitted for its own purpose yet when he changes its purpose he is culpable then other sacrifices which are forbidden for their own purpose if he changes their purpose is it not logical that he is culpable but if this interpretation is so surely they are dissimilar since the first clause refers to a man who abrogates whereas the second clause refers to him who hears in our Eliza's view there is no difference but according to our Joshua who holds that there is a difference let him answer him thus he says thus to him according to my view they are dissimilar for the first clause refers to a man who abrogates whereas the Second clause refers to him who hears but even according to you it is not so if you say thus of the Passover he is culpable because he changed it for something that is forbidden will you say the same of other sacrifices where he changed them for something that is permitted said our Eliza to him let the public sacrifices prove it which are permitted for their own sake yet he who slaughters other sacrifices in their name is culpable our Joshua answered him not so if you say thus of public sacrifices that is because they have a limit will you say the same of the Passover which has no limit are we to say that wherever there is a limit our Joshua holds him culpable yet surely infants have a limit yet we learned he who had two infants for circumcision one for circumcision after the Sabbath and the other for circumcision on the Sabbath and he heard and circumcised the one belonging to after the Sabbath on the Sabbath he is culpable if he had one for circumcision on the eve of the Sabbath and another for circumcision on the Sabbath and he heard and circumcised the one belonging to the Eve of the Sabbath on the Sabbath our Eliza holds him liable to a sin offering but our Joshua exempts him said RMI the circumstances here are e.g. that he first circumcised the infant of the Eve of the Sabbath on the Sabbath so that there is this infant of the Sabbath with whom he is preoccupied here e.g. it means that he first slaughtered the public sacrifices at the beginning. If so when our Meir said he too who slaughters other sacrifices in the name of public sacrifices is not liable he meant even if he had first slaughtered the public sacrifices at the beginning surely it was taught our high of Abel Arab said in our Meir's name our Eliza and our Joshua did not differ concerning him who had two infants one for circumcision on the Eve of the Sabbath and one for circumcision on the Sabbath and he heard and circumcised the one belonging to the Eve of the Sabbath on the Sabbath both agreeing that he is culpable about what do they disagree about a man who had two infants one for circumcision after the Sabbath and another for circumcision on the Sabbath and he heard and circumcised the one belonging to after the Sabbath on the Sabbath our Eliza ruling him liable to a sin offering while our Joshua exempts him now is that logical if there in the second clause where he did not perform a religious duty our Joshua exempts him then where he did perform a religious duty he rules him liable said the school of Arjane the first clause means e.g. that he previously circumcised the infant belonging to the Sabbath on the eve of the Sabbath Talmud, Mos Pesachim be so that the Sabbath does not stand to be overridden whereas in the second clause the Sabbath stands to be overridden by him thus here too surely the Sabbath stands to be overridden in respect of the public sacrifice our Ashi said to our Kahana but here too in the first clause the Sabbath Stands to be overridden in connection with infants in general, nevertheless, it was not given to be overridden in connection with this man. He answered him, while all other sacrifices which he slaughtered as a Passover, if they are not eligible, he is culpable. While if they are eligible, our Eliza rules him liable to a sin offering, while our Joshua rules him not culpable, which tended draws a distinction between eligible and not eligible. It is our Simeon, for it was taught the sacrifices which are eligible for a Passover, and the sacrifices which are not eligible are as one. And similarly, he who slaughters for the sake of public sacrifices is not liable. This is our Meir's view. Our Simeon said, Our Eliza and our Joshua did not differ about those which are not eligible, agreeing that he is liable about what do they differ about those which are eligible. Our Eliza ruling him liable to a sin offering, while our Joshua declares him not liable. Our BB said in our Eliezer's name, our Meir declared him not liable even. If it was a calf of a peace offering sacrifice which he slaughtered in the name of a Passover offering said Arzera to our Bibi but our Yohanan said our Meir admitted that he is liable in the case of blemished animals he is not preoccupied with blemished animals at all whereas he is occupied with this calf he answered him Rabbah asked our Naman what is our Meir's opinion where a man slaughters Holland for the sake of a Passover said he to him our Meir declared him not liable even if he slaughtered Holland for the sake of a Passover but our Yohanan said our Meir admitted that he is liable in the case of blemished animals blemished animals cannot be confused for these these can be confused is then our Meir's reason because they can be confused or they cannot be confused surely our Bibi said in our Eliezer's name our Meir declared him exempt even if it was a calf of a peace offering sacrifice which he slaughtered in the name of a Passover offering which proves that our Meir's reason is because he is preoccupied with the sacrificing of an animal said he to him if he is preoccupied he is not liable even if it cannot be confused if it can be confused he is not liable even if he is not preoccupied with sacrificing which excludes blemished animals which can neither be confused nor is he indeed preoccupied with the sacrificing of the marzara and our Samuel B. Isaac were sitting in the hall of our Samuel B. Isaac's house and they sat and said our Simeon B. Lakish said if a man mistook a spit of nuthar for a spit of ordinary roast meat and he ate it he is liable while our Yohanan said if a man had intercourse with his
Ruling on infants thereto his time is urgent rather it is in accordance with our Joshua's ruling on Teramah for we learned if he a priest was eating Teramah it became known that he was the son of a divorced woman or of a Haliza Eliezer holds him liable for the principal plus a fifth while our Joshua exempts him perhaps however this is as our BBB Abbe for our BBB Abbe said this refers to Teramah on Passover Eve since its time is urgent alternatively Teramah is different as it is designated Abodah and the divine law declared Abodah valid for we learned if he was standing and offering sacrifices and it became known that he was the son of a divorced woman or of a Haliza all the sacrifices which he offered on the altar are invalid but our Joshua declares them valid now we said what is our Joshua's reason because it is written bless Lord his substance hello and accept the work of his hands now where is Teramah designated Abodah for it was taught it once happened at our Tarfan had not attended the Beth Hamidrash the previous evening. The following morning, our Gamaliel met him and said to him, Why did you not attend the Beth Hamidrash last night? I performed an Abodah reply. He, all your words are not but mysteries. He retorted, For whence have we Abodah nowadays? Said he to him, Behold, it is said Talmud, Mas Pesach, may I give you the priesthood as a service of Abodah gift, and the common man that draw it, and I shall be put to death. Thus they made the eating of Teramah in the borders as equivalent to the Abodah in the temple. If he slaughtered it for those who are not its eaters, etc., that is obvious since it is taught there that it is unfit. He is liable here because the second clause teaches he is not liable. The first clause teaches he is liable, but that too is obvious since the sacrifice is fit there. He is not liable here rather because he teaches if he slaughtered it for a different purpose on the Sabbath. He also teaches about those who are not its eaters and what is the purpose of that itself he states it because he wishes to teach the controversy of our Eliezer and our Joshua who not behind it has said to his son when you go before our Zerika ask him on the view that he who causes damage through a wound is not liable when we learned if he slaughtered it for those who are not its eaters he is liable what a positive value has he affected he affected this is that if they the Emirim ascended the top of the altar they do not descend if he slaughtered it and it was found to possess a blemish he is liable what a positive value has he affected he affected something positive in the case of cataracts in the eye this being in accordance with our Akiba who maintained if they the Emirim ascended they do not descend if he slaughtered it and it was found to be tearful internally he is not culpable hence if it is in an exposed part he is culpable yet what has he affected he affected its withdrawal from the scope of Nibble Rubin demurred as to what was taught he who slaughters a sin offering on the Sabbath without the temple to an idol is liable on account thereof to three sin offerings what has he affected said Arara because he withdraws it from the interdict of a limb cut from a live animal if he slaughtered it and it became known etc. Arhuna said in Rab's name a guilt offering which was transferred to pasture and then slaughtered without a specified purpose is fit for a burnt offering this proves that he holds that it does not require express abrogation if so even if it was not transferred to when it is sacrificed thus immediately after atonement it is preventively forbidden on account of when it is sacrificed thus even before atonement and whence do you rule thus for we learned a guilt offering whose owner died or whose owner otherwise obtained atonement must raise until it becomes unfit then it is sold and its money falls is utilized for a voluntary offering are Eliezer said it is left to die our Joshua said he can sell it and bring a burnt offering for its money thus only for its money but not that itself because he preventively forbids it when sacrificed after atonement on account of when it is sacrificed before atonement this proves it our history raised an objection against Arhunad if he slaughtered it and it became known that the owners had withdrawn their hands etc. Talmud, Mas Pesachim be now it weighs taught thereon during a week in such circumstances it must be burnt immediately now it is well if you say that it requires abrogation this is a Passover and since it has no owners its disqualification is in itself and for that reason it must be burnt immediately but if you say that it does not require abrogation then from the beginning it is a peace offering on account of what then is its disqualification presumably on account of something extraneous is that he slaughtered it after the evening tamed but then it requires Disfigurement for it was taught this is the general rule wherever its disqualification is in itself it must be burnt immediately if it is in the blood or in its owner the flesh must become disfigured and then it goes out to the place of burning rather do not say if he slaughtered it without specifying its purpose it is fit as a burnt offering but say if he slaughtered it for the purpose of a burnt offering it is fit this proves that it requires express abrogation then according to our high begamita who said it was thrown out from the mouth of the company and they said the circumstances are e.g. that its owners were unclean through a dead body and relegated to the second Passover thus only this requires abrogation but in general abrogation is not required what can be said rather said Arhuna son of our Joshua what are we discussing here e.g. if he separated it for a Passover before midday and the owner died after midday so that it was eligible and then rejected and whatever was eligible and then rejected cannot be eligible again is then our reasoning required for any but rap surely rap said live animals cannot be permanently rejected rather said our papa the author of this is our Eliezer who maintains similarly if he slaughters other sacrifices for the sake of the Passover they are unfit so that its disqualification is in itself but if it is according to our Eliezer he would rule him liable to a sin offering since our Eliezer rejects the view that he who hears in the matter of a precept is exempt our Joseph the son of our Salah pious explained it before our papa the author of this is our Joseph Bihana for we learned our Joseph Bihana said those other sacrifices which are slaughtered for the purpose of a Passover or for the purpose of a sin offering are unfit this proves that its disqualification is in itself and for that reason it must be burnt immediately while in the matter of non-culpability he agrees with our Joshua Arashi said Rab ruled in Accordance with our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka, for it was taught our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka said if there was sufficient time in the day to ascertain whether the owners had withdrawn their hands or died or become defiled he is liable and if the sacrifice must become disfigured and then go out to the place of burning he slaughtered it without a specified purpose express abrogation not being necessary but the reason in the Baraka is a different one as stated thus at midday the owner was still alive and therefore it was immediately eligible for a Passover offering the owner's death disqualified it from that purpose and he holds that it can never be eligible again in such circumstances what is the reason is it not because it does not require abrogation whence does this follow perhaps it is because he agrees with the tana of the school of Rabbi Abba who said even pickle too requires disfigurement because we learn the meaning of iniquity from Nahar. For if you should not say thus where the owners become defiled what can be said for surely that certainly requires abrogation for our high begamita said it was thrown out from the mouth of the company and they said the circumstances are e.g. that its owners were unclean through a dead body and relegated to the second Passover hence it is clear as we answered at first this is in accordance with our Joseph Bihana Talmud, Mas Pesachim A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I-I Mishnah how is the Passover offering? Roasted we bring a spit or pomegranate wood and thrust it into its mouth right down as far as its buttocks and place its knees and its entrails inside it this is the view of our Jose the Galilean our Akiba said this is in the nature or seating but they are hung outside it one may not roast the Passover offering either on a metal spit or on a grill our Zadok said it once happened that our Gamaliel said to his servant Tavi go out and roast us the Passover offering on the grill tomorrow but let us bring a spit of metal when part of it is hot the whole of it is hot and so part of it is roasted through the spit whereas the divine law saith roast with fire and not roast through something else but let us bring a spit of palm wood since it has grooves it exudes water sap so that it would be like oil then let us bring a spit of fig wood since it is hollow it exudes water so that it is like oil then let us bring a spit of the oak tree the carob tree or the sycamore tree because it has knots it exudes water but the wood of the pomegranate tree too has knots its knots are smooth alternatively this refers to a shoot of this i.e. the first year's growth which has no knots but there is a point where it is cut he causes the point where it is cut to protrude without the animal our mission is not according to our judah for it was taught our judah said just as a wooden spit is not burnt so a metal spit does not boil the flesh said they to him this sc metal if Part of it is hot, the whole of it is hot, whereas the other wood, if part of it is hot, the whole of it is not hot, and we place its knees, etc. It was taught, our Ishmael called it talk, talk, our
Pigeon for rab and he rab said to him if the paste is good tasty give it me and I will eat it that was done with a paste of fine flour which is crumbly but Rabba visited the home of the Reshkalif and they put a paste of dough over a roasted duck for him said he had I not seen that it was as clear as white glass I would not eat of it now should you think as it absorbs so it exudes why particularly when it is clear it is permitted even if not clear there it was prepared with white flour so that if the paste is compact now the law is a paste of finest flour whether it looks red or does not look red is permitted a paste of white flour if it is as clear as white glass it is permitted if not it is forbidden a paste of other flours if it looks red it is forbidden if it does not look red it is permitted as to a stuffed lamb he who forbids does so even if the mouth is at the bottom while he who permits does so even if the mouth is on top now the law is a Stuff lamb etc. is permitted even if the mouth is on top with regard to raw meat eggs and the jugular veins are aha and rubbin a differ therein in the whole Torah araha is stringent while rubbin is lenient and the law is as rubbin of is as a lenient view except in these three where araha is lenient and rubbin is stringent and the law is as araha is as a lenient view if raw meat turns reddish if one cuts and salts it it is permitted even for a pot if one impales it on a spit over the fire it is permitted because if the blood certainly oozes out if he placed it on burning coals araha and rubbin a differ therein one forbids and the other permits he who forbids holds that if the fire binds the blood while he who permits holds that it draws the blood out and the law is it does indeed draw the blood out similarly with eggs if he cut and salted them they are permitted even for a pot if he suspended them from a spit they are permitted because if the blood Certainly oozes out if he laid them on coals aha and rub and a differ therein one forbids and the other permits them he who forbids holds it certainly binds the blood while he who permits maintains it draws it out similarly with the throat portion containing the jugular veins if he cut and salted it it is permitted even for a pot if he suspended it on a spit the place of the cut being underneath it is permitted because it does indeed ooze out if he laid it on coals aha and rub and a differ therein one forbids and the other permits he who forbids holds it does indeed bind the blood while he who permits maintains it draws it out and the law is it draws it out raw meat which turns red it serum is forbidden if it does not turn red it serum is permitted rub and a said even if it does not turn red it serum is forbidden for it cannot but contain streaks of blood marbia mimar said to arashi my father did indeed drink it others say arashi himself drank it marbia mimar said to Arashi vinegar which had been used once for contracting meat, my father would not use it again for contracting. How does it differ from wheat vinegar which may be used for contracting their Talmud? Moss Pesachim of the tartness of the fruit is present in its natural state, whereas here the tartness of the fruit is not present in its natural state. One may not roast the Passover offering, etc. A story is quoted in contradiction. The text is defective and it teaches us, but if it is a perforated grill, it is permitted. And Arzadok said likewise. It once happened that our Gamaliel said to his servant, Go out and roast us the Passover offering on the perforated grill. Our Hina B.E.D. asked R.E.D.B. If a man fires an oven with the shells of Orla and then sweeps it out and bakes bread in it, what is the law on the view that it is forbidden? The bread is permitted. He answered, said he to him, But our Hina the elder said in R.C.'s name and our Yohanan's name, If a man fires an oven, sweeps it. Out and roasts the Passover offering in it that is not roast with fire because roast with fire is stated twice thus the reason is that the divine law revealed it by stating roast with fire twice but if the divine law had not revealed it I would say it is roast with fire the divine law revealed it there replied he and we learn from it for elsewhere alternatively there the reason is that the divine law wrote roast with fire twice but if the divine law had not written roast with fire twice I would say the divine law insisted on fire and even if he swept it out that too is roast with fire but here the divine law objected to forbidden fuel which is now absent our rabbis taught if he cut it and placed it on the coals rabbi said I maintain that this is roast with fire our hey boy B M I pointed out a contradiction to our his then rabbi ruled that coals are fire but the following contradicts it or when the flesh hath in the skin thereof burning by fire etc I know it only where it was burnt by fire if it was burnt with coals hot ashes boiling lime boiling gypsum or anything produced by fire which includes hot water heated by fire how do we know it therefore burning is stated twice as an amplification hence it is only because the divine law amplified it by writing a burning twice but if the divine law had not amplified it by writing a burning twice I would say that coals are not fire scripture does not find it necessary to include a wood coal he answered him a verse is necessary only in respect of a coal of metal then are not coals of metal fire surely in respect of a priest's daughter who committed adultery though it is written she shall be burnt with fire our said they made a lead with for her there it is different because the divine law said she shall be burnt with fire she shall be burnt is to include all burnings which come from fire then all the more fire itself if so let us surround her with bundles of faggots and Burn her the meaning of burning is learned from the children of Aaron just as there it was a burning of the soul while the body remained intact so your burning of the soul while the body remains intact is meant then let us prepare for her boiling water heated by the fire that is ruled out on account of our nominest dictum for our nominest said scripture saith but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself choose an easy death for him now since there is our nominest deduction what is the purpose of the Gezerah I will tell you but for the Gezerah I would say that the burning of the soul while the body remains intact is not burning while as for our nominest teaching let us use many bundles of faggots for her so that she should die quickly therefore if the Gezerah informs us that it is not so then what is the purpose of she shall be burnt with fire it is to exclude boiling lead drawn straight from its source our Jeremiah said to our Zerah then wherever she Shall be burnt with fire is written it is to include all burnings which are produced by fire surely in respect to the sacrificial bullocks which were burnt though it is written and the priest shall burn it on wood with fire it was nevertheless taught with fire but not with boiling lime or boiling gypsum said he to him how compare there with fire is written first and she shall be burnt after hence it is to include all burnings which are produced by fire whereas here is written and he shall burn it on wood with fire with fire being at the end to intimate that fire only is permitted but not anything else but there too burning is written at the end for it is written Talmud Moss Pesachim be where the ashes are poured out shall it be burnt I will tell you that shall it be burnt is required for what was taught it shall be burnt even if no ashes are there it shall be burnt even if he made the fire catch onto the greater part of it Rubin said unite them and learn the burning by fire I know it only if it was burnt by fire or with a coal if it was burnt with hot ashes boiling lime boiling gypsum or with anything produced by fire which includes hot water heated by the fire how do we know it therefore a burning is stated twice as an amplification Rabba pointed out a contradiction did then Rabbi say that coals are designated fire but the following contradicts it and he shall take a censer full of coals of fire you might think that quenched smoldering coals are meant therefore fire is stated if fire you might think that a flame must be brought therefore coals of is stated how then is it to be understood he must bring of the brightly burning coals now this is self-contradictory you say coals you might think that quenched coals are meant which proves that brightly burning coals are termed fire then consider the second clause if fire you might think that a flame must be brought therefore coals of is stated which proves that even brightly burning coals are not fire whereupon our she answered this is what he teaches coals you might think both smoldering and brightly burning can be taken therefore fire is stated if fire you might think that a flame must be brought therefore coals of is stated how then is this to be understood he must bring of the brightly burning coals yet at all events coals are not called fire which is a difficulty according to rabbi said Abbe explained it thus coals if I might think quenched but not brightly burning therefore fire is stated if fire you might think he can bring a flame or a coal whichever he desires therefore coals of fire is stated how then is it meant he must bring of the brightly burning coals rabbi asked you say he can bring a flame or a coal as he desires but how is a flame without a coal possible only if one smears a vessel with oil and lights a fire in it then why do I need a verse to exclude that seeing that you do not do thus before a king of flesh and blood is it not all the more forbidden before the holy one blessed be he rather said rabba explained it thus coals of you might think quenched but not brightly burning therefore fire is stated if fire you might think let him bring half coal and half flame so that by the time he carries it within the holy of holies it is all a coal therefore it
Roasted at that spot by the heat of the earthenware whereas a divine law said roast with fire but not roast with something else but on Samuel's view that the lower prevails since the earthenware is cold it actually cools the juice why then should he remove its place as our Jeremiah said in Samuel's name the reference is to hot flour so here too the reference is to hot earthenware we learned if some of its juice dripped onto the flour he must remove a handful from its place it was assumed. That this refers to cold flour it is well on Rab's view that the upper prevails consequently he must remove a handful from its place because it heats the flour around it and the flour in turn heats it and the juice is roast by the heat of the flour whereas the divine law said roast with fire but not roast with something else but on Samuel's view that the lower prevails since the flour is cold it actually cools it why then must he remove a handful from its place said our Jeremiah B. Samuel this. Refers to hot flour we learned if he basted it with oil of terramah if they who registered for it are a company of priests they may eat it if it belongs to Israelites if it is yet raw let him wash it off if it is roast he must bear the outer part it is well on Rab's view that the upper prevails consequently mere pairing is sufficient because the upper is cold but on Samuel's view that the lower prevails since it is hot it certainly absorbs why then is pairing sufficient let us forbid it. Entirely basting is different because a mere trifle is used it was taught in accordance with Samuel if hot matter falls into hot it is forbidden similarly if he put cold into hot it is forbidden hot into cold or cold into cold he must wash it off you say hot into cold he must wash it off surely since it is hot until it cools it cannot but absorb a little then it should at least require pairing rather say hot into cold he must bear it cold into cold he must wash it off another beretha. Taught if hot meat fell into hot milk and likewise if cold fell into hot it is forbidden hot into cold or cold into cold he must wash the meat hot into cold he must wash the meat surely since it is hot until it cools it cannot but absorb a little then it should at least require pairing rather say hot into cold he must bear it cold into cold he must wash the meat the master said cold into cold he must wash the meat Arhuna said they learned this only where he had not previously salted it but if he had salted it it is forbidden for Samuel said salted matter is like hot if preserved in vinegar it is like boiled Rabbah said as to what Samuel said salted matter is like hot this was said only where it cannot be eaten through the salt but if it can be eaten in spite of the salt it is not so a young pigeon fell into a jug of Kamkai and Arhina the son of Rabbah Pashrunia permitted it said Rabbah who is so wise as to permit such a thing if not Arhina the son of Rabbah Pashrunia who is a great man for he can tell you when did Samuel say salted matter is like hot where it cannot be eaten through the salt whereas this could be eaten in spite of the salt that is however only if it is raw but if roasted requires pairing further this was said only if it contains no splits but if it contains splits it is altogether forbidden and if it is seasoned with condiments it is forbidden Rab said Talmud, Mos Pesachim be fat meat of a ritually slaughtered animal which was roasted together with lean meat of nibla is forbidden what is the reason they fatten each other but Levi maintained even lean meat of a ritually slaughtered animal which was roasted together with fat meat of nibla is permitted what is the reason it is a mere smell and smell is nothing Levi gave a practical decision at the house of the Reshlif in the case of a goat and something else an objection is raised one may not roast two Passover offerings together on account of it. Mixture surely that means a mixture of the flavors which is a difficulty on Levi's view no it means a mixture of their carcasses this too is logical since the second clause teaches even a kid and a lamb now it is well if you say that it is on account of the carcasses hence he teaches even a kid and a lamb but if you say that it is on account of the mingling of the flavors what does it matter whether it is a kid and a lamb or a kid and a kid what then you are bound to say that it is forbidden only on account of the mixing of the carcasses but the mingling of flavors is permitted shall we say then that this is a refutation of Rab said our Jeremiah the case we discuss here is e.g. where he roasted them in two pots you say in two pots can you think so rather say as though they were roasted in two pots and this is what it teaches one may not roast two Passover offerings together on account of the mixture what mixture the mixture of the flavors and even when Roasted as it were in two pots, it is forbidden on account of the possible confusing of the carcasses, and even a kid and a lamb must not be roasted together. Armari said this is dependent on tanaim. If a man removes a hot loaf from the oven and places it on a wine barrel of terramah, Armari forbids it, whereas our Judah permits it, while our Jose permits it in the case of a loaf of wheat, but forbids it in the case of barley flour because barley absorbs surely, then it is dependent on tanaim. One master holding smell is nothing, while the other master holds smell is something substantial. According to Levi, it is certainly dependent on tanaim. Shall we say that it is dependent on tanaim? According to Rab, to Rab can tell you all agree that smell is something substantial, and as to the ruling of our Judah, was it not stated thereon? Rab will be Barhana said in the name of Reshlakish in the case of a hot loaf and an open barrel, all agree that it is forbidden in the case of a cold. Loaf and a closed stoppered barrel all agree that it is permitted they differ only in the case of a hot loaf and a sealed barrel or a cold loaf and an open barrel and this too is like a hot loaf and an open barrel Arkahana the son of Arhina the elder recited a loaf which was baked together with roast meat in an oven may not be eaten with kutai fish was roasted i.e. baked together with meat whereupon Rabbah Partiki forbade it to be eaten with kutam rbr as she said even with salt. Two it is forbidden because it is harmful to one smell and in respect of something else Mishnah five things sacrifices may come in Uncle Anes yet must not be eaten in Uncle Anes the Omer the two loaves the shoe bread the sacrifices of the public peace offerings and the egoats of new moons the paschal lamb which comes in Uncle Anes is eaten in Uncle Anes for from the very beginning it came for no other purpose but to be eaten tomorrow what does five exclude it excludes the hajiga for. Example of the 15th for I might argue since it is a public sacrifice and a season is fixed for it let it override uncleanness therefore he informs us that since you can make it up the whole seven days it does not override the Sabbath and since it does not override the Sabbath it does not override uncleanness now let him the tennis state that he goes of festivals too he does indeed state the sacrifices of the public peace offerings if so let him not state that he goes of new moons. Either seeing that he states the sacrifices of the public peace offerings I will tell you Talmud, Mos Pesachim it is necessary for him to teach about the egoats of new moons I might argue surely appointed season mode is not written in connection therewith therefore he informs us that new moon is designated mode in accordance with Abbe's dictum for Abbe said the Tammuz of that year was indeed made full as it is written he hath proclaimed an appointed time mode against me too. Crush my young men shall we say that all of them are derived from mode appointed time how do we know it for our rabbis taught and Moses declared unto the children of Israel the appointed times of the Lord for what purpose is this stated because we have learned only of the daily offering and the Passover offering that they override the Sabbath and uncleanness since in its appointed time is stated in connection with them in its appointed time implying even on the Sabbath in its appointed time implying even in uncleanness whence do we know it of other public sacrifices because it is said these shall ye offer unto the Lord in your appointed time whence do we know to include the Omer and that which is offered with it and the two loaves and that which is offered with them therefore it is stated and Moses declared unto the children of Israel the appointed times of the Lord the writ fixed it as one appointed season for all of them now what is the purpose of all these they are Necessary for if the divine Lord of the daily offering alone I would say the daily offering overrides the Sabbath and uncleanness because it is constant and entirely burnt but the Passover is not so hence we are informed otherwise while if the divine Lord of the Passover offering I would argue that the Passover offering must be offered under all circumstances because it involves the penalty of Kareth but as for the continual offering for neglect of which there is no penalty of Kareth I would say that it is not so hence we are informed otherwise again if the divine Lord of these two I would say these alone override Sabbath and uncleanness since they possess a stringent feature the continual offering being constant and entirely burnt the Passover offering involving the penalty of Kareth but as for other public sacrifices I would say it is not so hence the divine Lord of these shall ye offer unto the Lord in your appointed times while if the divine law merely wrote these shall ye offer unto the Lord in your appointed times I would argue it refers only to other public sacrifices which come to make atonement but the sacrifices
Community again it was assumed that all hold the headplate does not propitiate for the defilement of eatables for there is no tata whom you know to maintain that the headplate propitiates for the defilement of eatables save R. Eliezer for it was taught R. Eliezer said the headplate propitiates for the defilement of eatables R. Jose said the headplate does not propitiate for the defilement of eatables accordingly shall we say that our mission does not agree with our Joshua for it was taught and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings the flesh and the blood R. Joshua said if there is no blood there is no flesh and if there is no flesh there is no blood R. Eliezer said the blood is fit even if there is no flesh because it is said and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out against the altar of the Lord thy God then how do I interpret and thou shalt offer thy burnt offering the flesh and the blood it is to teach you just as the blood requires throwing so does it Flesh required throwing hence say there was a small passageway between the stairway and the altar now according to our Joshua too surely it is written and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out he can answer you surely in connection therewith is written and thou shalt eat the flesh Talmud, Mas Pesachim be Talmud, Mas Pesachim be then what is the purpose of these two verses one refers to the burnt offering and one refers to a peace offering and both are necessary for it the divine law. Wrote it in connection with the burnt offering I would say it is only with the burnt offering which is stringent because it is entirely burnt but as for the peace offering which is not stringent I would say that it is not so again if the divine law wrote it of a peace offering I would say on the contrary the reason is because it has two forms of consumption but as for the burnt offering where there are not two forms of consumption I would say that it is not so hence we are informed. Otherwise now according to our Eliezer too surely it is written and thou shalt eat the flesh he can answer you he utilizes that to teach that the flesh is not permitted for eating until the blood is sprinkled if so say that the whole verse comes for this purpose then how do we know that the blood is fit even if there is no flesh he can answer you if so let the divine law first write thou shalt eat the flesh and then and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out as is written. In the beginning of the verse and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings the flesh and the blood why then does scripture place the blood of thy sacrifices first hence infer from it that the blood is fit even if there is no flesh and infer from it also that the flesh is not permitted for eating until the blood is sprinkled and our Joshua that the flesh is not permitted for eating until the blood is sprinkled follows a minority of the immune which when not available are not indispensable to. The eating of the flesh yet when available are indispensable and the blood which if not available is indispensable if available how much the more is it indispensable and our Eliezer even a law which can be inferred a minority the rid takes the trouble of writing it and our Joshua wherever we can interpret we do interpret shall we now say that our mission is not in accordance with our Joshua for since he says that we require both while the headplate does not propitiate for the defilement of eatables how can it come in uncleanness you may even say that it agrees with our Joshua but our Joshua holds the headplate propitiates for those that ascend that is well of sacrifices where there are objects which ascend sc in your room but what can be said of the omer and the two loaves where there are no objects to ascend the altar I will tell you our Joshua too said that we require both only in the case of sacrifices but he did not say it in the case of meal offerings yet did he not say it in the case of meal offerings, surely we learned if the remainder thereof was defiled or if the remainder thereof was lost according to the view of our Eliezer, if the handful is fit according to the view of our Joshua, it is unfit, it is according to his view, yet not entirely so, thus according to the view of our Joshua that we require both, yet not entirely so, for whereas our Joshua ruled thus in the case of sacrifices, but he did not rule thus in the case of meal offerings, this Tana holds that. It is so even in the case of meal offerings now who is this Tana that agrees with him but is more stringent than he, moreover it was taught our Jose said I agree with the words of our Eliezer in respect to meal offerings and animal sacrifices and with the words of our Joshua in respect to animal sacrifices and meal offerings the words of our Eliezer in respect to animal sacrifices for he used to say the blood is fit even if there is no flesh and the words of our Joshua in respect to sacrifices. For he used to say if there is no blood there is no flesh and if there is no flesh there is no blood the words of our Eliezer in respect to meal offerings for he used to say the handful is fit even if there is no remainder for consumption and the words of our Joshua in respect to meal offerings for he used to say if there is no handful there is no remainder and if there is no remainder there is no handful rather our Joshua holds the headplate propitiates for the defilement of the objects which ascend the altar and for eatables if so why do you say according to the view of our Joshua it is unfit that refers to what is lost or burnt and according to whom does he teach if the remainder was defiled according to our Eliezer but that is obvious seeing that you say that even when it is lost or burnt where they are now non-existent our Eliezer declares the handful fit need it be stated where it is defiled when it is in existence hence it is obviously taught according to our Joshua yet he teaches that it is unfit furthermore it was taught our Joshua said in the case of all the sacrifices of the Torah whether the flesh was defiled while the fat has remained clean or the fat was defiled while the flesh has remained clean he the priest sprinkles the blood but not if both were defiled this proves that our Joshua holds that the headplate does not propitiate either for the defilement of the objects which ascend the altar or for the eatables rather explain. It thus after all our mission is the view of our Joshua yet there is no difficulty here it means in the first place there it means if it was done offered our Joshua said that both are required only in the first place but not if it was done and whence do you know that our Joshua draws a distinction between what is required in the first place and what was done because it was taught if the flesh was defiled or disqualified or it passed without the curtains our Eliezer said he must sprinkle it. Blood our Joshua maintained he must not sprinkle the blood yet our Joshua admits that if he does sprinkle it it is accepted but surely this explanation is not acceptable firstly because it is unfit implies even where it was done moreover five things may come in uncle and s implies even in the first place Talmud, Mas Pesachim or rather there is no difficulty here the reference is to an individual there in the mission of the reference is to a community shall we say that our mission does not agree with our Jose for it was taught our Eliezer said the headplate propitiates for the defilement of eatables our Jose said the headplate does not propitiate for the defilement of eatables now it was assumed since our Jose rules the headplate does not propitiate for the defilement of eatables he agrees with our Joshua who maintains we require both shall we now say that our mission does not agree with our Jose no our Jose agrees with our Eliezer who maintained the blood is fit even if there is no flesh if so in respect of what law does he rule the headplate does not propitiate for the defilement of eatables and on your reasoning when our Eliza rules the headplate does propitiate for the defilement of eatables since he maintains that the blood is fit even if there is no flesh in respect of what law does the headplate propitiate rather they differ in respect of branding it with the unfitness of pickle and excluding it from the law of trespass our Eliza holds it. Headplate propitiates for it the defilement of the flesh and renders it as clean and so brands it as pickle and excludes it from the law of trespass while our Jose holds the headplate does not propitiate for it and does not render it as clean hence it cannot be branded as pickle nor does it exclude it from the law of trespass to this armory demur even granted that our Jose agrees with our Eliza as for sacrifices it is well since there is blood as for the omer there is a handful in it. Case of the shoe bread too there are the censors of frankincense but in the case of the two loaves what can be said and should you answer it is in respect of what is offered together with them then it is tantamount to the public peace offerings and if so there are only four whereas we learned five rather our Jose holds uncleanness was permitted in the case of the community but surely it was taught both in the case of the one and the other we besprinkle them the whole seven days with the ashes of all the purification offerings which were there this is our mayor's view our Jose said we besprinkle them on the third day and on the seventh day alone now if you should think that our Jose holds uncleanness was permitted in the case of the community why do I need sprinkling at all hence it is clear that our mission does not agree with our Jose our papa said to obey and does our Jose grant the court's document to two for it was taught our Jose said I agree with the words of our Eliza in respect to meal offerings and animal sacrifices and with the words of our Joshua in respect to sacrifices and meal offering the words of our Eliza in respect to sacrifices for he used to say the blood is fit even if there is no flesh the words of our Joshua in respect to sacrifices for he used to say if there is no blood there is no flesh if there is no fl
That just as they differ in respect to meal offerings, so do they differ in respect to sacrifices too. But surely the verses are fundamentally written in connection with sacrifices. Rather explained it thus, there is no difficulty. I agree with the words of our Eliezer where it, the flesh was defiled, and with the words of our Joshua where it was lost or burnt where it was defiled. What is the reason that he agrees with our Eliezer? Because the headplate propitiates. Surely you know our Jose to maintain that the headplate does not propitiate for the defilement of eatables. Rather explained it thus, there is no difficulty. I agree with the words of our Eliezer. In the case of the community, I agree with the words of our Joshua. In the case of an individual, in the case of the community, what is the reason that he agrees with our Eliezer? Because uncleanness is permitted in the case of a community. But one objection is that you know our Jose to maintain that uncleanness is overridden in the case of a. Community again if it refers to a community does only our Eliezer declare it fit but not our Joshua Talmud, Mos Pesachim be surely you have said even our Joshua agrees in the case of a community rather explain it thus I agree with the words of our Eliezer where it was done offered and with the words of our Joshua where it is at the very outset but if it was done even our Joshua agrees for it is taught our Joshua agrees that if he sprinkled the blood it is made acceptable one refers to uncleanness. The other to the case where it is lost or burnt thus when does he teach our Joshua agrees that if he sprinkled the blood it is made acceptable where the flesh was defiled but not if it was lost or burnt and when does our Jose say I agree with the words of our Eliezer if it was done where the flesh was lost or burnt mission if the flesh was defiled while the fat has remained clean he must not sprinkle the blood if the fat was defiled while the flesh has remained clean he must sprinkle. The blood, but in the case of other dedicated sacrifices, it is not so. For even if the flesh was defiled while the fat has remained clean, he must sprinkle the blood. Gemara Argidal said in Rab's name, if he sprinkled the blood, at the Passover offering is made acceptable. But we require eating. The eating is not indispensable. But surely it is written according to every man's eating. Ye shall make your count for the lamb that is for preference. And is this not too intimate that it is indispensable? Surely it was taught according to the number of the mixed souls. This teaches that the Paschal lamb is killed for none save those who registered for it. You might think that if he killed it for those who are not registered for it, he should be regarded as violating the precept. Yet it is fit. Therefore it is stated according to every man's eating. Ye shall make your count. Takis of the reiterated it to teach that it is indispensable. And eaters are assimilated to registered. Persons rather Rab ruled as our Nathan who said the eating of the Passover offerings is not indispensable which statement of our Nathan is alluded to shall we say the following dictum of our Nathan for it was taught our Nathan said how do we know that all Israel can discharge their obligation with one Passover offering because it is said and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at dusk does then the whole assembly kill surely only one kills but it teaches that all Israel can discharge their duty with one Passover offering perhaps it is different there because if some withdraw it is fit for the others and if the others withdraw it is fit for these rather it is the dictum of our Nathan for it was taught if one company registered for it and then another company registered for it the former for whom there is as much as an olive per person eat it and are exempt from sacrificing a second Passover offering the latter for whom there is not as much as an Olive per person cannot eat and they are bound to sacrifice a second Passover offering. Our Nathan said both are exempt from sacrificing a second Passover offering because the blood has already been sprinkled yet still perhaps it is different there because if these withdraw it is fit for them the others if so let him teach because it is possible for them to withdraw why state because the blood has already been sprinkled that proves that the matter depends entirely on the sprinkling of the blood but the eating is not indispensable now what compels Rab to establish our mission as meaning in the first place only and in accordance with our Nathan let us establish it as agreeing with the rabbis and even if it was done it is not fit to Rab our mission presents a difficulty why does it state he must not sprinkle the blood let it teach it is unfit hence this proves that he must not sprinkle in the first place only but if done it is indeed well but on our Nathan's view what is the purpose of according to every man's eating to teach that we require men who are fit to eat to register for it who is the author of the following which our rabbis taught if he slaughtered it for those who can eat of it but sprinkled its blood for those who cannot eat of it the paschal offering itself is fit and a man discharges his duty therewith with whom does this agree shall we say that it is according to our Nathan but not the rabbis you may even say that it agrees with the rabbis there is no intention of eaters at the sprinkling who is the author of the following which our rabbis taught if he was ill at the time of the slaughtering but well at the time of sprinkling or well at the time of slaughtering but ill at the time of sprinkling one may not slaughter and sprinkle on his behalf unless he is well from the time of the slaughtering until the time of the sprinkling with whom does this agree shall we say that it is according to the rabbis but not our Nathan. You may even say that it agrees with our Nathan. We require a man who is capable of eating to be registered for it. Who is the author of the following? Which our rabbis taught: If he slaughtered it in cleanness and then its owners became unclean, he must sprinkle the blood in cleanness. But the flesh must not be eaten in uncleanness. With whom does this agree? Said our Eliezer. This was taught as a controversy, and it is the view of our Nathan. But our Yohanan said, You may even say that it is the view of the rabbis. We treat here of the community who may even sacrifice in a state of uncleanness. If it refers to the community, why may the flesh not be eaten in uncleanness as a preventive measure, lest the owners become unclean in a subsequent year after the sprinkling? And they argue, Were we not unclean last year? And yet we ate then. Now too we will eat, but they will not know that in the previous year the owners were unclean when the blood was sprinkled, whereas this year the owners were clean. When the blood was sprinkled, Talmud, Mos Pesachim, alternatively, I may answer Rab ruled as our Joshua, for it was taught our Joshua said in the case of all the sacrifices of the Torah, whether the flesh was defiled while the fat has remained clean, or the fat was defiled while the flesh has remained clean, he must sprinkle the blood in the case of a Nazi right, and one who sacrifices the Passover offering if the fat was defiled and the flesh has remained clean, he must sprinkle the blood if the flesh was defiled while the fat has remained clean, he must not sprinkle the blood, yet if he sprinkled it, it is acceptable if the owners became unclean through a dead body, he must not sprinkle the blood, and if he does sprinkle the blood, it is not acceptable, but in the case of other dedicated sacrifices, it is not so, etc. Who is the author of our mission? It is our Joshua, for it was taught our Joshua said with regard to all the sacrifices of the Torah, of which as much as an olive of flesh. Or an olive of fat has remained clean, he sprinkles the blood. If there remains as much as half an olive of flesh and half an olive of fat, he must not sprinkle the blood. But in the case of a burnt offering, even if there remains as much as half an olive of flesh and half an olive of fat, he sprinkles the blood because the whole of it is entirely burnt. While in the case of a meal offering, even if the whole of it is in existence, he must not sprinkle the blood. What business has a meal offering here? Said our Papa, this refers to the meal offerings of libations. You might have said, since it comes in virtue of the sacrifice, it is as the sacrifice. Hence, he informs us that it is not so. How do we know it? Of fat said, are you Hanan on our Ishmael's authority? While it is ultimately derived from our Joshua, be Hanani's scripture said, and the priest shall sprinkle the blood and burn the fat hell up for a sweet savor unto the Lord. The fat authorizes the sprinkling of the blood. Even if there is no flesh, we have thus found this to hold good of fat. How do we know it of the lobe above the liver and the two kidneys? But where have we said that we do sprinkle? Since he states, while in the case of a meal offering, even if the whole of it is in existence, we do not sprinkle the blood. That implies the meal offerings alone is not sufficient for the sprinkling of the blood. But the lobe above the liver and the two kidneys are well. Whence then do we know it? Are Yohanan giving his own exegesis? Said Scripture, said for a sweet savor, whatever you offer up for a sweet savor, now it is necessary that both Heleb and for sweet savor be written. For if the divine Lord Heleb alone, I would say only fat, but not the lobe on the liver and the two kidneys. Therefore, the divine Lord for a sweet savor. While if the divine Lord for a sweet savor alone, I would say all that is sent for a sweet savor, and even the meal offering permit the sprinkling of. The blood therefore the divine Lord Halab Mishnah if the community or the majority thereof was defiled or if the priests were unclean and the community clean they must sacrifice in uncle and as if a minority
that touch it any unclean thing shall not be eaten we also read and as for the flesh everyone that is clean may eat thereof and wherever we do not read and the flesh that touch it any unclean thing shall not be eaten we also do not read and as for the flesh everyone that is clean may eat thereof it was stated behold if the israelites were half of them clean and half unclean rap set half against half is as a majority while our kahana said half against half is not as a majority rap set Half against half is as a majority hence the sacrifice by themselves while those sacrificed by themselves while our Kahana said half against half is not as a majority hence the clean observe the first Passover while the unclean observe the second others say our Kahana said half against half is not as a majority the clean observe the first Passover Talmud, Mos Pesachim B while the unclean observe neither the first nor the second they cannot sacrifice on the first because they are not a majority while they cannot sacrifice at the second because they are not a minority we learned if the community or the majority thereof was defiled or if the priests were unclean and the community clean they must sacrifice in uncleanness thus it is only the majority that sacrifices in uncleanness but when it is half and half they do not sacrifice at the first Passover which is a difficulty on Rab's view Rab can answer you when a majority is unclean all sacrifice in uncleanness. Whereas where there is half and half these observe the Passover by themselves and those observe it by themselves that too is logical because the second clause states if a minority of the community were defiled those who are clean observe the first Passover while those who are unclean observe the second thus only a minority sacrifice at the second but not when it is half against half for then they sacrifice at the first these sacrificing by themselves and those sacrificing by themselves but in that case it is a difficulty on Arkahana's view Arkahana can answer you it states if a minority of the community were defiled those who are clean observe the first Passover while those who are unclean observe the second hence when it is half against half the clean observe the first but the unclean observe neither the first nor the second now that is well according to the latter version of P. Kahana's ruling but according to the version in which Arkahana states the clean. Observe the first and the unclean each half ranks as a majority and when the majority is clean they must not sacrifice in uncleanness on the other hand the unclean half is not relegated to the second Passover since they two count as a majority observe the second what is to be said Arkahana can answer you the same law holds good that even half against half the clean observe the first while the unclean observe the second yet as to what he the Tana teaches a minority of the community because he teaches the majority in the first clause he also teaches a minority in the second clause it was taught in accordance with Rabbi was taught in accordance with Arkahana and as both versions of his ruling it was taught in accordance with Rabbi if the Israelites were half of them clean and half of them unclean the former sacrifice by themselves and the latter sacrifice by themselves it was taught as the first version of Arkahana as ruling behold if the Israelites were half of them clean and half of them unclean the clean observe the first Passover while the unclean observe the second and it was taught as the second version of our Kahana's ruling behold if the Israelites were half of them clean and half of them unclean the clean observe the first while the unclean observe neither the first nor the second now according to Rab and the second version of our Kahana's ruling when he teaches the clean observe the first and the unclean observe the second how do they reconcile it with their views e.g. if the Israelites were half of them clean and half of them unclean with women making up the number of the unclean now he holds the observance of the Passover offering by women at the first Passover is voluntary hence deduct the women from the number of unclean so that the unclean are a minority and a minority are relegated to the second Passover according to Rab and the first version of our Kahana as to what was taught the clean observe the first and it Unclean observe neither the first nor the second how do they reconcile it with their views Rab reconciles it thus e.g. if the male Israelites were half of them unclean and half of them clean with women as an addition to the clean now he holds the observance of the Passover offering by women at the first Passover is a duty but voluntary at the second hence that the unclean cannot sacrifice at the first because they are a minority and a minority do not sacrifice at the first while they cannot sacrifice at the second because deduct the women from them so there is half and half and a half do not sacrifice at the second while according to Arkahana who maintained a half to sacrifice at the second he explains it thus e.g. if the Israelites were half of them clean and half of them unclean with women making up the number of the clean now he holds the observance of the Passover offering by women at the first Passover is a duty while at the second it is voluntary hence they cannot sacrifice at the first because they are half against half and a half does not sacrifice at the first at the second too they cannot sacrifice because deduct the women from the clean and the unclean are a majority and a majority do not sacrifice at the second again according to our Kahana as to what was taught behold if the Israelites were half of them clean and half of them unclean the former sacrifice by themselves while the latter sacrifice by themselves how does he explain it our Kahana can answer you it is a controversy of Tanaim there is a view that half against half is as a majority and there is a view that half against half is not as a majority to turn to the main text behold if the Israelites were half of them clean and half of them unclean the former sacrifice by themselves and the latter sacrifice by themselves if the unclean exceeded the clean even by one they all sacrifice in uncleanness because a public sacrifice cannot be divided our Eliezer. B. Matthew said a single individual cannot overbalance the community to uncleanness because it is said Talmud, Mos Pesachim, thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover offering at one of the gates. Our Simeon said even if one tribe is unclean and all the other tribes are clean, the former sacrifice by themselves while the latter sacrifice by themselves. What is our Simeon's reason? He holds one tribe is designated a community. Our Judah said even if one tribe is unclean and all the other tribes are clean, let them all sacrifice in uncleanness because a public sacrifice cannot be divided. Our Judah holds one tribe is designated a community so that it is half against half. And since a public sacrifice is not divided, they all sacrifice in uncleanness. It was stated if the Israelites were half of them clean and half of them unclean, said Rab, we defile one of them with a reptile. But why so let the former sacrifice by themselves and the latter by themselves? For surely Rab said these sacrifice by themselves and those sacrifice by themselves I will tell you what do we discuss here e.g. where the unclean exceeded the clean by one if so the majority are unclean then let them all sacrifice in uncleanness he holds as our Eliezer B. Matthew who maintained a single individual cannot overbalance the community to uncleanness if so our difficulty returns in full force let the former sacrifice by themselves and the latter by themselves rather this is what he means that there is a Tana who agrees with the first Tana who rules when there is half against half they must not all sacrifice in uncleanness and also he agrees with our Judah who said a public sacrifice cannot be divided then we defile one of them with a reptile but Allah maintained we send away one of them on a journey afar off but let us defile him with a reptile he holds we slaughter the Passover offering and sprinkle its blood for a man who is unclean through a reptile then let us defile him through a dead body then you Debar him from his Hajjagah but now to you debar him from his Passover offering it is possible to sacrifice at the second Passover then in the case of defilement by a dead body too it is possible to sacrifice the Hajjagah on the seventh day of Passover which would be his eighth day after defilement Allah holds they are all a compensation for the first day hence he who is eligible on the first is eligible to sacrifice on all of them but wherever one is not eligible on the first he is not eligible on any of them or Naman said to them his disciples go and tell Allah who will obey you to pull up his tent picks and tent and speed away it was stated if the majority were Zabin and the minority unclean though the dead rap said those unclean through the dead cannot sacrifice either on the first or on the second they do not observe the first Passover because they are a minority and a minority do not observe it on the first they cannot observe it on the second either Whenever the community observes it on the first individual s observe it on the second but whenever the community does not observe it on the first individual s do not observe it on the second said Samuel to them his disciples go out and say to Abba how do you dispose of let the children of Israel keep the Passover in its appointed season he rab answered them go and say to him yet how do you dispose of it the verse when they are all zabin but you must say since it is impossible to carry it out it is impossible so here too it is impossible it was stated if the majority were unclean through the dead and the minority were zabin Arhuna said there is no compensation for a Passover offering which comes in uncleanness while our Adabi Ahabah said there is compensation for a Passover offering which comes in uncleanness shall we say that they differ in this because he who maintains that there is no compensation for a Passover offering
Through the dead who did not sacrifice on the first, hence they are a majority, and a majority is not relegated to the second Passover mission. If the blood of a Passover offering is sprinkled and then it becomes known that it was unclean, the headplate propitiates. If the person the owner became unclean, the headplate does not propitiate because the sages ruled in the case of a Nazi right, and he who sacrifices the Passover offering, the headplate propitiates for the uncle and S of it. Blood, but the headplate does not propitiate for the uncle and S of the person if he was defiled with the uncle and S of the deep. The headplate propitiates Gemara, thus it is only because it was first sprinkled and it became known afterwards that it was unclean, but if it first became known and the blood was sprinkled afterwards, it does not propitiate. But the following contradicts it for what does the headplate propitiate for the blood, flesh, and fat which were defiled, whether in ignorance? Or deliberately, accidentally, or intentionally, whether in the case of an individual or of a community, said Rabbanu, with regard to its defilement, whether it occurred in ignorance or deliberately, the offering is made acceptable. But as to its sprinkling, if done in ignorance that the blood was unclean, it is acceptable. If deliberately, it is not acceptable. Arshila said, with regard to its sprinkling, whether done in ignorance that the blood was unclean or deliberately, it is accepted. But as to its uncleanness, if it occurred in ignorance, it is acceptable. If caused deliberately, it is not acceptable. But surely he states, whether in ignorance or deliberately, this is what it means. If it was defiled in ignorance, and he the priest sprinkled it, whether unwittingly or deliberately, it is accepted. Yet surely it is taught if the blood was sprinkled, and then it became known. Thus it is only because it was sprinkled first, and it became known afterwards. But if it became known. First and it was sprinkled afterwards it is not so the same law holds good even if it became known first and it was sprinkled afterwards and the reason that he states if it was sprinkled and then it became known is because he wishes to teach in the second clause if the person became unclean the headplate does not propitiate where even if it was sprinkled first and it became known afterwards it does not propitiate therefore he teaches the first clause too if it was sprinkled and then it became known if he was defiled with the uncleanness of the deep etc. Rami Bihama asked the priest who propitiates with their sacrifices is the uncleanness of the deep permitted to him or not do we say when have we a tradition about the uncleanness of the deep it is in the case of the owners but we have no tradition in respect of the priest or perhaps we have a tradition in respect of the sacrifice no matter whether the owners or the priest are thus defiled said Rabbi come and here for our I taught that the sages spoke of the uncleanness of the deep in respect of the corpse alone. What does this exclude? Surely it is to exclude uncleanness of the deep caused by a reptile. And to what then do we refer? Shall we say to the owners who are thus defiled? And in the case of whom, if we say in the case of a Nazi right, does it a reptile uncleanness affect him? Seeing that the divine law said, and if any man die beside him, etc. Hence it must refer to him who sacrifices the Passover offering. Now that is well on the view that we may not slaughter the Passover offering and sprinkle its blood for those who are unclean through a reptile. But on the view that we slaughter and sprinkle on behalf of those who are unclean through a reptile, what can be said? Seeing that no uncleanness was permitted to him who sacrifices at Passover, how much the more uncleanness of the deep? Hence it must surely refer to the priest once it is proved that uncleanness of the deep was. Permitted to him said our Joseph no after all it refers to the owners and the Passover offering and it excludes uncleanness of the deep of Gonorrhoe yet does it the headplate not propitiate for the uncleanness of the deep of Gonorrhoe surely it was taught our Jose said a woman who washes from day to day on whose behalf they slaughtered the Passover offering and sprinkled its blood Talmud, Moss Pesachim on her second day and then she saw a discharge may not eat of the sacrifice and is exempt from observing the second Passover what is the reason is it not because the headplate propitiates I will tell you it is not so the reason being because our Jose holds she is defiled from now and henceforth but it was taught our Jose said as of two discharges on whose behalf they slaughtered the Passover offering and sprinkled its blood on the seventh day and then he discharged again for the third to see whether another discharge will follow rendering her as or not thus on. The first or second day of her discharge within these eleven days she is called a woman who washes from day to day should another discharge follow on the third day she cannot regain cleanness until seven days have passed without any issue at all the foregoing is on the basis of the ancient law but already in the period of the Talmud itself the law was adopted that a single blood issue at any time imposes all the restrictions which necessitate for cleanness a period of seven consecutive clean days now in the present instance the eve of Passover occurred on the second day of her discharge the sacrifice was offered and its blood was sprinkled on her behalf before she had a discharge on that day so that if she had not discharged later she would have been fit to eat in the evening since however she subsequently discharged she cannot eat of the sacrifice as she cannot perform tevila until the following evening similarly a woman who washes from day to day on whose second day they Slaughtered and sprinkled on her behalf, and then she discharged again these defile their couch or their seed retrospectively, and they are exempt from observing the second Passover. I will tell you what does retrospectively mean by rabbinical law. Now our Ashai too holds that he defiles retrospectively by rabbinical law only for it was taught our Ashai said, but Azab who saw a discharge on his seventh day upsets the preceding period, whereupon our Yohanan said to him, He does not upset aught. Save that day, what will you if he holds that he defiles retrospectively? Let us upset even all of them, while if he holds that he defiles only from now and onwards, let him not upset even that day. Rather say he does not even upset that day, whereupon he or Ashai said to him, Our Yohanan, our Jose agrees with you, yet surely our Jose said they defile their couch and their seed retrospectively, hence it certainly proves that they defile retrospectively by rabbinical law only. This proves it now. According to our Jose seeing that he rules that he defiles from now and onwards only what does they spoke of the uncleanness of the deep in respect of the corpse alone exclude hence let us solve from this that it refers to the priest and thus the uncleanness of the deep is permitted to him I will tell you after all it refers to the owners and treats of the Passover offering but here Jose holds one may not slaughter the Passover offering and sprinkle its blood on behalf of those who are unclean through a reptile and thus it is necessary to exclude it but according to our Jose how is a complete Zaba possible when she has a continuous discharge alternatively e.g. if she sees a discharge the whole of two successive twilights or Joseph asked the priest who officiates at the continual offering is the uncleanness of the deep permitted to him or not if you should say that the uncleanness of the deep is permitted to the priest who officiates at their sacrifices what about the Gonorrhoe which has no connection with the preceding and when a man has a single discharge he is unclean only until the evening when he performs tibula and becomes clean why then does he need another day priest who officiates at the continual offering do we say when have we a tradition about the uncleanness of the deep in respect of the Passover offering but we have no tradition about the uncleanness of the deep in respect to the continual offering or perhaps the continual offering is learned from the Passover offering said Rabbi it stands to reason if where no uncleanness was not permitted to him yet the uncleanness of the deep was permitted to him and where no uncleanness was permitted to him Talmud, Mos Pesachim B is it not logical that the uncleanness of the deep was permitted to him I will tell you can we then argue a she arrived from a traditional law surely it was taught our Eliezer said to him Akiva that a bone of a corpse the size of a barley grain defile is a traditional law whereas that a quarter log of blood of a corpse defile is deduced by you a fortiori and we do not deduce a fortiori from a traditional law rather said Rabbah we learn the scope of its appointed time from the Passover offering and where is the law about the uncleanness of the deep itself written said our Eliezer scripture said and if any man die beside him Allah which means when it is quite clear beside him we have thus found it in the case of a Nazi right how do we know it in the case of one who sacrifices a Passover offering said our Yohanan because scripture said if any man shall be unclean by reason of a dead body or in a distant road unto you that means when it is quite clear unto you our Simeon Belakish said it is as the road just as the road is manifest so must the cause of defilement be manifest to an objection is raised what is the uncleanness of the deep wherever not even a person at the end of the world had been cognizant thereof if a person at the end of the world had been cognizant thereof it is not the uncleanness of the deep but according to our Eliezer who interpreted when it is quite clear beside him then it is uncleanness of the deep unless he himself the Nazi
is unclean in respect of the laws of a Nazi rite or one who sacrifices a Passover offering he is clean when is that said if he has no room to pass by but if he has room to pass by he is clean even in respect of Teramah when is that said if he finds it whole but if it was broken or dismembered he is clean as he might have passed between the pieces but if it lay in a grave even if broken and dismembered he is unclean because the grave unites it when is that said if he was walking on foot but if he was laden with a burden or riding he is unclean because he who walks on foot can avoid touching it or overshadowing it but when he is laden or riding he cannot but touch it or overshadow it when is this said in the case of uncleanness of the deep but in the case of known uncleanness he is unclean and what is uncleanness of the deep wherever not even one at the end of the world had been cognizant thereof but if one even at the world's end was cognizant thereof it is not uncleanness of the deep if he found it hidden in straw earth or pebbles it is uncleanness of the deep if he found it in water in darkness or in the clefts of rocks it is not uncleanness of the deep and they did not state the law of uncleanness of the deep in respect of what save a corpse alone mission if it the paschal lamb became unclean either holy or the greater part thereof we burn it in front of the byro with the wood of the pile if the lesser part thereof became unclean also not harvey the people burn it in their courtyards or on their roofs with their own wood misers burn it in front of the byra in order to benefit from the wood of the pile tomorrow what is the reason said our jose be in order to put them to shame if the lesser part thereof became unclean etc but the following contradicts it similarly he who went out of jerusalem and reconnected that he had holy flesh with him if he has passed scopus he burns it where he is but if not talmud mas pesachim he returns and burns it in front of the temple with the wood of the altar pile said our hamabiyah there is no difficulty one refers to a lodger the other our mission refers to a householder our papa said both refer to a lodger there he had repaired to the road here he had not repaired to the road our zibit said in truth it is as was first stated visitor it refers to a lodger while here it refers to a householder and even where he had not taken to the road in the case of a lodger since he has not wood of his own he was regarded as a miser for we learned misers burn it in front of the temple in order to benefit from the wood of the altar pile our rabbis taught if they come desire to burn it in their own courtyards and with the wood of the altar pile we do not eat permit them in front of the temple and with their own wood we do not eat them as for not eating them when they wish to burn it with the wood of the pile in their own courtyards that is well the reason being less some of it the wood be left over and they come to a stumbling block through it but what is the reason that they may not burn it in front of the temple with their own wood said our joseph so as not to shame him who has none of his own robbers said on account of suspicion wherein do they differ they differ where he brought cane reeds and dry branches which are not fit for the pile we learned elsewhere the head of the mohammed used to place the unclean by the east gate what is the reason said our joseph in order to put them to shame robbers said because of suspicion wherein do they differ they differ in respect of delicate persons or rope makers mission a passover offering which passed out or was defiled must be burnt immediately if its owners were defiled or they died it must become disfigured and be burnt on the 16th or yohan and be said this too must be burnt immediately because there are none to eat it tomorrow as for uncleanness it is well because it is written and it Flesh that toucheth any unclean thing shall not be eaten, it shall be burnt with fire. But how do we know it of what goes out? Because it is written, Behold, the blood of it was not brought into the sanctuary within Moses said to Aaron, Why did ye not eat the sin offering? Perhaps its blood entered the innermost sanctuary. No, he answered him, Perhaps it passed without its barrier. He asked no reply. He it was in the sanctuary, said he to him, If it was in the sanctuary, and behold, the blood of it was not brought into the sanctuary within, wherefore have ye not eaten it? Whence it follows that if it passed out, or if its blood entered within, it requires burning as for when it is defiled, it is well the divine law revealed it in the case of lesser holy sacrifices, and all the more in the case of most holy sacrifices. But as to what goes out, we have found that it is disqualified in the case of superior sacrifices. Whence do we know it of inferior sacrifices? Moreover, as to what was taught of its Blood was kept overnight Talmud, Mos Pesachim B if its blood was poured out or if the blood passed outside the temple enclosures where it is all established law that it requires burning once do we learn it we deduce it from our Simeon's teaching for it was taught our Simeon said in the holy place it shall be burnt with fire this teaches of the sin offering that is burnt in the holy place sanctuary now I only know this alone how do we know it of the unfit of the other most holy sacrifices and the emirim of the lesser holy sacrifices therefore it is stated in the holy place it shall be burnt with fire we have thus found it of the most holy sacrifices whence do we know it of the lesser holy sacrifices rather that wherever there is a disqualification in the sacred sacrifices burning is required no matter whether it is the most holy sacrifices or the lesser holy sacrifices this is known by tradition and as for Aaron's sin offering that is because the incident that happened happened us now according to the tenor of the school of Rabbi Biabu who said even pickle requires disfigurement whence do we know it because he learns the meaning of iniquity from Nahar yet let us learn the meaning of iniquity from Aaron's sacrifice he can answer you a sacrifice such as Aaron's sin offering to in such a case would require disfigurement in future generations but there it was a special dispensation now that we say that wherever there is a disqualification in the sacred sacrifices burning is required no matter whether it is the most sacred sacrifices or the lesser sacrifices this is known by tradition what is the purpose of in the holy place it shall be burnt with fire that is required to teach that its burning must be in the holy place what is the purpose of and the flesh that touch it any unclean thing shall not be eaten it shall be burnt with fire that is required for its own sake you might say all disqualifications of the sacred sacrifices mean each of its blood was kept overnight if its blood was spilled if its blood went outside or if it was slaughtered by night these require burning because they do not apply to Holland but if it became unclean which disqualifies in the case of Holland too I would say since it has been treated as profane not holy it does not require burning and burial should suffice for it hence we are informed that it is not so if its owners were defiled or they died it must become disfigured etc our Joseph said the controversy is where the owners were defiled after the sprinkling so that the flesh had become fit for eating but if the owners were defiled before the sprinkling so that the flesh had not become fit for eating all agree that it must be burnt immediately an objection is raised this is the general rule wherever its disqualification is in itself it must be burnt immediately if it is in the blood or in its owner their flesh must become disfigured and then it Goes out to the place of burning now the disqualification through the owners is taught as analogous to that of the blood just as that of the blood is before sprinkling so was the defilement of the owners before sprinkling rather if stated it was thus stated the controversy is where the owners were defiled before the sprinkling so that the flesh is not fit for eating whereby it is as though its disqualification were in itself but if the owners were defiled after the sprinkling so that the flesh had become fit for eating all agree that its disqualification is through something else extraneous and it requires disfigurement but our Yohanan maintained the controversy holds good even if the owners were defiled after sprinkling to now our Yohanan is consistent with his view for our Yohanan said our Yohanan be and our Nehemiah said the same thing our Yohanan be this which we have stated what is the allusion to our Nehemiah for it was taught our Nehemiah said this Aaron sin Offering was burnt on account of bereavement, therefore it is stated, and there have befallen me such things as these. Now surely bereavement is as a disqualification after sprinkling, yet when it was burnt, it was burnt immediately. Talmud, Mos Pesachim, Rabbah added, Our Jose the Galilean, too, for it was taught, Our Jose the Galilean said, The whole passage speaks only of the bullocks which were burnt and the he goats which were burnt, and its purpose is to teach that when they are disqualified, they must be burnt before the temple and to impose a negative injunction against eating them. Said they to him, A sin offering whose blood entered the innermost sanctuary, whence do we know that it is disqualified? Said he to them from the verse, Behold, the blood of it was not brought into the sanctuary within, whence it follows that if it the sacrifice went outside or if its blood entered within, it requires burning, but our Yohanan holds the blood and the flesh are one thing while the defilement of the owners is a different thing mission of the bones and the sinews and the nathar of the paschal lamb are to be burnt on the 16th if the 16th falls on the sabbath they are to be burnt on the 17th because they do not override either the sabbath or the festival gemara armari biabua said in our isaac's name bones
There is no difficulty here it means where it enjoyed a period of fitness there it means where it never enjoyed a period of fitness and which Tana admits a distinction between where it enjoyed a period of fitness and where it did not enjoy a period of fitness it is our Jacob for it was taught neither shall ye break a bone thereof thereof implies of a fit one but not of an unfit one our Jacob said if it enjoyed a period of fitness and became unfit it is subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone if it did not enjoy a period of fitness it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone our Simeon said both the one and the other are not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone an objection is raised no bones of sacrifices require burning except the bones of the Passover offering on account of the stumbling block how are these bones meant if we say that they contain no marrow why do they need burning hence it is obvious that they contain marrow now if you should think that the serving of Nahar is something substantial. Why do the bones of other sacrifices not require burning? Said Arnam and B. Isaac. The circumstances here are e.g. if he found them, the bones scooped out. In the case of the bones of other sacrifices which are not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone, we assume that they were scooped out before it. the marrow became Nahar. Hence they did not serve Nahar and do not require burning. But in the case of the bones of the Passover offering, which are subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone, we assume that they were scooped out after they became Nahar. Hence they had served Nahar and required to be burnt. Arzibit said the circumstances here are e.g. Talmud, Mos Pesachim B. That he found them piled up in heaps and some of them were scooped out. In the case of bones of other sacrifices which are not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone, I assume that they have all been scooped out and the marrow eaten. Hence they do. Not require burning, but in the case of bones of the Passover offering, which are subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone, I say perhaps it is these only which were scooped out, while the others were not scooped out. Hence, they require burning. Rab Judah said in Rab's name, all sinews are flesh except the sinews of the neck. We learn the bones of sinews and the nahar are to be burnt on the sixteenth hour. These sinews meant if they are sinews of flesh, let us eat them while if they remain over, then they are indeed nahar. Hence, it is obvious that the sinews of the neck are meant now. It is well if you say that they are flesh, therefore they require burning. But if you say that they are not flesh, why do they require burning? Said our This teaching arises only in respect of the thigh sinew and in accordance with our Judah, for it was taught our Judah said the prohibition of the thigh sinew is operative only in respect of one and reason determines that of the right. Thigh then in that case conclude that Arjuna is in doubt for if he is really certain let us eat that which is permitted and throw away that which is forbidden why then do they both need burning said Rika behind of this law was stated where e.g. they were originally distinguished but subsequently mixed up Rashi said it is necessary to teach it only in respect of the fat of the sinew of the thigh for it was taught its fat is permitted but the Israelites are holy and treated as forbidden Rabbanah said it refers to the outer sinew of the thigh and is in accordance with Rab Judah's dictum in Samuel's name for Rab Judah said in Samuel's name the inner one which is near the bone is forbidden and a person is liable on its account to flagellation the other which is near the flesh is forbidden but a person is not liable on its account if the sixteenth fell etc yet why so let the affirmative command come and override the negative command said Hezekiah and the school of Hezekiah taught likewise, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, but that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Now the second until the morning need not be stated. What then is the teaching of until the morning? Scripture comes to appoint a second morning for its burning of a said scripture. Set the burnt offering of the Sabbath shall be burnt on its Sabbath, but the burnt offering of weekdays is not to be burnt on the Sabbath, nor is the burnt offering of weekdays to be burnt on festivals. Rabbah said, Scripture saith, No manner of work shall be done in the messy festival, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done by you, that but not its preparatory requisites, only Talmud, Mos Pesachim, but not circumcision out of its proper time, which might otherwise be inferred. For Shiori Rashi said, On the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, Shabbat, and written in connection with festivals is an affirmative precept and one affirmative precept cannot override a negative precept and an affirmative precept combined mission everything which can be eaten of a full-grown ox may be eaten of a tender goat and also the tops of the four legs and the gristles Gemara Rabbah pointed out a contradiction we learned everything which can be eaten of a full-grown ox may be eaten of a tender goat hence that which cannot be eaten of the former may not be eaten of the latter then consider the sequel and also the tops of the four legs and the gristles yet surely these cannot be eaten in the case of a full-grown ox rather it is dependent on tanaim and it is taught us everything which can be eaten of a full-grown ox may be eaten of a tender goat while that which cannot be eaten of the former may not be eaten of the latter but some maintain also the tops of the four legs and the gristles Rabbah said this the second is a defining clause and it teaches us everything which can be eaten of a full-grown ox after much boning may be eaten of a tender goat when roasted and what is it the tops of the four legs and the gristles it was taught in accordance with Rabbah everything which can be eaten of a full-grown ox after much boning may be eaten of a tender goat when roasted and what is it the tops of the four legs and the gristles and the soft sinews are treated as flesh it was stated with regard to sinews which would ultimately harden are you had and said one may register for them in the Passover offering Reshlakish maintained one may not register for them in the Passover offering are you had and said one may register for them in the Passover offering because we decide by the present Reshlakish maintained one may not register for them in the Passover offering because we decide by its ultimate condition Reshlakish raised an objection against are you had and everything which can be eaten of a full-grown ox may be eaten of a tender goat and what is it the tops of the four legs and the gristles Thus only these but not sinews which would ultimately harden said he to him he teaches those and the same applies to these thus why are those permitted because they can be eaten in the case of a full-grown ox after much boning so these two call be eaten of a full-grown ox after much boning our Jeremiah said to Arabin when you go before Arabin point out a contradiction to him did then Aryohan and say with regard to sinews which would ultimately harden one may register for them in the Passover offering which shows that we decide by the present surely Rush Lakish asked Aryohan and can the skin of the head of a tender sucking goat be defiled and he answered him it cannot be defiled which proves that we decide by the future said he to him he who pointed out this contradiction to you was not particular about his flower surely Aryohan and retracted in favor of Rush Lakish S view and he said to him do not provoke me for I learned it as the opinion of an individual Mishnah he who Breaks a bone of a clean Passover offering receives forty lashes, but he who leaves over flesh of a clean offering or breaks a bone of an unclean one eye is not flagellated with forty lashes. Gemara as for leaving over flesh of a clean offering, it is well for it was taught, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Scripture desires to state an affirmative command after a negative command, thus teaching that one is not flagellated for it. This is our Judas view. Our Jacob said this is not the real reason, but because it is a negative injunction involving no action for which one is not flagellated. But how do we know that he who breaks a bone of an unclean offering is not flagellated? Because Scripture states neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Thereof implies of a fit sacrifice, but not of an unfit one. Our rabbis taught neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Thereof implies of a fit. Sacrifice, but not of an unfit one. Rabbi said, In one house shall it be eaten, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. This intimates whatever is fit for eating is subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone, while whatever is not fit for eating is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone. Wherein do they differ? Said our Jeremiah, they differ in respect of a Passover offering which came in a state of uncleanness on the view that the verse refers to a fit sacrifice. Talmud, Moss. Passage be this, however, is unfit, but on the view that whatever is fit for eating is subject to this law, surely this too is fit for eating. Our Joseph said, In such a case, all agree that it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone, for Rabbi comes to be more lenient, and this is surely unfit, but they differ where it enjoyed a period of fitness and then became unfit on the view that the verse refers to a fit sacrifice. This indeed was fit, but on the view that only what is fit. For eating is meant surely it is not fit for eating now. Abay said in such a case all hold that it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone.
Ebrook is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone. Arshis hate the son of Aridi said in such a case all agree that it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone for this limb is surely unfit but they differ in respect of breaking a bone of a half roast offering on the view that the verse refers to a fit sacrifice this is fit while on the view that only what is fit for eating is subject to this law now however it is not fit for eating Arnam and B. Isaac said in such a case all agree that it is subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone what is the reason because it is surely fit for eating as he can roast it completely and eat it but they differ in respect of the breaking of the bone of the fat tail on the view that the verse refers to a fit sacrifice this is indeed fit but on the view that only what is fit for eating is subject to this law this however is not fit for eating for the fat tail is offered to the most higher as she said. In such a case it is certainly not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone for it is certainly unfit for eating at all but they differ in respect of breaking the bone of a limb upon which there is less than an olive of flesh on the view that the verse refers to a fit sacrifice this indeed is fit but on the view that only what is fit for eating is subject to this law we require the standard of eating which is absent Robin has said in such a case it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone because we require the standard of eating but they differ in respect of a limb upon which there is less than an olive of flesh at this point but which contains as much as an olive of flesh elsewhere on the view that the verse refers to a fit sacrifice this indeed is fit but on the view that only what is fit for eating is subject to this law we require the standard of eating at the point where it is broken which is absent and was taught as four of these four. It was taught Rabbi said in one house shall it be eaten neither shall ye break a bone thereof he is culpable on account of that which is fit but he is not culpable on account of that which is not fit thus if it had a period of fitness but became unfit by the time of eating it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone if it contains the standard of eating it is subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone if it does not contain the standard of eating it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone that which is intended for the altar is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone only at the time of eating is it subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone when not at the time of eating it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone it was stated if a limb does not contain as much as an olive of flesh at this point but does contain as much as an olive of flesh elsewhere are Yohanan maintained it is subject to the prohibition of Breaking a bone, Arsimian B. Lakish said it is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone, or Yohanan raised an objection against Rush Lakish, neither shall ye break a bone thereof, both a bone upon which there is as much as an olive of flesh, and a bone upon which there is not as much as an olive of flesh. Now, what does there is not as much as an olive of flesh upon it mean? Shall we say that there is not as much as an olive of flesh upon it at all? Then why is it subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone? Hence, surely this is what it means, both a bone upon which there is as much as an olive of flesh at this very point, and a bone upon which there is not as much as an olive of flesh at this point, but there is as much as an olive of flesh upon it elsewhere, said he to him, Talmud, Mos Pesachim, and no, it means this, both a bone which has as much as an olive of flesh on the outside, and a bone which has not as much as an olive of flesh on it on the outside, but contains as much as an Olive of flesh marrow inside yet still at the point of breaking and it was taught even so neither shall ye break a bone thereof this refers to both a bone which contains marrow and a bone which does not contain marrow while to what do I apply and they shall eat the flesh in that night to the meat on the bone yet perhaps it is not so but it applies to the meat marrow inside the bone too while to what do I apply neither shall ye break a bone thereof to a bone which does not contain marrow but in the case of a bone which contains marrow he breaks it and eats the marrow and do not wonder thereat for the affirmative command comes and overrides the negative command when however they shall not break a bone thereof is stated in connection with the second Passover which need not have been taught seeing that it has already been said according to all the statute of the Passover they shall keep it deduced from this that it means both a bone which contains marrow and a bone which does not contain marrow an objection is raised with regard to a limb part of which went outside he cuts the flesh as far as the bone and pierces it until he reaches the joint and then cuts it off now if you say that a limb upon which there is not as much as an olive at this point but there is as much as an olive on it elsewhere is not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone why does he pierce it until he reaches the joint and then cut it off let us scrape a little away and break it up said this cannot be done because of a possible split robin has said this refers to the thigh bone we learned elsewhere pickle and nut hard to file the hands are huna and are his one maintained it was on account of the suspects of the priesthood while the other maintained it was on account of the lazy priest one recited the reason in reference to pickle while the other recited it in reference to nut hard he who recited it in reference to pickle gave the reason as being on account of the suspects of the priesthood while he recited it in reference to Nathar stated that it was on account of the lazy priests one recited as much as an olive while the other recited as much as an egg he recited as much as an olive took the same standard as its prohibition while he recites as much as an olive takes the same standard as its uncleanness the scholars asked did the rabbis enact uncleanness in respect of what goes outside or not do we say they impose uncleanness on Nathar because they the priests might come to be lazy about it but concerning that which goes outside they will certainly not carry it out with their own hands and so the rabbis did not decree uncleanness in connection therewith or perhaps there is no difference come and here if part of a limb went outside he cuts the flesh as far as the bone and pierces it until he reaches the joint and then cuts it off now if you say that the rabbis impose uncleanness upon it what if he does Cut surely it defiles it, it is concealed uncleanness and concealed uncleanness does not defile but according to Rabbanah who maintain the connection of foodstuffs is not a real connection and they are as though separated what can be said surely they touch each other and at the inner portion is defiled hence according to him who recited as much as an olive we must say here that it did not contain as much as an olive while according to him who recited as much as an egg we must say that it did not contain as much as an egg come and here if a man carries out flesh of a Passover offering from one company to another though he has violated a negative injunction if the flesh is clean now does that not mean that it is clean yet forbidden because that which goes out from one company to another company is like that which goes outside its boundary and is disqualified for eating yet even so it teaches that it is clean which proves that the rabbis did not decree uncleanness no it is clean and permitted because that which goes out from company to company is not like that which goes outside its boundary and it is not disqualified but surely the second clause teaches he who eats it is subject to a negative injunction as for him who says as much as an egg it is well this may refer to where it contains as much as an olive but not as much as an egg but according to him who says as much as an olive what can be said rather say thus we do not ask in respect of what goes out in the case of a passover offering for the rabbi certainly did not decree uncleanness there what is the reason the members of the company are most scrupulous and so are very careful with it but we do ask in respect of what goes out in the case of sacrifices in general what is the law the question stands over now he who carries out flesh of the passover offering talmud mos pesachim be from one company to another company how do we know that he violates a negative injunction because it was taught thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad out of the house I only know that it must not be taken from one house to another house whence do we know that it must not be taken from one company to another company because it is stated abroad meaning outside the place of its consumption rm I said he who carries out flesh of the Passover offering from one company to another company is not culpable unless he deposits it there carrying out is written in connection with it is in connection with the Sabbath hence just as in the case of the Sabbath he is not culpable unless he removes and deposits so here too he is not culpable unless he removes it from one company and deposits it with the second R Abu Bimamal raised an objection if they were carrying them on staves the front bearers having gone outside the walls of the temple court while the rear ones had not yet gone out those in front defile their garments while those behind do not defile their garments but it has not come to rest he raised the objection and he himself answered it it refers to carcasses which are trailed along the ground mission if part of a limb went outside he cuts the flesh as far as the bone and pierces it until he reaches the joint and cuts it away but in the case of other sacrifices he cuts it off with a chopper because they are not subject to the prohibition of breaking a bone from the door stop and within ranks as within the city from the door stop and without is as
must not conclude after the Paschal meal by saying to the after meal entertainment and Rab said that means that they must not remove from one company to another there is no difficulty there it is at the time of eating here it is not at the time of eating come and here Abbasal said the upper chamber of the Holy of Holies was more stringent than the Holy of Holies for the high priest entered the Holy of Holies once a year whereas the upper chamber of the Holy of Holies was entered only once. A septenate others say twice a septenate others say once in a jubilee to see what it required said our Joseph shall a man stand up and raise an objection from the Hikal the Hikal is different because it is written then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch of the temple and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper rooms thereof and of the inner chambers thereof and of the place of the ark cover and it is written all this do I give thee in. Writing as the Lord hath made me wise by his hand upon me, come and here with regard to the chambers built in the sacred area and opening into the non-sacred area, their inside is not sacred while their roofs are sacred. Arhist explained this as meaning where their roofs were level with the ground of the temple court. If so, consider the second clause as to those built in the non-sacred area and opening into the sacred area, their inside is sacred while their roofs are not sacred. Now, if you think that it means where their roofs are level with the ground of the temple court, then they are sellers, whereas our Yohanan said the sellers were not sanctified. Our Yohanan said this only in respect of those opening into the temple mount, whereas that was taught in respect of those opening into the temple court, but it was taught our Judah said the sellers under the call were not sacred, that was taught where they opened into the non-sacred area, come and here and its roof is sacred now is. That logical surely he teaches as for these roofs you may not eat their sacrifices of the greater sanctity nor kill their sacrifices of the lesser sanctity but in that case its roof is holy presents a difficulty said our ham of Egeria that was taught in respect of those two cubits for we learned there were two cubits measures in shoes and the castle one on the northeast corner and one on the southeast corner that on the northeast corner exceeded the cubit of Moses by half a finger breadth. While that on the southeast corner exceeded SC the first cubit by half a finger breadth so that it exceeded the cubit of Moses by a finger breadth and Y was one large and one small so that the workers might receive contracts by the small measure and deliver the work by the large one to avoid liability to a trespass offering any Y2 one was for working gold and silver while the other was or building we learned the windows and the thickness of the wall are as the inside as. For the windows it is well this being possible where they were level with the ground of the temple court but how is the thickness of the wall conceivable it is possible in the case of the inner wall as it is written but he hath made the rampart and the wall to mourn which are aha others say are Hannah interpreted the wall proper and the minor wall mission if two companies are eating in one room these may turn their faces in one direction and those may turn their faces in another direction with the boiler in the middle when the waiter rises to mix the wine he must shut his mouth and turn his face away from the other company until he reaches his own company but a bride may turn her face away and eat Gemara who is the author of our mission it is our Judah for it was taught upon the houses wherein they shall eat it this teaches that a paschal lamb may be eaten in two companies you might think that the eater may eat in two places therefore it is stated in one house shall he eat it. Whence it was said if the waiter ate as much as an olive at the side of the oven if he is wise he eats his fill of it but if the members of the company wish to do him a favor they come and sit at his side this is our Judah's opinion our Simeon said upon the houses wherein they shall eat it this teaches that the eater may eat in two places Talmud, Mos Pesachim be you might think that it may be eaten in two companies therefore it is stated in one house shall it be eaten wherein do they differ are. Judah holds the traditional non vocalized text is authoritative while our Simeon holds the text as read as vocalized is authoritative if they were sitting in one company and a partition was spread between them on the view that one pascal may be eaten in two companies they may eat thus but on the view that one pascal may not be eaten in two companies they may not eat thus if they were sitting when the partition was removed from between them on the view that the eater May eat in two places they may go on eating thus but on the view that the eater may not eat in two places they may not go on eating our Kahana set and stated this as a definite ruling set our Ashi to our Kahana you should rather ask it as a question does the removing of a partition or the setting up of a partition transform it into two places or two companies respectively or not the question stands over the bride turns her face away etc what is the reason set our high Abba in our Yohanan's name because she is modest our the son of our Nathan visited the home of our Naman B Isaac they asked him what is your name Rabhuna replied he would you sir sit down on the couch said they and he sat down then they offered him a goblet which he accepted at the first invitation but he drank it in two times without turning his face away they asked him what is the reason that you called yourself Rabhuna he replied that is my name what is the reason that when they told you to sit on the couch you did sit said he to them whatever your host tells you do what is the reason that when a goblet was offered you you accepted it at the first invitation said he to them one must show reluctance to a small man but one must not show reluctance to a great man why did you drink it in two times said he to them because it was taught he who drinks his goblet in once is a gourmand in two times shows good breeding in three times is of the arrogant why did you not turn your face away we learned the bride turns her face away replied he or Ishmael son of our Jose visited the home of our Simeon B our Jose B Laconia they offered him a goblet which he accepted at the first invitation and drank in one draft said they to him do you not agree that he who drinks his goblet in one draft is greedy said he to them this was not said when your goblet is small your wine sweet and my stomach brought Arhuna said the members of the company enter three at a time and depart even singly Rabbi observed but that is only if they enter at the time when people generally enter and providing that the attendant had taken notice of them Rabbin said and they must make their full payment and the last must pay extra but the law does not agree with him Talmud, Mos Pesach M-A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I-I Mishnah woman when she is in her husband's home and her husband slaughtered on her behalf and her father slaughtered on her behalf must eat of her husband's if she went to spend the first festival in her father's home and her father slaughtered on her behalf and her husband slaughtered on her behalf she may eat wherever she pleases an orphan on whose behalf his guardian slaughtered may eat wherever he pleases a slave of two partners may not eat of either he who is half slave and half free must not eat of his master's Gemara hence you may infer from this that selection is retrospective no what does she pleases mean at the time of the slaughtering now the following contradicts this a woman. On the first festival eats of her father's thereafter if she desires she eats of her father's while if she desires she eats of her husband's there is no difficulty there it means when she is eager to go to her father's home here in our mission it means when she is not eager to go for it is written and was I in his eyes as one that found peace shalom which our Yohanan interpreted like a bride who was found perfect shalom in her father-in-law's home and is eager to go and recount her merits in her father's house as it is written and it shall be at that day saith the Lord that thou shalt call me my husband Ishi and thou shalt call me no more my master B.A.L. Our Yohanan said that means like a bride in her father-in-law's house and not like a bride in her father's house we have a little sister and she hath no breasts our Yohanan said this alludes to Elam who was privileged to study but not to teach I am a wall and my breast like the towers thereof our Yohanan said I am a Wall alludes to the Torah and my breasts like the towers thereof to scholars while Rabbah interpreted I am a wall symbolizes the community of Israel and my breasts like the towers thereof symbolizes the synagogues and the houses of study are Zitra Bitoya said in Rab's name what is meant by the verse we whose sons are as plants grown up in their youth whose daughters are as corner pillars carved after the fashions of the temples we whose sons are as plants alludes to the young men of Israel who have not experienced the taste of sin whose daughters are as corner pillars to the virgins of Israel who reserve themselves for their husbands and thus it is said and they shall be filled like the basins like the corners of the altar alternatively a parallel is drawn from the following whose garners are full affording all manner of store carved after the fashion of the temple both the one and the other the writ ascribes praise to them as though the temple were built in their days the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea the son of Biri in the days of Uziah Jotham and Hezekiah kings of Judah four prophets prophesied in one age and the greatest of all of them was Hosea for it is said the Lord spoke at first with Hosea did he then speak first with Hosea were there not many prophets from Moses until Hosea said are Yohanan he was the first of
It means that she was as sweet in everyone's mouth as a cake of fixed dibla while Aryohan and interpreted it means that all trod upon her like a cake of fixed is trodden. Another interpretation Gomer Rab Judah said they desired to destroy Ali Gamer the wealth of Israel in her days Aryohan and said they did indeed despoil their wealth for it is said for the king of Aram Syria destroyed then and made them like the dust in threshing and she conceived and bore him a son and the Lord said. Unto him call his name Jezreel for yet in little while and I will visit the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel and it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel and she conceived again and bore a daughter and he said unto him call her name Lorah that hath not obtained compassion for I will no more have compassion upon the house of Israel that I should in any wise pardon them. And she conceived and bore a son and he said call his name Lo am I not my people for ye are not my people and I will not be yours after two sons and one daughter were born to him the holy one blessed be he said to Hosea shoots thou have not learned from thy teacher Moses for as soon as I spoke with him he parted from his wife so do thou too part from her sovereign of the universe pleaded he I have children by her and I can neither expel her nor divorce her said the holy one blessed be he do. him and if thou whose wife is a harlot and thy children are the children of harlotry and thou knowest not whether they are thine or they belong to others yet thou art so then Israel who are my children the children of my tribe ones the children of Abraham Isaac and Jacob one of the four possessions which I have acquired in this world the Torah is one possession for it is written the Lord acquired me as the beginning of his way heaven and earth is one possession as it is written God most. I who possesses heaven and earth the temple is one possession for it is written this mountain sc the temple mount which his right hand had acquired Israel is one possession for it is written this people that thou hast gotten yet thou sayest exchange them for a different people as soon as he perceived that he had sinned he arose to supplicate mercy for himself said the holy one blessed be he to him instead of supplicating mercy for thyself supplicate mercy for Israel against whom I have decreed three decrees because of thee thereupon he arose and begged for mercy and he annulled the decree as then he began to bless them as it is said yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea and it shall come to pass that instead of that in which was said unto them ye are not my people it shall be said unto them ye are the children of the living God and the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and I will sow her unto me in the land and I will have compassion upon her that hath not obtained compassion and I will say to them that were not my people thou art my people to you and said woe to lordship which very slays its possessor for there is not a single prophet who did not outlive four kings as it is said the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uziah Jotham and Hezekiah kings of Judah are you and said how did Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel merit to be counted together with the kings of Judah because he did not heed slander against Amos whence do we know that he was counted with them because it is written the word of the Lord that came into Hosea the son of Beri in the days of Uziah Jotham and Hezekiah kings of Judah and in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel and whence do we know that he did not heed slander because it is written and Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel saying Amos hath conspired against thee, etc. And it is written for thus Amos saith Jeroboam shall die by the sword, etc. Said he Jeroboam heaven forfend that that righteous man should have said thus yet if he did say what can I do to him the Sheshana told it to him or Eliezer said even when the Holy One blessed be he is angry he remembers compassion for it is said for I will no more have compassion upon the house of Israel or Jose son of Arhanan said I he deduced it from this that I would in any wise pardon them or Eliezer also said the Holy One blessed be he did not exile Israel among the nations save in order that proselytes might join them for it is said and I will sow her unto me in the land surely a man sows as in order to harvest many core while Arhanan and deduced it from this and I will have compassion upon her that hath not obtained compassion Arhanan and said on the authority of Arsimian Biohe what is meant by the verse slander not a servant unto his master lest he curse. Thee and thou be found guilty and it is written a generation that curse their father and do not bless their mother because they curse their father and do not bless their mother therefore do not slander but it means even if they the slaves are a generation that curse their father and do not bless their mother yet do not slander etc. Whence do we know it from Hosea or Ashai said what is meant by the verse even the righteous acts of his ruler in Israel the Holy One blessed be he showed righteousness mercy unto Israel by scattering them among the nations and this is what a certain sectarian said to our Hannah we are better than you of you it is written for Job and all Israel remained there six months until he had cut off every male in Edom whereas you have been with us many years yet we have not done anything to you said he to him if you agree a disciple will debate it with you thereupon our Ashai debated it with him and he said to him the reason is because you do not Know how to act if you would destroy all they are not among you should you destroy those who are among you then you will be called the murderous kingdom said he to him by the capital of Rome with this care we lie down and with this care we get up our high taught what is meant by the verse God understandeth the way thereof and he knoweth the place thereof the holy one blessed be he knoweth that Israel are unable to endure the cruel decrees of Edom therefore he exiled them to Babylonia are. Eliezer also said the holy one blessed be he exiled Israel to Babylonia only because it is as deep as Gol for it is said I shall ransom them from the power of the netherworld Gol I shall redeem them from death Arhanan said because their language is akin to the language of the Torah Arhanan said because he sent them back to their mother's house it may be compared to a man who becomes angry with his wife whether does he send her to her mother's house and that corresponds to the Dictum of our Alexandria who said three return to their original home is Israel Egypt's wealth and the writing of the tables Israel as we have said Egypt's wealth as it is written and it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord the writing of the tables for it is written and I broke them before your eyes it was taught the tables were broken yet the letters flew up Ola said their exile was in order that they might eat Talmud, Moss passage imitates and occupy themselves with the Torah Ola visited Pumadiva on being offered a basket Tyrama of dates he asked them how many such are obtainable for Azuz three for Azuz they told him a basketful of honey for Azuz exclaimed he yet the Babylonians do not engage in the study of the Torah at night they the dates upset him a basketful of deadly poison cost Azuz in Babylonia exclaimed he yet the Babylonians study the Torah our Eliezer also said what is meant by the verse and many people shall go and say come yet and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob the God of Jacob but not the God of Abraham and Isaac but the meaning is this we will not be like Abraham in connection with whom mountain is written as it is said as it is said to this day in the mountain where the Lord is seen nor like Isaac in connection with whom field is written as it is said. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide but let us be like Jacob who called him home as it is said and he called the name of that place Bethel God is a home are you and said the reunion of the exiles is as important as the day when heaven and earth were created for it is said and the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint themselves one head and shall go up out of the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel and it is written and there was evening and there was morning one day an orphan on whose behalf his guardian slaughtered etc you may infer from this that selection is retrospective said arzara no lamb according to their father's houses implies in all cases our rabbis taught a lamb for a household this teaches that a man can bring a lamb and slaughter it on behalf of his son and daughter if minors and on behalf of his canaanitish non-jewish slave and bondmaid whether with their consent or without their consent but he cannot slaughter it on behalf of his son and daughter if adults or on behalf of his hebrew slaves and bondmaids or on behalf of his wife save with their consent another very the taught a man must not slaughter the passover offering on behalf of an adult his son and daughter and on behalf of his hebrew slave and bondmaid and on behalf of his wife save with their consent but he may slaughter it on behalf of his son and daughter if minors and on behalf of his Canaanite slave and bondmaid whether with their consent or without their consent and all of these if they themselves slaughtered and their master also slaughtered on their behalf can discharge their duty with their masters but they cannot
and if he wishes he can eat of that one said he to him he and Asab others say you black pot between you and me the law will be clearly defined our mission holds good where they are particular with each other the berry who was taught when they are not particular with each other he who is half slave and half free must not eat of his masters it is only of his masters that he must not eat yet he may eat of his own but it was taught he may not eat either of his own or of his masters there is no difficulty one is according to the earlier mission while the other is according to the later mission for we learned he who is half slave and half free works one day for his master and one day for himself this is a view of Bethel el Betsham I say Talmud, Mas Pesachim you have thus safeguarded his master but you have not safeguarded him he is unable to marry a Canaanitish bondmaid because he is already half free he is unable to marry a free woman because he is still half slave. Shall he be made as not but surely the world was not created for aught but procreation as it is said he created it not a waste he formed it to be inhabited hence in the public interest we compel his master and he makes him a free man and he entices a bond for half his value and Bethel el reverted to rule as Betsham I Mishnah if a man says to his slave go forth and slaughter the Passover offering on my behalf if he slaughtered a kid he eats thereof if he slaughtered a lamb he eats. Thereof if he slaughtered a kid and a lamb he must eat of the first if he forgot what his master told him how shall he act he slaughters a lamb and a kid and declares if my master told me to slaughter a kid the kid is his for his Passover offering and the lamb is mine while if my master told me to slaughter a lamb the lamb is his and the kid is mine if his master also forgot what he told him both go forth to the place of burning yet they are exempt from sacrificing the second Passover. Gemara it is obvious that if he slaughtered a kid he the master may eat thereof even though he is accustomed to lamb if he slaughtered a lamb he may eat thereof even though he is accustomed to a kid but how is it stated if he slaughtered a kid and a lamb he must eat of the first surely it was taught one cannot register for two Passover offerings simultaneously our mission refers to a king and a queen and it was taught even so one may not register for two Passover offerings simultaneously. Yet it once happened that the king and queen instructed their servants go forth and slaughter the Passover offering on our behalf but they went and killed two Passover offerings for them then they went and asked the king which he desired and he answered then go and ask the queen when they went and asked the queen she said to them go and ask our Gamaliel they went and asked our Gamaliel who said to them the king and queen who have no particular desires must eat of the first but we nay. Similar case might not eat either of the first or of the second on another occasion a lizard was found in the temple abattoir and they wished to declare the entire repast unclean they went and asked the king who answered them go and ask the queen when they went to ask the queen she said to them go and ask Gamaliel so they went and asked him said he to them was the abattoir hot or cold it was hot replied they then go and pour a glass of cold water over it he told them they went and Poured a glass of cold water over it and it moved whereupon Argamaliel declared the entire repast clean thus the king was dependent on the queen and the queen was dependent on Argamaliel hence the whole repast was dependent on Argamaliel if he forgot what his master had told him etc. Remind whatever a slave owns his master owns said Abay he repairs to a shepherd with whom his master generally has dealings who is therefore pleased to make things right for his master and he gives him possession of one of them on condition that his master shall have no rights therein if his master forgot what he had told him etc. Abay said they learned this only where he forgot after the sprinkling so that when the blood was sprinkled it was fit for eating but if he the master forgot before the sprinkling so that when the blood was sprinkled it was not fit for eating they are bound to observe the second Passover others recite this in reference to the following very the heights of five companies. Passover offerings became mixed up with each other and a ward was found on one of them they all go out to the place of burning and they their owners are exempt for observing the second Passover said Abay this was taught only where they were mixed up after the sprinkling so that at least when the blood was sprinkled it was fit for eating but if they were mixed up before the sprinkling they are bound to observe the second Passover he who recites this in reference to our mission holds that all the more does it apply to the Beritha but he who recites it in reference to the Beritha holds that it does not apply to our mission since the sacrifices themselves are valid for if he reminds himself of what the master had told him it would be fit for eating it is indeed revealed before heaven the master said and their owners are exempt from observing the second Passover but one has definitely not discharged his duty the reason is because it is impossible to do. Otherwise what should be done should each bring a second Passover offering then they bring Holland to the temple court since four of them have already sacrificed if all of them bring one Passover offering the result is that the Passover offering is eaten by those who have not registered for it how so let each of them bring his Passover offering and stipulate and declare if mine was blemished let this one which I am bringing now be a Passover offering while if mine was unblemished let this one which I am bringing now be a peace offering that is impossible Talmud, Mas Pesachim because there is the breast and the shoulder of the peace offering which is eaten by priests only then let each one bring a priest with him what is the position of this priest if he has already sacrificed the Passover offering then perhaps this too is a Passover offering with the result that the Passover offering is eaten by those who have not registered for it while if he has not observed it. Passover perhaps this is a peace offering and so he will not observe the Passover then let all the five jointly bring one priest who had not kept the Passover and register him for these five Passover offerings for on any hypothesis there is one sacrifice with which he will discharge his duty rather the reason is because he reduces the time allowed for the eating of the peace offering for the Passover offering is eaten a day and a night whereas a peace offering is eaten two days. And one night then let them bring a Passover remainder and declare if mine was blemished let this which I bring now be a Passover offering while if mine was unblemished let this which I bring now be a peace offering for a Passover remainder is eaten one day and one night only may we then set aside animals in the first instance to be remainders then let us take the trouble to bring a Passover remainder rather the reason is because of the laying of hands for whereas a Passover offering does not require laying of the hands a remainder requires laying of the hands that is well of a men's sacrifice but what can be said of a woman as sacrifice rather it is on account of the blood applications for whereas the Passover offering requires one application the peace offering requires two which are four but what does that matter surely we learned all blood which is sprinkled on the outer altar if he the priest applied them with one sprinkling he has made atonement. Rather the reason is because whereas the blood of the Passover offering must be poured out gently that of the peace offerings requires dashing against the altar but what does that matter surely it was taught all blood which is applied by dashing against the altar if he the priest applied it by pouring it out he has discharged his duty granted that we say thus where he has done so do we say thus as a very outset to mission if a man says to his children behold I Slaughter the Passover offering on behalf of whichever of you goes up first to Jerusalem as soon as the first has inserted his head and the greater part of his body in Jerusalem he has acquired his portion and he acquires it on behalf of his brethren with him. Gemara this proves that selection is retrospective said Aryohan and he their father said this in order to encourage them in the performance of precepts this may be proved too for he the Tana teaches and he acquires it on behalf of his brethren with him now it is well if you say that he had registered them beforehand and it is correct but if you say that he had not registered them beforehand can they be registered after he has slaughtered it surely we learn they may register and withdraw their hands from it until it is killed this proves that it was taught likewise it once happened that the daughters outstripped the sons and so it was seen that the daughters were zealous while the sons were indolent mission one may Always register for it as long as there is as much as an olive therein for each one registered they may register and withdraw their hands from it until it is slaughtered our Simeon said until the blood is sprinkled tomorrow what does he inform us he informs us this is though this company had registered for it it can retract entirely and a different company register for it they may register and withdraw their hands from it until it is killed etc. Abbe said the controversy is in respect of withdrawing for the rabbis hold and if the household be too little for being mehoth for a lamb implies in the lifetime mehoth of the lamb while our Simeon holds that it implies during the existence mehoth of the lamb but in respect of registering all agree that this can be done only until it is killed because the writ saith according to the number of the the souls and then ye shall make your count takasu it was taught likewise they may register and withdraw their hands from it until it is slaughtered. Our Simeon said they may register until it is slaughtered and withdraw until the blood is sprinkled. Talmud, Mas Pesachim B. Mishnah. If a
Opinion thus only if they wish but not if they do not wish yet why so let him say to them surely you have accepted me there it is different because they can say to him we accepted you with the intention of troubling you to attend on us but we did not accept you that we should take the trouble of attending to you come and your members of a company one of whom is quick cunt are at liberty to say to him take your portion and go and not only that but even when five arrange for a meal in common they are at liberty to say to him take your portion and go this proves it what does and not only that mean he proceeds to a climax in the case of Passover offerings it goes without saying for they can say to him we accepted you for the purpose of the sacrifice but even in the case of a meal in common which is mere companionship they are at liberty to say to him take your portion and go other state that is no problem to us but this is our question are the members of a company permitted to divide or are they not permitted to divide come and your members of a company one of whom was quick handed are at liberty to say to him take your portion and go thus only if he is quick cunt but not if he is not quick handed this proves it our papa and our the son of our joshua joined their bread together but by the time our the son of our joshua ate one piece our papa ate four said he to him divide with me you have accepted me as a partner he retorted thereupon he raised all these objections to him and he answered him as we have answered them he then refuted him by the teaching regarding the members of a company etc said he to him there the reason is because they can say to him we accepted you for the purpose of the sacrifice he refuted him by the teaching regarding a meal in common etc so he divided with him and he went and joined bread with Rubina. by the time our the son of our joshua ate one piece Rubina ate eight said he a hundred papas rather than one Rubin our rabbis taught if a man registers others with him for his Passover offering and his Hashigah the money he holds his Hullin and he who sells his burnt offering and his peace offering has affected nothing and the money however much it is is utilized for a freewill offering but since he has not affected anything why should it be utilized for a freewill offering said Rabbah as a penalty and what does however much it is mean even if the animals were only worth four zoos and he paid. Five the rabbis penalized him even in respect of that additional zoos all other state Arashai said perhaps our Babylonian colleagues know the reason for this ruling consider one set aside a lamb for his Passover offering and another set aside money for his Passover offering how can sanctification fall upon sanctification that he teaches the money he holds his Hullin Talmud. Mos Pesachim said Abbe had not Arashai related that Mishnah to a case where he registers a harlot for his. Passover offering and in accordance with Rabbi I would have related it to sacrifices of lesser sanctity and in accordance with our Jose the Galilean who maintains sacrifices of lesser sanctity are their owner's property but on Rabbi's view a man does not leave anything over unconsecrated in the Passover offering yet he certainly does leave over in the case of money because when he set it aside for a Passover offering in the first place he did so with this intention while this the present. Beretha is the view of Rabbi and for that reason the money he holds is hollow as a man certainly leaves over something of money unconsecrated again what Arashai explains as the view of Rabbi I do not explain as the view of Rabbi for a man does not leave over anything unconsecrated of the Passover offering but this present Beretha cannot be established as agreeing with our Jose since it is taught therein and he who sells his burnt offering and his peace offering has affected. Nothing now, however, that Arashai related that mission to the case of a man who registers a harlot in his Passover offering, and in accordance with Rabbi, it follows that he holds that a man leaves something unconsecrated even in his Passover offering itself. What is the statement of Arashai which is alluded to? For we learned if he gave her a harlot consecrated animals as her hire, they are permitted for the altar. If he gave her birds of Holland, they are forbidden, though the reverse would have been logical if with consecrated animals which a blemish disqualifies, yet the interdict of hire or price does not fall upon them, then with birds which a blemish does not disqualify, is it not logical that the interdict of hire and price does not fall upon them? Therefore, it is stated for any vow which includes birds, but now you might argue a minority in respect of consecrated animals if with birds though a blemish does not disqualify them, yet hire and price fall upon them. Then with consecrated animals which a blemish disqualifies is it not logical that higher and price fall upon them therefore it is stated for any vow which excludes that which is already vowed not are now the reason is because the divine law wrote vow but otherwise I would say the interdict of higher falls upon consecrated animals but surely a man cannot prohibit that which is not his set Arashai it refers to the case of a man registering a harlot for his Passover offering this being. According to Rabbi what is the solution to Rabbi for it was taught and if the household be too little from being for a lamb sustain him with the proceeds of the lamb in his food requirements but not in his requirements of general purchases Rabbi said in his requirements of general purchases too so that if he has not wherewith to purchase he may register another in his Passover offering and his hashigah while the money he receives is hollow for on this condition to the Israelites. Consecrate their Passover offerings Rabbi and Arzara disagree one maintains none differ about fuel for roasting it for since this makes the Passover offering fit to be eaten it is as the Passover offering itself their controversy is only about unleavened bread and bitter herbs the rabbis hold this is a different eating while Rabbi holds since it is a requisite of the Passover offering it is as the Passover offering itself the other maintains none disagree about unleavened bread and bitter herbs either for it is written they shall eat the flesh and unleavened bread with bitter herbs they shall eat it and since they are a requisite of the Passover offering they are as the Passover offering their controversy is only about buying a shirt there with or buying a cloak there with the rabbis hold the divine law set from being for a lamb he may devoted Hahayahu to the lamb while Rabbi holds sustain Hahayahu thyself with the proceeds of the lamb but according to Abbe who said had not Arashai related that Mishnah to a case where he registers a harlot in his Passover offering and in accordance with Rabbi I would have related it to sacrifices of lesser sanctity and in accordance with our Jose the Galilean who maintains sacrifices of lesser sanctity are their owner's property but on Rabbi's view a man does not leave anything over unconsecrated in the Passover offering surely it is explicitly stated for on this condition to the Israelites. Consecrate their Passover offering say for on this condition to the Israelites consecrate the money for their Passover offerings Mishnah if Azab has suffered two attacks of discharge one slaughters the Passover offering on his behalf on his seventh day if he has had three attacks one slaughters on his behalf on his eighth day if a woman washes day by day one slaughters on her behalf on her second day if she saw a discharge on two days one slaughters on her behalf on the third. Day and Estuazaba one slaughters on her behalf on the eighth day Gemara Rab Judah said in Rab's name one slaughters and sprinkles on behalf of a tebul yum and one who lacks atonement Talmud, Mos Pesachim be but one may not slaughter and sprinkle for a person unclean through a reptile but Allah maintained one slaughters and sprinkles for a person unclean through a reptile according to Rab where and does a tebul yum differ because he is fit in the evening but one unclean through a reptile too. Is fit in the evening he lacks tebul and a tebul yum too lacks the setting of the sun the sun goes down of its own accord and one who lacks atonement too surely lacks forgiveness it means where his pair of birds are in his hand and a person unclean through a reptile too surely the meekway stands before him he may neglect it if so he who lacks sacrifice too perhaps he will neglect to sacrifice it means e.g. that he had delivered them his birds to the beth in this being in. Accordance with Arshimeh who said it is a presumption that the Beth Din of priests do not rise from there until the money in the horn-shaped receptacles is finished now according to Rab by scriptural law he is indeed fit and it was the rabbis who preventively forbade him why then did Rab say we defile one of them with a reptile rather say according to Rab he is not fit by biblical law either for it is written if any man be unclean by reason of a dead body does this not hold good even. When his seventh day falls on the eve of Passover which case is tantamount to uncleanness through a reptile yet the divine law said let him be relegated to the second Passover but how do you know that it is so he holds as our Isaac who said they were unclean through an unattended corpse whose seventh day fell on the eve of Passover for it is said and they could not keep the Passover on that day thus only on that day could they not keep it but on the morrow they could keep it yet the divine. Law said let them be put off we learned if Azab has suffered two attacks one slaughters on his behalf on his seventh day does that not mean where he had not performed tabula which proves that one slaughters and sprinkles for a person unclean through a reptile no it means where he has performed tabula if he has performed tabula what does it the
on behalf of one who had two discharges and is in his seventh day but has not performed tabla so that he is quite unclean and how much the more does one slaughter and sprinkle for one who had three attacks and is in his eighth day and has performed tabla on the seventh so that his uncleanness is of a lighter nature hence it surely follows that the law that we slaughter on behalf of one who has had two attacks and is in his seventh day refers to the case where he has performed tabla no in truth i may tell you that he has not performed tabla and yet it is necessary i might argue only on the seventh day do we slaughter for him since it lies in his own hand to make himself fit but on the eighth day when it is not in his power to offer the sacrifice i might say the priests may neglect him hence we are informed that it is as arshima stated and as to azaba one slaughters etc a tanner recited before our abi and as to azaba one slaughters on her behalf on her seventh day said he to him is that Azaba on her seventh day fit even on the view that one slaughters and sprinkles for a person unclean through a reptile that is only for a person unclean through a reptile who is fit in the evening but this one is not fit until the morrow when she brings her atonement say instead on the eighth then it is obvious you might say since she lacks atonement one must not slaughter on her behalf hence he informs us that it is as Arshimea. Stated Rabbana said he to Tanner recited before him about Anitta thus and as to Anitta one slaughters for her on the seventh day said he to him is that Anitta fit on the seventh day even on the view that one slaughters and sprinkles for a person unclean through a reptile that is because he is fit in the evening but Anitta performs table in the evening of i.e. following the seventh day hence she is not fit for eating the Passover offering until the evening after the Eighth by when she has had the setting of the sun but say on the eighth that is obvious seeing that one slaughters and sprinkles for Azaba on the eighth day though as yet she lacks atonement need it be taught that one slaughters and sprinkles on behalf of Anita who does not lack atonement he finds it necessary to teach about Anita and informs us this only on the eighth but not on the seventh even as it was taught all who are liable to table their table takes place by day. Nita and a woman in confinement their table takes place at night for it was taught you might think that she Anita performs table by day therefore it is stated she shall be in her impurity seven days let her be in her impurity full seven days and a woman in confinement is assimilated to Udomish as to an omen Talmud, Mos Pesachim and one who is removing a heap of debris and likewise one who has received the promise to be released from prison and an invalid and an agent. Person who can eat as much as an olive one slaughters on their behalf yet in the case of all these one may not slaughter for them alone lest they bring the Passover offering to disqualification therefore if a disqualification occurs to them they are exempt from keeping the second Passover except one who was removing debris because he was unclean from the beginning of our rabbi son of Arhuna said in our Yohanan's name they learned this only of a heathen prison but if he is incarcerated in an Israelite prison one slaughters for him separately since he was promised he will definitely be released as it is written the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies are his dog observed as to what you say if he is in a heathen prison one may not kill on his behalf alone that was said only when the prison is without the walls of Beth Page but if it is within the walls of Beth Page one slaughters on his behalf alone what is the reason it is possible to convey it the flesh to him and he will eat it therefore if a disqualification occurs etc. Rabbi B. Barhana said in our Yohanan's name they learned this only of a round heap but if it was a long heap he is exempt from keeping the second Passover for perhaps he was clean at the time of the Shechet it was also taught likewise our Simeon the son of our Yohanan B. Barakah said one who is removing a heap of debris is sometimes exempt from the second Passover and sometimes liable how so it was a round heap and uncleanness a corpse was found underneath that he is liable a long heap and uncleanness was found underneath that he is exempt for I assume that he was clean at the time of Shechet a Mishnah one may not slaughter the Passover offering for a single person this is our Judah's view but our Jose permits it and even a company of a hundred who cannot eat as much as an olive jointly one may not kill for them and one may not form a company of women and slaves and minors Gemara our rabbis taught how to we know that one may not slaughter the Passover offering for a single person because it is said thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover offering for one this is our Judah's opinion but our Jose maintained a single person and he is able to eat it one may slaughter on his behalf ten who are unable to eat it one must not slaughter on their behalf now our Jose how does he employ this for one he requires it for our Simeon's deduction for it was taught our Simeon said how do we know that one who sacrifices his Passover offering at a private bama at the time when Bameth were prohibited violates a negative command because it is said thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover offering within one of the gates you might think that it is also thus when Bameth were permitted therefore it is stated within one of the gates they ruled that he violates a negative injunction only when all Israel enter through one gate and how does our Judah know this you may infer two things from it now according to our Jose. Whence does he know that its purpose is for what our Simeon said? Perhaps it comes for what was stated by our Judah. He can tell you, you cannot think so, for surely it is written according to every man's eating. Our Abba behind a parish had pointed out a contradiction to Rabbi did then our Judah say, One may not kill the Paschal lamb for a single person, but the following contradicts it as to a woman at the first Passover, one may slaughter for her separately, but at the second one makes her an addition. To others, this is the view of our Judah said he to him, Do not say for her separately, but for them separately, yet may we form a company consisting entirely of women. Surely we learned one may not form a company of women and slaves and minors. Does that not mean women separately and slaves separately and minors separately? No, he replied, It means women and slaves and minors together, women and slaves on account of obscenity, minors and slaves on account of Talmud, Mos Pesachim, be licentiousness too. Turn to the main text as to a woman at the first Passover one slaughters for her separately while at the second one makes her an addition to others this is the view of our Judah our Jose said as to a woman at the second Passover one slaughters for her separately and at the first it goes without saying our Simeon said as to a woman at the first one makes her an addition to others at the second one may not slaughter for her at all wherein do they differ our Judah holds according to the number of the souls implies even women and should you say if so even at the second two it is therefore written that man shall bear his sin only a man but not a woman yet should you argue if so she may not even be made an addition at the second therefore is written according to all the statue of the first Passover which is effective in respect of her being made a mere addition and our Jose what is his reason because in connection with the first Passover it is written according to the number of souls implying even a woman again in connection with the second Passover it is written that soul shall be cut off from his people soul implying even women while what does that man shall bear his sin excluded excludes a minor from Kareth while our Simeon argues in connection with the first Passover a man is written only a man but not a woman yet should you say if so she may not even be made an addition therefore is written according to the number of Sue which is effective in respect of her being an addition but should you say then even at the second two therefore the divine law excluded her from the second for it is written that man shall bear his sin implying only a man but not a woman now from what is she excluded if from an obligation this cannot be maintained seeing that there is no obligation at the first is there a question of the second hence she is surely excluded from participation even as an addition now what is this man which our Simeon quotes if we say they shall take to them every man a lamb according to their father's houses etc. Surely that is required for the teaching of our Isaac who deduced only a man can acquire on behalf of others but a minor cannot acquire on behalf of others rather it is derived from a man according to his eating but since our Jose agrees with our Simeon our Simeon too must agree with our Jose and he needs that verse to teach that one slaughters the Passover offering for a single person. He can answer you if so let the divine law right according to his eating why state a man hence you infer two laws from it with whom does the following dictum of our Eliezer agree is the observance of the Passover offering by a woman at the first Passover is obligatory while at the second it is voluntary and it overrides the Sabbath if voluntary why does it override the Sabbath rather say at the second it is voluntary while at the first it is obligatory and overrides the Sabbath with whom does it agree with our Judah? Our Jacob said in our Yohanan's name a company must not be formed consisting entirely of proselytes lest they be too particular about it and bring it to disqualification. Our rabbis taught the Passover offering and unleavened bread and bitter herbs are obligatory on the first night but voluntary from men onwards. Our Simeon said in the case of men it is obligatory in the
Passover offering in the evening but he may not partake of other sacrifices one who hears about his dead for the first time Talmud, Mas Pesach and one who collects the bones of his parents performs Tabla and eats sacred flesh if a proselyte was converted on the eve of Passover Beth Shammai maintained he performs Tabla and eats his Passover offering in the evening while Beth Hillel rule one who separates himself from the state of uncircumcision is like one who separated himself from a grave tomorrow what is the reason he holds the law of Anina at night is rabbinical only and where the Passover offering is concerned they did not insist on their law since it involves Kareth but in respect to sacrifices in general they insisted on their law seeing that only an affirmative precept is involved one who hears about his dead etc one who collects bones but he requires sprinkling on the third and the seventh day say one for whom his parents bones were Collected a proselyte who was converted, etc. Rabbi B. Barhanna said in our Yohanan's name the controversy is in respect of an uncircumcised even where Beth Hillel hold he is forbidden to eat in the evening as a preventive measure lest he become defiled the following year by the dead and he argues did I not perform Tabla last year and eat of the Passover offering so now too I will perform Tabla and eat but he will not understand that the previous year he was a heathen and not susceptible to uncleanness whereas now he is an Israelite and susceptible to uncleanness while Beth Shammai hold we do not enact a preventive measure but with regard to an uncircumcised Israelite all agree that he performs Tabla and eats his Passover offering in the evening and we do not preventively forbid an uncircumcised Israelite on account of an uncircumcised heathen it was taught likewise our Simeon B. Eliezer said Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel did not differ about an uncircumcised. Israelite both agreeing that he performs Tabla and eats his Passover offering in the evening about what do they differ about an uncircumcised even where Beth Shammai rule he performs Tabla and eats his Passover offering in the evening while Beth Hillel maintained he who separates himself from uncircumcision is as though he separated from a grave Rabbah said in the case of an uncircumcised person sprinkling and a knife they the sages insisted on their enactments even where Kareth is involved in the case of an one in a leper and Beth Haperes they did not insist on their enactments where Kareth is involved an uncircumcised person as stated sprinkling for a master said sprinkling is forbidden as a Shabbat yet it does not override the Sabbath a knife as it was taught just as one may not bring it as see a knife for circumcision through the street so may one not bring it by the way of roofs courtyards or enclosures in one and as we have stated what is this law of a leper for it was taught a leper whose eighth day fell on the eve of Passover and who had a nocturnal discharge carry on that day performs Tabla and eats the Passover offering in the evening for the sages said though a Tibalyam may not enter the Levitical camp this one does enter it is preferable that an affirmative precept which involves Kareth should come and override an affirmative precept which does not involve Kareth now are you had and said by the law of Torah there is not even an affirmative precept in connection therewith for it is said and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court what does the new court mean that they innovated a law there and ruled a Tibalyam must not enter the Levitical camp Beth Haperes for we learned now Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel both agree Talmud, Mos Pesachim be that we examine the Beth Haperes for the sake of those who would keep the Passover but we do not examine it for those who would he tear him? How is it examined? Said Rab Judah in Samuel's name. He sifts the Beth Haperes as he proceeds. Our Judah Abbe said in Rab's name, a Beth Haperes which was thoroughly trodden down is clean. C H A P T E R I X Mishnah. He who was unclean or in a journey afar off and did not keep the first Passover must keep the second. If he unwittingly erred or was accidentally prevented and did not keep the first, he must keep the second. If so, why is an unclean person and one who was in a journey afar off specified to teach that these are not liable to Gareth, whereas those are liable to Gareth? Mara, it was stated if he was in a journey afar off and they slaughtered the Passover offering and sprinkled its blood on his behalf. Arnaman said it is accepted. Arshis hate said it is not accepted. Arnaman said it is accepted. The divine law indeed had compassion on him, but if he kept the first, the blessing come upon him. While Arshis hate said it is not accepted. The divine law did in. Facts suspend him like an unclean person. Arnaman said, Whence do I know it? Because we learned he who was unclean or in a journey afar off and did not keep the first Passover must keep the second. Whence it follows that if he wished he could keep it and Arshis hate he can answer you. If so, the second clause which teaches if he unwittingly erred or was accidentally prevented and did not keep the first, he must keep the second. Will you argue that since he the ten estates and did not keep it? Follows that had he desired he could have kept it, but surely he had unwittingly erred or been accidentally prevented. Hence you must answer that he teaches of deliberate neglect together with these. So here too in the first clause he teaches about in one and together with these are as she said our Mishnah too implies this for it is taught these are not liable to Karath while those are liable to Karath. Now to what does this refer? Shall we say to one who hears unwittingly or is accidentally prevented? Are then he who hears unwittingly and he who is accidentally prevented subject to Gareth hence it must surely refer to a deliberate offender and in one and in Arnaman he can answer you in truth it refers to a deliberate offender alone and logically he should have taught he is liable in the singular but the reason that he teaches they are liable is that because the first clause teaches they are not liable the second clause teaches they are liable Arshis hate said whence do I know it because it was taught our Akiva said unclean is stated and in a journey afar off is stated Talmud, Mos Pesachim just as an unclean person is one who has the means of keeping it yet must not keep it so a man in a journey afar off means one who has the means of keeping it yet he must not keep it and Arnaman he can answer you our Akiva is consistent with his view for he holds one must not slaughter and sprinkle on behalf of a person unclean through a reptile whereas I agree with the view that one Slaughters and sprinkles on behalf of a person unclean through a reptile are rabbis taught the following keep the second Passover Zabin and Zaboth male lepers and female lepers Nidath and those who had intercourse with Nidath and women after confinement those who do not observe the first Passover inadvertently and those who are forcibly prevented and those who neglect it deliberately and he who is unclean and he who was in a journey afar off if so why is an unclean person mentioned you? Ask why is he mentioned surely to teach that if he wishes to keep it at the first we do not permit him rather the question is why is a person on a journey afar off mentioned to exempt him from Kareth this being in accordance with the view that it is accepted is then a woman obliged to keep the second Passover but surely it was taught you might think that only a person unclean through the dead and one who was in a journey afar off keep the second Passover whence do we know that? Zabin and lepers and those who had intercourse with Nidath must keep it from the verse if any man etc. There is no difficulty one is according to our Jose the other according to our Judah and our Simeon our rabbis taught one incurs Kareth on account of the first Passover and one incurs Kareth on account of the second this is rabbis view our Nathan said one incurs Kareth on account of the first but does not incur it on account of the second our Hanania B. Akibia said one does not incur Kareth even on account of the first unless he deliberately does not keep the second now they are consistent with their views for it was taught a proselyte who became converted between the two Passovers and similarly a minor who attained his majority between the two Passovers are bound to keep the second Passover that is rabbis view our Nathan said whoever is subject to the first is subject to the second and whoever is not subject to the first is not subject to the second wherein do they differ rabbi? Holds the second is a separate festival. Our Nathan holds the second is a compensation for the second, but it does not make amends for the first. While our Hanania Biakibia holds the second makes amends for the first. Now the three deduce their views from the same verse, but the man that is clean and is not in a journey, Rabbi holds and forbeareth to keep the Passover. That soul shall be cut off, because he did not keep it at the first, or alternatively, if he brought not the offering of the Lord in its appointed season, i.e., at the second. And how do you know that that phrase that man shall bear his sin means Kareth Talmud? Mos Pesachim he holds that Megadeth is one who curses the divine name, while of him who curses the divine name it is written, Whosoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And the meaning of this his sin is learned from his sin there, just as there it means Kareth. So here too it means Kareth again. Our Nathan holds and forbeareth to keep the Passover that. Soul shall be cut off for this key denotes because and this is what the divine law saith because he brought not the
Afar off, but when one is from the threshold of the temple court and without he is regarded as being afar off, G-E-M-A-R-A will ascend from Odiyam to Jerusalem is 15 miles. He holds as Rabbi Barhan ascend in our Yohanan's name. What is an average man's journey in a day? 10 parts and 5 mils from daybreak until the first sparklings of the rising sun and 5 mils from sunset until the stars appear. This leaves 30, 15 from the morning until midday and 15 from midday until evening. I.E. sunset Ula is consistent with his view for Ula said what is a journey afar off any place whence a man is unable to enter Jerusalem at the time of slaughtering the master said 5 mils from daybreak until the first sparklings of the rising sun. Whence do we know it because it is written and when the morning arose I.E. at daybreak then the angels hastened lot saying etc. And it is written the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot came unto Zor while Arhanan said I myself saw. That place and it is five mils from Sodom. The above text stated Ullah said what is a journey afar off any place whence a man is unable to enter Jerusalem at the time of slaughtering, but Rab Judah maintained any place whence one is unable to enter Jerusalem at the time of eating Rabbi said to Ullah on your view there is a difficulty and on Rab Judah's view there is a difficulty on your view there is a difficulty for you say any place whence a man is unable to enter at the time of slaughtering yet surely a man unclean through a reptile is unable to enter at the time of slaughtering yet you say one slaughters and sprinkles on behalf of a person unclean through a reptile on Rab Judah's view there is a difficulty for he says any place whence one is unable to enter at the time of eating but surely he who is unclean through a reptile is able to enter at the time of eating yet he says one may not slaughter and sprinkle on behalf of a man unclean through a reptile said he too. Him neither on my view nor on Rab Judah's view is there a difficulty on my view there is no difficulty a journey afar off is stated in reference to a clean person but a journey afar off is not stated in reference to an unclean person Talmud, Moss Pesachim on Rab Judah's view there is no difficulty when one is unclean through a reptile the divine law relegated him to the second Passover for it is written if any man shall be unclean by reason of a dead body does this not refer even to one whose seventh day falls on the eve of Passover yet even so the divine law said let him be relegated to the second our rabbis taught if he was standing beyond Modiim and is able to enter by horses and mules you might think that he is culpable therefore it is stated and is not in a journey whereas this man was in a journey if he was standing on the hither side of Modiim but could not enter on account of the camels and wagons which held him up you might think that he is not culpable. Therefore it is stated and is not in a journey and lo he was not in a journey Rabbah said the world is 6,000 parasangs and the thickness of the heaven Rakia is 1,000 parasangs the first one of these statements is a tradition while the other is based on reason thus he agrees with Rabbah B. Barhanah's dictum in Aryohanan's name what is an average man's journey in a day 10 parasangs from daybreak until the first sparklings of the rising sun 5 mils and from sunset until the stars appear 5 mils hence the thickness of the heaven is 1 sixth of the day's journey an objection is raised Rab Judah said the thickness of the sky is 1 tenth of the day's journey the proof is this what is an average man's journey in a day 10 parasangs and from daybreak until the rising sun 4 mils and from sunset until the stars appear 4 mils hence the thickness of the sky is 1 tenth of the day's journey this is a refutation of Rabbah and a refutation of Ola Refutation shall we say that this is also a refutation of our Yohanan he can answer you I spoke only of an average man's journey in a complete day and it was the rabbis who heard by calculating the distance for pre-dawn and after nightfall shall we say that this is a refutation of our Hanan and no and the angels hastened is different come and here Egypt was 400 parasangs square now Egypt is 1 60th of Ethiopia Cush Ethiopia 1 60th of the world the world 1 60th of the garden the garden 1 60th of Eden Eden 1 60th of the Gehenna thus the whole world is like a potlet in relation to Gehenna this is indeed a refutation come and here Tana de Belia who taught our Nathan said the whole of the inhabited world is situated under one star the proof is that a man looks at a star and when he goes eastward it is opposite and when he goes to the four corners of the world it is opposite him this proves that the whole of the inhabited world is Situate under one star this is indeed a refutation come and here the wing wagon is in the north and Scorpio is in the south the whole of the inhabited world lies between the wing and Scorpio and the whole of the inhabited world represents but one hour of the day for the sun enters the space above the inhabited world only for one hour in the day the proof is that at the fifth hour the sun is in the east while at the seventh the sun is in the west during half of the sixth and half of it. Seventh the sun stands overhead all people this is indeed a refutation come and here for our Yohanan Bezakai said what answer did the bath coal give that wicked man Nebuchadnezzar when he asserted I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be like the most high a bath coal came forth and rebuked him thou wicked man son of a wicked man Talmud, Mos Pesachim be descendant of the wicked Nimrod who incited the whole world to rebel him against me during his reign how many are they? Years of man seventy years and if by reason of strength eighty years for it is said the days of our years are three score years and ten or even by reason of strength four score years now from earth to heaven is a five hundred years journey the thickness of heaven is a five hundred years journey and between the first heaven and the next lies a five hundred years journey and similarly between each heaven yet thou shalt be brought down to the nether world to the uttermost parts of the pit this is indeed a refutation our rabbis taught the sages of Israel maintain the Galgal is stationary fixed while the Mazaloth revolve while the sages of the nations of the world maintain the Galgal revolves and the Mazaloth are stationary rabbi observe this disproves their view as we never find the wane in the south or Scorpio in the north to this Arahabi Jacob demurred perhaps it is like the pivot of a millstone or like the door socket the sages of Israel maintain the sun travels beneath it Sky by day and above the sky at night while the sages of the nations of the world maintain it travels beneath the sky by day and below the earth at night said rabbi and their view is preferable to ours for the wells are cold by day but warm at night it was taught our Nathan said in summer the sun travels in the heights of the heaven therefore the whole world is hot while the well springs are cold in winter the sun travels at the lower ends of the sky therefore the whole world is cold while the wells are hot our rabbis taught the sun travels over four courses during this and year and seven it travels over the mountains in order to melt the snows in Tammuz of Enelu over the inhabited world to ripen the fruits in Tishri Marswan and Kislev overseas to dry up the rivers in Tevechabat and it are through the wilderness so as not to dry up the seeds in the ground our Eliezer said from the threshold etc even though he can enter and we do not say to him arise and enter but it surely was taught an uncircumcised Jew who did not circumcise himself is punished by Karath. This is the opinion of our Eliezer said of a journey afar off is stated in respect of a clean person, but a journey afar off is not stated in respect of an unclean person. Rabbi said it is a controversy of Tanaim, for it was taught really as said distance of places stated in connection with the Passover and distance of places stated in connection with Tithe, just as there it means without the boundaries of its eating. So here too it means outside the place of its eating. Our Jose, son of our Judah, said on our Eliezer's authority, it means outside the place where it is sacrificed. With whom does the following dictum of our Isaac, son of our Joseph, agree? Is in respect of those who are unclean, decide by the majority who are standing in the temple court. With whom does it agree? With our Jose, son of our Judah, as he stated the law on our Eliezer's authority, said our Jose to him, therefore, etc. It was. Taught our Jose the Galilean said by a journey afar off I may understand a distance of two or three days but when it is said and is not in a journey it teaches that from the threshold of the temple court and without is designated a journey M-I-S-H-N-A-H Talmud, Mos Pesachim Talmud, Mos Pesachim what is the difference between the first Passover and the second the first is subject to the prohibition of leaven shall not be seen and leaven shall not be found while at the second a man may have leavened and unleavened bread in the house with him the first requires the reciting of hell when it the Paschal M-I-S eaten when the second does not require hell when it is eaten but both require the reciting of hell when they are sacrificed and they are eaten roast with unleavened bread and bitter herbs and they override the Sabbath Gemara our rabbis taught according to all the statute of the Passover they shall keep it the rid refers to the ordinance as pertaining to Itself,
that as far as it is possible to procure another unclean person we do so our rabbis taught according to all the statute of the Passover they shall keep it you might think just as the first is subject to the prohibition of leaven shall not be seen and shall not be found so is the second subject to the prohibition of leaven shall not be seen and shall not be found therefore it is stated they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs again I know it only of positive precepts how do we know it of negative precepts because it is stated they shall leave none of it unto the morning also I know it only of a negative precept modified to a positive precept how do we know it of an absolute negative precept because it is stated and they shall not break a bone thereof hence just as the particularization is explicitly stated as a positive precept and a negative precept modified to a positive precept and an absolute negative precept so every positive precept and a negative precept modified to a positive precept and complete negative precept are included what is included in the general proposition as applied to they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs roast with fire what does it exclude in its particularization the putting away of leaven may I not reverse it the inclusion of a precept pertaining to itself is preferable what is included in the general proposition as bearing on they shall leave none of it unto the morning thou shall not carry Fourth out of the flesh brought out of the house which is similar thereto since the one is disqualified through being nuthar while the other is disqualified through going out of its permitted boundary what does it exclude by its particularization dash leaven shall not be seen and shall not be found which is similar thereto for the one does not involve flagellation since it is a negative precept modified to a positive precept while the other does not involve flagellation since it is a negative precept modified to a positive precept may I not reverse it the inclusion of a precept pertaining to itself is preferable what is included in the general proposition as bearing on they shall not break a bone thereof Talmud, Mos Pesachim be not of it half roast by its particularization what does it exclude thou shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread may I not reverse it the inclusion of a precept pertaining to itself is preferable the first requires it. Reciting of hallow when it is eaten, etc. Whence do we know it said are Yohanan on the authority of our Simeon B. Jehoshadak scripture saith ye shall have a song as in the night when a feast is hallowed, the night that is hallowed for a feast festival requires the reciting of hallow song while the night which is not hallowed for a feast does not require the reciting of hallow, but both require the reciting of hallow when they are sacrificed, etc. What is the reason I can either say scripture? Excludes the night but not the day, or alternatively, is it possible that Israel sacrifice their Passover offerings or take their palm branches without reciting hallow and they are eaten roast, etc. Only the Sabbath do they override, but not uncleanness. Our mission does not agree with our Judah, for it was taught at the second Passover overrides the Sabbath, but it does not override uncleanness. Our Judah maintained it overrides uncleanness too. What is the reason of the first Tennessee that I have? Suspended him from the first Passover on account of uncleanness shall he after all keep it in uncleanness and our Judah the Torah sought means for him to keep it in cleanness yet if he was not privileged thus he must keep it in uncleanness our rabbis taught the first Passover overrides the Sabbath and the second Passover overrides the Sabbath the first Passover overrides uncleanness and the second Passover overrides uncleanness the first Passover requires the spending of the night in Jerusalem and the second Passover requires the spending of the night in Jerusalem the second Passover overrides uncleanness with whom does this agree with our Judah but according to our Judah does it require the spending of the night in Jerusalem surely it was taught our Judah said how do we know that the second Passover does not require the spending of the night in Jerusalem because it is said and thou shalt turn in the morning and go unto thy tents and it is written six days thou Shall eat unleavened bread that which is eaten six days requires the spending of the night in Jerusalem, but that which is not eaten six days does not require the spending of the night in Jerusalem. There is a controversy of two Tanamis to our Judah's opinion mission with regard to the Passover offering which comes in Uncle Anas and Zaboth menstruant women and women after confinement must not eat thereof yet if they did eat they are exempt from Karath but our allies are exempt. The even of the Karath normally incurred for entering the sanctuary GEMARA our rabbis taught if Zabin and Zaboth menstruant women and women after confinement ate of the Passover offering which was sacrificed in uncleanness you might think that they are culpable therefore it is stated everyone that is clean may eat flesh of sacrifices but the soul that eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord having his uncleanness upon him that soul shall be. Cut off with regard to that which is eaten by clean persons you are culpable on its account on the score of uncleanness but as to that which is not eaten by clean persons you are not culpable on its account on the score of uncleanness our Eliezer said if Zabin and lepers forced their way through and entered the temple court at a Passover offering which came in uncleanness you might think that they are culpable therefore it is stated command the children of Israel that they sent out of it. Camp every leper and everyone that hath an issue Zab and whosoever is unclean by the dead when those who are unclean by the dead are sent out Zabin and lepers are sent out when those who are unclean by the dead are not sent out Zabin and lepers are not sent out our Joseph asked what if persons unclean through the dead forced their way in and entered the temple he called at a Passover offering which came in uncleanness do we say since the uncleanness of the temple court was permitted it. Uncleanness of the temple he called to was permitted or perhaps what was permitted was permitted while what was not permitted was not permitted said Rabbah scripture saith that they sent out of the camp implying even from part of the camp others maintain Rabbah said scripture saith without me has the camp shall yes and only where without the camp shall yes and them is applicable is that they sent out of the camp applicable a Joseph asked what if persons unclean by the dead forced their way through to the altar and ate the emirim of the Passover offering which came in uncleanness Talmud, Mos Pesachim do we say since the uncleanness of the flesh was permitted the uncleanness of the emirim too was permitted or perhaps what was permitted was permitted and what was not permitted was not permitted said Rabbah consider whence is the uncleanness of emirim included from the uncleanness of the flesh for it is written that pertain unto the Lord which includes emirim hence wherever the Uncleanness of the flesh is interdicted, the uncleanness of the emurim is interdicted, while wherever the interdict of the uncleanness of the flesh is absent, the interdict of the uncleanness of the emurim is absent. Our Zara asked where did they burn the emurim of the Passover offering of Egypt, said Abay, and who is to tell us that it was not prepared roast. Moreover, surely our Joseph learned three altars were therefore the sprinkling of the blood, vis the lintel, and the two doorposts further was. There nothing else, M-I-S-H-N-A-H, what is the difference between the Passover offering of Egypt and the Passover offering of subsequent generations? The Passover offering in Egypt was taken on the tenth of Nisan, its blood required sprinkling with a bunch of hits upon the lintel and on the two doorposts, and it was eaten in haste on one night, whereas the Passover offering of subsequent generations is kept the whole seven days. G-E-M-A-R-A, whence do we know it because it is written speak? Yea, unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. The taking of this one was on the tenth, whereas the taking of the Passover offering of subsequent generations is not on the tenth. If so, when it is written, and ye shall keep it mishmareth until the fourteenth day of this month, does that too intimate this requires a four days examination before slaughtering, but no other requires examination. Surely it was taught the son. A bag bag said, How do we know that the tamed requires a four days examination before slaughtering? Because it is said, Ye shall observe Tishmaru to offer unto me in its due season, while elsewhere it is said, And ye shall keep it mishmareth until the fourteenth, etc. Just as there it requires a four days examination before slaughtering, so here too it requires a four days examination before slaughtering. There it is different because Tishmaru ye shall observe is written and thus in. Connection with the annual Passover offering it is indeed written and thou shalt keep the service in this month which intimates that all the services of this month in subsequent generations should be like this hence that word this is to exclude the second Passover which is like itself but again if so when it is written and they shall eat the flesh in this night does that too teach that this is eaten at night but another is not eaten at night scripture saith then thou shalt keep this service etc then what is the purpose of this it is required for the exegesis of our LA's or B's and A respectively but if so when it is written but no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof does that too teach that he may not eat thereof yet he may eat of the Passover offering of subsequent generations no for scripture saith then thou
necessary, but if so, when it is written, a sojourner Tashab and the hired servant Sakir shall not eat thereof, does the too intimate that he must not eat thereof, but he does eat of the annual Passover scripture set, then thou shalt keep, etc. Then what is the purpose of thereof? Only in this case does apostasy disqualify, but apostasy does not disqualify from Terima, but if so, when it is written, but every man servant that is bought for money when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof, does the too intimate that he must not eat thereof, but he does eat of the annual Passover scripture set, then thou shalt keep, etc. Then what is the purpose of thereof? Only in this case, bow is the circumcision of his males and his slaves indispensable, but the circumcision of his males and his slaves is not indispensable in the case of Terima, but if so, when it is written, neither shall ye break a bone thereof, does the too intimate that he may not break a bone thereof. But he may break a bone of the annual Passover scripture set, then thou shalt keep, etc. Then what is the purpose of thereof? Thereof indicates of a fit sacrifice, but not of an unfit one. But if so, when it is written, eat not of it half roast, does the too intimate of it. You may not eat half roast, but you may eat half roast of the annual Passover offering scripture set, then thou shalt keep, etc. Then what is the purpose of it? Before the teaching of Rabbi in our Isaac's name and was eaten in haste, etc. How do we know it? Because scripture set, and ye shall eat it in haste, it was eaten in haste, but no other was eaten in haste, and the annual Passover offering I ask kept the whole seven days, etc. To what does this refer if we say to the Passover offering, is there then a Passover offering all the seven days Talmud? Mos Pesachim be rather it must refer to leaven, hence it follows that at the Passover of Egypt leaven was forbidden one night and no more, but surely it was. Taught our Jose the Galilean said, How do we know that at the Passover of Egypt the prohibition of leaven was enforced one day only because it is said there shall no leavened bread be eaten and in proximity thereto is written this day ye go forth rather this is its meaning the Passover offering is kept one night and the same law applies to the annual Passover offering while the prohibition of leaven was enforced the whole day whereas at the Passover offering of subsequent generations. The interdict of leaven holds good for the entire seven days mission of Joshua said I have heard from my teachers that the substitute of the Passover offering I has offered and that the substitute of the Passover offering I has not offered and I cannot explain it said our Akiva I will explain it the Passover offering which was found before the slaughtering of the Passover offering must be left to graze until it becomes unfit be sold and one brings a peace offering for its money and the same applies to its substitute if found after the slaughtering of the Passover it is offered as a peace offering and its substitute likewise G-E-M-A-R-A but let him say the Passover offering is offered and the Passover offering is not offered he informs us this is that there is a substitute of a Passover offering which is not offered as a peace offering it was stated Rabbi said we learned before slaughtering and after slaughtering our Zerah maintained we learned before midday and after midday but according to our Zerah surely he teaches before the slaughtering of the Passover offering say before the time of the slaughtering of the Passover offering this is dependent on Tanaim the Passover which is found before slaughtering must graze etc if found after slaughtering it is offered our Eliezer said if found before midday it must graze etc after midday it is offered if it is found after the slaughtering of the Passover he brings it as a peace offering etc Rabbi said they learned this only if it was found after the slaughtering and he substituted another for it after the slaughtering but if it was found before the slaughtering while he substituted another for it after the slaughtering its substitute derives from the power of rejected sanctity and it cannot be offered have a raised an objection against him if he bring a lamb for his offering etc for what purposes if he bring a lamb stated to include the substitute of a Passover offering after Passover teaching that it is offered as a peace offering how is it meant if we say that it was found after the slaughtering and he substituted another for it after the slaughtering then it is obvious why do I require a verse hence it must surely apply where it was found before slaughtering and he substituted another for it after slaughtering no in truth it applies where it was found after slaughtering and he substituted another for it after slaughtering while the verse is a mere support then for what Purpose does the verse come for what was taught if he bring a lamb etc. This is to include the Passover offering in respect of its fat tail when it is stated if he bring a lamb this is to include an animal more than a year old dedicated for a Passover offering and a peace offering which comes in virtue of a Passover offering in respect of all the regulations of the peace offering is that they require laying of the hands libations and the waving of the breast and shoulder again. When it states and if his offering be a goat it breaks across the subject and teaches of a goat that it does not require the burning of the fat tail on the altar others recited Rabbis dictum in reference to the first clause of Passover offering which was found before the slaughtering of the Passover offering must graze until it becomes unfit be sold and one brings a peace offering for its money and the same applies to its substitute said Rabbi they learned this only where it was. Found before the slaughtering and he substituted another for it before the slaughtering but if it was found before the slaughtering and he substituted another for it after the slaughtering it is offered as a peace offering what is the reason the slaughtering of the Passover offering stamps with its sanctity only something that is eligible therefore but it does not stamp with its sanctity that which is not eligible therefore have a raised an objection against him if he bring a lamb etc. What is its purpose to include the substitute of a Passover offering after Passover teaching that it is offered as a peace offering Talmud, Mos Pesachim you might think that it is also thus before Passover therefore it is stated it is offered as a peace offering but the substitute of a Passover offering is not offered as such how is it meant if we say that it was found before slaughtering and he substituted another for it before slaughtering then it is obvious why do I Require a verse hence it must surely apply to where it was found before the slaughtering while he substituted another for it after the slaughtering thus the refutation of Rabbah is indeed a refutation Samuel said whatever must be left to perish in the case of a sin offering is brought as a peace offering in the case of a Passover and whatever must be left to graze in the case of a sin offering must also be left to graze in the case of a Passover while our Yohanan said no Passover is brought as a peace offering save that which is found after the slaughtering but not if it is found before the slaughtering to this our Joseph demurred now is this a general rule surely there is a sin offering more than a year old which goes forth to pasture for our Simeon be like said a sin offering more than a year old we regard as though it stood in a cemetery and it must be left to graze whereas a Passover in such a case is brought as a peace offering for it was taught if he bring a lamb etc this is to include the Passover offering in respect of its fat tail when it is stated if he bring a lamb this is to include an animal more than a year old dedicated for a Passover and a peace offering which comes in virtue of a Passover offering in respect of all the regulations of a peace offering is that they require laying of the hands libations and the waving of the breast and shoulder again when its scripture states and if his offering be a goat it breaks across the subject and teaches of a goat that it does not require the burning of its fat tail on the altar said he to him Samuel spoke only of lost sacrifices but he did not say it of rejected animals yet is this principle possible in the case of a lost sacrifice surely an animal which was lost at the time of separating another in the view of the rabbis goes to pasture until it receives a blemish for we learned if he set apart an animal as his sign offering and it was lost and he then set apart Another in its stead and then the first was found again and behold both stand before us any one of them may be sacrificed while the other must die this is rabbi's ruling but the sages maintain no sin offering must die except one found after its owner has been atoned for hence if found again before its owner was atoned for it must graze whereas in the case of a Passover offering if it was lost and found again after midday but before the slaughtering of the second it is brought as a peace offering Samuel agrees with rabbi who maintained a lost animal goes forth to perish but every lost sin offering according to rabbi is left to die whereas in the case of a Passover offering if it was lost before midday and found again before midday it must be left to graze if found before midday it is not regarded as lost in accordance with rabbi for rabbi said a loss at night is not designated a loss then according to rabbi how is it possible that a sign offering should be left to Grace Talmud, Mos Pesachim B in accordance with Arashai for Arashai said if he set apart two sin offerings as security he is atoned for by one of them while the second must be left to graze yet surely a Passover offering in such a case is brought as a peace offering rather Samuel holds as our Simeon who maintained the five sin offerings are left to die but surely our Simeon does
It rather Samuel agrees with Rabbi who ruled the lost sacrifice goes forth to perish but all lost sacrifices are left to perish in Rabbi's opinion whereas in the case of the Passover offering where it is lost before midday and found before midday it must be left to graze he holds that if it is found before midday it is not regarded as lost and he also holds midday stamps at mishnah if a man sets aside a female or a two-year-old male for his Passover offering it must be left to graze until it becomes unfit then be sold and its money is spent on a voluntary sacrifice on a peace offering Talmud, Mas Pesachim if a man separates his Passover offering and dies his son after him must not bring it as a Passover offering but as a peace offering Gemarar who the son of Arjashua said this proves three things I live animals may be permanently rejected to that which is rejected even of initio is rejected and three rejection is applicable to monetary sanctity of a man. Separates his Passover offering, etc. Our rabbis taught if a man separates his Passover offering and dies, if his son is registered with him, he must bring it as a Passover offering. If his son is not registered with him, he must bring it as a peace offering on the 16th of Nisan only on the 16th, but not on the 15th. He holds vows and voluntary offerings may not be offered on a festival. Now, when did the father die? Shall we say that he died before midday? Then how is it stated if his son is registered with him, he must bring it as a peace offering? But surely any bereavement has previously fallen upon him again. If he died after midday, if his son is not registered with him, he must bring it as a peace offering. But midday has stamped it, said Rabbi. In truth, it is meant where he died before midday, and what does he must bring it as a Passover offering? Mean he must bring it for the second Passover. Abbe said it is taught destructively if he died after midday and his. Son is registered with him, he must bring it for the sake of a Passover. If he died before midday and his son is not registered with him, he must bring it as a peace offering. Arsh Arabia said, In truth, it means where he died after midday. The case being, e.g., where his father was in a dying condition at midday. Arashi said, In truth, it means that he died after midday. This being in accordance with our Simeon who maintained live animals cannot be permanently rejected. Rabbin said, It means, e.g., where he said, It aside after midday and its owner died after midday and he holds only midday establishes it. Mishnah, if a Passover offering became mixed up with other sacrifices, all must be left to graze until they become unfit through a blemish, then be sold. And for the price of the best, one must purchase an animal of each denomination and make up the excess from one's private purse. If it became mixed up with firstlings, our Simeon said, If the Passover offering belonged to a company of priests. They eat all on that night Gemara Talmud, Mas Pesachim B. But he brings sacrifices to the place of unfitness. Our Simeon is consistent with his view for he maintains one may bring sacrifices to the place of unfitness for we learned if a guilt offering was mixed up with a peace offering our Simeon said they must be slaughtered at the north side of the altar and eaten in accordance with the laws of the more stringent of them said they to him one may not bring sacrifices to the place of unfitness. Now according to the rabbis what do we do said Rabbi we wait until they receive a blemish then he brings a choice animal and declares wherever the Passover offering may be let it as sanctity be transferred to this one and he eats them in accordance with the laws of the blemish. Firstling Mishnah if a company lost their paschal sacrifice and instructed one of their number go and seek it and slaughter it on our behalf and he went found and slaughtered it while they also took it. Animal and slaughtered it. If his was slaughtered first, he eats of his, and they eat with him. While if theirs was first slaughtered, they eat of theirs. While he eats of his, but if it is unknown which of them was first slaughtered, or if they killed both of them at the same time, he eats of his, but they may not eat with him. While theirs goes forth to the place of burning, and they are exempt from keeping the second Passover. If he said to them, If I delay, go forth and slaughter on my behalf, and then he went and found and slaughtered it. While they took another and slaughtered it. If theirs was slaughtered first, they eat of theirs. While he eats with them. While if his was slaughtered first, he eats of his, and they eat of theirs. But if it is unknown which of them was slaughtered first, or if they slaughtered both of them at the same time, they eat of theirs, but he may not eat with them. While his own goes forth to the place of burning, and he is exempt from keeping the second Passover. If he Instructed them and they instructed him they must all eat of the first to be slaughtered and if it is unknown which of them was slaughtered first both go forth to the place of burning if he did not instruct them and they did not instruct him they are not responsible for each other if the paschal sacrifices of two companies become mixed up these take possession of one animal and those take possession of one one member of these joins those and one member of those joins these and they declare thus if this paschal sacrifice is ours your hands are withdrawn from your own and you are registered for ours while if this paschal sacrifice is yours our hands are withdrawn from ours and we are registered for yours similarly if there are five companies consisting of five members each or of ten each they draw one from each company to themselves and make the foregoing declaration if the paschal sacrifices belonging to two single individuals become mixed up each takes possession of one animal this one registers a stranger with himself and that one registers a stranger with himself the former goes over to the latter sacrifice and the latter goes over to the former sacrifice and the i.e. each owner declare thus if this paschal sacrifice is mine your hands are withdrawn from your own and you are registered for mine while if this paschal sacrifice is yours my hands are withdrawn from mine and I am registered for yours G.E.M.A.R.A. or rabbis taught if he instructed them and they instructed him they must all eat of the first if he did not instruct them and they did not instruct him they are not responsible for each other Talmud, Mas Pesachim hence the sages said silence is better for the wise and how much more so for fools as it is said even a fool when he holdeth his piece is counted wise if the paschal sacrifices belonging to two single persons become mixed up etc shall we say that our mission does not agree with our Judah for it was taught and if the household be too little for a lamb this teaches that they may go on decreasing their numbers providing however that one of them remains this is our Judas view our Jose said providing that they do not leave the paschal sacrifice as it is said our Yohanan you may even say that it agrees with our Judas since our Judas said one may not slaughter the Passover offering for a single person then from the outset he stood to register another with himself and he the newly registered person is accounted as one of the original members of the company Arashi said our Mishnah too proves this for it teaches similarly if there are five companies consisting of five members each thus only of five each but not if some consist of five and others of four is not the reason because one of the original members of the company does not remain with it this proves it chapterxmishnah Talmud Mas Pesachim be on the eve of Passover close to Minhai man must not eat until nightfall even the poorest Man in Israel must not eat on the night of Passover until he reclines and they should give him not less than four cups of wine and even if he receives relief from the charity plate G-E-M-A-R-A-Y particularly the eve of Passover even the eves of Sabbaths and festivals too are subject to this law for it was taught a man must not eat on the eves of Sabbaths and festivals from Minha and onward so that he may enter i.e. commence the Sabbath with an appetite for food these are the words of our Judah our Jose said he may go on eating until nightfall said our Hunavis our mission is necessary only on the view of our Jose who said he may go on eating until nightfall that is only on the eves of Sabbaths and other festivals but with respect to the eve of Passover he agrees with our Judah because of the duty of eating unleavened bread our Papa said you may even say that it must be taught on our Judah's view too there on the eve of Sabbaths and festivals it is forbidden only from Minha and after but close to Minha it is permitted whereas on the eve of Passover it is forbidden even close to Minha to now is it permitted just before Minha on the eve of the Sabbath and festival surely it was taught a man must not eat on the eve of the Sabbath or festivals from nine hours and onwards in order that he may enter the Sabbath with an appetite these are the words of our Judah our Jose said he may go on eating until nightfall said Marzitra who is to tell us that this is authentic Talmud, Mas Pesachim Talmud, Mas Pesachim perhaps it is a corrupted version said Mirmar to him other state our Yamar I visited the session of Arphinus the son of Rmi and Atana rose and recited it before him and he accepted it as corrective so there is a difficulty hence it is clearly to be explained as Arhuna yet is it satisfactory according to Arhuna surely our Jeremiah said in our Yohanan's name other state our said in the name of our Jose B our Hanan of the Halachah. Is as our Judah in respect to the eve of Passover and the Halachah is as our Jose in respect to the eve of
All time it was related they did not stir dance until they had established the Halachah as our Jose Rab Judah said in Samuel's name the Halachah is neither as our Jude nor as our Jose but one must spread a cloth and sanctify the day but that is not so for our Talafah Bi Abdimi said in Samuel's name just as one must interrupt the meal for Kiddush Talmud, Mas Pesachim B so must one interrupt it for Havdalah now what does one must interrupt mean surely by removing the table no by spreading a Cloth Rabbi Bi Arhuna visited the Reshalutha when a tray with food was placed before him he spread a cloth and sanctified the day it was taught likewise and they both agreed that one must not bring the table unless one has recited Kiddush but if it was brought a cloth is spread over it and Kiddush is recited one buried the top both agree that one must not commence while another taught and both agree that one may commence as to what was taught and both agree that one must not commence. It is well that holds good on the eve of Passover but as to the statement and both agree that one may commence when is that if we say on the eve of the Sabbath but surely they differ there is no difficulty here it means before nine hours thereafter nine hours as for people who have sanctified the day in the synagogue Rab said they have not done their duty in respect of one but they have done their duty in respect of Kiddush but Samuel maintained Talmud, Mas Pesachim but they have not done their duty in respect of Kiddush either then according to Rab why he the reader recite Kiddush at home in order to acquit his children and his household of their duty and according to Samuel why must he recite Kiddush in the synagogue in order to acquit travelers of their obligation for they eat drink and sleep in the synagogue now Samuel is consistent with his view for Samuel said Kiddush is valid only where the meal is eaten from this it was understood by the disciples that only to adjourn from one house to another is forbidden, but to adjourn from one place to another in the same house is not forbidden, said Arain and B. Talafa to them. On many occasions I was standing before Samuel when he descended from the roof to the ground and then recited again Kiddush. Now Arhunatu holds that Kiddush is valid only where the meal is eaten for. On one occasion Arhuna recited Kiddush and then his lamp was upset, whereupon he carried his utensils into the marriage. Chamber bald action of his son Rabba where a lamp was burning recited Kiddush again and then ate something which proves that he holds Kiddush is valid only where the meal is eaten. Now Rabba too holds Kiddush is valid only where the meal is eaten for Abbe said when I was at the master's SC Rabba's house and he recited Kiddush he would say to us eat a little here less by the time you reach your lodgings your lamps become upset and you do not recite Kiddush in the house where you Eat while you will not have discharged your duty with the Kiddush of this place because Kiddush is valid only where the meal is eaten but that is not so for surely Abbe said in all matters the master S.C. Rabbah acted in accordance with Rabbi except these three where he did as Samuel this one may lie from lamp to lamp one can detach the fringes from one garment for insertion in another garment and the Halachah is as our Simeon in respect to dragging for it was taught our Simeon said a man may drag a bed seat or bench providing that he does not intend to make a rut he acted upon Rab's stringent rulings but he did not act upon Rab's lenient rulings but our Yohanan maintained they have done their duty in respect of wine to now our Yohanan is consistent with his view for our Hanin B. Abbe said in the name of our Pedat in our Yohanan's name both for a change of wine Talmud, Mas Pesachim B and for a change of place he need not recite the benediction again an objection is raised for a Change of place he must recite the benediction again for a change of wine he need not recite the benediction again this refutation of our Yohanan is indeed a refutation our EDB have been set before our Hisda while our Hisda sat and said in our Huna's name as to what you said for a change of place he must recite the benediction again they taught this only of a change from one house to another but not from one place to another place said our EDB have been to him we have learned it thus in the Beritha of the school of our Hanak other state in the school of our Hanak in accordance with your ruling does then our Huna teach us a Beritha our Huna had not heard the Beritha furthermore our Hisda sat and said in his own name as to what you said for a change of place he must recite the benediction again we said this only of things which do not require a benediction after them in the same place but for the things which demand a blessing after them in the same place he need not recite the benediction. Again, what is the reason he mentally returns to the first appointed place? But our she's hate maintained both for the one and the other. He must recite the benediction again. An objection is raised if the members of a company were reclining to drink and they precipitately arose to go out to welcome a bridegroom or a bride. When they go out, they do not need to recite a benediction beforehand. When they return, they do not need to recite a benediction at the beginning. When is that if they left an old man or an invalid there? But if they did not leave an old man or an invalid there, when they go out, they need to recite a benediction beforehand. And when they return, they need a benediction at the beginning. Now, since he teaches, they precipitately arose. It follows that we are treating of things which require a blessing after them in the same place. And it is only because they left an old man or an invalid there that when they go out, they do not need a benediction beforehand. And when they return they do not need a benediction at the beginning but if they did not leave an old man or an invalid there when they go out they need a blessing beforehand and when they return they need a blessing at the beginning this is a difficulty according to our Hista said Arnam and B. Isaac Talmud, Mas Pesachim which Tana rules thus on precipitate rising our Judah for it was taught if companions were reclining and they precipitately arose to go to the synagogue or to the Beth Hamid Rashwin. They go out they do not need a blessing beforehand and when they return they do not need a blessing at the beginning said our Judah when is that said when they left some of their companions behind but if they did not leave some of their companions behind when they go out they need a blessing beforehand and when they return they need a blessing at the beginning then make an opposite deduction it is only because there are things which need a blessing in the same place that when they go out they do. Not need a blessing beforehand, and when they return, they do not need a blessing at the beginning. But for things which do not need a blessing in the same place, even on the view of the rabbis, when they go out, they need a blessing beforehand, and when they return, they need a blessing at the beginning. Shall we say that this is a refutation of our Yohanan's ruling? But have we not already refuted him once? Shall we then say that from this too there is a refutation? Dash no, our Yohanan can answer you. The same law holds good that even for things which do not require a blessing after them in the same place, it is unnecessary to recite a blessing afresh. But as to why he teaches, they precipitately arose. That is to inform you the extent of our Judah's view is that even for things which require a blessing after them in the same place, it is only because they left some companions behind that these additional blessings are not recited. But if they did not leave some companions behind when they go. Out they need a blessing beforehand and when they return they need a blessing at the beginning it was taught in accordance with our Hisda if companions were reclining to drink wine and they arose departed and returned they need not recite a blessing and our rabbis taught if members of a company were reclining when the day became holy upon them a cup of wine is brought to one of them and he recites over it the sanctity of the day i.e. Kiddush and a second cup is brought over which he recites the grace after meals these are the words of our Judah our Jose said he goes on eating until nightfall Talmud, Mas Pesachim B when they finish their meal he recites the grace after meals over the first cup and the sanctity of the day over the second yet why so let us recite both over one cup said Arhunat in Arshesha's name one may not recite two sanctities over the same cup what is the reason said Arnam and B. Isaac because you may not perform religious duties in wholesale fashion yet. May you not surely it was taught he who enters his house at the termination of the Sabbath recites blessings over the wine the light and the spices and then recites Havdalah over the cup of wine but if he has one cup only he leaves it until after the meal and he recites them all together after it where he has not enough it is different but on the festival which falls after the Sabbath though he has wine yet Rab said the order is yet I will tell you since he Rab did not include the seasons even it follows that we are discussing the seventh day of Passover by which time he has consumed all that he had and has one more but on the first day of the festival he has wine yet Abbe said the order is Yaksana while Rabbi said the order is yet has but Havdalah and Kiddush constitute one observance whereas the grace after meals and Kiddush are two distinct observances to turn to the main text when a festival falls after the Sabbath Rab said the order is Yana Samuel said the order is Yana Talmud, Mas Pesachim Rabbi said Yana Levi said Kena the Rabbi said Kena the son of Rabbi said Nikilamartha said in our Joshua's name Nihak Samuel's father sent to Rabbi let our master teach us what is the order of Hav
First and then spices while Beth Hillel rules spices first and then light and Aryuhan and said thereon the people act in accordance with Beth Hillel as interpreted by Arjuna. Our Jacob B. Abba visited Rabba's home. He saw him recite the blessings who created the fruit of the vine over the first cup and then he recited a blessing over the cup of grace and drank it. Said he to him, Why do you need all this? Surely, sir, you have already recited a blessing for us once when we were at the Resh Galuthus. We did thus reply, He it is well that we did this at the Resh Galuthus. Said he, Because there was a doubt whether they would bring us more wine or they would not bring us more. But here, surely the second cup stands before us and we have it in mind. I acted in accordance with Rab's disciples. He replied, For our Baron and our Hanil disciples of Rab were sitting at a meal Talmud. Mas Pesachim B. and Arya Basaba waited on them. Said they to him, Give us wine and we will say grace subsequently. They said, Give us wine and we will drink. Said he to them, Thus did Rab say, Once you have said, Give us wine and we will say grace. It is forbidden to you to drink. What is the reason? Because you let it pass out of your minds. Amimar and Marzitra and Arashi were sitting at a meal, and Araha, the son of Rabba, waited on them. Amimar recited a separate blessing for each cup. Marzitra recited a blessing over the first cup and over the last cup, but Arashi recited a blessing over the first cup and no. More said Araha, be Rabba to them in accordance with whom are we to act. Amimar replied, I made a fresh decision each time. Marzitra replied, I acted in accordance with Rab's disciples, but Arashi maintained the law is not as Rab's disciples, for surely when a festival falls after the Sabbath, Rab ruled the order is Yana, but that is not so there. He had detached his mind from drinking, whereas here he had not detached his mind from drinking when he came to perform Havdalah, his attendant arose. And kindled a torch at a lamp, said he to him, Why take all this trouble? Surely the lamp is standing before us. My servant has acted of his own accord, replied he had he not heard it thus from you, he retorted, he would not have done it. Said he to him, Do you then not hold to employ a torch for Havdalah is the best way of performing the precept? Then he commenced Havdalah and recited, He who makes a distinction between holy and not holy, between light and darkness, between Israel and the nations. Between the seventh day and the six working days, said he to him, Why do you need all this? Surely Rab Judah said in Rab's name, He who makes a distinction between holy and not holy was the formula of Havdalah is recited by our Judah Hanisai. I hold with the following answer, He for our Eliezer said in Arashai's name, He who would recite but few distinctions must recite not less than three, while he who would add must not add beyond seven, said he to him, Talmud, Mas Pesachim, but you said neither. Three nor seven it is true answered he between the seventh day and the six working days is of the nature of the conclusion and Rab Judah said Samuel's name he who recites Havdalah must say something in the nature of the conclusion near to its conclusion while the Pomadithians maintain he must say something in the nature of the commencement just before its conclusion wherein do they differ they differ in respect of the festival which falls after the Sabbath i.e. Sunday when we conclude with who makes a distinction between holy and holy on the view that something in the nature of the commencement must be repeated immediately before the conclusion it will be unnecessary to say thou didst make a distinction between the sanctity of the Sabbath and the sanctity of the festival but on the view that a formula in the nature of the conclusion must be said immediately before the conclusion it is necessary to say thou didst make a distinction between the sanctity of the Sabbath. And the sanctity of the festival the above text stated our elders are said in Arashai's name he who would recite but few distinctions must recite not less than three while he who would add must not add beyond seven an objection is raised Havdalah is recited at the conclusion of the Sabbath at the conclusion of festivals at the conclusion of the Day of Atonement at the conclusion of the Sabbath giving place to a festival and at the conclusion of a festival giving place to the intermediary days but not at the conclusion of a festival leading to the Sabbath he who is well versed recites many points of distinction while he who is not well versed recites one it is dependent on Tanaim for our Yohan and said the son of holy men recited one but the people are accustomed to recite three who is the son of holy men are Menahem Bismai and why did they call him the son of holy men because he did not look at the effigy of the coin our Samuel B.E.D. sent word to him my brother Hananiah Recites one, but the law does not agree with him. Or Joshua B. Levi said, He who recites Havdalah must recite formulas in the nature of the distinctions mentioned in the Torah. An objection is raised. What is the order of the distinctions recited in the Havdalah? He recites who makes a distinction between holy and profane, between light and darkness, between Israel and the nations, between the seventh day and the six working days, between unclean and clean, between the sea and dry land, between the upper waters and the nether waters, between priests, levites, and Israelites, and the concludes with the order of creation. Others say, With he who formed the creation, our Hosea B. Our Judah said, He concludes who sanctifies Israel. Now, if this is correct, surely no distinction is mentioned in the Torah between the sea and the dry land. Delete between the sea and the dry land from this. If so, you must also delete between the seventh day and the six working days that corresponds to the conclusion then. There is one less so there are not seven I will tell you who made a distinction between priests Levites and Israelites is two formulas between Levites and Israelites is one as it is written at that time the Lord made distinct the tribe of Levi between priests and Levites is another as it is written the sons of Amram Aaron and Moses and Aaron was made distinct that he should be sanctified as most holy how does he conclude it Rab said who sanctifies Israel while Samuel said who make a stay. Distinction between holy and non-holy Abay other state our Joseph denounced this ruling of Rab it was taught in the name of our Joshua Behanania when one concludes who sanctifies Israel and makes a distinction between holy and non-holy his days and years are prolonged Talmud, Mas Pesachim be but the law is not as he visited Pumadi the said Rab Judah to our Isaac his son go and offer him a basket of fruit and observe how he recites Havdalah he did not go however but sent Abay when. Abbe returned to your Isaac asked him what did he say in the Havdalah blessed is he who make the distinction between holy and profane replied he and nothing else when he came before his father he asked him how did he recite it I did not go myself replied he but I sent Abbe and he told me that he recited who makes a distinction between holy and profane said he to him your pride and your haughtiness are the cause that you are unable to state the law from his own mouth and objection is raised in all blessings you commence with blessed art thou and conclude with blessed art thou except in the blessings over precepts the blessings over fruits a blessing immediately preceding another and the last blessing of the reading of the Shema in some of these you commence with blessed but do not conclude with blessed while in others you conclude with blessed but do not commence with blessed and in the blessing who is good and doth good unto all you commence with blessed but do not conclude with blessed Talmud, Mas Pesachim and now this raises a difficulty according to Alola can answer you this too is like a blessing for precepts for what is the reason in the case of a blessing over precepts because it is mere praise this too is praise our Hanania Bishalimia and the disciples of Rab were sitting at a meal and our Hamna Nisaba was waiting on them said they to him go and see if the day has become holy in which case we will interrupt the meal and appoint it for the Sabbath you do not need it he replied the Sabbath itself makes it an appointed meal for Rab said just as the Sabbath makes it an appointed meal in respect of tithe so does the Sabbath make it an appointed meal in respect of Kiddush now they understood from him just as it makes it an appointed meal in respect of Kiddush so does it make it an appointed meal in respect of Havdalah said Aram Rome to them thus did Rab say it makes it an appointed meal in respect of Kiddush but it does not make it an appointed meal in respect of Havdalah but that is only in respect of interrupting the meal is that we do not interrupt it we may not however commence one and even about interrupting we said this with respect to eating only but not with respect to drinking and with respect to drinking too we said this only of wine and beer but as for water it does not matter now he differs from Arhuna for Arhuna saw a certain man drinking water before Havdalah whereupon he observed to him are you not afraid of choking for it was taught in our Akiva's name he who tastes anything before reciting Havdalah shall die through choking the rabbis of Arashi's academy were not particular about water Robin asked Arnam and B. Isaac he who did not recite Kiddush on the eve of the Sabbath can he proceed to recite Kiddush at any time of the day said he to him since the sons of Arhai said he who did not recite Havdalah at the termination of the Sabbath can proceed to recite. Havdalah the whole week it follows
Termination of the Sabbath recites blessings over the wild delight and the spices and then he recites Havdalah over the cup of wine but if he has one cup only he leaves it until after the meal and recites then all together after it thus we do not say a religious duty is more precious at the proper time said he to him I am neither a self-pretended scholar nor a visionary i.e. storyteller nor unique in this ruling but I am a teacher and systematizer of traditions and they rule thus in. The Beth Hamid Rash as I do we draw a distinction between ushering the day in and ushering the day out as for ushering the day in the more we advance it the better as we thereby show our love for it but as for ushering the day out we delay it so that it may not be a pure burden upon us you may infer eight things from this very I.e. who recites Havdalah during the prayer must also recite Havdalah over the cup of wine two grace after meals requires a cup of wine three the cup. Of wine for grace demands a minimum standard for he who says a blessing over anything must partake thereof. If he tastes it, he renders it defective. Six, even when one has tasted food, he recites Havdalah Talmud. Mas Pesach Yemei Seven, you may recite two sanctities over the same cup and date. This is the ruling of Bet Shammai as interpreted by Arjuna Arashi. Said the deductions that if he tastes it, he renders it defective and that the cup of grace requires a minimum standard are the same thing. And this is what he says. What is the reason that once he tastes of it, he renders it defective because the cup of grace requires a minimum standard are Jacob Bed objected to a defective pitcher. Red Shisha objected to a defective cup. Mar Arashi objected even to a defective barrel. Our rabbis taught remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember it over one. I know it only of the day. Once do we know it of the night because it is stated remember the Sabbath day to keep it. Holy, you ask, whence do we know it of the night? On the contrary, the principal Kiddush is recited at night, for when he sanctifies, he must sanctify from the beginning of the day. Moreover, you say, whence do we know it of the night? Because it is stated, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Tana seeks proof for the night, while he adduces a verse relating to the daytime. This is what he means, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, remember it over the one at its commencement. I know it only of the night, whence do we know it of the day? Because it is said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What blessing does he recite by day? Said Rab Judah, who created the fruit of the vine, Arashi visited Mahuza, said they, the Mahuzians to him, let the master recite the great Kiddush for us. They gave him the cup of wine. Now he pondered, what is the great Kiddush? Let us see, he reason for all blessings of Kiddush. We first say, who created the fruit of the vine? So he Recited who created the fruit of the vine and tarried over it and then he saw an old man bend his head and drink thereupon he applied to himself the verse the wise man his eyes are in his head the sons of Arhai said he who did not recite Havdalah at the termination of the Sabbath proceeds to recite Havdalah any time during the week and until when said Arzara until the fourth day of the week even as Arzara sat before Arsi other state Arsi sat before Aryohanan and he sat and stated in respect to divorces the first day of the week the second and the third are defined as after the Sabbath the fourth the fifth and the eve of the Sabbath they rank as before the Sabbath are Jacob Bede said but he does not recite a blessing over the light Arbaran is said in Rab's name Talmud Mas Pesachim Bede who washes his hands before eating must not recite Kiddush said Arisaac be Samuel be Martha to the Rab has not yet died and we have already forgotten his ruling I stood Many times before Rab, sometimes he preferred bread and recited Kiddush over bread at others he preferred wine and recited Kiddush over wine. Arhuna said in Rab's name once he has tasted food he must not recite Kiddush. Arhana behind and ask Arhuna may he who has tasted food recite Havdalah. I maintain replied he that he who has tasted food recites Havdalah but Arsi said he who has tasted food may not recite Havdalah. Or Jeremiah B. Abba visited Arsi he forgot himself and ate something then they gave him a cup of wine and he recited Havdalah said his Arsi's wife to him Arsi but you do not act thus leave him replied he he holds as his teacher Arjoseph said in Samuel's name he who has tasted food may not recite Kiddush. He who has tasted food may not recite Havdalah but Rabba said in Arnaman's name in Samuel's name he who has tasted food does recite Kiddush and he who has tasted food does recite Havdalah Talmud. Mas Pesachim Rabba said the law. Is he who has tasted food recites Kiddush and he who has tasted food recites Havdalah again he who does not recite Kiddush on the eve of the Sabbath proceeds to recite Kiddush any time during the Sabbath until the termination of the Sabbath he who did not recite Havdalah at the termination of the Sabbath proceeds to recite Havdalah in time during the week Mimar commenced this ruling of Rabbah in the following version the law is he who has tasted food recites Kiddush he who has tasted food recites Havdalah he who did not recite Kiddush on the eve of the Sabbath proceeds to recite Kiddush at any time of the day he who did not recite Havdalah proceeds to recite Havdalah the whole day Marianaka and Markashi saw the sons of Arhista said to Arashi Mimar once visited our town lacking wine we brought him beer for Havdalah but he would not recite Havdalah over it and passed the night fasting the next day we took trouble to procure wine for him whereupon he recited Havdalah and ate something the following year he again visited our town and we offered him beer said he if so it is the one of the country so he recited Havdalah and ate a little this proves three things I even he who recites Havdalah in the prayer must recite Havdalah over a cup of wine two a man must not eat until he has recited Havdalah and three he who did not recite Havdalah at the termination of the Sabbath proceeds to recite Havdalah any time during the week Arhista asked Arhuna is it permitted to recite Kiddush over beer said he to him seeing that I asked Rab and Rab asked Arhai and Arhai asked Rabbi about Persumafic beverage and he could not resolve it for him can there be a question about barley beer now it was understood from him Kiddush indeed may not be recited over it yet we can recite Havdalah over it said Arhista to them thus did Rab say just as you may not recite Kiddush over it so may you not recite Havdalah over it it was stated to our Talafabi. Abdimi said in Samuel's name, just as you may not recite Kiddush over it, so may you not recite Havdalah over it. Levi sent to Rabbi Beer strain thirteenfold on tasting it, he found it well flavored, said he over such as this it is fitting to recite Kiddush and to utter all the psalms and praises in the world at night it caused him pain, said he seeing that it chastises us, shall it propitiate our Joseph said I will bow in the presence of a multitude not to drink beer Rabbi said I would drink. Flax water yet I would not drink beer Rabbi also said his drink shall be but beer who recites Kiddush over beer Rab found Arhuna reciting Kiddush over beer said he to him Abba has begun to acquire his theory with beer our rabbis taught you recite Kiddush over wine only and you say a blessing over wine only do we then not recite the blessing by whose word all things exist over beer and water said Abba this is what he means you do not say bring a cup of blessing to say grace after meals over aught. Except wine or rabbis taught you do not recite Kiddush over beer on the authority of our Eliezer son of our Simeon they said you can recite Kiddush over it the tasting of wine demands but a small quantity our Jose B. Judah said at least a mouthful Arhuna said in Rab's name and thus did Argidal of Naresh learn he who recites Kiddush and drinks a mouthful of the wine has discharged his duty if not he has not discharged his duty at Naman B. Isaac said I recite this name neither as Gidal B. Menasea nor Gidal B. Menyamai but simply Gidal what difference does that make in respect of opposing one statement of his to another statement of his close to Minha the scholars asked did we learn close to the great Minha or perhaps we learn close to the lesser Minha did we learn close to the great Minha the reason being on account of the Passover offering lest he come to prolong the meal Talmud Mas Pesachim B and refrain from performing the Passover offering or perhaps we Learn close to the lesser minhah the reason being on account of the unleavened bread lest he merely gorge himself with the unleavened bread said Rabbin come and here even King Agrippa who was accustomed to eat at nine hours might not eat on that day until nightfall now it is well if you say that we learn close to the lesser minhah hence it is that which is noteworthy about Agrippa but if you say that we learn close to the great minhah what is there noteworthy about Agrippa seeing that the interdict has already fallen upon him from before what then we learn close to the lesser minhah yet after all what is there remarkable about Agrippa surely the view of the interdict has come you might say nine hours to Agrippa is like four hours to us hence he informs us otherwise our Jose
Man in Israel must not eat until he reclines it was stated for the eating of the unleavened bread reclining is necessary for the bitter herbs reclining is not necessary as for the drinking of the wine it was stated in Arnaman's name that reclining is necessary and it was stated in Arnaman's name that reclining is not necessary yet they do not disagree one ruling refers to the first two cups and the other ruling refers to the last two cups some explain it in one direction others explain it in the other direction thus some explain it in one direction for the first two cups reclining is necessary because it is at this point that freedom commences for the last two cups reclining is necessary because what has been has been others explain it in the contrary direction on the contrary the last two cups necessitate reclining because it is precisely then that there is freedom the first two cups do not necessitate reclining because he is still reciting we were slaves now that it was stated thus and it was stated thus both the first and the last ones necessitate reclining lying on the back is not reclining reclining on the right side is not reclining moreover he may put his foot into the windpipe before the gullet and thus endanger himself a woman in her husband's house need not recline but if she is a woman of importance she must recline a son in his father's house must recline the scholars asked what about a disciple in his teacher's presence come and here for Abbe said when we were at the master's rabbi Benjamin's house we used to recline on each other's knees when we came to our joseph's house he remarked to us you do not need it the fear of your teacher is as the fear of heaven an objection is raised a man must recline with all people and even a disciple in his master's presence that was taught of a craftsman's apprentice the scholars asked what about an attendant come and here or our joshua believe i said a attendant who ate as much as an olive of unleavened bread while reclining has discharged his duty thus only while reclining but not if he was not reclining this proves that he must recline this proves that our Joshua B. Levi also said women are subject to the law of these four cups Talmud, Mos Pesachim B. because they too were included in that miracle Rab Judah said in Samuel's name these four cups must contain sufficient for the mixing of a generous cup if he drank them raw and diluted he has discharged his duty if he drank them all at once he has discharged his duty if he gave his sons and household to drink of them he has discharged his duty if he drank them raw and diluted he has discharged his duty Rab observed he has discharged his duty of wine but he has not discharged his duty of symbolizing his freedom if he drank them all at once Rab said he has discharged his duty of drinking wine but he has not discharged his duty of four cups if he gave his sons and household to drink of them he has discharged his duty said Arnaman B. Isaac providing that he himself drank the greater part of each cup an objection is raised these four cups must contain the standard of a rebuth whether neat or diluted whether new wine or old Arjuda said it must possess the taste and the appearance of wine thus it is incidentally taught standard of a rebuth whereas you say a generous cup I will answer you both are the same standard for what does he mean by sufficient for the mixing of a generous cup for each one separately of the four cups which is a rebuth for all of them together Arjuda said it must possess the taste and appearance of wine said Rabba what is Arjuda's reason because it is written look not thou upon the wine when it is read our rabbis taught all are bound to drink the four cups men women and children said Arjuda of what benefit then is wine to children but we distribute to them Talmud, Mos Pesachim parched ears of corn and nuts on the eve a Passover so that they should not fall asleep and ask the questions it was related of our Akiva that he used to distribute parched ears and nuts to children on the eve of Passover so that they might not fall asleep but ask the questions it was taught our Eliezer said the Mass oath are eaten hastily on the night of Passover on account of the children so that they should not fall asleep it was taught it was related of our Akiva that never did he say in the Beth Hamid Rash it is time to rise cease. Study except on the eve of Passover and the eve of the day of atonement on the eve of Passover because of the children so that they might not fall asleep on the eave of the day of atonement in order that they should give food to their children our rabbis taught a man is in duty bound to make his children and his household rejoice on a festival for it is said and thou shalt rejoice at thy feast thou and thy son and thy daughter etc wherewith does he make them rejoice with one our Judah said men. With what is suitable for them and women with what is suitable for them and with what is suitable for them with wine and women with what our Joseph recited in Babylonia with colored garments in Eretz Israel with iron blind garments it was taught our Judah be but there is said when the temple was in existence there could be no rejoicing save with me as it is said and thou shalt sacrifice peace offerings and shalt eat there and thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God but now that the temple is no longer in existence there is no rejoicing save with wine as it is said and wine that make glad the heart of men our Isaac said the zest for Maurice and Sephoris was about equal to the temple log and thereby we gauge the rebuke of wine for Passover our Yohanan said the ancient Tamantan which was in Tiberias exceeded this by a quarter and thereby we gauge the rebuke of wine for Passover our Hista said the rebuke of the Torah is the cubic content of a vessel two finger breadths square by Two and seven tenths finger breadths in depth as it was taught, and he shall bathe all his flesh in water. This intimates that nothing must interpose between his flesh and the water in water means in the water of Amikwe. All his flesh implies sufficient water for his whole body to be covered therein. And how much is the Talmud? Mos Pesachim BA square cubit by three cubits depth. And the sages estimated the standard of the water of Amikwe at forty SEAHSR as she said, Rabin behind it told me the table in the sanctuary was jointed. For if you should think that it was permanently fastened, how could one immerse a cubit in a cubit? What difficulty is this? Perhaps it was immersed in the sea which Solomon made for our high taught the sea which Solomon made held one hundred and fifty clean IU regulation size Mikwath, and they should give him not less than four cups. How could our rabbis enact something whereby one is let into danger? Surely it was taught a man must not eat in peers. Nor drink in peers, nor cleanse himself twice, nor perform his requirements twice. Said our nom in scripture, said it is a night of guarding unto the Lord, i.e., it is a night that is guarded for all time from harmful spirits. Rabbis said the cup of grace after meals combines with the others for good, but does not combine for evil. Rabbis said our rabbis instituted four cups as symbolizing liberty. Each one Talmud, Mos Pesachim, Talmud, Mos Pesachim is a separate obligation. He must not perform his requirements twice. Why has he not newly decided? Said Abbe, this is what he the Tana means. He must not eat in peers and drink in peers, and he must not perform his needs even once after eating or drinking in peers, lest he be weakened and be affected. Our rabbis taught he who drinks in peers, his blood is upon his own head. Said Rab Judah, when is that if he had not seen the street, but if he has seen the street, he is at liberty to drink a second cup. Our Ashi said, I saw that our. Hananiah BBB used to go out and see the street at each cup. Now we have said this only if he intends to set out on a journey after drinking, but if he intends to stay at home, it is not harmful. Our Zara observed and going to sleep is like setting out on a journey. Our Papa said and going to the privy is like setting out on a journey. Now if he intends to stay at home, it is not dangerous. Yet surely Rabbi counted the beams while when Abe had drunk one cup, his mother would offer him two cups in her two hands again. When Arnam and B. Isaac had drunk two cups, his attendant would offer him one cup. If he had drunk one cup, he would offer him two cups in his two hands. An important person is different. Ola said ten cups are not subject to the danger of peers. Ola is consistent with his view for Ola said while others maintain it was taught in the very the sages instituted ten cups in a mourner's house. Now if you should think that ten cups are subject to the danger of peers, how? Could our rabbis arise and enact a regulation whereby one is let into danger but eight are subject to peers our hista and rabbis son of our who not both maintained shalom peace combines with others for good but does not combine for evil but six is subject to peers rabbi and our joseph both maintained we humka and be gracious unto thee combines with others for good but does not combine for evil but four is subject to peers abe and rabbi both maintained we yishmirka and keep the combines with others for good but does not combine for evil now rabbi is consistent with his view for rabbi allowed the rabbis to depart from his house after four cups and the rabbi bilu came to harm he paid no heed to the matter saying that was his punishment because he raises difficulties at the public session our joseph said the demon joseph told me that ashmite the king of the demons is appointed over all peers and a king is not designated a harmful spirit others explained it in the Opposite sense, on the contrary, a king is quick tempered and does whatever he wishes for a
A wine dash barrel at once happened at a barrel burst. This is the position in general when one is particular, that the demons are particular about him, while when one is not particular, they are not particular about him. Nevertheless, one should take heed when our demi came. He said two eggs, two nuts, two cucumbers, and something else. These are halacha from Moses at Sinai, but the rabbis were doubtful what this something else was, and so the rabbis forbid appears on account of the something else. And as to what we have said, ten, eight, six, and four are not subject to peers that was said only in respect to the harmful spirits mazikin, but where witchcraft is concerned, we fear even many as it once happened in the case of a certain man who divorced his wife, whereupon she went and married a shopkeeper every day. He, her first husband, used to go and drink wine, and though she exercised her witchcraft against him, she could avail not because he was heedful of peers. One day he drank two excess and did not know how much he drank until sixteen cups. He was clear-headed and on his guard after that he was not clear-headed and took no care, and she turned him out at an even number of drinks as he was going along. An Arab met him and observed to him, corpses walking here, he went and clasped the palm tree. The palm tree cried out and he burst. Our said plates and loaves are not subject to even numbers. This is the general rule that which is completed by man is not subject to even. Numbers, but in the case of that which is completed by heaven, such as various kinds of eatables, we fear even numbers. A shop is not subject to even numbers. If a man changes his mind, it is not subject to even numbers. A guest is not subject to even numbers. A woman is not subject to even numbers. But if she is an important woman, we take heed. Our Highness, son of our Joshua, said asparagus wine combines with other liquors for good, but does not combine for harm. Robin has said in Robin's name, a doubt. Concerning even numbers, is resolved stringently. Others stated doubt. Concerning even numbers, is resolved leniently. Our Joseph said two cups of wine and one of beer do not combine. Two of beer and one of wine combine. And your token is this. This is the general principle. Whatever is joined thereto of a material more stringent than itself is unclean. Of a material more lenient than itself is clean. Our Naman said in Rab's name two cups before the meal and one during the meal combine one. Before the meal and two during the meal do not combine our measure she had do we then desire to effect a remedy for the meal we desire to effect a remedy for the person and surely the person stands remedied yet all agree that two during the meal and one after the meal do not combine in accordance with the story of Rabbi Binamani Rab Judah said in Samuel's name all mixed drinks combine Talmud, Mas Pesachim except water while our Yohan and maintained even water our Papa said this was said only. Of hot water mixed with cold or cold mixed with hot but not if it is hot mixed with hot or cold with cold Rush Lakish said there are four actions for which he who does them has his blood on his own head and forfeits his life is easing oneself between the palm tree and the wall passing between two palm trees drinking borrowed water and passing over spilled water even if his wife poured it out in his presence easing oneself between the palm tree and the wall this was said only if there is not four. Cubits, but if he leaves four cubits, it does not matter, and even if he does not leave four cubits space, it was said only where there is no other path, but if there is another path, it does not matter. Passing between two palm trees, this was said only where a public thoroughfare does not cross between them, but if a public thoroughfare crosses between them, it does not matter. Drinking borrowed water, that was said only if a child borrowed it, but if an adult, it does not matter, and even if a child borrowed it, this was said only in respect to the countryside where it is not found in abundance, but in the town where it is found in abundance, it does not matter, and even in respect to the countryside, this was said only of water, but there is no objection against borrowed wine and beer and passing over spilled water, this was said only if he did not interpose dust or spit into it, but if he interposed dust or spit into it, it does not matter again, this was said only if the sun had not passed over. It nor did he walk sixty steps over it, but if the sun had passed over it and he walked sixty steps over it, it does not matter again. This was said only if he was not riding an ass and was not wearing shoes, but if he was riding an ass and was wearing shoes, it does not matter yet. That is only where there is not to fear of witchcraft, but where there is ought to fear of witchcraft, even if there are all these safeguards, we still fear as in the case of a certain man who rode on an ass and was wearing his shoes, his shoes shrank and his feet withered. Our rabbis taught there are three who must not pass between two men, nor may others pass between them. Visit dog a palm tree and a woman, some say a swine, two, some say a snake, too, and if they pass between what is the remedy said, our papa let them commence a verse with El God and end with El others say, let them commence a scriptural passage with low not and finish with low if a menstruant woman passes between two men if it is at the beginning of her menses she will slay one of the men if it is at the end of her menses she will cause strife between them what is the remedy let them commence a verse with L and end with L when two women sit at a crossroad one on one side of the road and one on the other side of the road facing each other they are certainly engaged in witchcraft what is the remedy if there is another road available let one go through it while if there is no other road then if another man is with him let them clasp hands and pass through while if there is no other man let him say thus a graph is laugh see a have been slain with arrows when one meets a woman coming up from her statutory table if subsequently he is the first to have intercourse a spirit of immortality will infect him while if she is the first to have intercourse a spirit of immortality will infect her what is the remedy let him say thus he poureth contempt upon princess and causeth them to wander in the waste where there is no way, our Isaac said what is meant by the verse, Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. This refers to him who sleeps in the shadow of a single palm tree or in the shadow of the moon. Now, in respect to the shadow of a single palm tree, this holds good only where the shadow of the neighboring tree does not fall upon it. But if the shadow of the neighboring tree falls upon it, it does not matter. Then when it was taught, he who sleeps in the shadow of a single palm tree in a courtyard, and he who sleeps in the shadow of the moon has his blood on his own head. How is it meant? Shall we say that the shadow of the neighboring tree does not fall upon it? Then even in a field too, it is dangerous. Hence, you may surely infer from this that in a courtyard there is danger, even if the shadow of the neighboring tree fall on it. This proves it. And in respect to the shadow of the moon too, this holds good only when it falls in. The west, but when it is in the east, it does not matter. Talmud, Mas Pesachim B. If one eases oneself on the stump of a palm tree, the demon Pelka will seize him, and if one leans one's head on the stump of a palm tree, the demon Zirida will seize him. He who steps over a palm tree, if it had been cut down, he will be cut down, killed. If it had been uprooted, he will be uprooted and die. But that is only if he does not place his foot upon it. But if he places his foot upon it, it does not matter. There are five shades: the shade of a single palm tree, the shade of a candle tree, the shade of a caper tree, and the shade of sword bushes. Some say also the shade of a ship and the shade of a willow. This is the general rule. Whatever has many branches, its shade is harmful, and whatever has hard prickles or wood, its shade is harmful. Except the service tree, whose shade is not harmful, although its wood is hard, because should the demon said to her son, fly from the service tree, because it is that which killed. Your father and it also killed him or as she said I saw our kahana avoid all shades of demons of caper trees are called ruah spirits those of sort bushes are called shy demons those which haunt roofs are called rich fiery bolts in respect of what does it matter in respect of amulets the demon of caper trees is a creature without eyes what does it matter in respect of fleeing from it a scholar was once about to ease himself among the caper trees when he heard it advancing upon him so he fled from it while he had gone and embraced a palm tree whereupon the palm tree cried out and it the demon burst the demons of sort bushes are called shy a sort bush which is near a town has not less than sixty shy demons haunting it how does this matter in respect of riding an amulet a certain town officer went and stood by a sort bush near a town whereupon he was set upon by sixty demons and his life was in danger he then went to a scholar who did not know that it was a Sword bush haunted by sixty demons, and so he wrote a one demon amulet for it. Then he heard how they suspended a hingon at the tree and sing us the man's turban is like a scholar's. Yet we have examined the man and find that he does not know. Blessed art thou. Then a certain scholar came who knew that it was a sword bush of sixty demons and wrote a sixty demon amulet for it. Then he heard them saying, Clear away your vessels from your kitab Mary. There are two kitabs, one before noon and one afternoon. The one before noon is called Kethab Mary and looks like a little turning in the jug of Kamka.
Days the genius appointed over sustenance is called nakia cleanliness. The genius appointed over poverty is called nabal folly or filth. Dirt on the spout of a pitcher leads to poverty. He who drinks water out of a plate is liable to a cataract. He who eats cress without first washing his hands will suffer fear. Thirty days Talmud. Mas pesishim. He who lets blood without washing his hands will be afraid. Seven days. He who trims his hair and does not wash his hands will be afraid. Three days. He who pierces his nails and does not wash his hands will be afraid. One day without knowing what affrights him. Putting one's hand to one's nostrils is a step to fear. Putting one's hand to one's forehead is a step to sleep. And was taught if food and drink are kept under the bed, even if they are covered in iron vessels and evil spirit rests upon them. Our rabbis taught a man must not drink water either on the nights of the fourth days, Wednesdays, or on the nights of Sabbath. And if he does drink. His blood is on his own head because of the danger. What is the danger? An evil spirit. Yet if he is thirsty, what is his remedy? Let him recite the seven voices which David uttered over the water, and then drink as it is said. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. Even the Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord break the cedars. Yet the Lord break in pieces the cedars of the Lebanon. The voice of the Lord heweth out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shake the wilderness. The Lord shake the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord make the hinds to calve and strip at the forest bare and in his temple all say glory. But if he does not say this, let him say thus: Elul Shafan and Ibran and Erdafan. I dwell among the stars. I walk among lean and fat people. But if he does not say this, if there is a man with him, he should rouse him and say to him: So and so, the son of so. And so I am thirsty for water, and then he can drink. But if not, he knocks the lid against the pitcher, and then he can drink. But if not, let him throw something into it, and then drink. Our rabbis taught a man should not drink water from rivers or pools at night. And if he drinks, his blood is on his own head because of the danger. What is the danger? The danger of blindness. But if he is thirsty, what is his remedy? If a man is with him, he should say to him, So and so, the son of so and so, I am thirsty for water. But if not, let him say to himself, Oh, so and so, my mother told me, Beware of Shabrai, Shabrai, Beriah, Rai, 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 I am thirsty for water in a white glass. And even if he receives relief from the charity plate, etc., that is obvious. It is necessary only even according to our Akiba who said, Treat your Sabbath like a weekday rather than be dependent on man. Yet here, in order to advertise the miracle, he agrees. Tanadeb Aliyah, who taught though our Akiba said, Treat your Sabbath like a weekday. Rather than be dependent on men, yet one must prepare something trifling at home. What is it said? Our Papa Fish Hash, as we learned, our Judah B. Tima said, Be strong as the leopard and swift as the eagle, fleet as the deer, and valiant as a lion to do the will of thy Father in heaven. Our rabbis taught seven things. Did our Akiva charge his son, our Joshua, my son, do not sit and study at the highest point of the town. Do not dwell in a town whose leaders are scholars. Do not enter your own house suddenly and of it. More your neighbor's house and do not withhold shoes from your feet. Arise early and eat in summer on account of the sun, i.e., and in winter on account of the cold. Treat your Sabbath like a weekday rather than be dependent on men and strive to be on good terms with the men upon whom the hour smiles. Our Papa observed that does not mean to buy from or to sell to him, but to enter into partnership with him. But now that our Samuel B. Isaac said what is meant by the verse, thou hast blessed it. Work of his hands, whoever took a farthing peritah from Job was blessed even to buy from and to sell to him is advisable. Five things did our Akiva charge our Simeon Biyohe when he was immured in prison. He the latter said to him, Master, teach me Torah, I will not teach you. He replied, If thou wilt not teach me, said he, I will tell my father Yohe, and he will deliver thee to the state. My son answered he more than the calf which is to suck, does the cow desire to suckle? Said he to him, Yet who is in danger? Surely the calf is in danger, said he to him, If you wish to be strangled, be hanged on a large tree, and when you teach your son, teach him from a corrected scroll. What is that said? Rob other state our Meshachi, a new one for once an error has entered, it remains. Do not cook in a pot in which your neighbor has cooked. What does that mean? Do not marry a divorced woman during her husband's lifetime, for a master said, When a divorced man marries a divorced woman, there are four minds in it. But alternatively, it refers even to a widow for Talmud. Mas pesishim be not all fingers are alike. Enjoying the produce without interest is a good deed and profitable investment. A religious deed which leaves the body pure is marrying a woman when one already has children. Four things did our holy teacher command his children: do not dwell in shechins of because its inhabitants are scoffers and will corrupt you to disbelief. And do not sit upon the bed of a Syrian woman. Some say that means to not lie down to sleep without reading the Shema. While others explain, do not marry a proselyte. But others explain Syrian literally the reason being on account of what happened to our Papa. And do not seek to evade toll tax lest they discover you and deprive you of it that you possess. And do not stand in front of an ox when he comes up from the meadow because Satan dances between his horns. Said our Samuel, this refers to a black ox. And in the month of Nisan, our Ashai recited, one must remove a distance. Of fifty cubits from an ox that is a tam, and as far as the eye can see from an ox that is a mu at a tan taught in our mayor's name, even when the ox's head is in the feeding bag, climb up to the roof and throw away the ladder from under you. Rab said the cry for an ox's hand, hand for a lion's eyes, for a camel did a ship's cry is Helani, hey, hell, we look, Yulia, base, skin, a fish, a cup, hot water, eggs, and the vermin in linen are all injurious to something else, skin that means he who sleeps on a tanner's high day, fish, vishabuta during this, and a cup, the residue of fish, hash, hot water, pouring extremely hot water over oneself, eggs, i.e., he who treads on their shells, vermin in linen, if one launders his garment and does not wait eight days before putting it on the vermin are produced and harmful for something else, our papa said a man should not enter a house in which there is a cat without shoes, what is the reason because the cat may kill a snake and eat it now the snake has. Little bones and if a bone sticks into his foot it will not come out and will endanger him. Others say a man should not enter a house where there is no cat in the dark. What is the reason lest a snake wind itself about him without his knowing and he come to danger? Three things did our Ishmael son of our Jose charge Rabbi Nimonic Makish do not inflict a blemish upon yourself. What does that mean? Do not engage in a lawsuit with three for one will be your opponent and the other two witnesses against you and do not feign interest in a purchase when you have no money when your wife has performed table. Do not be intimate with her. The first night said Rab that refers to an by scriptural law for since there is a presumption of an open well she may continue with Conroe. discharge three things did our Jose son of our Judah charge Rabbi do not go out alone at night and do not stand naked in front of a lamp and do not enter a new bathhouse lest it the floor split. How long is it? Regarded as new said our Joshua be Levi for twelve months and do not stand naked in front of a lamp for it was taught he who stands naked in front of a lamp will be epileptic and he who cohabits by the light of a lamp will have epileptic children our rabbis taught if one cohabits in a bed where an infant is sleeping that infant will be an epileptic now that was said only if he is less than one year old but if he is a year old it does not matter again this was said only if he is sleeping at their feet but if he is sleeping at their head it does not matter again this was said only if he does not lay his hand upon him but if he lays his hand upon him it does not matter and do not go out alone at night for it was taught one should not go out alone at night i.e. on the nights of neither Wednesday nor Sabbaths because Igrath the daughter of Mahalachi and 180,000 destroying angels go forth and each has permission to wreak destruction independently originally they were about a day on one occasion she met our Hannah Abidosa and said to him had they not made an announcement concerning you in heaven take heed of Hannah and his learning I would have put you in danger if I am of account in heaven replied he I order you never to pass through settled regions I bet you she pleaded leave me a little room so he left her the nights of Sabbaths and the nights of Wednesdays on another occasion she met Abay said she to him had they not made an announcement about you in heaven take heed of Namani and his learning I would have put you in danger if I am of account in heaven replied he I order you never to pass through settled regions but we see that she does pass through I will tell you those are Talmud Moss passage him the narrow paths which they frequent
and the exercise of charity are papa said every bill requires collecting in every credit sale it is doubtful whether a payment will be forthcoming or not and when it is forthcoming it may be bad money three things did our Yohanan say in the name of the men of Jerusalem when you go out to battle do not go out among the first but among the last so that you may return among the first and treat your Sabbath like a weekday rather than be dependent on your fellow beings and strive to be on good terms. With him upon whom the hour smiles three things did our Joshua believe I say in the name of the men of Jerusalem do not practice immodesty on account of the incident which occurred if your daughter has attained puberty free your slave and give him to her and beware of your wife with her first son in law what is the reason Arhista said on account of immorality our Kahana said on account of money and in fact both are correct our Yohanan said three are of those who will inherit the world to come this. He who dwells in Eretz Israel and he who brings up his sons to the study of the Torah and he who recites Havdalah over wine at the termination of the Sabbath who is that he who leaves over wine from Kiddush for Havdalah or Yohanan said concerning three does the Holy One blessed be he make proclamation every day a bachelor who lives in a large town without sinning a poor man who returns lost property to its owner and a wealthy man who tithes his produce in secret our Safra was a bachelor living. In a large town Talmud, Mos Pesachim Binao Atana recited our Yohanan's dictum before Rabbah and our Safra whereupon our Safra's face lit up said Rabbah to him it does not mean such as you but such as our Hannah and our Ashai who were cobblers in Eretz Israel and dwelt in a street of harlots and made shoes for harlots and went into them they the harlots looked at them but they these scholars would not lift their eyes to look at them and there the harlots oath was by the life of the holy rabbis. Of Eretz Israel three the holy one blessed be he loves he who does not display temper he who does not become intoxicated and he who does not insist on his full rights three the holy one blessed be he hates he who speaks one thing with his mouth and another thing in his heart and he who possesses evidence concerning his neighbor and does not testify for him and he who sees something indecent in his neighbor and testifies against him alone as it once happened at Tobias and Zika. Alone came and testified against him before our Papa whereupon he had Zikat punished to Bison and Zikat is punished exclaimed he even so said he to him for it is written one witness shall not rise up against the man whereas you have testified against him alone you merely bring him into ill repute our Samuel son of our Isaac said in Rab's name yet he may hate him for it is said if thou see the ass of thine enemy lying under its burden now which enemy is meant shall we say a Gentile enemy but it was taught the enemy of whom they spoke is an Israelite enemy not a Gentile enemy hence it obviously means an Israelite enemy but is it permitted to hate him surely it is written thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart again if there are witnesses that he had committed wrong the all indeed hate him why particularly this person hence it must surely apply to such a case where he had seen something indecent in him or not and B. Isaac said it is a duty to hate him as it is said the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Araha son of Rabbah asked Arashi what about telling his teacher that he should hate him said he to him if he knows that his teacher regards him as trustworthy as two witnesses he should tell him but if not he must not tell him. Our rabbis taught there are three whose life is not like the overcompassionate, the hot tempered and the two fastidious whereon our Joseph observed and of these qualities are found in me. Our rabbis taught three hate one another his dogs fowls. And Parsi priests some say harlots too some say scholars in Babylonia too. Our rabbis taught three love each other his proselyte slaves and rabbins four are too impossible for words a poor man who is arrogant the wealthy man who flatters a lecherous old man and a leader who lords it over the community without cause some say also he who divorces his wife a first and a second time and takes her back in the first tana it may be that her kethuba is large or else he has children from her end. Cannot divorce her five things did Cain and charge his sons love one another love robbery love lewdness hate your masters and do not speak the truth six things were said of a horse it loves promiscuity it loves battle it has a proud spirit it despises sleep eats much and excretes little some say it also seeks to slay its master in battle seven are banned by heaven these are the Jew who has no wife he who has a wife but no children and he who has children but does not bring them up to the study of the Torah and he who has no phylacteries on his head and on his arm no fringes on his garment and no mezuzah on his door and he who denies his feet shoes and some say also he who never sits in a company assembled for a religious purpose Rabbi Barhanna said in the name of our Samuel B. Martha in Rab's name on the authority of it Hosea of Huzel, how do we know that you must not consult astrologers because it is said thou shalt be wholehearted with the Lord thy God and how do we know? That one who knows that his neighbor is greater than himself even in one thing must show him honor because it is said because a surpassing superior spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm and she a woman who sits over clean blood is forbidden intercourse for how long said Rabbi Ona Eitan taught Joseph of Huzal is identical with Joseph the Babylonian with Isibi Gerariah with Isibi Judah with Isibi Gamaliel and with Isibi Mahalalel and what was his real name Isibi Akibi Isaac B. Tabla is identical with our Isaac B. Hakla and with our Isaac B. Ilay Talmud. Mos Pesachim A. R. Isaac B. Aha mentioned in legal discussions is the same as our Isaac B. Finis mentioned in homilies and the token is here Mishima Uni my brethren Ahai and my people Rabbi B. Barhanna said in our Yohanan's name in the name of our Judah B. R. I. L. A. I. E. Onions Basil and dwell in the protection basil of your house and do not eat peace and fowls lest your heart pursue. You reduce your food and drink and increase expenditure on your house when Willa came he said in the West Palestine a proverb is current he who eats the fat tail alive must hide in the loft alive but he who eats cress cockle may lie by the dunghill kickle of the town M-I-S-H-N-A-H they filled the first cup for him Beth I maintained he recites a blessing for the day first and then recites a blessing over the wine while Beth Hillel rule he recites a blessing over the wine. First and then recites a blessing for the day G-E-M-A-R-A or rabbis taught these are the matters which are disputed by Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel in respect to the meal Beth Shammai maintained he recites a blessing for the day first and then recites a blessing over the wine because the day is responsible for the presence of the wine moreover the day has already become sanctified while the wine has not yet come but Beth Hillel maintained he recites a blessing over the wine and then recites a Blessing for the day because the wine enables the Kiddush to be recited another reason the blessing for wine is constant while the blessing for the day is not constant and of that which is constant and that which is not constant that which is constant comes first now the law is as the ruling of Beth Hillel why state another reason this for should you argue there we have two reasons whereas here there is only one I answer that here also there are two for of that which is constant and that which is not constant that which is constant comes first now the law is as the ruling of Beth Hillel that is obvious since there issued a bath coal if you wish I can answer that this was before the bath coal alternatively it was after the bath coal and this is in accordance with our Joshua who maintained we disregard a bath coal Mishnah they then set IT before him he dips the lettuce before yet he has reached the after course of the bread they set before him as all that is hazer and Haroseth and two dishes though the Haroseth is not compulsory our Eliezer son of Arzadik said it is compulsory and in the temple they used to bring the body of the Passover offering before him G-E-M-A-R-A Talmud, Mos Pesachim B. Reshlegish said this proves that precepts require intention for since he does not eat at the stage when bitter herbs are compulsory he eats it with the blessing who creates the fruit of the ground and perhaps he did not intend to fulfill the obligation of bitter herbs therefore he must dip it again with the express purpose of eating bitter herbs for if you should think that precepts do not require intention why two dippings surely he has already dipped it once but once does this food perhaps after a precepts do not require intention and as to what you argue why two dippings the answer is that there may be a distinction for the sake of the children and should you say if so we should be informed about other vegetables if we were informed. About other vegetables I would say only where other vegetables are eaten first do we require two dippings but lettuce alone does not require two dippings hence he informs us that even lettuce alone requires two dippings so that there may be a distinction shown therewith for the children moreover it was taught if he ate them the bitter herbs while he may he has discharged his duty if he ate them without intention he has discharged his duty if he ate them in half quantities he has discharged his duty providing that he does not wait between one eating and the next
Only said Arhuna first he recites a blessing over the bitter herbs who create us the fruit of the ground and eats and then later he recites over it concerning the eating of bitter herbs and eats Talmud, Mas Pesachimay to this Arhis Dadimert after filling his stomach with it he returns and recites a blessing over it rather said Arhis Dad on the first occasion he recites over it who create us the fruit of the ground and concerning the eating of bitter herbs and eats while subsequently he eats. The lettuce without a blessing in Syria they acted in accordance with Arhuna while Arshis hate the son of Arjashu acted according to Arhis Dad and the law is in accordance with Arhis Dad Araha the son of Rabba used to go in search of other vegetables so as to avoid controversy Rabba said our Meshashi son of Arnathan told me thus did Hillel say on the authority of tradition a man must not make a sandwich of maza and bitter herbs together and eat them because we hold that maza nowadays is a Biblical obligation whereas bitter herbs are a rabbinical requirement and thus the bitter herbs which are rabbinical will come and nullify the mazah which is biblical and even on the view that precepts cannot nullify each other that applies only to a biblical precept with a biblical precept or a rabbinical precept with a rabbinical precept but in the case of a scriptural and a rabbinical precept the rabbinical one comes and nullifies the scriptural one which tana do you know to hold that precepts do not nullify each other it is hillel for it was taught it was related of hillel that he used to wrap them together for it is said they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs are Yohanan observed hillel's colleagues disagreed with him for it was taught you might think that he should wrap them together and eat them in the manner that hillel ate it therefore it is stated they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs intimating even each separately to this Arashi demurred if so what is the meaning of even rather said Arashi this Tana teaches us you might think that he does not discharge his duty unless he wraps them together and eats them in the manner of Hillel therefore it is stated they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs intimating even each separately now that the law was not stated either as Hillel or as the rabbis one recites the blessing who has commanded us concerning the eating of unleavened bread and eats. Then he recites the blessing concerning the eating of bitter herbs and eats and then he eats unleavened bread and lettuce together without a blessing in memory of the temple as Hillel did our Eliezer said in Arashi's name whatever is dipped in a liquid requires the washing of the hand said our papa infer from this that the lettuce Talmud, Mas Pesachim B must be plunged right into the Haroseth to counteract the kappa for if you should think that it need not be sunk into it why is the washing? Of the hands required, surely he does not touche the Haroseth, yet perhaps I may maintain that in truth it need not be sunk into the Haroseth, the cap dying from its smell, yet why is washing of the hands required in case he plunges it in our papa also said a man must not keep the bitter herbs an appreciable time in the Haroseth because the sweetness of its ingredients as see the Haroseth might neutralize its bitterness, whereas the taste of bitter herbs is essential, but it is then absent Arhista. Brought Rabbi Akba and he lectured if he washed his hands at the first dipping, he must wash his hands at the second dipping too. The rabbis discussed this before our papa. This was stated in general, for if you should think that it was stated here in connection with Passover, why must he wash his hands twice? Surely he has already washed his hands once said our papa to them. On the contrary, it was stated here, for if you should think that it was stated in general, why two dippings what then it was? Stated here then why must he wash his hands twice surely he has already washed his hands once I will tell you since he is to recite the Haggadah and Hallel he may let his thoughts wander and touch something unclean Rabbah said if he swallows unleavened bread he discharges his duty if he swallows bitter herbs he does not discharge his duty if he swallows unleavened bread and bitter herbs together he discharges his duty of unleavened bread but not his duty of bitter herbs if he wraps them in bast and swallows them he does not discharge his duty of unleavened bread either Arsimi B. Ashi said unleavened bread must be set before each person of the company bitter herbs before each person and Haroseth before each person but we remove the table only from before him who recites the Haggadah Arhuna said all these two are set only before him who recites the Haggadah and the law is as Arhuna why do we remove the table the school of Arjane said so that the children may perceive the unusual proceeding and inquire its reasons Abbe was sitting before Rabbah when he saw the tray taken up from before him said he to them we have not yet eaten and they have already come and removed the tray from before us said Rabbah to him you have exempted us from reciting why is this night different Samuel said bread of Oenai means bread over which we recite on in many words it was taught likewise bread of Oenai means bread over which we recite on in many words another. Interpretation bread of Oenai on poverty is written just as a beggar generally has a piece Talmud, Mas Pesachim so here too a piece is taken another interpretation just as a poor man fires the oven and his wife bakes so here too he eats and she bakes so Haroseth is not a religious requirement then if it is not a religious requirement on what account does he bring it said RMI on account of the Kappa RC said the Kappa of lettuce is counteracted by radishes the Kappa of Radishes by leeks, the kappa of leeks by hot water, the kappa of these by hot water, and in the meanwhile let him say thus kappa kappa I remember you and your seven daughters and your eight daughters in law are Eliezer son of Arzadak said it is a religious requirement why is it a religious requirement are Levi said in memory of the apple tree are Yohanan said in memory of the day I observed therefore one must make it accurate and thicken it make it accurate in memory of the apple tree and thicken it. In memory of the day it was taught in accordance with our Yohanan the condiments are in memory of the straw and the Haroseth itself is a reminder of the day our Eliezer son of Arzadak said thus did the grocers cry come and buy ingredients for your religious requirements Mishnah they filled a second cup for him at this stage the son questions his father if the son is unintelligent his father instructs him to ask why is this night different from all other nights for on all other nights we Eat leavened and unleavened bread whereas on this night we eat only leavened bread on all other nights we eat all kinds of herbs on this night bitter herbs on all other nights we eat meat roast stewed or boiled on this night roast only on all other nights we dip once but on this night we dip twice and according to the son's intelligence his father instructs him he commences with shame and concludes with praise and expounds from a wandering Aramean was my father until he completes the whole. Section G E M A R A or rabbis taught if his son is intelligent ask him while if he is not intelligent his wife asks him but if not he asks himself and even two scholars who know the laws of Passover ask one another why is this night different from all other nights for on all other nights we dip once while on this night we dip twice to this rabbi demurred is then dipping once indispensable all other days rather said rabbi it was thus taught for on all other nights we are not obliged to dip even. Once whereas on this night twice to this our Safra demurred a statutory obligation on account of children rather said our Safra he teaches us we do not dip even once whereas this night we dip twice he commences with shame and concludes with praise what is with shame rap said aforetime our fathers were idolaters while Samuel said we were slaves our nom and asked his slave there when a master liberates his slave and gives him gold and silver what should he say to him he should thank and praise him. Replied he you have excused us from saying why is this night different observed he thereupon he commenced by reciting we were slaves mission Argamaliel used to say whoever does not make mention of Talmud, Mas Pesachim be these three things on Passover does not discharge his duty and these are they the Passover offering unleavened bread and bitter herbs the Passover offering I a sacrifice because the omnipresent passed over the houses of our fathers in Egypt as it is said and ye shall. Say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover for that he passed over etc. The unleavened bread is eaten because our fathers were redeemed from Egypt as it is said and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt etc. The bitter herb is eaten because the Egyptians embittered the lives of our fathers in Egypt as it is said and they made their lives bitter etc. In every generation a man is bound to regard himself as though he personally had gone forth from Egypt because it is said and thou shalt tell thy son in that day saying it is because of that which the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt therefore it is our duty to thank praise law glorify exalt honor bless extol and adore him who wrought all these miracles for our fathers and ourselves he brought us forth from bondage into freedom from sorrow into joy from mourning into festivity from darkness into great light and from servitude into redemption therefore let us say before him Hallelujah how far does one recite it Beth Shammai maintain until as a joyous mother of children while
holds that unleavened bread nowadays is a scriptural obligation, but surely it was our Ahabi Jacob himself who said the obligation of eating unleavened bread nowadays is rabbinical. He holds whatever our rabbis enacted, they enacted it similar to the scriptural job, but according to our Shizhate and our Joseph too, surely it is certain that whatever our rabbis enacted, they enacted similar to a scriptural law. How compare as for there it is we since it should have been written, he is our son, whereas it is written this our son, you may infer that it comes to exclude blind persons, but here if not for the sake of this what should be written, hence it comes to intimate for the sake of the unleavened bread and bitter herbs, therefore it is our duty Talmud, Mas Pesachim Talmud, Mas Pesachim Ar Hista said in our Yohanan's name, Hallelujah Kesha and Jedja are single words, Rab said Kesha and Mirhabja are single words, Rabbi said Mirhabja alone is a single word, the scholars asked what about? Mirhabja in our Hista's view, the question stands, the scholars asked what about Jedja in Rab's view, come and here Jedja is divisible into two, therefore Jedja is not sacred, while Yah the Lord is sacred, the scholars asked what about Hallelujah in Rab's view, come and here for Rab said, I saw a copy of the Psalms in my friend's college wherein Hallelujah was written on one line, and Yah on the following, now he disagrees with our Joshua B. Levi, for our Joshua B. Levi said, what is the meaning of? Hallelujah praise him with many praises further here Joshua B. Levi is self-contradictory for our Joshua B. Levi said the book of Psalms was uttered with ten synonyms of praise Viznijua victory Nigun melody masculine is more psalm sure song ashray happy tehila praise tefila prayer hodeah thanksgiving and hallelujah the greatest of all is hallelujah because it embraces the divine name and praise simultaneously Rab Judah said in Samuel's name the song in the Torah was uttered by Moses and Israel when they ascended from the Red Sea and who recited the tale of the prophets among them ordained that Israel should recite at every important epoch and at every misfortune may it not come upon them and when they are redeemed they recite in gratitude for their redemption it was taught our mayor used to say all the praises which are stated in the book of Psalms David uttered all of them for it is said the prayers of David the son of Jesse are ended Calorie. Not Caleb but Kolelu, all these who recited this Hallel are Jose said my son Eliezer maintains that Moses and Israel said it when they ascended from the Red Sea but his college disagree with him averring that David said it but his view is preferable to theirs is it possible that Israel slaughtered their Passover offerings or took their palm branches without uttering song another argument Micah's image stands at Becky and Israel recites the Hallel our rabbis taught as for all the songs and praises to which David gave utterance in the book of Psalms our Joshua said he spoke them in reference to himself our Joshua said he spoke them with reference to the Jewish community while the sages maintain some of them refer to the community while others refer to himself thus those which are couched in the singular bear upon himself while those which are couched in the plural allude to the community Nizhu and introduce Psalms relating to the future masculine indicates that it was Spoken through a maturgement interpreter, the superscription to David a psalm intimates that the Shechen arrested upon him, and then he uttered that song a psalm of David intimates that he first uttered that particular psalm, and then the Shechen arrested upon him. This teaches you that the Shechen arrested upon man neither in indolence nor in gloom nor in frivolity nor in levity nor in vain pursuits, but only in rejoicing connected with a religious act. For it is said, but now bring me a minstrel, and it came to pass when the minstrel played that he hand of the Lord came upon him. Rab Judah said in Rab's name, and it is likewise so in the matter of Halisha Arnaman said, and it is likewise so for a good dream, but that is not so for Argidal said in Rab's name. If a scholar sits before his teacher and his lips do not drip anxiety, they shall be burnt. For it is said his lips are as lilies Shechenim dropping with flowing murmur. Over read not Shechenim, but Shechonim that study. Read not moreover, but moreover dropping anxiety there is no difficulty one applies to the teacher the other to the disciple alternatively both refer to the teacher yet there is no difficulty the one holds good before he commences the other after he commences even as rabbi used to say something humorous to his scholars before he commenced his discourse in order to amuse them after that he sat in awe and commenced the lecture our rabbis taught who uttered this hell our Eliezer said Moses had Israel uttered it when they stood by the Red Sea they exclaimed not unto us not unto us and the Holy Spirit responded for mine own sake for mine own sake will I do it our Judah said Joshua and Israel uttered it when the kings of Canaan attacked them they exclaimed not unto us etc and the Holy Spirit responded etc our Eliezer the Modi said Deborah and Barak uttered it when Caesar attacked them they exclaimed not unto us etc and the Holy Spirit responded for mine own sake for mine own sake Will I do it? Our Eliezer B. Ezra said Hezekiah and his companions uttered it when Sennacherib attacked them. They exclaimed not unto us, etc. And the Holy Spirit responded, etc. Our Akiba said Hanani missile and Ezra uttered it when the wicked Nebuchadnezzar rose against them. They exclaimed not unto us, etc. And the Holy Spirit responded, etc. Our Jose the Galilean said Mordecai and Esther uttered it when the wicked Haman rose against them. They supplicated not unto us, etc. And the Holy Spirit responded, etc. But the sages maintained the prophets among them enacted that the Israelites should recite at every epoch and at every trouble may it not come to them. And when they were redeemed, they recited in thankfulness for their delivery. Our Hista said Hallelujah marks the end of the chapter. Rabbi B. Arhuna said Hallelujah marks the beginning of the chapter. Our Hista observed I saw that in the copies of the Psalms used in the College of Arhanin B. Rab Hallelujah was written in the middle of it. Chapter which proves that he was in doubt. Arhanin Birabba said, I agree that in the case of my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Hallelujah, which follows it is the beginning of the next psalm. In the wicked shall see and be vexed, he shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. The hallelujah which follows it commences the next psalm again in the passage that stated in the house of the Lord in the night seasons. The following hallelujah commences the next psalm. Bible scholars add the following, he will drink of the brook by the way, therefore will he lift up the head. Hallelujah, which follows it is the beginning of the next psalm. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding how they that do thereafter his praise and it forever. Hallelujah, which follows it is the beginning of the next psalm. Shall we say that this is dependent on Tanaim, for we learned how. Far does he recite it, Beth Shammai maintain until as a joyous mother of children, while Beth Hillel say until the flint into a fountain of waters, but another buried the taught how far does he recite it, Beth Shammai maintain until when Israel came forth out of Egypt, while Beth Hillel say until not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, Talmud, Mas Pesachim, be surely then they differ in this, he who says until as a joyous mother of children holds that the following hallelujah praise ye Lord is the beginning of the next psalm, while he who says until when Israel came forth out of Egypt holds that hallelujah is the end of the previous psalm, our history reconciles it with his view, all agree that hallelujah is the end of the psalm, hence the statement until when Israel came forth out of Egypt is well, while he who says until a joyous mother of children is meant inclusively, then let him say up to hallelujah, and should you answer because we would not know which hallelujah, then let him say up to. The hallelujah of as a joyous mother of children. This is a difficulty. Rabbi Bar Huna reconciles it with his view. All agree that hallelujah is the beginning of the psalm. Hence the statement until as a joyous mother of children is well. While he who says until when Israel came forth does not mean it inclusively. Then let him say until the hallelujah. And should you answer because we would not know which hallelujah is meant. Then let him say until the hallelujah of when Israel came forth. This is a difficulty. And he concludes with the formula of redemption. Rabbi said the ending of the benediction following the reciting of the Shema and Hallel is who redeemed Israel. That a prayer is the redeemer of Israel. What is the reason? Because it is a petition. Our Zerah said the formula in Kiddush is who did sanctify us with his commandments and did command us that a prayer is sanctify us with thy commandments. What is the reason? Because it is supplication. Our Ahabi Jacob said and he must refer to. The Egyptian Exodus in the Kiddush of the day for here it is written that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt while there it is written remember the Sabbath day to hallow it by reciting Kiddush Rabbi Sheila said the formula in prayers who
The Sabbath while on festivals it is who sanctifies Israel and the seasons that argument however is incorrect is not prayer recited privately to and is not Kiddush recited by Rabbah however holds follow the main practice Olabi Rab visited Rabbah he recited Kiddush in accordance with the elders of Pumadiah and he said nothing to him in protest this proves that Rabbah retracted our Nathan the father of Arhunay the son of our Nathan visited our Papa he recited it in accordance with the elders of Pumadiah whereupon our Papa praised him Rabbah and said I visited Mirmar at Surah when the reader went down to the reading desk and recited it as the elders of Pumadiah everybody made to silence him but he said to them leave him alone the law is as the elders of Pumadiah then they did not silence him Mishnah they filled the third cup for him he then recites grace after meals over the fourth cup he concludes the hell and recites the grace of song between these cups he may drink. If he wishes between the third and the fourth he may not drink Gemara Arhanan said to Rabbah this proves that grace after meals requires a cup of wine said he to him our rabbis instituted four cups as symbolizing freedom let us perform a religious act with each over the fourth cup he concludes the hell and recites the grace of song Talmud Mas Pesachimba what is the grace of song Rab Judah said they shall praise the O Lord our God while our Yohanan said the breath of the living etc. Our rabbis taught at the fourth he concludes the hell and recites the great hell this is the view of our Tarfan others say the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want what comprises the great hell Rab Judah said from O give thanks until the rivers of Babylon while our Yohanan said from a song of ascents until the rivers of Babylon our Ahabi Jacob said from for the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself until the rivers of Babylon and why is it called the great hell said our Yohanan because the Holy One Blessed be he sits in the heights of the universe and distributes food to all creatures are Joshua believe I said to what do these twenty-six verses of give thanks correspond to the twenty-six generations which the Holy One blessed be he created in his world though he did not give them the Torah he sustained them by his love our Hista said what is meant by the verse oh give thanks unto the Lord for he is good give thanks unto the Lord who exacts man's debts by means of his goodness the wealthy man. Through his ox and the poor man through his sheep the fatherless through his egg and the widow through her fowl our Yohanan said man's sustenance involves twice as much suffering as that of a woman in childbirth for of a woman in childbirth it is written in pain be as if thou shalt bring forth children whereas of sustenance it is written in toil be as shalt thou eat our Yohanan also said man's sustenance is more difficult to come by than the redemption for of redemption it is written. The angel who hath redeemed me from all evil thus a mere angel sufficed whereas of sustenance it is written the God who hath fed shepherded me or Joshua believe I said when the Holy One blessed be he said to Adam thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to the tears flowed from his eyes and he pleaded before him sovereign of the universe shall I and my ass eat out of the same crib but as soon as he said to him in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread his mind was set at rest our Simeon. Belakish said happy are we that we did not remain subject to the first Abbey observed yet we have still not altogether escaped from it for we eat herbs of the field arshes by said in the name of our Eliezer be Ezra a man's sustenance is as difficult to provide as the dividing of the Red Sea for it is written who giveth food to a flesh and near it to him who divided the Red Sea in sunder our Eliezer be Ezra said a man's excretory organs when blocked up are as painful as the day of death and as difficult to overcome as the dividing of the Red Sea, for it is said the prisoner hasteneth to be loosed, and he shall not go down dying into the pit, neither shall his bread fail, and that is followed by for I am the Lord thy God who stirreth to the sea that the waves thereof roar again. Our she's hate said on the authority of our Eliezer B. Ezra, he who despises the festivals is as though he engaged in idolatry, for it is said thou shalt make thee no molten gods which is followed by the feast. Of unleavened bread shalt thou keep our she's hate also said on the authority of our Eliezer B. Ezra, whoever relates slander and whoever accepts slander and whoever gives false testimony against his neighbor deserve to be cast to dogs, for it is said ye shall cast to the dogs which is followed by thou shalt not take up the false report which may be read Tashina, since there is a great hell, why do we recite this one because it includes a mention of the following five things the Exodus from. Egypt, the dividing of the Red Sea, the giving of the Torah, revelation, the resurrection of the dead, and the pangs of Messiah, the Exodus from Egypt, as it is written, when Israel came forth out of Egypt, as the dividing of the Red Sea, the sea saw it and fled, the giving of the Torah, the mountain skipped like Ram's resurrection of the dead. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living, the pangs of Messiah, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, or Yohanan also said, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. Refers to the servitude to foreign powers, other state, or Yohanan said, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, refers to the war of Gog and Magog, Arnam and B. Isaac said, Hell is recited because it contains an allusion to the deliverance of the souls of the righteous from the Gehenna, as it is said, I beseech thee, O Lord, deliver my soul, Hezekiah said, because it alludes to the descent of the righteous into the fiery furnace, and their ascent from it, their descent, for it is written, not unto us, O Lord, not. Unto us this had and I said, but unto thy name give glory was said by missile for thy mercy arid for thy truth sake by Ezra, wherefore should the nation say by all of them their ascent from the fiery furnace for it is written, O praise the Lord all ye nations this had and I said, Lord him all ye peoples was said by missile for his mercy is great toward us by Ezra, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever by all of them others maintain that it was Gabriel who said and the truth of the Lord endureth forever for when the wicked Nimrod cast our father Abraham into the fiery furnace Gabriel said to the Holy One blessed be he sovereign of the universe let me go down cool it and deliver that righteous man from the fiery furnace said the Holy One blessed be he to him I am unique in my world and he is unique in his world it is fitting for him who is unique to deliver him who is unique but because the Holy One blessed be he does not withhold the merited reward of any. Creature, he said to him, Thou shalt be privileged to deliver three of his descendants, Arsimi and the Shilonite lectured when the wicked Nebuchadnezzar cast Hanani missile and Ezra into the fiery furnace. Here to my prince of hail rose before the Holy One, blessed be he, and said to him, Sovereign of the universe, let me go down and cool the furnace and save these righteous men from the fiery furnace. Said Gabriel to him, The might of the Holy One, blessed be he, is not thus manifested, for thou art it. Prince of hail, and all know that water extinguishes fire, but I, the prince of fire, will go down and cool it within Talmud. Mos Pesachim be, and he did without and will thus perform a double miracle. Said the Holy One, blessed be he, to him, Go down. It was then that Gabriel commenced with praise and said, And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Our Nathan said, It was the fish in the sea who said, And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. This being in accordance with Arhuna, for Arhuna said it. Israelites of that generation S.C. of the Egyptian Exodus were men of little faith and as Rabbi Bimari expounded what is taught by the verse but they were rebellious at the sea even at the Red Sea this teaches that in that moment the Israelites were rebellious and said just as we ascend at one side of the sea so do the Egyptians ascend from another whereupon the Holy One blessed be he ordered the prince of the sea spew them forth onto the dry land said he to him sovereign of the universe does a master make a gift to his servant and then take it back from him I will give you one and a half times their number he replied sovereign of the universe he pleaded can a servant claim a debt from his master let the brook of Kishon be surety for me he answered straightway he spewed them forth onto the dry land and Israel came and saw them as it is said and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore what is the solution to one and a half times their number for in the case of Pharaoh it is written and he took six hundred chosen chariots whereas in the case of Caesarea it is written and Caesarea gathered nine hundred chariots of iron when Caesarea came to fight Israel he advanced against them with iron staves thereupon the Holy One blessed be he brought forth the stars out of their orbits against them as it is written the stars in their courses fought against Caesarea as soon as the stars of heaven descended upon them they heated those iron staves so they went down to cool them and to refresh themselves in the brook of Kishon said the Holy One blessed be he to the brook of Kishon go and deliver your pledge straightway the brook of Kishon swept them out and cast them into the sea as it is said the brook Kishon swept them away that ancient brook what does that
Ethiopia shall argue with herself if those the Egyptians who enslaved them are thus treated how much the more we who did not enslave them at that the Holy One blessed be he shall bid him accepted from and straightway Ethiopia shall hasten to stretch out her hands unto God then shall the wicked Roman state argue with herself if those who are not their brethren are thus accepted how much the more we their brethren but the Holy One blessed be he will say to Gabriel rebuke the wild beast of the reeds can of the multitude of Adath the bulls rebuke the wild beast Rome and take the possession can of the congregation at another interpretation rebuke the wild beast of the reeds i.e. that dwells among the reeds as it is written the boar out of the wood doth ravage it that which moveth in the field feedeth on it our high be Abba interpreted it in our Yohanan's name rebuke the wild beast all of whose actions may be recorded with the same pen the multitude of the bulls and Iram. With the calves of the people that means that they slaughtered the valiant of iron like calves which have no owners everyone opening his hand with the desire of money they stretch out their hand to accept the money but do not carry out its owners wishes he has scattered the people that delight in approaches what caused Israel to be scattered among the nations the approaches to the nations which they desired he also sent to him there are 365 thoroughfares in the great city of Rome and in each there were 365 palaces and in each palace there were 365 stories and each story contained sufficient to provide the whole world with food our Simeon be rabbi asked rabbi others say our Ishmael son of our Jose asked rabbi for whom are all these other stories for you your companions and acquaintances as it is said and her gain and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord it shall not be stored nor treasured for her gain shall be for them that dwell before the Lord what does it shall not be stored mean our Joseph learned it shall not be stored refers to a storehouse granary nor treasure to a treasure house what means for them that dwell before the Lord said our Eliezer Talmud, Mos Pesachim they who recognize their colleagues place in the academy other state our Eliezer said they who welcome their colleagues in the academy what does and for stately clothing leave Mikasa a thick mean that refers to him who conceals Mikasa the things which the ancient the thick of days concealed and what is that the secrets of the Torah others explain that refers to him who reveals the things which the ancient of days concealed Kisa and what is it the reasons of the Torah our Kahana said on the authority of our Ishmael be our Jose what is meant by for the leader Lamanazia a psalm of David sing praises to him who rejoices when they conquer him come and see how the character of the Holy One blessed be he is not like that of mortal man the character of mortal man is such that when he is conquered he is unhappy but when the Holy One is conquered he rejoices for it is said therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn back his wrath our Kahana said on the authority of our Ishmael son of our Jose and our Rabbi said in the name of our Judah what is implied by the verse and they had the hands of a man under their wings you do his hand is written this refers to the hand of the Holy One blessed be he which is spread out under the wings of the Hayyoth in order to accept penitence and shield them from the attribute of justice Rab Judah said in Samuel's name all the gold and silver in the world Joseph gathered in and brought to Egypt for it is said and Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan now I know it only about that of Egypt and Canaan whence do we know it about that of other countries because it is stated and all the countries came unto Egypt to Joseph to buy corn and when the Israelites migrated from Egypt they carried it away with them for it is said and they despoiled the Egyptians are a sea said they made it like a trap in which there is no corn our Simeon be like said like a pond without fish thus it the treasure lay until Rehoboam when Shishak king of Egypt came and seized it from Rehoboam for it is said and it came to pass in the fifth year of king Rehoboam that Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house then Zerah king of Ethiopia came and seized it from Shishak then Asa came and seized it from Zerah king of Ethiopia and sent it to Hadramon the son of Tabramon the Ammonites came and seized it from Hadramon the son of Tabramon Jehoshaphat came and seized it from the Ammonites and it remained so until Ahaz when Sennacherib came and took it from Ahaz then Hezekiah came and took it from Sennacherib and it remained thus until Zedekiah when the Babylonians Chaldeans came and seized it from Zedekiah the Persians came and took it from the Chaldeans the Greeks came and took it from the Persians the Romans came and took it from the Greeks and it is still lying in Rome Arham the son of Arhanan said three treasures did Joseph hide in Egypt one was revealed to Korah one to Anton he knew the son of Severus and the third is stored up for the righteous for the future time riches kept by the owner thereof to his heart our Simeon be said this refers to Korah's wealth and to the substance that was at their feet our Eliezer said this refers to a man's wealth which puts him on his feet our Levi said the keys of Korah's treasure house were a load for three hundred white mules though all the keys and locks were of leather Nemonic Daesh Adish Kashtak Miedek our Samuel be Namani said in our Jonathan's name I will give thanks unto thee for Thou hast answered me was said by David the stone which the builders rejected is become the chief cornerstone by Yeshai Jesse this is the Lord's doing by his brothers this is the day which the Lord hath made by Samuel we beseech thee O Lord save now was said by his brothers we beseech thee O Lord make us now to prosper by David blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord by Jesse we bless you out of the house of the Lord by Samuel the Lord is God and hath given us light by all of them. Order the festival procession with vows by Samuel thou art my God and I will give thanks unto thee by David thou art my God I will exalt thee by all of them we learned elsewhere where it is the practice Talmud, Mos Pesachim be to repeat he must repeat to recite it once only he must recite them once only to pronounce a blessing after it see the hell he must pronounce a blessing upon it it all depends on local custom have they observed this was taught only about a blessing after it but a Blessing before it is obligatory for Rab Judah said in Samuel's name a blessing must be recited for a religious duties before over there performed how is it implied that over connotes priority said Arnam and B. Isaac because it is written that Ahimez ran by the way of the plain and over and W. A. Yabra ran before the Kishite Abbe said it follows from this and he himself passed over Abar before them others quote the following and their king is passed on W. A. Yabra before them and the Lord at the head of them it was taught Rabbi repeated certain verses of it S. C. Halal R. L. Azer B. Parada added passages to it what did he add said Abbe he added passages for repetition from I will give thanks to the end onwards R. R. lectured sometimes stating it in R. M. I. sometimes in R. C.'s name what is meant by and the child grew and was weaned W. A. Yagamal the Holy One blessed be he will make a great banquet for the righteous on the day he manifests Yagmal his love to. The seed of Isaac after they have eaten and drunk the cup of grace will be offered to our father Abraham that he should recite grace but he will answer them I cannot say grace because Ishmael issued from me then Isaac will be asked take it and say grace I cannot say grace he will reply because Esau issued from me then Jacob will be asked take it and say grace I cannot say grace he will reply because I married two sisters during both their lifetimes whereas the Torah was destined to forbid them to me then Moses will be asked take it and say grace I cannot say grace because I was not privileged to enter Eretz Israel either in life or in death then Joshua will be asked take it and say grace I cannot say grace he will reply because I was not privileged to have a son for it is written Joshua the son of Nun his son Joshua his son then David will be asked take it and say grace I will say grace and it is fitting for me to say grace he will reply as it is said I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord Mishnah one may not conclude after the Paschal meal by saying now to the entertainment Ipokom and Gemara what does Ipokom mean said Rab that they must not remove from one company to another Samuel said e.g. mushrooms for myself and pigeons for Ab our hand of Abishila and our Yohanan said e.g. dates parched ears of corn and nuts it was taught as our Yohanan you must not conclude after the Paschal meal with e.g. dates parched ears and nuts Rab Judah said one may not conclude after the last unleavened bread is eaten by saying now to the entertainment we learned you may not conclude after the Paschal meal by saying now to the entertainment thus it is forbidden only after the Paschal meal but you may conclude thus after the unleavened bread he proceeds to a climax after the unleavened bread it need not be stated since its taste is not substantial but I might think that there is no objection after the Paschal lamb whose taste is substantial and c
The beginning he proceeds to a climax at the beginning when he eats with an appetite it is unnecessary to teach it but at the end where he may merely gorge I might say that it is not permitted hence the Tana informs us that it is Rabba said the eating of unleavened bread nowadays is a scriptural obligation whereas that of bitter herbs is rabbinical yet wherein do bitter herbs differ because it is written they shall eat at the Passover offering with unleavened bread and bitter herbs which implies when the law of the Passover offering is enforced that of bitter herbs is enforced and when the Passover offering is not enforced bitter herbs are not required either then in the case of unleavened bread too surely it is written they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs scripture indeed repeated the precept in the case of unleavened bread and even yet shall eat unleavened bread but our Ahabi Jacob maintained both the one and the other are only Rabbinical, but surely it is written that even ye shall eat unleavened bread that is required in respect of an unclean person and one who was on a journey afar off. For you might argue, since they cannot eat of the Passover offering, they need not eat unleavened bread or bitter herbs either. Hence, the verse informs us otherwise. And Rabbi, he can answer you in respect of an unclean person and one who was on a journey afar off. A verse is not required, for they are no worse than an uncircumcised person and an alien. For it was taught, no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Thereof he may not eat, but he must eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And the other it is written in the case of the one the uncircumcised, etc. And it is written in the case of the other the unclean, etc. And they are both necessary. It was taught in accordance with Rabbi six days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord thy God, just as on the seventh day. The eating of unleavened bread is voluntary so on the six days it is voluntary what is the reason because it is something which was included in the general law and then excluded from the general law in order to eliminate other cases which means that it was excluded not in order to throw light upon itself but in order to throw light upon the entire general law you might think that on the first night too it is merely voluntary therefore it is stated they shall eat it with unleavened bread. And bitter herbs I know this only when the temple is in existence whence do we know it when the temple is not in existence from the verse and even ye shall eat unleavened bread thus the rid made it a permanent obligation mission if some of them fell asleep they may eat when they awake if all of them fell asleep they must not eat Talmud. Moss Pesach and Jose said if they fell into a light sleep they may eat if they fell fast asleep they must not eat the Passover offering defile one's hands. After midnight pickle and nut are defile one's hands. Kamar Jose said if they fell into a light sleep they may eat. If they fell fast asleep they must not eat. What condition is meant by a light sleep? Said Arashi a sleep which is not sleep. A wakefulness which is not wakefulness. E.g. if he answers when called cannot make a reason statement yet recollects when reminded Abbe was sitting at the Passover meal before Rabbi seeing him dozing he remarked to him you sir are sleeping I was merely dozing replied he and we have learned if they fell into a light sleep they may eat. If they fell fast asleep they must not eat the Passover offering defile one's hands after midnight etc. This proves that from midnight it is not har which Tana holds us said our Joseph it is our Eliezer B. Ezrai for it was taught and they shall eat the flesh in that night our Eliezer B. Ezrai said in that night is stated here while elsewhere it is stated for I will go through the land of Egypt in that night just. As there it means midnight, so here too they may eat the Passover offering until midnight, said our Akiba to him, yet surely it is already stated, and ye shall eat it in haste, implying until the time of haste. If so, what is taught by in that night, you might think that it can be eaten like other sacrifices, is by day, therefore it is stated in that night it is eaten by night, but it may not be eaten by day. Now, how does our Akiba employ that night? He utilizes it as excluding a second night. For I might argue, since the Passover offering is a sacrifice of lesser sanctity, and the peace offering is a sacrifice of lesser sanctity, just as the peace offering is to be eaten two days and one night, so in the case of the Passover offering, I will substitute nights for days, and it may be eaten two nights and one day, therefore the divine Lord that night, and our Eliezer be Ezra, he can answer you that is deduced from, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and our Akiba. He can answer you had not the divine Lord in that night I would have said what does morning mean the second morning then what of our Eliezer B. Ezra he can answer you wherever morning is written it means the first morning Rabbah said if a man eats unleavened bread after midnight nowadays according to our Eliezer B. Ezra he does not discharge his duty that is obvious for since it is assimilated to the Passover offering it is like the Passover offering you might say surely the writ excluded it from the analogy hence he informs us that when the writ restores it it restores it to its original state pickle and not our defile one's hands are who not and our hista one maintains it is on account of suspected priests while the other said it is on account of the lazy priests one maintained as much as an olive defile while the other said at least as much as an egg Talmud Mos Pesachimba one taught in reference to pickle while the other taught in reference to not who taught in Reference to pickle gave the reason as being on account of the suspected priests while he who taught in reference to Nathar gave the reason as being on account of the lazy priest one said as much as an olive defile while the other said at least as much as an egg he who maintained as much as an olive accepts the standard as its prohibition while he who rules as much as an egg holds that the standard is the same as its uncleanness mission if he recited the blessing for the Passover offering either by exempts the festival sacrifice but if he recited the blessing for the sacrifice he does not exempt the Passover offering this is the view of our Ishmael our Akiba said the former does not exempt the latter nor does the latter exempt the former tomorrow when you examine the matter you must conclude that in our Ishmael's opinion sprinkling Zerika is included in pouring Shafika but pouring is not included in sprinkling whereas in our Akiba's opinion pouring is not included in Sprinkling nor is sprinkling included in pouring Talmud. Mos Pesach and Bar was present at a redemption of the firstborn. He was asked, It is obvious that for the redemption of the firstborn, it is the Father who must recite the blessing who has sanctified us with thy commandments and has given us command concerning the redemption of the firstborn. But as for the blessing, blessed who has kept us alive and preserved us and enabled us to reach the season, does the priest recite it or the child's father? Does the priest recite the blessing since the benefit redounds to him or does the child's father recite it since it is he who carries out a religious duty? He could not answer it, so he went and asked it at the schoolhouse and he was told the child's father recites both blessings and the law is that the child's father recites both blessings.